to line rimming we prefer as i said the highly costing polyethylene which averages of 9 mega at one shot uh, we do not go for the um, uh, for the regular say it's suppose two or three shots because that will actually um, disturb the mechanical uh, property of the liner so that's why we have gone for the one uh, one shot 9 mega uh, dosage of highly costing polyethylene under the um, mm -hmm. melting point so we do not do it above the melting point so which allows the liner to maintain the mechanical property so the crystallinity of the of the liner is not uh, disturbed <laughs> the minimum wall thickness which is um, prescribed or uh, allowed by us is 5.5 mm we are much above than that so we have maintained all along more than 5.5 mm of dome loading everywhere so this is the structure you can see we have a shell from 40 to 70 mm a liner and you can see we have uh, heads from 22 to 40 and at 45 degree you can see that uh, we have minimum thickness of if you if, if you are using a 40 mm cup we have a minimum thickness of around 9.1 mm or a 9.9 mm for 22 or if you are using a 28 for the smallest cup you still have a 6.1 to 6.9 mm of uh, poly thickness in the dome so that will reduce the Um, uh, and that will give more a stable polyethylene at the dome, and it will reduce the wear. If you go to the larger size, so and if you are using some something like thirty-two or thirty-six for the larger size, also we maintain of around eleven point nine to nine point nine of, or for seven point nine of dome thickness, even if you are using a forty mm. So that kind of uh, um, uh, that kind of stability we have looked into, and that kind of product range we have from forty to seventy, and the head option for twenty-two for two. 40 mm we have screws from 15 to 50 so you you can use anywhere with 6.5 mm cancel screws and there is a stop in the for the occluder so you can uh, close the apical hole in the cemented uh, portion again we have taken the proven philosophy which is a uh, double tapered highly polished stem uh, it is also a 12 by 14 it is a highly polished surface which reduce the fix, friction between the bone and the metal interface and which will allow the stem to take absorb a subsidence of around up to 3 mm across its life so if the stem is there in the body for around 35 40 years it uh, it will allow subsidence up to around 3 mm and doesn't have any friction between the cement and the uh, uh, metal interface because of the highly polished surface and uh, there are nine sizes from narrow uh, the, we have four and the standard size we have five uh, we have very very reduced distal profile to, for easy insertion again uh, the, there is a double taper again to convert the shear stress into compressive load to give you maximum proximal loading to the bone and we have a cemented centralizer uh, so polymethyl metacrylate acrylic cemented centralizer and we have a color colorless neck and we have some iconic marks over there which will to have you through so that's how it is converting the uh, hoop stress into compressive load to the proximal femur and the lower uh, and the fixed chain becomes very precise and gives long term fixation here are three markings so if you wish you can put the stem a little bit down or a little bit up and you increase the uh, leg length or increase the uh, neck length as well as the uh, horizontal offset so you can do it both way vertical offset or uh, horizontal offset you can increase both way and the gap the distance between uh, the iconic marks is 4 mm so you can reduce it by 2 mm or you go up to the 4 mm or you can go up to 4 mm or also go up to 2 mm as per your choice so this gives you uh, intra op uh, flexibility uh, these are the cement restrictors we have and uh, you can see and we have this is the end cap of the centralizer which allows the stem the centralizer allow the stem to subside within the cement mantle without end bearing and resulting in optimum load transfer as i said nine uh, sizes if you look at if you go for the minus sizes minus 3.5 offset will be around 34.2 it can go up to around 47.6 if you use a plus 7 head so those are the kind of offsets you can get a length 127 to 149 we have a uh, cup we have again a uh, 10 degree uh, cup um, and uh, this is made of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene grade 1050 uh, we have the grooves over here for better cement integration with along with the pegs which will and we need around 2 mm of 
cement integration into this and it will allow you to have a, a cement layer of around 2 mm uh, in the acetabulum the beauty of this stem cup is it there is a the inbuilt um, area of the stem is built in such a way that it head, hip, uh, the, the head will automatically get little bit medialized so that it is easier for you to reduce the head into the cup as well as it also uh, reduce the joint reaction forces so the so the dislocation chances also get reduced so it increase the momentum by increasing the horizontal offset it gives you little bit more stability because the head goes little bit medially to into the cup and your joint reaction force also get reduced so less chances of dislocation as well so we have from 38 to 60 and head you can uh, use for the smaller cups 22 and you can go up to 28 and then 32 and even up to 40 for the bigger sizes it allows cement mantle of 2 mm and it, you can see the minimum thickness of the uh, dome thickness will be 5.9 going, going up to 7.9 across the sizes so the polyethylene thickness is maintained uh, the bipolar Again, made of the same um, same polyethylene grade one zero or five zero ultra high molecular polyethylene. We have thirty seven to fifty eight. If you look at the sizes, uh, sixty three. Uh, sorry, and we, we it will accept twenty two in the smaller sizes and twenty eight in the bigger sizes. So with one m of increment, thirty seven, thirty eight, and so on, sixty one in up to fifty three. It will have 1 mm of increment beyond 53, it will have 2 mm. It's a quite a long range for you. Uh, the, the bipolars are made of 316 LVM alloy and the surface roughness is less than 0 0.05. And again, the uh, grade is 1050. So that will reduce the friction. The head, we have three, three types of head, Biolos Delta Ceramic Femoral Head, Latitude COCR Head and Latitude uh, Modular High Nitrogen Stainless Steel. We recommend stainless steel uh, heads to be used with stainless steel stem, as you know. And these are the sizes. We uh, start from minus 3.5 goes up to plus 7 for the ceramic heads. And for the uh, COCR heads, it goes from minus 3.5 to around plus 7 to the uh, in the length and the particle offsets. Same for the stainless steel. For the smaller size, we have 22 plus 0 and plus 3.5. From 28 to 40, we have minus 3.5 plus 0, plus 3.5, and, and 7. These are some of the extras you can see done with our stems. Left one is unseminated, the right one is a cemented. And all the uh, tests have been required, testing have been done in the, in the, in the lab, in ORL. And if you see, uh, we have done for the distal stem, fatigue stem, uh, stem and uh, 10 million cycles have been done for both the stainless steel stem, the cemented one and non-cemented stem. Proximal stem neck fatigue stem have been done again for 10 million cycles without failure. Fretting corrosion tests have been done between the head and the stem uh, interface so that the fretting is reduced. So that test we have done for 10 million cycles as per the ASTMF1875. And destruction test, how tough it is to take out the head from the stem the tougher it is the better it is the locking mechanism and the less the fretting will be that test has also been done from uh with uh, as per the standard of iso 7206 push in and uh, uh, push in and push out test how difficult it is to take out the liner from the shell so so that the the the, the backside wear is reduced so that the micro motion is reduced so that test we have done we also done the impingement test at what level and what limit our 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 head or the stem can go in the into the liner? So that also we have done. Where to stings? We have seen that our nine megalad highly costing polyethylene is two hundred times less uh, wear than the conventional polyethylene that we have tested. And range of motion as per up to one fifty five degree can be achieved with this kind of stain. So it's if we we have looked into the efficient over workflow and also precise instrumentation, which we will take you through very quickly. After this, based all the stems are based on the rich history of uh, clinically successful implant design, both the unseminated and the cemented, as you know, and a very facet and optimized inventory and efficient OR through simplified implants and instrument selection and fewer implant to stock. We have looked into this side also. And thank you uh, for giving me time to take you through the product uh, journey. Any, if, if there is any question, I'm ready to answer or else. I will ask my colleague uh, Vinay and team to take you through the uh, instrumentation workshop.
So thank you so much, sir. It was a very yes, nice sir. and a very concise presentation. Thank you so much, sir. And I think so, we can start uh, go directly to the workshop, please. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank, thank so, you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, respected uh, faculties. I will take you through the uh, Vinay and team. Are you there? Can you quickly start? Sir, we are online. So please start. So uh, I will introduce you. Um, we have three uh, three of my colleagues are there in our academy in Merrill. We have a huge academy. So yeah. Vinay, Janil, and Sriraj there. They will take you through the presentation. Of course, I will be there uh, to uh, to to uh, to answer any question you have. So it is in our academy, which is in uh, Merrill uh, facility. It's a huge academy. So take you. Please start. Vinay, Janil, and team. And Sriraj. Okay. Turn the pin. Sir, I would like uh, request you to pin my video. Yes, please. Sir, respected is a, a presentation, sir. So we can show yes, the video. Yes, I am unsharing it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, can you pin which one to be pinned, General Professor? Can you see, sir? Um, Instrumentation. Can yeah. you see the video? Can, can you make it full screen, sir? It's not obvious. It, it, it's your picture that's obvious uh, in just in front of us, sir. Yes. Can you make, make it full screen? Uh, it's full screen, sir, now. Uh, I would like everyone to clean this video so they can see every all the procedure over here. Now, is it full screen? I don't think it's full screen. It's full screen now, sir. No, we yeah. can't say it. it is. So, can you can you move your... Uh, yes, thing we want it to be moved. Rectangular view. Rectangular view. Yes. Yeah. Is it okay now? It's still, is it's not rectangular. Yes. If you can maximize the the picture, please. If you can maximize, yes, I think that is yes. better. Yes. Yes. Right, sir. So yes, sir. Okay. So start very quickly. Time is short. So, hello everyone. First of all, I like to. Thank everyone for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak in between you guys. So, respected dignitaries, uh, I am so much happy and uh, excited to represent Merit and talk about our deep instruments. So, if you see, we have altogether seven trails here. So, if uh, a surgeon wants to work on the acetabular path, so we have this acetabular trail. Can you just show it there? We have removed most of the instrument that we will be reading. We are just showing you an overview. There are like there are two trays, uh, one tray, and this is comprised of first floor, second floor for acetabular, followed by the reverse tray, the odd and even reverse, as you can see here. Depending on such a preference, you can uh, choose wisely. Then we have for this part of we have this bipolar top assembly, so a surgeon can use it up according to his needs. This bipolar assembly followed by this is cemented uh, cemented stem. So if a surgeon wants to do this femur part, he have two options. One is uncemented uh, tray, one is cemented tray. And in between, what remains common is called common instrument tray. So if a surgeon wants to go for the cemented tray, a cemented uh, surgery, he can take this common instrument together. For uncemented, he can take this too. So all together, seven trays. So we have kept most of the instrument over here in an array depending on their use. So we'll be starting with the uh, acetabular first. So we have already dislocated it and uh, it's all set. We haven't cut the deck of a finger, which we'll do later. So first and foremost, we'll start with reaming of acetabular. So first for that, we'll be taking a reamer. So depending on our surgeon preference, he can start with reaming. So we will start with the smallest. So we'll go 90. We'll go 45. Yeah, slightly BGL, then slightly 45, and then parallel to acetabular uh, this uh, transverse acetabular ligament. So we'll gradually go. So here we have just taken even. So we'll go for 36, 38, 40, 42. A BGL reaming, then we will 45. Can, can the camera can the camera be a little bit closer? Sure. Little, little closer so that uh, the fa faculties and delegates oh. can see it properly. Yes. Yeah. 
So we'll gradually change it. So this is size size. So this size fifty followed by this will go with the size fifty. So a surgeon can bring him according to his preference until healthy using of blood and at only place So our last remote size was size 52. So with our negative rim system, we have line to line rim. So we'll go with size 52. 52. So we will take a mallet. This will remove this. This is the acetabular handle. So, followed by this, like our last reamer was size 52. So, this cup is size 52. So, as it is line to line reaming. So, prior to final assembly of the final cup, we'll check like what liner fits and how is the you know range of motion and everything. So, for that, we have this, this color coded. Team. Like if you see, the, our heads are color coded because OT environment is full of blood, so this gives uh, ease of uh, visibility to a surgeon. If you see this size 22 head, the outer die is 22, 28, 32, 36, and 40. These are color coded accordingly. The liner trials are color coded, which will marry with the both. Like this one will the brown will marry brown, gray will marry gray. So these are color coded 22. 28, 32, 36, and 40. So, our, can you bring this away? So, our uh, uh, cell trial was size 52. So, 52 marries 44. So, we will use 44 liner. Uh, depending on a surgeon preference, surgeon has a flexibility to use two kind of screwdriver. So, one is a normal hexagonal screwdriver, the other is a ball and socket screwdriver, which is having an excellent motion, range of motion, which you can use. So we'll fix it up. Then we will take the line. So uh, yeah. We'll take universal hand. So surgeon has a you know is of a you can feel it like this. The second option is you can use the yeah, you can use the trial brooch, head, neck, and this one, and he can see. So once the surgeon feels that everything is okay, then he can go for a final plan. So we'll remove this liner trial. Uh, we feel everything feels okay. We need this. We will use size specific final trial. So if you see, if you see in between the most If you see here, the difference in between these two is 1.3 mm difference. At the periphery. At the periphery. So at the equator, it gives excellent fit. So actually, like if you see, the reamer is size 52, but there is a difference of 1.3 mm at the equator. So what happens, you know, it gives excellent peripheral fit in the bone. So we will take this.
and tell it so we will uh, uh, you can see as it has been snug fit it won't come out even if we try so followed by this we can again use the trial liner there is the show one screw yeah you have yeah. the screws so this is just for looking so then also have a flexibility to use the screws so as you can see there are three screw options so we will go with the uh, uh, drill uh, so before uh, like putting up a screw we will use a drill bit so there are two options 3.8 4.5 mm drill bit so to get so uh, accordingly we have these two kind of you know this uh, drill sleeves 3.8 and 4.5 so we'll create So uh, after this, you can surgeon has a flexibility to use the depth gauge to check the what size of screw he needs to put. Once he's done with this, he has again a flex a flexibility of using the screw holding forceps to hold the screws so that it doesn't get unsolid. So, and again, to put the screws, he has again two options: the this is ball and socket joint. Screwdriver and hexagonal screwdriver. So we will put this assembly liner. Then you can see it's okay. So we are done. Uh, Kalyan sir, if any. So, so uh, now you do the uh, unsimilar stem. Yes. You got the neck. So for that, we have neck section that so that I can show it. So this is a neck resection guide, uh, like uh, we can cut at the angle of 45 and there are different markings depending on surgeon preference, we can cut. So we'll mark along in the end. Oh, okay. So we'll do a marking. Okay. To hold the, uh, uh, yeah. To hold this assembly, uh, we have this femoral head extractor, which can be mounted with three handles and three handle or a drill, depending on a certain preference. So once a surgeon is done with this, then he can start preparing middle section of the bones. So we have two sizes here, the small and large. So depending on the surgeon preference, he can go for the same. So there are two osteotomes, large and the small. Can you go a little bit yes. closer to the... 
you have to go little bit closer yes sir what surgeon is done with this you can use the bone tamp and this is the bone tamp to create the shape in the cavity followed by trial rust so to hold the rust we have two kind of holders one is straight one and one is curved one if you talk about rust it is reverse cutting rust so it will compress and compact the bone so it, it is available in 11 sizes from 0 to 10 so this is the, the biggest size sir can you mention please to our dear this how yeah. can you uh, adjust the antiversion during uh, rasping uh, yes uh, th there is a handle you can attach so you, you can do it yeah. and, and, and there is a down cutting reverse the brooch is a down cutting reverse brooch which which will help you to compact the cancellous bone into the canal it will not take out so there's a difference. Yes, Vinay. Yeah. Sir, uh, uh, have I been able to answer your query? No, I'm just uh, mentioning it to our dear attendees, sir. Okay, okay. okay. So th there is a, there is a Tommy bird like thing which we can put it through the hole of the brooch. And, and you can control the antiversion of the femur. That bar is there, uh, Vinay? That, can you put it through the hole and uh, control the uh, hole of the brooches? So you can control it with this, sir. Is it the question you asked, sir? Yes, sir. I'm asking about the antiversion just to mention to our dear attendees. Can you make okay. it full screen, sir? Because the, the, uh, the picture is not uh, obvious on the full screen. Yes, yes. Please, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you me. so much, sir. Sir, it's still not, not obvious on the full screen. It's on the side. Rina, it is not still full screen. Can you... No, can, can you... Maximize, can you, Maximize the photo, please. No, so, so you have to increase it on both the side. 16 is to 9, you have to do it. It has to be 16 inch and then generally you need to be closer. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Your fingers are coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Again, no, no, no. It's not a full view now. It's not go full back, view. Go, go back to the previous view. Now little better but still not full screen okay come closer because professor and the delegates they are not being able to see it i think it's little better now but still not full screen okay we need to we don't have time so we need to do it quickly the view has to be 16 is to 9 then only it can be full screen So it is a two tap down and two one tap back. There is a uh, technique of doing the broaching. So we have three kind of uh, neck angles available. So depending on that, we have this style neck. So with this is one twenty five degree standard. It is color coded. This is one thirty five degree lateralized, and this is one thirty five degree standard. So we'll go with one thirty five degree standard. Accordingly, we have this uh, can bring camera over here. We have this hair size color coded like 40, 36, 30, 2, 28, and uh, 22. So you have plus 4, minus 4, plus 3.5, minus 3.5. 
So according uh, neutral options, plus so, seven, so, minus seven. So, so team, the question from the delegates and the faculties would be, uh, what, which size of cup you have used? Shell, which size? Uh, size 52. So if it is 52, how many, uh, what types of heads you can use? 28, 32, 36? Yes. So how many heads you can use? 40. 20, 28, 32, 36, 36 and 40. 46. And 40 as well? Okay, so four. Four sizes of yeah. um, heads you can use. Okay. Yes. So according to the surgeon preference, you can adjust the limb length plus 3.5 minus 3.5 plus 7 minus 7 and neutral. Sh and these are color Show how, uh, which yeah. are the implant, how to, um, after doing the trialing, uh, how, how to uh, put in the uh, original yeah. implant. I think you can see the depth. So this is the difference in between, you know, where you can adjust the leg length. And put it on the implant. Yes. The original implant implantation. Yes, yeah. So if you can see, we have put. No, we can't see. If minus three point five, it's. See, you can see it's totally going inside. Then we will use plus seven. Mm -hmm. Can you show the on the other neck trial? You can see the marginal difference in between both. Okay. No. Go, go to the stem stem implantation. We have understood this. Yes. So once you are done with this, then the surgeon also has the flexibility of rasping the calcar. Using the calcal plane, yeah? show it, show it. So, this is a calcar plane. The surgeon can use a power tool, a three hander, depending on the use of power tool. Plane out of the surface. We have chosen minus three point five and this is the assembly in a nutshell. Okay, we have been. Yeah. Can you show them how to put in the uh, original stem with the Tommy yes, bar yes. and other? Okay. Yeah. Over here. So uh, the question regarding you know putting the antiversion handle. So if you see there is a threading here in this uh, final implant holder. So you can use this antiversion handle. You can fix it up here. Then keep it inside and adjust antiversion according. Can you show Jerry? Yeah. Yeah. So this can be mounted on both the side. Yeah. And how we, how you are fixing the um, handle to the the yeah. implant uh, the dead new to show. Yeah. If Remove you see, there is again a threading. So this will go like this. Then you have to go around. Not being able to see it. Take it up. So it has fixed. This so this is how you can put it inside and rasping to be done until you can toggle the length. Okay, so now you show the cement stem preparation. Yeah. Uh, can you just remove this one? Remove this brooch and start with the IM initiator or everything, right? Remove. Yes. Yes. You need hold the yes, fine. Now it's good. Don't move. 
Oh, okay. Can... So in cement we have different kind of brooch called, that is called diamond cutting brooch. So here the agenda is different. Over uh, in uncemented, can you bring the brooch? Friend, can you bring the brooch? In uncemented, the, the agenda was to you know compress and compact the bone so that there is excellent biological fixation for and primary fixation. Here, like we have to, you know, create a space for cement mantle. So this is the diamond cutting process. So, so it will remove the bone. So we have like all together nine stems, nine and uh, nine uh, uh, trials for standard and uh, narrow step. So five sides in a uh, standard and four sides in narrow step. And accordingly the raspness. So we'll go with size zero. So we can again use the same uh, last candle. Can you give me the straight ones? Yeah, so no, but start with the IM initiator and okay, the reamer, okay. lo long reamer, then go to the approach. So use yeah. all the instruments uh -huh. you we have. So what are the starter reamers in case the surgeon wants to ream it first? So first and foremost is to get into the canal. So surgeon has this IM initiator yes. followed by this. The taper reamer, then he have this canal finder, then 6 mm reamer, 8 mm reamer, 10 mm reamer, and the last is 12 mm reamer. So the, he also have this taper reamer. So depending on his preferences, he can, uh, you know, create a space in the canal. Correct. Okay. So we will start with uh, just as a demo. We'll start with uh, you know from piriformis fossa. We'll create uh, the entry hole. Then we'll cut the neck and perform all the steps what we did for yeah. earlier. Then we'll start. Can you bring the reamers? Reamers. Reamers. Uh, show at okay. least one or two reamers. Yes. 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 And then show the brooches. So we'll start with the starter reamer, this is size 6 mm. So this will create a space followed by 8 mm. So the narrow reamers are for the narrow uh, femurs. Eight the mm. surgeon wants they can start the straight away go up to from 10. 10, 10 mm. And then 12 mm. Fine. So this, the last was 12 mm. So he, if he wants to taper the canal, he also have this taper reamer. So if you see, there is a tapering from pro going from proximal to distal. So he can use this to create tapering in that. So once he, he's done with this, then he can perform all the steps. Then he'll go for this. So the same brooch handle can be used for the cemented one also. Yes, and the diamond cutting over here, uh, as Vinay said, it also helps in the removal of the debris. Also makes it safe for the two mm cement that we have to be used over here because this is a so, cemented. I don't know if it's visible or not. When we have when we it removes. Can you just bring it over here? Yeah. Can you hold it? If we are going inside. Then if we are getting it out of the canal, you can see it is removing the debris. So two tapings. Get a pound. So if you, you I think is is this visible, sir? Yes. The debris. Yeah. So this is how the uh, uh, man. Uh, no, also, 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 uh, uh, also attach the Tommy bar to this and show how you can, uh, uh, how you are controlling the anti-version. This is the question uh, faculty asked, professor asked you. So when you are, 
broaching how you are controlling the activation yes that's what so with the help of this instrument along with the broach you can during the broaching you can control the activation yes so you have to hold it and do it like this yeah thank you correct now you do. remove it yes So now we will go to a bipolar. Sir, can we move to bipolar? Yes. No, but show them the implantation, so the original implantation for the cement. Yeah, Those instruments you need to show, right? You have done the rimming and broaching on. So once you have a cement restrictor, you can put it inside. This cement restrictor handle. Yes. And there are also markings accordingly. You can do go inside. Then, if you see the uncemented, the cemented, cemented assembly or cemented uh, stem handle is quite different. So you can move it medial lateral. See that can you just come out here and put the Tommy bar for. Yeah. You can go medial lateral, depending on your preferences. So we'll go here. Target it. And put the Tommy bar again for control of antiversion. Yeah. Again, we are going to use the antiversion over here. Yeah. Yeah. So as again there is a threading, you can use the tongue bars. And you can adjust the anti-version, like if you want to keep it more anti-verted, you can use this one. Okay, fine. Now show the bipolar. And uh, there is one more thing. Uh, can you bring the slap hammers a little bit? Yeah. Uh, if a surgeon wants, he can mount this slap hammer on this assembly. Can you hold it? To fix the canal inside. And also in case if he wants to remove. Fine. No need to put that in inside. Fine. Yeah. Show the bipolar assembly. You have only five minutes. Okay. So, like, uh, once a surgeon cut the neck off, bring the cut neck. Hey, 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 hey. So once the surgeon cut the head, so he, we ha he can go for sizing of the head for bipolar assembly. So we have these two kind of templates, small and large. So we'll go with the large one. So 50 is not, uh, so it, it is around 51. It's 51. So there is two ways to finalize it. One is using the template. Second, he can use the acetabular itself. He can use show this it. one. Show it with so the handle. handle. We'll go with 51. 51 for Yeah, it's 51. So this fits snugly. And if he wants to lower it, he can lower to 52. depending on his preference. So two ways to confirm the head. Okay. So once he's done with this, then we can take this bipolar compress. Can you bring the bipolar? So this is again, the trials are color coded. The brown ones uh, marry with 22 
head dia and gray ones marry with 28 head dia video video is not uh, the camera is not yeah so you can put the bipolar block here and the head here then you can fix the head here then you can go round and round and complex the bipolar head so can you put some light marker here so this how so it, you can go round and round until there is a, a so sound of air tuck and it will get locked and once it's locked that's not the worst problem so you move it around uh, till there is a click sound once the click sound is uh, there you hear yeah. the click sound that means the head has gone into the um, bipolar so like this yeah. so once there is click sound it will get li locked like this and it won't come out and then you put it into the into the uh, onto the stem Yes. Stem. Stem. Fine. Yes. Fine. I think that is the end, right, uh -huh. Vinay? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. And one more thing. One more thing. I like to add. Okay. Uh, what forbid it? Sometimes uh, there is a tendency that you uh, you you put a wrong a uh, wrong liner or wrong something. So mm -hmm. to remove that one, or if there is some crack or some damage, so this is a liner remover tool or a liner extractor. So there is one method removing it like like this. The second is by a drill. So you will put a drill on it, and then you can screw it. and remove it but once it is uh, removed you cannot use it again so you throw it yes. so that is for uh, in case the the wrong liner has been put in and if anybody wants to change it right okay thank you i think that's the end so respected yeah. faculties uh, professors and delegates that's the end of our presentation if there is any question we are ready to answer at the moment Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, very interesting scientific uh, workshop, and thank you for your participation in our uh, international webinar. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, it was a pleasure, sir. We are grateful so and much. honored to, and, to be here. And many here. thanks to all all Merrill Company team, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yusuf, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, uh, Dr. Walid, and thank you so much, sir, for uh, your participation. Thank you, sir. Thank Again, you very I would much. like to thank our dear Indian uh, colleagues for making a, a very a big uh, scientific participation with us. With mo was more than 19 speakers. It will be on the next Friday from all over India. Many thanks to all of them. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure to be here, and we are honored to be present in the. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank yeah. you, and hoping you, uh, all, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a good day and uh, great you, symposium ahead. Thank you, sir. And uh, till what? Now we come. We come to the official opening of uh, our uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Hisham, you are with us. Yeah, inshallah. Thank you, sir. Father Lipan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يعني احنا نتشرف النهارده بان احنا نكون في الويبينار الرائع ده باذن الله فور اول هيب هيب جوينت بروبلمز مع الساده الاساتذه الافاضل الكبار يعني بتشرفهم لينا ده بيرفع مستوى الويبينار كمان بنشكر كل المشاركين والمتواجدين معانا نشكر طبعا اللجنه المنظمه وعلى رايها وعلى راسها الاستاذ الدكتور جمال محمد جمال الاشهب عميد كليه الطب جامعه بنها على المجهود الرائع المتواصل اللي بيبذله تحت يعني مظله جمعيه جراحه العظام المصريه وكل اعضائها وطبعا على راسها 
السيد الاستاذ الدكتور احمد خليف استاذ جراحه العظام في طب القاهره الجمعيه بتسعد ب كل النشاطات العلميه المتوفره وسواء اونلاين او فيزيكال يعني دي كلها مجهود كبير جدا الجمعيه بتحب ان هي ده دور اساسي من للجمعيه ان هي تقوم به وان هي دايما تكون مشاركه ومتواجده في كل المحافل العلميه وجود الويبينار اونلاين ويبينارز دي سهل جدا جدا نقل العلم وانتشار العلم بكل تفاصيله لكل المستويات المجهود الكبير اللي بيبذل يعني لابد ان يقدر وبنشكر تاني الاستاذ الاشهب على هذا المجهود الرائع وبنشكركم على مشاركتكم معانا وبنرحب بيكم ويا رب نشوف حضراتكم دايما كده سواء اونلاين او فيزيكال في كل المؤتمرات العلميه أه بنشكر الأساتذة المحاضرين على اهتمامهم ومجهودهم ونسعد برؤيتكم دايما إن شاء الله شكرا جزيلا تفضل الدكتور جمال. Thank you so much professor هشام. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات. طبعا إنه من دواعي سروري إن أنا أكون موجود مع كوكبة من أساتذتنا الأفاضل من علماء مصر وعلماء العالم في الانترناشونال هيب ويبينار. احنا معانا حوالي 70 سبيكرز اكتر من 2000 اتنديز هنبدا ان شاء الله اول يوم النهارده مع الايجيبشن سبيكرز وهنبدا البلانري ليكتشر مع استاذي الحبيب بروفيسور جمال حسني وهو من هو طبعا دكتور جمال بيه غني عن التعريف دكتور جمال بيه هيتكلم على النون ارثروبلاستي سوليوشنز فور هيب ارثرايتس بليز دكتور جمال Thanks, Mohammed. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mohammed Lashab, Dean of uh, Banha University of Medicine, for the organization of this uh, great, great event. And um, I'm going to start with the non arthroplasty solutions. You know, with this webinar, we have. Uh, Many arthroplasty surgeons. I, I, I don't do arthroplasty. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. But if you talk about non-arthroplasty solution, it's actually swimming against the current. Yes? Because everybody else will talk about arthroplasty solutions. There is no doubt. Um, hip replacement is the commonly performed procedure and, and one of the most successful orthopedic procedures in clinical practice. And if you think about the epidemiology, it's going to be more. So from 2014 to 2030, we are the, 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 the number of cases will be uh, expected will be from 43 to 70% increase. But you have a corresponding increase of the revisions. So take care. If we talk about the young age, arthroplasty in the young age and the outcome, poorer outcome, you cannot compare arthroplasty in the young age with arthroplasty in the old age. And if you think about the literature, it's, it's very difficult to judge because in the young age, you can use many different or different types of cups, different types of stems, different patients. So usually the literature is not in favor of hip arthroplasty in the young patients. I mean, I'm going to give you an example. This is 38 years year old female. She's a hard worker. She has bilateral sublaxed hip and arthritis. But she has severe pain on the left side only. Only the left side. She has no pain on the right side. This patient, 26 years old female. She's a farmer. She wants to squat. And she had severe arthritis of the hip, severe pain. She also had a deformity. She has various internal rotation and shortening. You see the severe shortening and pelvic obliquity, of course. Again, 15 years old female with arthritis, pain, hip subluxation. She has many previous operations, five previous operations. Another example with the syndromes, this is the Gvain Melchior Clausen syndrome. And you have arthritis on both sides. And 
severe pain. Again, the patient is 23 years old. Again, 16 years old girl with severe pain on the left side. As you see here. 14 years old female with severe pain and arthritic left hip, also mild arthritis of the right hip. And also you have shortening, you have varus, you have internal rotation, you have a deformity. 15 years old boy with who the patient had safe surgical dislocation. This is funny to say safe on operation hookers. I don't want, because I see many problems with the safe operations. And you see here, avascular necrosis, osteoarthritis of the left hip, and pain. Again, this patient was diagnosed as Perthes disease, and this is at the age 14, developing mild osteoarthritis and extrusion of this fragment. So I showed you many cases. All these cases you can do. You can do hip arthroplasty in a 14 years old boy. It's okay, no problem. He's thin. It's an easy operation. Excellent surgical details. But about the outcome, if you do um, hip arthroplasty in a 14 years old boy, remember that primary total hip arthroplasty is a successful procedure. But revision is a salvage procedure. Yes, there's a big difference between primary hip arthroplasty and revision arthroplasty. And with time, you are going to face complications like infection, prolonged surgery time, blood loss. You see, this is 37 years old girl. You see, she had mild subluxation and mild pain. And she was treated with arthroplasty and dislocation and dislocation and dislocation. Three times dislocation. Again, hip arthroplasty in this young woman. You see this picture. Multiple revisions, infection. Again, 34 years old male. Again, arthroplasty, another arthroplasty. Dislocation, infection. We'll start with arthrodiasis. The term arthrodiasis is derived from the Greek word. Artho means joint, die through, and taxes to stretch out. And there are many indications like avascular necrosis, osteoarthritis, chondrolysis, neglected hip dislocation. And I will show an example. This is the first example of 38 years old female with severe pain on the left side. With this severe pain, usually we give the patient choice between arthroplasty and arthrosis. And we send him the arthroplasty surgeon. Or the patient was sent by the arthroplasty surgeon to tell him that there is another option. And we talk to the patient about the arthrodiastasis and we tell him we don't, we are not going to do any operative release. So if you fail, you can do arthroplasty. There is no harm. So in this case, we did arthrodiastasis, as you see. And this is the end picture after two years. The patient has no pain. Of course, this is not going to improve, but you know the radiological change is not getting worse and the patient has no pain after two years. Again, with this patient, 14 years old boy, as you see with this extrusion and also mild osteoarthritis, you see the patient looks benign at the beginning. And this is the follow-up. And this is after three years follow-up of the patient who was treated conservative for Perthes disease with this extrusion. And this is the CT with 3D to show you the extruded segment of the physics. Yeah. The extruded segment. No, we did arthrodiastasis, see? You see, there's, we usually do overdiastasis, as you see here. Eight millimeters or 10 millimeters above normal. You see, this is the normal. And this is after removal. You see the picture after removal. 
You see now, after removal, the way he runs. After three years and six months, look at the picture. He's a football player. You have to know this. See the walk, the way he walks, the way he runs. Squatting is very important in our culture. You see. This is that skeletal maturity. Of course, if we talk about the hip in adolescence, you cannot judge except if the patient reaches the skeletal maturity. So the patient now, after skeletal maturity, look to the uh, radiological picture. And you see the way he walks. He's a football player, remember? See the muscles. Again, squatting. See. Remember that this patient was offered arthroplasty five years ago. He came to me because everybody offered him hip arthroplasty. And they told him because of this extruded segment and pain, there was no other solution. So this is arthrodesis. Arthrodesis also can be a preliminary step in cases of osteotomies. Because if you have stiffness of the hip, sometimes you cannot do an osteotomy. I looked at this picture, 19 years old girl, and this severe arthritis. We did arthrodiastasis and also osteotomy, both at the same time. So you can do osteotomy and arthrodiastasis, like this picture. The principles of osteotomy, you can do reconstructive osteotomy or salvage osteotomy. You can do femoral osteotomy or, or pelvic osteotomy. The femoral osteotomy to correct the proximal femoral abnormalities and vice versa, like this patient. This patient, you see, was ununited fracture neck femur. 23 years old, male, and he started to develop arthritis. With the valgus osteotomy, with the vulgar osteotomy, we did medial displacement like this one to correct the mechanical axis. So we corrected the mechanical axis. You see the union. And again, he's a worker, and this is squatting position. Now we go to the pelvic support osteotomy. Pelvic support osteotomy is a very old operation. It's, it was described something like 200 years ago or something. It's not a new operation or something. It's not recent advances or the new concept or something. You know, um, branding of uh, the, uh, the uh, instruments, they always say new concept, new invention, recent advances. So to convince you that this is something new. No, but I'm talking about very old operation. Well, what Elizarov did, he just another did, another osteotomy distally to correct the mechanical axis and to correct the leg length inequality. You see, if you do an osteotomy here and abduction, you do tension of the abductors. So you improve the Trendelenburg gait. At the same time, this is an, a new weight-bearing point. So this we calculate from that point to that point, the mechanical axis. This angulation is very important because also cosmetically. In this case, especially with dislocated hip or subluxed hip, there is a lateral prominence, especially in the girls. So when you do the osteotomy and to correct this, you are going to improve the shape of the This combination of pelvic support and trochanteric liver action increases the effectiveness of the gluteal muscles enough to prevent the pelvis from rotating towards the side when unsupport, the opposite side when unsupport, while simultaneously pressing the proximal femur towards the pelvis. 
This is our experience. I will send you three papers at the end to show you if you, you want to read more about the pelvic support osteotomy. You see in this case, this is the first osteotomy and this is the second one. All the patients for pelvic support osteotomy had, had, had to be seen by an arthroplasty surgeon to discuss advantages and disadvantages of the arthroplasty in the young age. Why? You cannot compare the literature of pelvic support by the literature of hip arthroplasty. If you think about hip arthroplasty, you have thousands of patients everywhere. But if you talk about pelvic support, you have few patients. Even some people have uh, papers with six patients or eight patients done by eight surgeons for 10 years. So each surgeon is doing one patient every 10 years. And they talk about the experience. So, and this is the real problem. So we, for every, each patient, he has to see an arthroplasty surgeon and we show him the other patients having the same procedures and their follow-up. The level of support. We have high support and low support. Unfortunately, with these patients, with a small number of patients, the people talk about the uh, low support only, and they claim that the high support, they are going to have impingement. This is not true. No impinge impingement. I didn't see impingement. And in the paper, there was no impingement. It was hypothetical fear. So this is high support, and this is low support. And this is high support. This patient with high support, you see this patient. And this is after 25 years follow-up. You see, she's squatting normally. She's doing abduction. No, no hinged abduction or something. Again, this patient with severe osteoarthritis, 26 years old, female. We have various, we have internal rotation. And we did pelvic support osteotomy. Again. This is low support, now the cuticotum. And this is the way she walks after having children. This is the so-called safe surgical dislocation. And again, if you say safe surgical, this is one way of the branding. If you want to do branding, you have to use these words, safe, superior, recent advances, concept. You have to start the marketing before going through the science to differentiate between the science and marketing. You see, we have osteoarthritis, evascular necrosis, shortening, adduction, and we did pelvic support to start. You see, lengthening. And this is in the end. And this picture, we are not dogmatic. So in this patient, I did pelvic support osteotomy 21 years ago. I've showed you the picture at the age 14. And the other side, after 14 years, the patient came to me and with pain on the other side. And as usual, the patient went to the arthroplast surgeon and we offered them pelvic support in spite of the success of the first operation, the patient herself chose the arthroplasty. So this picture, as you see, this patient with the first operation, we did pelvic support, but after 14 years of the pelvic support, she chose the arthroplasty. And you see here, this is before, You see, this is in the frame, the lengthening, and this is the correction of the mechanical axis. We start from here. This is the new weight-bearing point. We excluded this from weight-bearing, and this is the philosophy. So this is not part, that's why we, there was no pain afterwards. And you see, four years after the first operation, See the way she walks after the first operation. 
Then she had severe pain on the right side and did the pelvic support, did arthroplasty on the right side. At that age 14, the family decided for the patient. But after 14 years old, she decided to have arthroplasty. Because this is the difference between the family decision and hard decision. You see here. An abduction, you see the abduction on both sides. You have to compare the abduction on both sides. When she sent us this picture, she had two children now. Okay, she's carrying the child, wearing high heels. Okay, she sent us her videos. She walks from behind. In conclusion, the early and midterm results of a lazar of modification of pelvic support osteotomy are encouraging. Pain relief or improvement is expected. However, the possibility of deterioration of time, unpredictability of improvement of Trendelenburg gate should not be excluded. You have to remember that. Some people think we do pelvic support osteotomy to postpone hip arthroplasty. This is not true. None of the patients required arthroplasty during the fall. Some patients required another pelvic support. When you do pelvic support on the young age, 10, 9 years old, with remodeling, perhaps you need another support. But none of the patients required arthroplasty. We don't do it to postpone the need for arthroplasty. But arthrodiastasis, you can do it to postpone the need for arthroplasty. In some parts of the world where the population is very young, you know that we have very young population in our area, in India too. One third of the population is young, children. Also in India, it's the same. In other countries with this huge population, children population, there must be another solution rather than just hip arthroplasty. You cannot do hip arthroplasty for this young, huge number of young population. Finally, arthroplasty versus non-arthroplasty solutions. The non-arthroplasty solutions can be considered as a valid option for hip arthritis in the young age. However, this option has to be, other options has to be offered to the patients and their families. These are my publications. If you are interested to read about an arthroplasty solution, this is about pelvic support osteotomy. These three publications, if you are interested, one of them in the bone and joint and one in the trauma, or Journal of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Also, there are th four papers about hip arthrodiastasis, if you are interested. Finally, we have two solutions, the turtle and the rabbit, but I prefer the turtle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gemel, for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we have five minutes. We can allow questions before we move to the uh, next speaker. Uh, I have two questions for you, Professor Gemel, please. Yes, ma'am. First question, uh, the fantastic case you have mentioned, sir. You have uh, presented uh, the uh, perthes with uh, arthrodiastasis and you present the, the uh, X-ray after full maturation. I think this uh, patient has some form of uh, femoral stabular impingement. I'm yes. right, sir. This is true. Yeah. That's why He's he not was complaining offered, of it, sir. Yes. The problem was uh, the, the the impingement, and you see, it's it looks like you know the edge of the acetabulum is in the middle or is in the head, and there is big extruded fragment, maybe thirty or forty percent of the acetabulum, and it was perhaps. Uh, uh, good indication for arthroplasty. And he was offered arthroplasty because they told him, even if we removed this segment, perhaps you are not going to 
in Brugge's course, it's a huge segment. It's not a small segment. Yes, sir. And the other option was arthroplasty. And naturally, when he came to me, we told him, if we fail, go and do arthroplasty. Yeah. Because we, we didn't do any operative procedure. This is 100% closed procedures. So we told them, and we told the family. We, don't, we didn't promise them ever anything. We just told them what I can promise, that they are going to have some sort of um, improvement of the movement. Or we can postpone the need for arthroplasty. But, you know, it worked out that way. Yes, sir. The second question, sir, if I uh, do pelvic support osteotomy and uh, I'm in need after it to total hip uh, arthroplasty, uh, the, the standard ordinary total hip will be feasible or have to have a custom made one? Uh, you know, I, uh, fortunately enough, I don't do arthroplasty, hip arthroplasty, so <laughs> I, I didn't face this problem before. Yes, sir. <laughs> The only, uh, I, I've seen somebody from Switzerland and he told me he did two cases after pelvic support and there was no problem. Yes. He corrected the deformity and he did it. But in my patients, none of the patients needed hip arthroplasty because we do pelvic support as a final operation, not because we do need an arthroplasty. Yes. Even, I didn't show it in, in, uh, in, in the presentation, um, in some cases, you have, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have to remove part of the head because, you know, after this place of a femoris or a vascular necrosis, you have some part of the head which is, you know, touching the astablum and doing fracture. We, uh, we remove this part. And again, we don't do arthroplasty because we, can, we, we had another point of contact, not this area. It's medial. You have another point of contact. Yes, sir. Professor, but if I have a case, I will send it to you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa have a question, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For how long do you keep the, the Elizaro frame for those patients? And when you decide to remove the, the frame, if there is like a time frame or you, uh, there you depend on some radiological uh, signs or something like that? Thank you, sir. There is no time frame. Each case uh, has its own merit. What does it mean? Uh, in one of the cases, if you look to the support area, I have to do, I have to displace the media, the, the, the shaft medially, um, you know, more than 50%. And this patient will need more for union. Another patient, it's not uh, included here, we have to do 14 centimeter lengthening. So if you do 14 centimeter lengthening, the patient has to stay in the frame for 14 months. Because, you know, each, each centimeter needs about one month in the frame. So each, each patient has, uh, uh, the patient has his own merit. And there's no time frame because for each case, you have to, uh, to, uh, to, to keep the patient in the frame according to the situation. Take care that if you have lengthening, uh, we have cases, it's not written in the literature, we have cases of fracture, refracture of the osteotomy site or the pelvic support site. So now before removal of the frame, we, the final stage, we remove the roads, all of the roads in the upper part and the lower part. And for 10 days, we ask the patient to walk without the roads. And in, in the morning, then before going to sleep, he put the roads himself. So of this part, it looks radiologically okay. But if there is a, a fissure occurred, we tighten, we put the rods again, and we keep the patient for one month, then we remove it again. So this is a final exam. We call it the clinical test for the osteotomy site and the lengthening site. Yes, sir. Uh, we can allow just one question uh, to before we go to the next speaker, sir. We have a question to you, sir, from uh, Dr. Mohammed Osman. He is asking how what line how would we line the mechanical axis in deformed head to plan for pelvic support osteotomy and what's the specific program for knee to avoid stiffness after pelvic support osteotomy, sir? Very good questions. A difficult question depends upon what are you going to do. Are you going to do a high support or low support? High support, you are going to use the acetabulum as a support area. Low support, you are going to 
be sub-establer at the iscal tuberosity. So in each situation, you have a new element of support. When you think about the mechanical axis, think about the upper femur. The upper femur now is the point up there which has to coincide with the center of the knee, regardless of what's going on in between, because you have to do various of the lower femur. Usually when you do support, pelvic support, at the end of the operation, you're going to have vulgus deformity, which was usually, you know, it's it's an old operation. The old operation was in DDH, neglected DDH, you do vulgus osteotomy, and the patient looks, walks with a waddling gait. What Elizarov did is just another osteotomy distally to correct the mechanics because you do various osteotomy. You don't do it at the first of the operation. No, at the first, uh, uh, during the operative uh, operation, you do the valgus osteotomy. During the lengthening, you correct the mechanical axis. Yes. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Amara is asking, sir, what's the appropriate time for follow-up of arthrodiastasis and when we remove and can we use it in AVN in young adults with sickle cell disease? Yes, we did it, but it was not um, uh, the, the topic of the, this lecture because you gave me the arthritis. But it's it's uh, if we talk about vascular necrosis, whether in sickle cell disease or in other indications, like cases where the you know uh, patient with a fracture femur and adolescent he had a nail femur, and after nail femur he had a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. All these cases you can use arthrodiastasis. And usually we use them for about four months. Four months is usually is a, a, a enough time for remodeling. Of it. After removal or arthrodiastasis, you have to keep the patient, you know, with partial with bearing for two months with hydrotherapy again. So don't do full with bearing because four months is not enough for the full remodeling. So you can use it, Mohammed. Yes, sir. We have uh, last two questions, sir, from uh, Dr. Sefi Dean. He's asking if there is if there are any limitations in the hip range of motion after pelvic support osteotomy. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. That means we start with a patient with limited with limitation, and we increase the range of motion. Most of the cases they have abduction problem, which is very difficult, especially in the you know the young girls when you want to marry or something like this, even. I showed you a case with osteoarthritis and internal rotation, severe virus. There was a hygiene problem. She cannot wash after the, you know. So it's the opposite. We always expect to have better range of motion after pelvic support, especially in abduction. Yes, sir. The last question, sir. Can we do it using internal fixation? Yes, it is, uh, not, uh, some people use internal fixation. But remember... It, you, of course, you can use internal fixation. No problem. Of course, you can use it. But um, uh, in my in, in in my experience, you know, after I do perhaps about been between fifteen and twenty cases per per year, the problem uh, was my cases because they stay in the frame for such a long lo time. I'm afraid that if you use the half pins or something, you can have pin track infection, which is potentially infected. This is one thing. Second thing, if you do your support, you do valgus osteotomy and you do your planning, you did support, you did valgus for 40 degrees, okay? After the operation, you test, this is not enough. If you use the external fixator, I can increase the valgus gradually. And this is the real merit of the external fixation. I can change my mind after two months, after three months. Second thing, if I have delayed union of the osteotomy site, I can do compression using the external fixator. If I do uh, uh, internal fixation, I cannot change my mind. I cannot do anything else. And this is the real merit of the external fixation. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Gemel, for uh, your time and for uh, your sharing your experience with our dear attendees. And thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Mohammed. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, sir. Now we come to uh, the uh, head trauma session. It, which is a very interesting session for uh, all of us. Our first speaker will be our elegant professor, Professor Osama Farouk, Asyut University. Professor Osama will speak about predictive and prognostic factors of outcome after acetabular fractures. Thank you so much, Professor Osama, for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed Al-Ashab, for inviting me to join you in this 
international hip webinar. I really enjoyed the lecture of or the presentation of Professor Gamal Hosni. It included amazing cases and all of us learned a lot from him. Now we move to the acetabular fractures and the predictive and prognostic factors of outcome after treating acetabular fractures. I would like to thank Professor Mohammed Al Ashab for organizing such important webinars. We had in the past the International Trauma Webinar. We have today and on next Friday the International Hip Webinar. These webinars include not only amazing, interesting content like the presentation of Professor Gamal Hosni, but also it coordinates between different orthopedic national and international societies. Thank you, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab. Thank you so much, sir. Now we raise the questions of this presentation. Can we predict the outcome in acetabular fractures? What are the outcome predictors? How do outcome predictors affect our decision making? Thanks to Letournel and Jude, they emphasized the importance of anatomical reduction of acetabular fracture, especially restoration of the roof of the acetabulum or the dome of the acetabulum, the weight bearing area of the acetabulum and they considered it one single factor appears paramount or very important to get good results in acetabular fracture. So we put in our basket the quality of reduction of the fracture as the first prognostic or predictor of outcome when we treat acetabular fracture. Do we have evidence to support this? Yes, we have hundreds of articles highlighting the importance of quality of production as the most important predictive factor of outcome. This is one of these articles that highlights the quality of production of fracture is the most important variable in forecasting the outcome for patients with acetabular fracture. Again, we raise the question, is it the single predictor of outcome? Let us go through the literature to see what are other predictives and other prognostic factors of outcome. This is a very important article published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, and they report the outcome of acetabular fracture fixation with 10 years follow-up. And the poor prognostic factors were increasing age, delay to surgery, the quality of reduction, and some fracture patterns. So we put in our basket the increasing age, the delay to surgery, and some fracture patterns. And we will go again through the literature to see such fracture patterns and such radiological criteria. We go to this article of Professor Ramesh Zinn and his working group. They reviewed 118 patients treated surgically for displaced acetabular fracture. And they came to the, to the conclusion that the four prognostic factors were quality of production again, presence of associated other musculoskeletal injuries, initial fracture displacement of more than 20 millimeter, hip joint dislocation, and again delay in surgery more than two weeks. So we add to our basket of predictors, the fracture displacement, hip joint dislocation, associated musculoskeletal injuries. So we have now many 
predictives of outcome. What about time to surgery? It was repeated in many articles. We go to this meta-analysis by Professor Peter Giannodis and his working group. And they came to the conclusion that the time factor is very important in managing such establar fractures. And they re recommended early patient transfer to tertiary care levels specialize in establar fracture and not to delay the patient in transfer in order to get better quality of reduction of the fracture and improved outcome. Again, we have this very nice article raising the question about achieving anatomic establar fracture reduction, which is the goal of treatment in establar fracture. When is the best time to operate? And we came again to the conclusion that the interval from injury to operative fixation of establar fractures will affect reduction quality and hence it will affect the final outcome of such patient. And we recommend performing open reduction and internal fixation as early as possible when the patient is optimized for surgery. So we have some recommendations about establar fractures. For complex associated fractures, we need to fix them in the first five days after trauma. For more or for simpler fractures, we can adequately manage them up to two weeks after injury, not more. And the outcome of all reconstructions beyond the three weeks will be significantly affected because the quality of reduction will be affected with time. What about fracture type and the outcome? We have this article again telling us about the outcome 10 years after treating a stabler fractures. And they showed that simple posterior column fractures and T-shaped fractures had a statistically significant negative impact on outcome. Combined posterior wall dislocation, combined posterior wall traumatic dislocation and sciatic nerve palsy also report bad outcome. So we have the T-shaped fractures, combined with a fracture of the posterior wall to represent the worst case scenario. So fracture types will affect the outcome as well. We have this article about the clinical and radiological predictors of outcome in establar fracture and concomitant posterior dislocation of the hip. And they came to the conclusion that factors significantly associated with the radiological score were the quality of reduction of the fracture, the time to relocation of the dislocation, and the damage to the femoral head. So we have other factors to be considered. Time to relocation of the hip dislocation and also associated femoral head lesions. This is a CT scan showing the associated femoral, femoral head injury with fracture dislocation of the hip with posterior wall trauma. So we have other radiological factors that should be considered, not only the femoral head injury, but also the acetabular impaction, the retained acetabular fragments inside the hip joint, and the number of incarcerated fragments. So we add again to our basket, the radiological criteria and on top comes damage to the femoral head or femoral head injury. Here we have again this nice article, a 30 year perspective on posterior wall fractures of the acetabulum. And they stated that the factors that are associated with 
unsatisfactory clinical results include greater delay 12 hour in the time to reduction of an associated hip dislocation. This confirms the previous study. And age, more than 50 years old. The presence of intra-articular comminution, three or more separate fragments. The presence of marginal impaction. And lastly, the accuracy of surgical reduction as assist on the post-op CT scan. In this article published by Professor Hans Christoph Pape and his working group about the predictors of poor outcome after both column establar fracture, a 30-year retrospective cohort study, they included 115 patients and they came to the conclusion that anatomic reduction was associated with the best clinical outcome. Initial displacement more than 10 millimeter and intra-articular fragments in both column fractures were associated with worse outcome. So we have another issue, the traumatic damage to the articular cartilage. This may be reflected in the plain X-ray and CT scan as, as articular impactions, but we usually cannot assess how much of the articular cartilage have been damaged during trauma. So the presence of subchondral impaction, fracture comminution, intra-articular fracture fragments may reflect the magnitude of damage to the articular cartilage and hence the bad outcome. This is a study published in the Journal of Orthopedic Research trying to quantitatively measure the damage to subchondral bone and reflecting it on the initial damage of the articular cartilage. So we put in our basket of predictors, the articular comminution, intra-articular fragments, articular impactions, and all reflect the magnitude of cartilage damage. <coughs> Do we have other predictors of outcome? Yes. High energy trauma. High energy trauma will affect all these factors previously mentioned, the presence of complications such as infection, sciatic nerve injury, heterotopic ossification, AVN, post-traumatic arthritis, all are associated with bad outcome. What about the surgeon's experience? Surgeon's experience affects assessment of the case, decision-making, quality of production, and the intraoperative techniques that will enable the surgeon to achieve the anatomic reduction or the best possible reduction. So the gold standard treatment for displaced establar fractures remain or if performed in dedicated units by surgical teams specialized in such surgeries as soon as possible to achieve the best quality of reduction that will affect the final outcome. What about fragility fracture in older patients? We, we, we put in our basket the increasing age. Why? Fractures of the establishment in patients 60 years or older will have a special pattern, special radiological criteria. Such a criteria includes as well bad predictives of outcome, such as the roof impaction, femoral head lesions, comminution, marginal impaction in posterior wall fractures, 
and we usually have displacement of the anterior column separate quadrilateral component and central hip dislocation and the treatment is really challenging to the orthopedic surgeon and we always have a decision making dilemma whether to go with RF or total hip replacement. These radiological criteria are examples of fracture establum in older patients. We have here the separated anterior column or the anterior wall fracture, associated roof impaction and femoral head injury as well. We can see them as well in the CT scan. However, we still have the same criteria and the same predictives of outcome in older patients. The quality of reduction of fracture when we are going to fix such fractures. It is the most predictive of good prognosis in such group of patients. So we have in our basket many of the predictors of outcome in acetabular fracture, starting on top the quality of reduction of the fracture and reaching to the surgeon's experience, which is, is still related to the quality of reduction. Our take-home message, quality of fracture reduction remains the most important outcome predictor in surgical management of acetabular fractures. We have other factors that come to define the uh, prognosis and the outcome on top fracture type, age of the patient, associated femoral head injuries, articular impactions, magnitude of cartilage damage, other related factors, maybe surgeon-related or patient-related. Injury and patient factors include the patient's age, mechanism of injury, especially high-velocity injuries in young patients, damage to the femoral head, hip dislocation, fracture pattern, sciatic nerve, palsy, comorbidities associated other musculoskeletal injuries. Surgeons related factors include timing of surgery, surgical selection, quality of reduction with restoration of articular congruity and adequate fixation. Level one trauma centers with dedicated pelvic specialized trauma team affords the safest atmosphere for management of such establar fractures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for this very interesting talk about a very important topic. Unfortunately, sir, both uh, eminent professors you have mentioned in your talk, Professor uh, Ramish Sen from uh, India and Professor, Professor Peter Giannoudis from uh, Leeds, uh, UK, will be guest speakers with us next Friday, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Abdesalam Eid, Professor Abdesalam Eid, Professor of uh, Orthopedic Surgery, Zagazig University, and uh, the uh, former uh, Dean of Zagazig Faculty of Medicine, and one of the eminent stars of arthroplasty surgery in Egypt, and also shoulder uh, surgeon, one of the, uh, the, the best shoulder surgeons all over the world. Professor uh, Abdesalam, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, sir, for the invitation. It's a great honor to be with this distinguished panel. Uh, I will try now to share my uh, screen, and I hope you uh, uh, notify me when you uh, find that I can share my screen. So, Professor Absalam will speak about femoral neck fractures. What uh, are they peculiar? Yes, sir. So you can see. You can yes, see sir. my screen now? I can see it, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, in this lecture, we are going to discuss the significance of femoral neck fractures, the classification of femoral neck fractures, internal fixation regarding timing and method of fixation, and arthroplasty for femoral neck fractures. As uh, we know, it, uh, the incidence is about 250,000 head fractures per year, but of course, these are not our Egyptian instances, these are international or maybe United States uh, numbers, 
costs exceed $8 billion per annum also maybe in the United States. With increasing life expectancy and increasing number of hip fractures, this is expected to double by the year 2050. They occur predominantly as low energy trauma in the elderly. Approximately 90% of hip fractures in this population result from a simple fall. In 1950, prediction found the third unsolved fracture that has been similar And up till this moment, we can say it is still an unsolved fracture. So, what makes femoral leg fractures more peculiar and unpredictable than other injuries? The two most feared complications of femoral leg fractures, these are non-union and uh, avian. Gun Union has a reported instance of 10 to 34%, and fracture displacement is associated with higher instance of Gun Union, although it has also been reported in undisplaced fractures. Even uh, long term studies showed that even rates range from 30 to 40% in displaced fractures. With early reduction and stable internal fixation within six hours after the fracture, AVN rates become as low as 11%. And we are going to come back to this figure six hours in a while. However, even in undisplaced fractures, a rate of aesthetic femoral head necrosis of 11 to 20% can be expected. So, all in all, we can say that there is a one in three chance of a femoral neck fracture going into AVN or non union the choice of treatment for an intracapsular fracture can only be made on an individual patient basis. Factors which influence these decisions are the facilities available, surgical expertise, the degree of displacement of the fracture, and the delay from fracture to surgery, and of course, the age of the patient. As regards fracture displacement, we are well aware of the guarding classification, and guarding classified uh, four types. Garden 1, which is infected in vulgus. Garden 2, undisplaced but not infected. Garden 3, displaced in virus. Garden 4, completely displaced with proximal uh, migration of the femoral shaft. And to simplify, because there is some inter- and inter-observer uh, uh, unreliability, we simplified it by mentioning that Garden 1 and 2 are undisplaced Garden 3 and 4 are displaced fractures. So, uh, on the top left, we see a garden type 1. On the top right, we see a garden type 2. On the bottom left, garden type 3. And on the bottom right, we see a garden type 4 fractures. There is little dispute, dispute among orthopedic surgeons. That means there is almost no dispute among orthopedic surgeons that undisplaced femoral neck fractures at any age should be fixed. Even if a patient is elderly and an undisplaced fracture, you should give him or her a trial of internal fixation. What about displaced fractures? Then comes the important uh, issue of the age of the patient. If the patients are younger than 60 or 65, then this age, 60 or 65, marks the beginning of uh, the uh, elderly uh, stage in uh, uh, human life because it is the age of retirement and it ranges from 60 to 65 according to where you live and therefore it has been coined as the beginning of the elderly or uh, age. So in patients younger than 60 or 65, preservation of the femoral head is paramount and by paramount this is not the movie company paramount we mean it's a very important issue. In older patients with unstable displaced fractures, arthroplasty may provide an adequate solution. So we go to discuss the internal fixation. What about the timing of surgery? Uh, the issue of six hours is uh, has been mentioned in some uh, uh, research, but it's uh, not uh, quite practical, especially in our country, where the patient may come delayed for a variety of reasons. And therefore, uh, 
the logical issue is to consider that the delay of treatment more than 48 hours is associated with a progressive increase in the risk of hearing complications. Therefore, we should all strive that the patient uh, should be operated before 48 hours. What about after three weeks? This is called a neglected fracture and it has its uh, own uh, type of management, including osteotomies and etc. What about between 48 hours and uh, uh, less than three weeks? We call it a delayed fracture and it also may merit special consideration. So we are still discussing uh, the internal fixation and we have uh, discussed uh, whether it's displaced or undisplaced and we have discussed the issue of timing. Now we come to the issue of fracture orientation. It has been proven that the fractures with higher power egg are more prone to displacing the living problems as a result of high shear forces that they are subject to. So what about fracture orientation? Uh, in the uh, shown example, this is uh, a paper uh, which shows type 1 to be 30 degrees, type 2 to be 50 degrees, or type 3 to be 70 degrees. Actually, this is a wrong conception because the original description was by uh, a German surgeon, uh, Pauls, and it was in German, and when it was translated, the English translators took an example that he mentioned and uh, made it into uh, the rule. Actually, type 1 is below 30, type 2 is between 30 and 50, and type 3 is over 50. So, a 55 degree uh, Powell's angle is a type 3, not a type 2. Another important issue is uh, how do we make the angle? We make the angle uh, with the uh, it differs with the limb position. If the limb is abducted or adducted, this affects the, uh, sorry, if the limb is abducted, the limb is abducted or abducted, this will affect the orientation of the fracture line and therefore uh, its relation with the horizon. Therefore, we have uh, learned that we should make, uh, excuse me, we have learned that we should uh, Take a perpendicular on the axis of the shaft, and we do not compare with the horizon. We compare with the perpendicular of the axis of the shaft, and this is a constant. And when you compare the fracture line with the perpendicular to the axis of the shaft, you get a, a good impression of the Powell's angle. Of course, the Powell's angle uh, is better measured in the operative theater after the patient has been uh, put in on the traction table under an easy because uh, a traction view will make it more clear. This is the original uh, Powell's classification, as I mentioned, under 30 type 1, 30 to 50 type 2, and more, more than uh, 50 type 3. So if uh, we place a higher Powell's angle traction, if you fix it with the calibrated screws, the shear forces are high and this will end high failure. Therefore, if it's a Powell's 1 or 2, we should or we may use canvas screws. If it's Powell's 3, we need to use angle stable implants such as TGS. Sometimes, as I said, decision making is only possible after traction. If we use canvas screws, we use, usually put three screws in an inverted triangle fashion. And as you see on the top left, uh, on the top left image, there is a, a blade. And we will come to this in a while. Alternatively, in higher power angle, we will use a DHS. So, what are the predictors of early failure of fixation? of the subcapital fractures. The two most important predictors are virus reduction and difficulty in achieving reduction. If the patient has uh, virus reduction or uh, the surgeon has had difficulty in reduction, uh, the fracture is 5.3 times more likely to fail. If there is a combination of virus reduction and difficulty reduction, fixation has more than uh, 13.6 three, times more likely to fail. 
So therefore, under this scenario, maybe 75% of taxations will do. So how do we do reduction? First, it's important to know that no internal taxation device, whatever it is, and how, however expensive it is, and compensate for malreduction. Therefore, during the reduction maneuver, sudden post movements should be avoided because they may injure the already precarious blood supply of criminal health. And according to Garden, the reduction maneuver must be successful during the first time. As you see, we are very gentle as orthopedic surgeons and we do our reductions gently. There are two reductions techniques, the Whitman technique and the Ledbetter technique. And I'll start with the Ledbetter technique, where we flex the knee and hip to 90 degrees, then we apply longitudinal traction in the vertical direction, and then internal rotation and then extension abduction. This is quite a difficult maneuver. It's called uh, reduction in flexion. Alternatively, a simpler and more uh, usually successful maneuver is the Whitman technique, which is called also reduction extension, where we apply traction and internal rotation. After we reduce, we must be sure that the reduction has been successful, and therefore we uh, go to the garden alignment index. So the garden alignment index it describes the angle between the midline of the clavicle of the femoral head and the longitudinal axis of the femoral shaft. An angle in the AP view between 160 and 180 is, uh, uh, represents an anatomic reduction. Um, uh, AP 160 and uh, lateral view 180. Slight bulbous position in the AP view up to 180 degrees is uh, acceptable, whereas the virus position is unacceptable. Also, in the lateral view, uh, the angle may be down to 160 degrees. Therefore, to simplify matters, we need an angle between 160 uh, to 180 in both AP and lateral view. So, back to the issue of the knife blade that we saw before, capsulotomy. These are controversial issues and practice uh, varies according to uh, the surgeon, to the region and the country. Uh, there are uh, studies that suggest it's beneficial, but clinical studies uh, uh, have shown that decompressing the intercapsular hematoma uh, reduces the intercapsular pressure. However, most of these studies have been small series, single institution, and Therefore, about capsulotomy, it's according to your preference and your training. Then, back to the issue of timing. What about neglected and ununited fractures? Numerous procedures have been developed to aid the fracture healing process, including femoral, uh, proximal femoral realignment, osteotomy, and uh, bone graft, such as medical quadratus femoris uh, bone graft. This is an article that I published in. 2010, about uh, bulbous osteotomy in the late presentation of ephemeral neck fractures, how it's been seen. This is the reposition of osteotomy. We use a DHS, not an angle plate. We take a wedge 30 degrees, we close the wedge, and we displace the shaft laterally. This converts the uh, shear forces into compression forces and aids human. So, back again to the issue of the age of the patient. If we are above 60, we have early elderly and late elderly. In the elderly, patients over 60, which is the ideal uh, treatment, the total hip replacement is the treatment of choice for patients older than 60. Why is that? Because total hip replacement has the lowest chance of revision and surgery, even though the best chances of the best results of uh, replacement is not uh, equal to the best uh, results of uh, fixation, but still, hip replacement and more specifically, total hip replacement has the lower chances of revision. Therefore, the patient can get and the surgeon can get his uh, peace of mind. What about late elderly patients? Uh, there is no consensus about unipolar or bipolar. Unipolar is best suited for patients who are household ability or low demands, bipolar are for those who are community and relatives like people who are 
jobs at the train the most school get some uh, things in the process, etc. Revision to total hip hop to parts of plus may be required because of the generation of stabilum or for component reason. And of course, if patients have an existing rheumatoid osteoarthritis, then total hip hop is uh, a choice. So now to the algorithm. What should we do? First, we look to the degree of displacement. If it's undisplaced, look at the fracture orientation. Fracture orientation powers one, two, look at related screws. Fracture orientation power three, do the adjust. So back to the degree of displacement. What if it is displaced? If the patient is below 60, when did he arrive? If he arrived early, go to the first column. Fracture orientation, pause on two, can lead to pause three digits. If the patient is delayed or neglected, you should add an osteotomy or a bone pit. What if a patient is above 60, you go to arthroplasty? Of course, in displaced fractures above 60, you go to arthroplasty. In the early elderly, you do a total hip. And, the, and of course, if there is also arthritis or rheumatoid, in the late elderly, community ambulator, bipolar, household ambulator, Uniform. Take home message. If it's undisplaced, this merits fixation. If it's displaced before fixity, fixation, foul zone two, can related, foul three digits, elder, early elderly, late elderly, community ambulator and household ambulator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear Professor Absalam Eid, for this very important talk about a very important subject. Uh, and because of the importance of this uh, topic, we will have many talks about uh, such a uh, topic. Uh, we can allow just one question, sir, and we have one question from uh, Dr. Uh, Walid de Goma. Uh, is it 6, 12, 24, or 48 hours the golden time limit uh, behind which I cannot blame myself for delay if the case is fit for surgery from the start? Well, as I mentioned, the logical and practical uh, number here is 48 hours. Uh, if you can operate well before 48 hours, good for you and good for the patient. But be aware that most of these patients are elderly. We are not here talking about the young and fit patients. But even the young and fit patients may, uh, with neck fractures, they usually come with high energy and they also may deserve specific uh, preparation. Therefore, you should prepare the patient well. You should operate before 48 hours. Uh, if you wait beyond 48 hours, your chances of complications are bigger. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Absalam, for uh, your uh, presentation and for your interesting uh, talk. Now we will move to the next speaker. The next speaker will be uh, Professor Mohammed Shafi, uh, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Vice Dean of Elmenia uh, University. Uh, professor Mohammed will speak about have fractures in elderly, the gray zone to fix or replace, which is a very important topic. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you. First of all, I uh, thank uh, the Egyptian Orthopedic Association for uh, inviting me for this talk. I congratulate uh, Professor Mohamed Ashab for this enormous effort uh, and uh, making the best use of uh, Corona uh, era uh, or uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, media teaching and webinars uh, to stay and last that benefit us all to learn from each other's experience and uh, thoughts. Uh, I welcome all uh, my colleagues or critics from everywhere. And I would like to talk about uh, hip fractures in special population, the 80s plus, and a special group of fracture, which is not the intracapsular fracture just covered, and in this uh, age group should be uh, treated by arthroplasty straightforward, uh, and not the extra capsular which should be fixed. I'm talking about the gray zone in between. <clears throat> what would you do for this fracture in an 80 year old lady? Do you fix or replace? And what about this one? 
and this one. Another example, your thoughts about whether you fix this or replace. To refresh our understanding of uh, hip fractures, the, uh, in the trochanteric fracture, the fracture almost always start from here, just in front of the uh, trochanter, and spirals up to the summit of the greater trochanter, and then it changes direction, which is a crucial uh, 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 point. And the first fracture line is in the axial view or in the axial plane. The second the fracture line is in the coronal plane. It fractures the greater trochanter or ends at the lesser trochanter or with a subtrochanter extension. And this, if this is a big part, then the greater trochanter is split from the lesser trochanter, the crucial posteromedial support. So, again, this is the primary fracture line. Start from in front of the lesser trochanter spiral to the summit. And another plane is a coronal plane, splitting the greater trochanter with or without the uh, lesser trochanter. So the fracture line, the primary fracture line, and you may notice that in elderly population, the fracture may behave slightly different. The fracture is more vertical. It starts extra capsular, but it ends up at the uh, uh, away from the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter remains seemingly intact, like in this, like in this case. <clears throat> or sometimes it behaves differently again and it mo moves more uh, transversely so the greater trochanter remains intact with the proximal parts so another case with the transverse intertrochanteric fracture, hip fracture, characteristic of the elderly population, uh, and the greater trochanter seems intact. So when to fix? When to fix? You cannot win uh, fixation with market instability and uh, poor bone quality. So what is instability? Classically, in the trochanteric fractures, we talk about the postromedial corner deficiency, the long subtrochanteric extension, the reverse trochanteric, and the deficient lateral wall. But in actually, in this elderly group of patients, you notice that the marked instability is related to vertical displacement, marked vertical displacement at the initial displacement, and posterior sag. Posterior sag or marked vertical displacement. So if you have reasonable stability, you fix and you start by crucial good reduction. Accept no virus, and you medialize the shaft rather than lateralize, and you correctly Re, uh, restore rotation to maintain medial contact. Medialization of the shafts. This patient is 90. You see, you notice the spike of the, uh, uh, the uh, proximal part is inside the shaft, not in front of the shaft, or probably posterior. During operative, this to the first look seems good reduction, Medial cortex is seemingly intact, but you see the greater trochanter is here. It should be here. So the entry point here was okay to start with the reaming, but by the end, there is a lateralization of the shaft and virus and failure. Another case, there is a gap superiorly, virus position, and the screw is high. Again, Always notice that there is a gap when, when there is a virus. Yes, there is a medial contact, but there is a gap here because of the virus or the lateralization of the shaft or both. Another case with a gap superiorly. So 
Be aware that the imaging can be misleading, especially intraoperatively. Lateral view may be inadequate. This case, the reduction looks very good on the AP, but look at the lateral. Rotation of the proximal part and posterior cell. This requires another approach, Homan, to reduce the rotation of the head and complete the operation. This is the final after correction of rotation. Another case is then after reduction, which you choose, nail or plane, the intramedullary nail fixation is superior to extramedullary, of course, because it's mechanically better, stronger, shorter liver arm, but rest against the medial shift or collapse of the uh, proximal part, less tissue cutting and less operative time. And this is the mechanical view, shorter liver arm. But in this old patient with coxavara, neck shaft angle may be as little as 90 degrees by age of 90. So the cephalic screws of the cephalodarary nail will be high in the head. So if you may err to slight valgus, which gives better biomechanics by decreasing the liver arm. But at the same time, you need to do some adduction into varus to get axis, which is more, makes the things more difficult, especially in obese patients. To commence a, a proper intramedullary nailing, the, you accept no varus, you may be as a little bit of valgus, no, media, no lateralization of the shaft, the lower screw should be just above the inferior calcar, Second screw is a must to prevent rotation of the head and engage as far as five millimeter of the subchondral bone to get uh, purchase the good dense bone in the head. The neck is empty. There is no bone, bone here to uh, uh, hold screws. Be wary of the uh, uh, bowed femur, exceptionally bowed in old age. If you don't purchase screws properly in the head, this is the expected result. And make a room for collapse of the head. So this case is a hot case just done a few hours ago. The decision might change on table. She's 90 or uh, she's actually 80. Uh, vertical fracture, as we said from here, the greater trochanter is intact, but she is a frail lady. The reduction looks very good on X-ray, on imaging. After just putting the wire, just putting the wire before reaming, you notice that there is a fracture of the greater trochanter. This is not seen. This is not seen in any X-ray. But you can uh, purchase a good bone quality by intramedullary nailing. Another case. Watch for very bad femur in this old group of patients. So, as the extramedullary plate fixation has a role, DHS and the rotation screw, second screw, may have a role if myofear for greater trochanter uh, to fracture or a fracture to displace. Like in this case, the greater trochanter seemingly intact with the proximal part. After putting the nail, the greater trochanter is off and the, uh, uh, the fixation is in varus. Uh, you can use also uh, extramedullary fixation if you need to reconstruct the greater trochanter uh, big part. <coughs> or if there is a medullary obstruction for nailing or stem of arthroplasty, you can uh, uh, revert to extramedullary fixation and uh, uh, second screw. Second screw must have a fixed angle fixation to plate, so prevent uh, rotation. The talking about reconstructing the lesser trochanter in this age group is easily said, but it's technically uh, difficult and uh, uh, not uncommonly impossible. The lesser trochanter is uh, retracted by the strong iliosoas and it is very weak and may be fragmented. 
If you do this, it usually unites as long as you uh, achieve good reduction and uh, prevent rotation. The arthroplasty is not relying much on bone quality and union. So there is no need for recumbency or uh, delay weight bearing. Uh, so it is have a merit. The old age, especially if delirium, you cannot uh, obey the orders of uh, partial weight bearing. But it is a bigger surgery, definitely higher incidence of complications, especially dislocation rate is higher in trauma cases. So you refer to a large head size, like bipolar. If the hip is arthritic, you go for a total hip. But in this case, you rely on tribolar, which makes things even bigger. So arthroplasty is a bigger surgery in, in these flare, flare, uh, frail elderly patients, especially in the, they have a trauma settings with hematoma, bruising, soft tissue uh, deficiency, more blood loss and tissue damage care, additional reconstruction of greater and or lesser trochanter uh, may be added. The approach, use the approach uh, you are familiar with, whether lateral or posterior, but there is no place for anterior approach. Gentle technique and don't use a, a strong assistant. Uh, ex uh, strong external rotation may fracture the femur or damage the ligaments of the knee, causing strain and soreness. They usually complain of after arthroplasty. Uh, greater trochanter uh, may need to be reconstructed. However, there is many ways of reconstructing the greater trochanter, meaning that none of it, none of them is. Uh, uh, totally uh, uh, successful. You use K wires to prevent falling of the greater trochanter anteriorly or posteriorly with flexion extension. And this is no guarantee of failure of fixation of the greater trochanter. And if this happened, dislocation is guaranteed. So the more unstable the fracture, the vertical displacement and, and sag, the more possible damage to the blood supply to the femoral head, the more expected delay to put the patients back on, on their feet, then revert to arthroplasty. <clears throat> this is a, a marked displacement, posterior sag, marked vertical displacement with no part of greater trochanter attached to the uh, femoral head with uh, possible or uh, very possible uh, affection of blood supply. Uh, this case highlights the importance of keeping the options. This 85-year-old uh, lady, that's the ref uh, referred for arthroplasty, but after reduction on traction table, the reduction is good and went well with fixation. The, the, the merit of the fixation is a smaller uh, uh, surgery with less complications. The, definitely the arthroplasty, they have a, a higher incidence of uh, serious complication. So all factors need to be considered to outweigh the inherent risks of a more complicated and expensive replacement procedures in, in such uh, uh, elderly population. What about the patients who are not fit for surgery? I believe that elderly patients with hip fractures are too ill not to have an operation. They must have an operation. This is patient is one week after uh, hip fracture, waiting for uh, uh, to be fit for operation, and this is the bed source. And in these patients, we use a mobile traction as an external fixator under sedation, analgesia, and uh, local anesthetic, you can do an external fixator and the unite. I urge you to uh, uh, look at this uh, paper from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons about the management of hip fractures in the elderly. They reviewed thousands of articles and they came out with uh, 25 medical or non-surgical recommendations. The most significant or most strong recommendations that the geriatric hip fracture patient must be a multidisciplinary team with a multimodal pain control, regional anesthesia and the blocks, nutritional support, 
post-operative physical and uh, rehabilitation and osteoporosis evaluation. The, the hip fractures may lose up to one liter of blood and there is no evidence that they should uh, delay the hip surgery uh, on, pati for, on patients on aspirin or clopidogrel. gel. It's most important to minimize delirium, which is very likely uh, as a cause and a result uh, of hip fractures, replace blood uh, loss, and reduce fasting uh, up before anesthesia from fluids for only two hours. Prolonged fasting is associated with increased catabolism, hypoglycemia, immunosuppression, and dehydration. To take home message, the instability reflected by displacement that is very important. The external rotation is not bad. You can, this means that it is an open pool and the blood supply is maintained, but the sag is, is bad. The virus displacement is not bad, but vertical displacement is very bad. Reduction is crucial in the three planes. Second generation kefalomedullary nails, tips and tricks improve the results remarkably. And you keep the options uh, available between arthroplasty and fixation till you reduce and properly image the uh, reduction. Resort to arthroplasty, especially if vascularity of the femoral head can be jeopardized. After you finish the operation, get the old veterans back to and up on their feet. They were strong, they lived long, they need to keep spirit. Team should prevent second fractures by identification and treatment of osteoporosis, prevention of falls by improving balance and mobility, and encourage functional activities of daily living and strains. You just need a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mohamed Shafi, for this very interesting presentation. We can take about the three questions before we move to the next speaker. Uh, first question, uh, Professor Shafi from Dr. Uh, Kamal Hamza, how can I get an accepted gentle reduction without traction table? No, you, uh, we mean reduction on the traction table. And if you see that the reduction uh, is not working good for you, then you revert to arthroplast before opening. Yes. Uh, another question from Dr. Muhammad Sultan, medialization impaction, non-anatomical stable reduction by DHS. Uh, it's unpopular operation, but it works if this type uh, of four-part fracture. What's your opinion, sir? No, we, we don't, uh, we, 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 the sarmiento valgalization or medialization of stokomy is, is obsolete. We just need to restore the anteromedial contact. The post-remedial uh, contact which is more important is deficient because of the fracture of the lesser trochanter, but you can uh, oppose the uh, lower spike against the medial cortex anteromedially. And uh, more important is to put a second screw to prevent the rotation of the head neck piece. Yes, sir. Uh, another question, sir, from Dr. Walid Ham. You can hear me, Professor Muhammad? No, I, I missed this. I didn't appear. Uh, uh, another question from Dr. Walid Hamad. Are these rules uh, applicable for pertrochantric fractures? Um, generally, yes. Uh, the pertrochantric fracture is a straightforward fixation. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now we come to the uh, to the end of uh, the, your presentation, sir. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Said Abdel Hamid from uh, South Valley University. Professor Said will speak about uh, extra capsular neck fractures. Professor Said, please, sir.
Professor Said, you are muted, sir. You are muted, sir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Ustazn. First of all, I'd like to thank the Egyptian Orthopedic Association, uh, in particular, Professor Mohammed Al Ashhad. Uh, he is doing really marvelous effort in spreading uh, the knowledge. Uh, and I am honored to be uh, uh, side by side to my great uh, professors and mentors in, in this session. And uh, I'm going to talk about the extra capsular uh, hip fractures. Uh, Actually, uh, we orthopedic surgeons have a different understanding of uh, hips. Uh, and this is Shakira say that hips don't lie. Uh, in fact, sometimes they do. Uh, as for hip fractures, uh, they are classified, as, as my professor Mohammed Shafi said, in, into, into intracapsular fractures, uh, previously talked about by uh, Professor uh, Eid, and uh, extracapsular fractures that includes uh, trochanteric and subtrochanteric fractures. In fact, extracapsular fractures, approximately 40% of all hip fractures, 90% of them are trochanteric fractures. Uh, intracapsular fractures, as mentioned by Dr. Raid, they are uh, famous for two uh, main famous complications, which are the avascular necrosis of the head of the femur uh, and the non-union. Fortunately, those complications are rare in extracapsular fractures because of the rich vascularity in this area uh, they tend to unite, however, they tend to unite in various positions. Why are those fractures important? Because of the high incidence of one-year mortality associated with those fractures. Uh, in fact, uh, those fractures sometimes are the beginning of the end of the patient's life, to the extent that we say uh, we come to life under the brim of the pelvis and will leave it through the proximal femur. Uh, mortality one year mortality rate is variable in different series reaching up to 58 percent in some series and those are uh, higher than the femoral uh, neck fractures uh, also uh, clinical diagnosis is straightforward just fragility fractures uh, that is defined as falling from a standing height patient is usually female above 65 years complaining of pain and inability to bear weight marked external rotation and shortening because a capsule is attached to the proximal fragment allowing the distal fragment to rotate freely uh, uh, to the uh, lateral side. Uh, no sophisticated examination uh, uh, investigations are needed, just anteroposterior and uh, cross-table lateral view. Uh, and in fact, sometimes we are in need to traction, traction internal rotation film uh, to appreciate the posterolateral comminution and better classify the fracture and formulate uh, a, a plan for management. Uh, do we need CT? Uh, in fact, uh, in usual cases, we don't need a CT. However, some authors uh, recommending having three-dimensional CT and complex fracture to break the complex fracture pattern into simple series of reduction steps, and this may affect uh, the outcome successfully. Uh, actually, different classification are proposed, the AO classification, A1, A2, and A3, uh, uh, and uh, A1 is pertrochanteric simple fracture, multifragmentary fracture of A2, and reversed obliquity in A3. Uh, actually, this is uh, also other classifications. In fact, they are less useful than the uh, classifications of the femoral neck, and it's better to look at it as stability of fracture. About 50% of those fractures un are unstable. Uh, as for the treatment, actually, the aim of treatment is to regain mobility and limit the morbidity. And as we said, we have uh, to uh, uh, treat those patients and get them mobile very early to avoid the recumbency problem in pneumonia, urinary tract infection, slow circulation of the skin will lead to uh, ulcers and, of course, the thromboembolic events. The greatest challenge for the treatment of those fractures are instability and osteoporosis. Sometimes those fractures uh, are actually bad and uh, uh, the bone quality is bad and the patient is always uh, sometimes is bad. So it is like a bad fracture in a bad patient. Uh, uh, unstable fractures are uh, actually the, those fractures that lack the uh, post-remedial support and those with reversed obliquity and those with subtrochanteric uh, extensions. Uh, the lateral war, as mentioned by Professor Shaka, is very important and a determining factor, determining factor of the success of uh, the operation. Uh, 
they have some some uh, formula uh, to uh, modify. Uh, if there is a place for non-operative treatment, actually it is rarely indicated, as Professor Safi said, and it should be uh, uh, considered only in non-ampulatory patient with very high risk of mortality intraoperative. Unfortunately, those will lead to uh, more than 80% mortality rate in the first year, in addition to the uh, recumbency problem as uh, uh, shown by Professor Shafi. Uh, the operative treatment actually uh, of uh, extracapsular or trochanteric fractures, uh, the, it depends on uh, five variables, surgeon dependent and surgeon independent. Uh, surgeon independent, the fracture pattern, the geometry of fracture, uh, the instability or stability of the fracture, and the bone quality uh, of the patient. The surgeon dependent factors actually the quality of reduction, implant choice, and uh, implant position. Uh, as Professor, uh, my Professor Osama Faru uh, talked about the uh, uh, critical uh, importance of timing in such uh, op uh, uh, operations. Uh, actually, uh, timing uh, is very important in our case, and uh, those fractures are should be dealt with as emergent but not urgent fractures. And actually, those fractures uh, that is done within the 24 hours have better post-operative outcome. And those delays for three or more days are usually associated with increased mortality rate. Time is gold. Uh, the second variable is the implants. We have uh, two famous implants, DHS and uh, proximal femoral nail. Both of them has its uh, pros and cons. Uh, DHS was introduced even in 1970s, even befe before I was born, and still the gold standard for stable fractures and have something to do with unstable fractures too. And it allows dynamic compression. It is said that the fracture is seeking its own stable position. They have good rate of fusion and low cost and this is very important for a country like ours and of course easy learning still they they, they have a uh, questionable uh, about the um, and the less well unstable fractures and they have a uh, long uh, liver arm and uh, proximal femoral nails was developed uh, introduced in 1996 for unstable fracture by the AO. as professor Muhammad uh, mentioned the advantage of the uh, closer uh, center of rotation and the shorter lever arm that uh, decreases the bending force in both the bone and implants. Which implant to use? Actually, the short answer is DHS for intertrochanteric stable fractures, proximal femoral nail for relatively unstable fracture. But are short answers enough? Let's explore this. Even though proximal femoral nails uh, m have more theoretical advantages, of course, than DHS, there is still ongoing controversy whether proximal femoral nail is, is a better choice than DHS or not, especially from clinical studies. Uh, this is Parton and colleagues published this, baser, this paper in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery 2010, and they concluded that DHS should remain the gold standard for treatment of extracapsular fracture, and they found that it have similar outcomes with the gamma nail, still it is significantly cheaper. Uh, the results of review of literature has no significant advantage of proximal femoral nail over DHS in terms of complications and functional outcome. Uh, another uh, papers reported that DHS was not inferior to intramedullary na nailing even for unstable fracture types. And this is a meta-analysis systemic review uh, randomized trials. And uh, it was concluded that proximal femoral nail results in shorter operative time, less blood loss intraoperative compared to DHS. However, there were no difference was seen for the post-operative complications. Uh, the, the, the important question actually is when not to use DHS in reverse obliquity fractures because the failure rate is more than 50% and in subterocanteric extension. And if you have lateral uh, uh, integrity, uh, the integrity of the lateral femoral wall is questionable, you have to think twice before using uh, uh, DHS. Uh, uh, the procedure, uh, it's a simple one, reduction, then guide wire insertion, reaming over the guide wire, screw insertion and plate fixation. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we uh, consider DHS as an easy operation. Uh, I remember it was my first surgery in, in my uh, orthopedic career, and I was really happy to do that. 
uh, I think we have to think twice before uh, offering the, the uh, young resident this operation at the end of the list because this operation is really critical for the patient. First, we have to start with uh, choosing the right implant. Here is, uh, of course, th this is a, a different choice from one of the orthopedic surgeon, and this is uh, end results. Uh, how I do this? I do uh, this op this operation in supine position under spinal anesthesia, and actually, I use flat table. I don't use traction table. Traction table is cumbersome. It leads a lot of time to be resetted, and uh, I'm not really comfortable with. I use a flat table with my assistant uh, uh, doing the uh, holding the traction uh, on the uh, other side of the uh, table and in the hemolysetum position to allow the C-arm to uh, uh, get the uh, cross table lateral view. Uh, actually, you have to ensure that both views are possible by C-arm before scrubbing. You will not do it if you don't see it. Uh, reduction, reduction, reduction. Uh, again, we have, uh, as uh, Professor Osama uh, talked about, the, the predictors of uh, good outcome of surgery as timing and reduction. Here, actually, the reduction is the main determinant of the success or failure of this operation. Reduction is the most important step in uh, this operation and will determine the success or failure of this operation. Why accurate reduction? Because it restored the hip biomechanics, reduced the stress on the implants, and le le lead to rapid healing. How to reduce? I do uh, flexion, abduction, gradual extension with internal rotation. You, sometimes you need to do a fine tuning like this. I This is one of the last cases. You just need to ex mildly externally rotate the, the, uh, the leg to achieve the uh, good reduction. And you have to be aware of the decastation of those uh, uh, trabeculae because this is a good side to anchor your implant. You have to use all the possible means, the spike pusher, the pointed clamps, and you may hold this reduction by uh, guide wires. Actually, I usually uh, uh, hold the reduction by guide wires, but you have to put in your mind to avoid the future path of your implant uh, position to avoid uh, uh, the problem of uh, going with your uh, fixing wire. Uh, remember, 25% of, of these fractures reduce in slight external rotation. And also uh, one fourth of those fractures uh, doesn't need uh, abduction. Uh, how you assess the reduction? The neck shaft angle should be normal or slight valgus. Sag of the femoral shaft should be uh, avoided. Displacement uh, should be less than five millimeters of any of the bone fragments. Rotation can be judged clinically. And on the lateral view, you have to uh, find the antiversion, which is around 15 degree, and you have to uh, ensure continuity of the anterior cortical line. Uh, you have to avoid uh, heavy traction because it will lead to valgus. More valgus is not uh, appreciated. Uh, and too much internal rotation that will open the posterior cortex. Actually, this is the tip apex distance, which is a summation of the distance from the tip of the screw to the apex of the femoral head in the AB and lateral view. And this is a very important determining of the success of uh, this operation. It's a it is a strong predictor of the cutout, and uh, it should be uh, always kept under 25 millimeters uh, 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 number. Uh, this is also uh, lesser to recanter is intact. The proximal fragment will be flexed, abducted, and externally rotated. The reduction will be difficult. If all visible, you have to put that in your mind if you uh, inspect the X-ray and find it, uh, the lesser trochanter is intact. The approach is slightly posterior to the mid-axial line. The guide wire should be should be, uh, uh, you should be using the guide angle, and this angle should be flushed with the, uh, the shaft of the femur. The guide should be central in anthroposterior and lateral view, and ideally, it should be at the level of the lesser trochanter. All the time, check with C-arm, and this is the fixing wire and the, uh, and the uh, guide wire that we will uh, use to uh, uh, fix uh, our implant. Reaming should be uh, done over guide. Please avoid bending of the guide. It may, it may be broken and be careful about shouldering because sometimes you broke the lateral wall intraoperatively and this is occurs in a very uh, good deal of numbers in, in those cases. And here you are uh, transferring this uh, case from stable to unstable and you will need another uh, implant to support your uh, uh, fracture. 
Uh, the screw position should be ideally central in the AP and central in the lateral. More important is the tape apex uh, distance. And uh, if difficulty encountered, slightly posterior and inferior positions are accepted. Tab or not, we tab actually in young patients. And we have to consider always the stabilization of the proximal fragment by guide wire while we are tabbing. And if we are going to tab, we have to tab uh, five millimeters length than the reamed area. Of course, you have never to force the blade on the screw. And uh, another very good option or uh, 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 aid, which is the uh, TSP or trochanteric stabilizing plate. We have to use uh, this plate uh, in case of lateral wall comminution. And actually, I sometimes used uh, 2T plate if this plate is unavailable. One of them is named after our pre great professor, Mohammed Shafi, the preceding speakers. Uh, we always consider a Shafi plate in, in your uh, uh, instrument, on your uh, plates. Uh, and actually, uh, if not available, you have to keep uh, one T plate. The, the, the disadvantage of T plate, of course, it, it, is it, it will change the uh, dynamicity of the uh, of the uh, implant into a fixed angle uh, plate because it doesn't have this hole uh, in front, uh, corresponding to the leg screw. However, uh, if you can't uh, find the, uh, the uh, TS uh, plate, you can use uh, this uh, T plate. Uh, in fact, trochanteric stabilizing plate is the treatment of trochanteric fractures. This is, was uh, published in Acta Orthopedica in, uh, 20, in uh, 2021. It provides uh, a more stable construct, reduce the leg screw sliding and medialization. However, this is translate into improved clinical outcomes or not, it is unclear. Uh, this is another uh, paper comparing BFN uh, uh, against uh, uh, DHS uh, with uh, TSP uh, for unstable fractures. And the conclusion is uh, they have both comparable uh, outcome and uh, good results. This is a very nice uh, uh, implant I came across in the last uh, sea coat was held in Egypt, uh, one of the booths of, uh, of one of the companies, I don't remember from which country, but they do this uh, uh, plate and it have an ex posterior extension. I think it will work uh, well uh, for the porting fracture. These are uh, my photos. Uh, right or left side, does it matter? Actually, uh, it doesn't, but you have to be careful because in the right hip, you uh, you you tighten the screw in a clockwise manner, which will be stabilizing the fragment towards the shaft. In the left, you may elevate the proximal fragment and you have to, to put that in your mind and to fix uh, a guide wire or something to avoid uh, this uh, position. Uh, cement augmentation and severe osteoporosis Panic bin improves the screw parches and prevent screw cut out. We have did a, a paper um, uh, published on this uh, issue. Uh, for the sake of time, arthroplasty was talked well about Professor Mohammed Shafi, and he introduced a very amazing cases. Uh, he said, as he mentioned, there is a high rate of complications, maybe five times mortality rate. And of course, it should be uh, preserved for those uh, old patients with uh, severely unstable and uh, uh, bad quality uh, bone. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Said, for this uh, very interesting talk. We have some questions to you before moving to the next speaker, please, sir. First question yeah. from uh, Dr. Gamal Qasim is... Uh, rule for non-operative measures if the fracture is stable, especially if comorbid patients? Uh, I think uh, yani, um, you have to, to live or not to live. This is a bad judgment of mine, but I think it's better to put the uh, 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 DHS for this patient, which is really simple in those patients, and move uh, get this patient ambulatory, uh, turning on bed, avoid bed sores, avoid uh, the recumbency position. I, I am not with non-operative uh, uh, approach, uh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, another question, sir, uh, uh, doctor, for Dr. Said, how do you set up the patient in flat table? What about the lateral views and uh, can you do it in uh, to, for PFN as well, sir? Yes, I use it also for BF BFN. Uh, as I said, and I put a picture from my uh, theater, I put the patient in the hemilysotomy position. This will open the way to have uh, your uh, lateral X-ray cross table without uh, need to uh, uh, move the, the leg. 
uh, and also I use uh, the same approach for uh, PFN2. Yes, sir. Uh, another question from Dr. Khaled uh, Muhammad. Uh, how you maintain the traction throughout the surgery without traction table? Uh, how support the patient against traction without the traction table, sir? Uh, as I said, I do the reduction. Uh, fortunately, most patients doesn't uh, need uh, a lot of traction. Uh, actually, sometimes if you do over, overdue traction, you will lead to a valgoid uh, situation. Uh, in fact, I used uh, one of my uh, assistants to hold the leg uh, throughout the procedure. And as I said first, once I reduced uh, the fracture, I try to put a guide wire uh, uh, to support the reduction. And uh, you have to put on in in your mind to uh, have another bath away from the expected bath of uh, the next uh, screw position. Yes, sir. Another question from Dr. Ahmed Hamdi. When we use a T plate with DHS plate, Dr. Said B. Uh, actually, uh, the indication of use the TS plate uh, first, if there is a questionable integrity of the lateral wall, actually, if the lateral wall is fractured or thinned uh, uh, up to uh, uh, 2.4 uh, centimeters, uh, it is expected to be fractured. Uh, so we use it in the, if there is questionable integrity of the lateral wall first, and we use it in uh, uh, unstable type of uh, fractures, uh, of uh, trochanteric fracture, unstable types and lateral wall uh, integrity questionable. Yes, sir. One of our attendees, our uh, dear colleagues is asking about, uh, can we have the material? Uh, of course, all the material, sir, uh, if you excuse me, will be available on the YouTube channel of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association within two weeks from now. Sure. Uh, we have uh, we have another question from Dr. Sadiq. What about using DCS plate in unstable fractures and the uh, scale of the patient? Actually, uh, there is a, a definite indications of DCS. I I, uh, I uh, exposed one of uh, the, the implant choice, uh, one of the surgeons that used DCS for uh, trochanteric fractures. Actually, this is not the indication at all. Uh, the indication of DCS is the subtrochanteric fractures and not the trochanteric fractures. Uh, th th there is no rule of DCS in trochanteric fractures. Yes, sir. Uh, one is asking about one of our colleagues is asking about what about the lateral position in PFM. Uh, actually, uh, it should be theoretically easier uh, to have the lateral position. Uh, 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 I usually to make it simple. A simple is simple. It's it works for me to have the flat table. And so far, I can I can uh, run my C arm and get the lateral view and the interposterior view easily. I don't need to. Uh, actually, the traction table is cumbersome. It has a lot of parts, at least in my hospital. And to set this traction table, I need a lot of time, more than 30, 40 minutes to set it the right way. Yes, sir. The last question, sir, from Dr. Akila. Uh, what about uh, version correction when uh, supplying side plate, retro or anti or non-traction table? Sorry, I didn't uh, get you. Uh, what about version correction when applying side plate, retro or anti or non-traction table? Uh, if, if I understand the, the, the question well, uh, I usually uh, uh, insert the DHS under C arm image, and I usually keep keep the the neck version within the fifteen degrees of uh, normal uh, anti version of the of the hip. Yes, sir. The last question, sir, because we are, we have to stick to time. From Dr. Kamal, uh, if the okay. remar went more into the acetabulum, what should I do? The reamer, it, should, it oh. shouldn't, uh, <laughs> it shouldn't, <laughs> but anyway, what happened is happened already, but you, you have to be short, uh, shortened your uh, uh, lag screw uh, to avoid migration of the screw within uh, the, the stabler. Yes, sir. thank you so much, Professor Said, for this very interesting presentation. Thank we you. will have to move to the next speaker. Our next speaker will be Professor Amr Azam, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, the National Institute of Locomotor Surgery, Locomotor System, I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Amr will speak about the updated surgical technique of safe surgical dislocation. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohammed. Um, 
It's a pleasure for me to share in such an international uh, event. Thank you for your tremendous efforts uh, under the umbrella of our beloved Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Um, my talk today will be, will be about the updated surgical technique the sur regarding the surgical hip dislocation. I think it, is a, it will be a complementary to Professor Sayed, Professor uh, Mohammed, and Professor Abdesalam Eid. Um, uh, to speak about uh, the learning objectives. It will be to explain the anatomical key points and essential steps to correctly perform this technique, also to describe the indications for such an approach and become familiar with this technique with having a long learning curve, with recognizing the advantages and limits of the safe surgical hip dislocation for either femoral heads or acetabular lesions. Uh, regarding the indications, in the pediatric cases, a slept capital femoral epiphysis and also in the femoral dysplasias regarding the might be used the femoral head intra-articular osteotomies, also the osteochondroplasty regarding the adult uh, patients might be used in both femoral head and acetabular fractures in adults, and lastly, the femoroacetabular impairment and chylectomy. Uh, to speak about, to start with, we don't have to forget the marvelous blood supply of the femoral head, which is a very important that comes from the medial circumflex femoral artery, uh, coming from anterior and passing from between the femur and the pelvis, and then supplies the femoral head from posterior. So, sub, um, uh, it originates, as we all know, from the deep femoral artery between the iliopsoas and pectineus muscle, and then uh, running along the inferior border of the obturator externus, posteriorly, and then it runs upwards covered by the quadratus femoris, and then on the top of the uh, obturator externus, it gives a very important trochanteric, trochanteric branches and keeps on running proximally and uh, crossing the triceps uh, coccyx form of three muscles and then end up by entering the joint with uh, through a very important landmark between the gemella super superior and pyriforms giving four to five retinacular Vessels. Here we have uh, a, a, sp a special specimen. This is a cranial and this caudal. This is uh, the uh, trochanteric branches. And also here the, we have the osteotomized part of the rear trochanter with a special dye injecting this specimen, showing the retinacular uh, vessels very well. Uh, regarding the patient positioning, we have here the surgeon and two assistance with a uh, uh, lateral, dead lateral decubitus with a special pillow uh, under the uh, contraepsilateral side to allow for the movement of this limb freely. Also, to speak about the approach, it started with speaking this approach, uh, the cochar langen pet posterior approach, and, and as we all know, it begins in, on the greater trochanter, extending proximally uh, within six centimeters on the posterior superior leg spine and splitting the gluteus maximus in line with its muscle. But we have here a problem in this uh, cochar langen pet, it's not visualizing all the structures. So we had a limited visibility with no option for dislocation and with limited access for the femoral head and difficult labral uh, repair or manipulation. So we had to move to the, uh, the comparative study that have been made between the Kocher Langen Peck and the trochanteric flip extension. And the very important uh, surgical exposure today is about the surgical hip dislocation, which is the Gibson posterolateral approach with uh, one of the modifications of the Kocher Langen Peck. Uh, we all know that starts the proximal limb, uh, at a point eight to nine centimeters to the posterior superior iliac spine, running bisecting the greater trochanter as a landmark, and then the hip can be dislocated by flexion, uh, abduction, and external rotation. Here we have the Gibson approach, as we can see under my pointer, and then the uh, iliotibial band, and here we have the dislocation maneuver 
uh, can be done easily. So to show you this approach, it starts, I think it's in a pediatric cases, it will, it would be 12 to 16 centimeters in children. And in adults, it, I think it will be an 18 to 20 uh, centimeters in adult incision aiming at the greater truck. Another point is a very important, this pillow and also the sterile uh, side bag that we have to be prepared at the end of the start of the operation to allow for the dislocated limb to be in the side table, on the side beside the table. So the Gibson interval with a very important landmark. Here we have this very important glute max presenting the uh, Gibson interval between the glute max and tensor fascia lata and a very nice incision, vertical incision, incising the tensor fascia lata here after exploration and delineation of this gap and cutting the glute max to inser uh, insertion to the iliotibial van, keeping in mind that you may face some of the retinacular vessels or sorry, some of the trochanteric uh, uh, anastomotic vessels uh, if you uh, touch the uh, femoral insertion of a glute max. And uh, this, uh, the assistant has to hold this limb in a maximum extension and internal rotation to delineate this side, showing the trochanteric bursa and also the retrotrochanteric space and observing the sciatic nerve not to injure it. So we have to now to uh, dissect the very important landmark, which is a, a, a marvelous, a marvelous uh, tendinous white structure the pyriforms fossa, uh, the pyriforms fossa, which is a pyriforms muscle. And here is this, this, uh, the very important landmark not to cut through it. Otherwise, you are going to jeopardize the femoral head vascularity. Here we have another usage of our screws regarding the fully threaded or partially threaded. Speaking about the greater stroke, here we have another tip for the greater trochanteric osteotomy, as we all know that we might, might be done directly one cut from posterior to anterior, but uh, uh, with, with having a small modification of this, we might have a, what we call a step cut osteotomy. This having the proximal three fifths, one, one cut, and the distal two fifths, another cut with a step in between. Here we have the saw blade, in the first cut and another saw blade in the second cut and the, the step between them, this uh, proved that having the increasing the stability during the reattachment after completing your surgery. Here we have the osteotome and chisel to elevate it and then to get into the complete release of the soft tissue, uh, the greater truck. And here we have the step cut at the end on. We can see it here. Uh, proximal three fifths and the distal two fifths uh, cut, step cut osteotomy. And as soon as we finish this osteotomy, we come from posterior to anterior. So we have to change the position of the lower limb by the assistant to be an in abduction and external rotation to come and to, to come to the anterior part of the femur with a superior release of these uh, sharp uh, sharp superior release of vessels, trellis and intermediates as well abduction, external rotation to show us all this external rotation showing the hip capsule. Now we are going to see the hip capsule with underlying structures inside. Here we have the head and the neck and now the we have to proceed to the capsulotomy which is a regularly it will be an azeplasty with a posterior transverse limb one or half a centimeter from the acetabular limb, not to injure the acetabular, uh, labrum acetabular and the vertical limb as well and through uh, lateral and uh, uh, another transverse limb and through lateral as we can see the starting with a vertical limb and then two transverse limbs. Now we can explore and we can see the head and the neck with a special uh, homens on the anterior and posterior superior part of the acetabulum. To show you so one of the examples in our work, we, uh, we are going to present a 12 years old boy who is unable to weight bear with a knee and hip pain, flexed adducted hip and limited hip abduction. On x-rays with having uh, unstable severely uh, scaphy degree 
And uh, as we have reached here with a safe surgical hip dislocation, we have to do the very important uh, vascularity test to test the vascularity of, uh, of this head. Now we have pierced this head with a special or small white bore needle and we're having the bleeding from the head denoting that's a still viable head. So we can proceed now to dislocate our hip, but in the pediatric cases, we have to fix the head to the neck before this dislocation. Otherwise, we are going to face the head to be separated. So in a slight extension and external rotation with a special hook here to dislocate this head gently. Here we have the more external rotation with a dislocation. And now this epsilateral hip on the contralateral side of the table on the side bag, which is a sterile bag prepared pre previously. After this location, we can visualize and now explore the acetabulum as well as the head. And here we have to repeat this, that we have the retinacular vessels coming from posterior to the superior, four to five retinacular vessels. And, and a, a special uh, tip for the pediatric cases, now we can see in some pediatric cases that the trochanteric apophysis in the end, a cut end on of the proximal uh, tru uh, greater trunk from superior, antero superior to posterior inferior, putting a, a chisel or osteotome here. We can re uh, split this part, uh, splitting with it all the trochanteric flap or retinacular flap, uh, preserving the blood supply of this head posterior as we can see on this arrow can point and we can handle the head and the new bone formation in the anterior, inferior and posterior as well as the posterior part of the neck as we can see here a new bone formation we have to deal with. After removing this we can fix the head to the neck in a pediatric cases and fixing the greater trunk. Before that we can do the reduction as a slight pull and then the same position, abduction, external rotation with a slight pull. Now we can internally rotate with a reducing the head inside the acetabulum successfully. Uh, before we go, we have to explore all the head and the neck and the lesions and to deal with properly. So the post-operatively, we have a special tips for first, no hip strengthening, straightening or full weight bearing until the trochanter is held, healed. And the very important as the patients who were allowed to use the crutches immediately as soon as the pain is tolerated with a continuous passive motion can be used to minimize the risk of developing a flexion and external rotation of the uh, contraction of, of the operated hip. And lastly, the physical therapy of uh, for gait training and gentle range of motion were initiated immediately. To take home message of this technique is a treatment uh, uh, considered to be a treatment of a head or a cartilage lesion inside the acetabulum and the uh, femoral head. It's a novel reduction technique. Also, the powerful safe approach with improvement of the long term results of such cases. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Amr Azam, for this very interesting talk. Well, unfortunately, Dr. Amr, inshallah, next Friday, we have one of our uh, eminent Indian speakers speaking about uh, safe surgical, surgical dislocation. I hope you can join us as a moderator, sir, in this session. I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have uh, just one question. Uh, Dr. Ali, thank you so Dr. Amr. Thank you so now we will move to the next speaker. Our next speaker will be Professor uh, Fadi Nasruddin from uh, Lebanon, our dear colleague from Lebanon, Dr. Fadi Nasruddin. Dr. Fadi, you are very welcome with us, sir. Dr. Fadi, can you hear me? Dr. Fadi? I think Dr. Fadi is not with us. He was with us. Dr. Fadi? Oh, 
Okay, uh, we we can move to the uh, Dr. Fed. You are with us. Dr. Fadi? Just one moment. I'll make a call to him. Just one moment, please. I'll call him. Dr. Fed, you are with us? I think Dr. Fed is not with us. Okay, now we will move to the next uh, session. Oh, yeah, Dr. Fed is with us. He's sharing. Dr. Fadi? Okay, uh, we will move to the next session. The next session is the uh, pediatric session. And our first speaker will be uh, my dear professor, Professor Osama Hgazi, professor of orthopedic surgery, Banha University. Dr. Osama, the pediatric orthopedic في الوطن العربي وايادي البيضاء على كل جراحي العظام في مصر وفي الوطن العربي دكتور اسامه بيه سعادتك معانا يا فندم اه معاك يا دكتور محمد يا مساء الخير يا فندم مساء الخير يا دكتور محمد يعني احنا يعني افضل حضرتك علينا دايما يا دكتور اسامه بيه يعني فندم. يعني دايما افضل حضرتك علينا كده يا فندم ودايما بنتعلم من حضرتك يا فندم ربنا يكرمك ويبارك فيك ربنا يبارك في حضرتك وبنسعد طبعا وبنتشرف بسماع محاضرات حضرتك يا دكتور اسامه بيه. لا شرف ليا يا دكتور محمد والله. العفو يا استاذنا، اتفضل يا استاذنا، ربنا يبارك لنا في سيادتك يا استاذنا. المحاضره شيرد؟ اه شيرد يا فندم، اتفضل يا فندم، فول سكرين بليز سير. اوكي. جود ايفنينج. This lecture will be about evidence-based guide, guide for management of persons. Management of persons disease is a challenging with a wide range of presentation and variety in age and severity of the disease. So we are in need of a standard algorithm for management. Standard and algorithm for management of persons disease based on uh, factors determine the treatment plan, which are age of the child, range of motion of the hip, lateral extrusion of the femoral head, degree of affection of the femoral head. So after fulfilling criteria of the factors, we can ask ourselves to treatment either non-surgical or surgical, or which is, if surgical, which surgical procedure. Uh, Basophysiology of birth disease is essential to understand the treatment principles. Uh, the, there is a four pathological st stage of Bers' disease because Bers' disease is a self-healing disease. And the, the pathology is, takes about three to four years uh, until the, the condition is settled. The first stage is the initial stage of the ne necrosis stage. It lasts for several months. The X-ray show like this, increased density and collapse. Uh, this is the initial and the necrosis stage. Uh, second stage, fragmentation stage, uh, is a stage of starting regeneration. So over a period, it takes a, over a period of one to, to, uh, up to two years. That this is uh, the big, very big picture is, shows the fragmentation stage. Then the ossification stage, the stronger bone starts to develop. The long, the, this is the longest st stage of the disease. It lasts a few for a few years, and this is a picture of it. This complete ossification of the head. Finally, the healed stage, the femoral head reaches the final shape. 
So this pathological stage have a radiological progress in the disease. There is four, five radiogra radiographic stages can be seen by plain X-ray in sequence as follows. The stage, is, the, the, the stage to see in person disease is, is, is the collapse, sclerosis and the collapse. And this is initial necrosis stage and it lasts for a few, a several months. Then stage of fragmentation is a stage of regeneration. That bone replaced by initial softer bone or even bone it takes over a period of one year, one to two years. Reossification is a stage of stronger bone develop. It lasts a few years. And then finally, here the stage, there is a final shape of the femoral head. So there are many treatment options for person disease. The one of treatment of person disease are really pain relief. Protect the shape of the femoral head, which is a very important goal. Protect the shape of the femoral head. Restore normal hip movements. Get the hip contained as early as possible to uh, to avoid uh, later on arthritis. The primary goal of treatment is to prevent further femoral head deformity and maintain hip sphericity as we look to this picture. This is the, the person's disease. Head is contained, contained, and this is the final picture. The, the head healed. With, a, with the femoral head is spherical and concentric. So this is, this is an, an, an example of a person disease which is healed very soundly without major defect or disability for the patient. Contentment is an intervention that plays the anterolateral part of the femoral epiphysis within the stablum, protecting the epiphysis from being uh, subjected uh, for a deforming force. The femoral head with lateral exclusion like that, the head is Left like that, head, this is a person's disease. This is lateral extrusion of the femoral head, and this is horizontal oriented cross plate. Uh, uh, if left like that without treatment, uh, if uh, it can deform it, uh, it's untreated, it can deform and not fulfill within the stablum, which can lead to further hip problems in adulthood, such as osteoarthritis. This is an example of pictures of person's disease with lateral exclusion, which is not treated. Well, so this is the final picture. The, the part of the head is upside. This will be flat. This will end by, by, like, by this picture, which is irregularity of the femoral head, which is a precursor of uh, early osteoarthritis of the head. So the principle of containment treatment is prevent femoral head deformation, which is a very essential goal of treatment. Treatment of person's disease based on age of the child, lateral extrusion of the femoral head, stage of the disease by cutterial grading, and the range of motion of the head. Current treatment of person's disease are non-operative treatment, which is very essential to, to, to know, activity restriction rest, non-operative containment, either by cast or pressing, operative treatment, either by hip adductor release, Operative containment osteotomy for either femoral or pelvic, or hip distraction. Those are the current treatment in for person's disease. Treatment of protocol of person's disease, which is must follow, we must follow as much as we can. If the head is if the head is with no lateral extrusion, femoral head is contained. Well, if the involvement is less than 50 degrees according to Cattrell classification. So this, this, this picture, so this conditions no need for surgery, we just observation, reassurance of the parents and intermittent symptomatic treatment for, for pain if, if needed. Uh, ne next group, which is, is, is presented with lateral extru extrusion, or if there involvement more than 50 degrees according to catarrhal grading, like this, this is grade five, Catrell with lateral extrusion of the femoral head. Those cases require a containment procedure, either non-surgical or surgical, as we will show after that. Uh, the head stage, uh, the head presented with complete healing, and this condition may need later reconstructive surgical treatment. This protocol is an easy protocol to apply in, for every case of person disease. We look for lateral extru extrusion, the amount of epithelial involvement, and 
the age of the patient. Treatment depending on the age of the patient. The age of the child is the most important variable in planning treatment. Why? Because healing potential is closely linked to growth and remodeling. Uh, children under five years, and this is the American Academy guidelines, children under five years, every graph suggests lateral extrusion, non-surgical containment is considered. Uh, children from five to seven years, if their involvement is 50% or greater than 50%, uh, with lateral extrusion, surgical containment is procedure. Is, 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 uh, children over 10 years, up to 12 years, they may be an early stage, in early groups, 7 to 9, or 7 and 10 years, if they involvement at any grade, in that, in that age, any grade of physical involvement, even grade 1, and ex lateral extrusion of the femoral head, surgical containment procedure is indicated, if the condition presented with healing stage self as a, a stable body may need it. Children over 12 years, there is no, there is no uh, rule for containment, but uh, as a procedure is to, to, to uh, if there is defect in the coverage of the femoral head, we need self as stable plastic. This, this is uh, according to the American Academy guidelines of treatment of person's disease. Children under five years, the healing potential is a very good at that age, and the outcome is very favorable. A full range of motion is maintained and a child is monitored. If the radiograph suggests lateral exclusion, non-surgical containment is considered. So, the key point for this, this group of patients is the, 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 the lateral ex extrusion. If there is no lateral extrusion, this is a case of child who's five years old with, low, with no lateral extrusion. And it's presented by pain since two months and slight limping. Well, abduction range at 30 degrees means good range of abduction, good range of motion. So in these conditions, there is no lateral extrusion, good range of motion, uh, treatment is symptomatic treatment, by uh, by giving some pain uh, pain pain uh, killers and mobilization and maintaining hip movement. This is this a case of five year old boy presented with pain in the groin the past three months with limping with abduction range thirty degrees, but in the X-ray we show we see a lateral extrusion of the femoral head. So in this case at the age of five years we recommend non surgical containment. According to the, the guidelines, and this is a case of a four-year boy, pain in the groin, about three months, with slight limping, with abduction, 30 degrees, with lateral extrusion of the femoral head. Also, you can recommend non-surgical non content. Non-surgical containment, I want to do, uh, it can be done in children up to five years of age, if the X-ray indicates lateral extrusion of the femoral head. Children up to five years can tolerate non-surgical treatment containment. Uh, non-surgical containment could be done by a cast or brace to keep the head in, of the fever in the normal position within the acetabulum. Non-surgical containment can, die, can be done by one of two, either battery cast, which is a long leg cast for both limbs with a, with a bar in between to maintain abduction of the head, or by abduction or sources like that. This is a case of Persis disease in a child five years old. This is a lateral extrusion of the femoral head. It had been treated by a battery cast. This is the X-ray, head is contained. This is the final X-ray, head is contained with spherical head, head. This is another case of Persis disease in a child five years old. Uh, according to the guidelines, we can use non-surgical content. This is X-ray after finishing the treatment. This is a case of five, five year old boy with limping. This is lateral exclusion with lateral subluxation and we see the central line is disrupted. So this is that age we can try non try non surgical containment. After finishing the treatment, the femoral head moves from lateral subluxed position to normal and central line regains its normal position and head spherical becomes spherical and there is, there is no 
defect in the acetabular cover. So non surgical containment could be a good line of treatment in children up to five years of old. More than five years, children cannot tolerate this line of treatment. Children from five to seven years old, the key factor in this age is lateral extrusion of the external epithelial involvement, according to Cotterell. If epithelial involvement is less than 50%, means grade one or two, and no lateral extrusion, so symptomatic treatment of acute episodes and immobilization and maintaining hip movement. Like this, this is a case of Persis disease in a six years old boy. Uh, this is not an extrusion. The physical involvement is less than 50%, so can be no need for surgery. Then, if the physical involvement is more than 50% 50% or more, with lateral extrusion, if a surgical containment procedure is, this is example of two cases. This is a lateral extrusion and physical involvement more than 50%, so lateral uh, containment procedure is recommended. Surgical containment could be done by, by femoral varus osteotomy, pelvic osteotomy, or combination of both. Uh, children for surgical containment procedure may be patients under six years of old. Pelvic osteotomies have better radiological outcomes than femoral osteotomies below age of six. Uh, patients after age of six years, both fem femoral and pelvic osteotomies have the same, uh, 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 same uh, I mean, there is no privilege of one over other, but it's, uh, it depends on some factors which we mentioned next slide. Uh, for for femoral osteotomy and pelvic osteotomy, in cases of various osteotomy, we should neck shaft angle should be should be more than 110, and the cross plate horizontally oriented. This, this is a neck shaft angle it should be at least 110, and the uh, cross plate should be uh, horizontally oriented. Do various osteotomy. For pelvic osteotomy, neck shaft angle is presented less than 110, so femoral osteotomy will lead to more reduction in the neck shaft angle, which is, which is not recommended, as the cross plate is not horizontally oriented or children grow six years. So if you, if you compare which is which, it's not it's not exactly personal uh, factor. It should should follow rules in film and various osteotomy. It's neck shaft angle is a factor. It should be not less than 110, and the cross plate should be horizontally oriented. And in shoulder osteotomy, neck shaft angle uh, uh, it could be done in the neck shaft angle less than 110, and the cross plate is not horizontally oriented or it's shoulder in below six years. This is a various femoral osteotomy that persists disease with lateral extrusion. This is a various femoral osteotomy. This is a solar osteotomy. A children over seven years, up to 12 years, differ from the previous group. The remodeling potential in this group is decreased. In this age group, there is, there is controversy regarding the benefit of surgical intervention. So if for cases was presented in this, in, in this, age, in this age group, May be present by initial fragmentation or uh, stage, initial or fragmentation stage. So surgical commended is a primary treatment, like this. If later stage the disease presented with uh, healing stage, containment is contraindicated, and a cytoplasmosis is performed to improve femoral coverage and increase the load bearing gain. So in the group of from five to seven, we may select either if, if there is lateral extrusion. We may need either femoral or varus or, or, or tabular osteotomy. If there is no lateral extrusion, no need for treatment, just observation and reassurance. From seven to up to 12 years, in this group, this present, uh, that shall be present by person's disease in the initial or fragmentation stage or early ossification stage, so may, may benefit from containment procedure if there is lateral extrusion. If he presented in, in this age group by Healed the stage, so there is, there is no role for containment. If there is defect in the stabular coverage, we would prefer to do a stabular a lateral shelf a stabular plastic. This is a bishop, a child who's eight years old, presented with uh, uh, pain limbing and a, a good range of abduction. There is lateral extrusion and this is, is, a, this is in the fragmentation stage. So we, we prefer surgical containment. 
This is another case, Pers' disease with lateral extrusion uh, of the femoral head. This is a virus osteotomy. This is the final X-ray head becomes spherical and contained in the, in the step. This is a Pers' disease, Caterell 4, uh, with horizontal gross plate with lateral ex extrusion of the femoral head. This is a virus osteotomy. The gross plate becomes oblique. Uh, the stapler coverage is improved, and this is the final X-ray head becomes spherical. So this is a various femoral osteotomy. This is another way to, to, to do various femoral osteotomy. In the case of Pers' disease, it could be treated by uh, do a various osteotomy. We can use we can use any planar fixator to to, uh, to fix the child. It, it is controversial. And this is in combined osteotomy femoral insulter in severe cases which we cannot do various osteotomy uh, uh, full, yani according to the uh, amount of various could not be exceed certain limits. We, we, sometimes in severe cases, we can need to do a combined osteotomy, femoral and solar osteotomy to improve the stapler coverage. Children over 12 years, the, the limited remodeling potentials indicates a counter on containment is not an op option in this group. And stability can improve femoral head coverage and reduce subluxation of the hip. This is the case of heel purses. And with, with, with the defect, there is an area of unexposed head which is defect in the uh, 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 stabular coverage, which is biomechanically is a, a disadvantage for this case. So shelf stability could be done. Shelf stability is a lateral shelf stability could be done in older children up to skeletal maturity. Indications defect in the femoral head. Coverage that cannot be corrected by containment of non-concentric non hips. This is a case of heel versus show it, and treated by lateral shelf stabilizability. And this is the final X-ray. This is a good stabler cover, which is improved the, the biomechanical improved uh, the, the biomechanical uh, properties of the hip, increase the surface area, so it, uh, it reduces the incidence of osteoarthritis later on. This is a case later, a case with versus disease with. A health stage, a containment procedure is not, uh, could not be done. This is a defect in the stabler coverage. So lateral shelf stability could be done. And this is the final X-ray. It, it improves the stabler cover. It uh, increases the surface area. And it improves the remodeling of the femoral head. So the shelf stability is able to increase the coverage of the femoral head, which is, is an important for remodeling and will prevent, prevent further changes in the femoral head. This is another case, couldn't watch with, and it's a final X-ray. is a good, good stabler cover, uh, surface area increased, and remodeling of the head. Okay, so it's 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 a good option for conditions in person's disease, which is, couldn't be treated by containment procedure. And this is another case also. So an algorithm for containment procedures. This is an algorithm for containment procedure. In cases of patient under five years with Pers' disease, with, with non-surgical non -surgical containment, this is, if, if the patient needs surgery, this algorithm, a group of patients would require surgery. There is a, a group of patients in Pers' disease, uh, and, and up to 50% of cases may not require surgery. There is pain, mild pain, good range of motion, the head is not it is a good stabler covers covers. If there is no if there is no lateral extrusion and physical involvement is less than fifty percent, up to seven years, the patient has no there is no indication for any surgery because how what we need from this surgery? Surgery is indicated to improve the stabler cover. If the patient presents with pers disease with no lateral ex extrusion, physical involvement grade one or two. With good range of motion, the treatment is symptomatic. 
if the group, any group of patients is presented with lateral ex extrusion or if they involved with more than 50%, uh, it, this group will require surgical containment. So there's, this algorithm is for containment procedure. Uh, under age of five years, non-surgical containment is indicated. And the result oriented cross uh -huh. So patient require uh -huh. non-surgical uh -huh. containment. A group huh. from five to seven years, huh. like this, huh. uh, this is a person's disease with not huh. huh. a horizontally oriented cross plate. Surgical containment is uh, recommended. Huh. Under age of six years, we prefer, our, our literature prefer pelvic osteotomy. Huh. Above age of six years, we get osteotomy, huh. femoral, or pelvic, according huh. to the patient, huh. the, the surgeon preference. Uh, over seven years, up to 12 years, if the condition is presented with a fragmentation stage, surgical containment is indicated. If it presented at the healed stage, uh, a later stage with, uh, with defect in the stabular coverage, defect in stabular coverage, this means an in, in indication of a stabuloplasty. So the factors affect the outcome of worsted disease are which is very essential as a, as for the prognosis of the con any condition. The age of the patient. If the age of the patient is less than six years old, Prognosis is good for the majority of cases. Range of motion is very significant. In, in patients with good range of motion, is a, a very good prognostic factor for person's disease. Radiological uh, uh, cases with lateral pillar collapse, uh, hearing lateral pillar, is, it's, a, it's a prognostic, very significant as a prognosis. Like it is not has no role in decision making. Lateral calcification, very significant treatment to plan lateral calcifications. Or lateral extrusion is very significant in treatment plan. Subluxation or lateral extrusion is very significant in treatment plan. So lateral ex extrusion, lateral calcification, or sub subluxation is a very significant factor in treatment plan for person's disease. The extent of the necrosis at Catarel has a slight significant factor. Uh, if you come to ask how person disease could be treated at the end of this lecture, treatment of person disease depends on age of the child, stage of the disease according to Catarell, and the containment effect uh, means extru extrusion of the lateral aspect of the femoral head. Children younger than six years old can be treated without surgery, wait and see approach. Children over five years old may be treated non-surgical or surgical according to the containment effect and the stage of the disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our dear Professor Dr. Osama Bey, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will be able to work with your life and work with your life and we will be able to learn from your life and you will be able to learn from your life and you will be able to learn ونسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى ان ايديكم البيضاء والعلم اللي علمته للالاف والالاف يكون في ميزان حسنات حضرتك يا استاذنا ان شاء الله. يا رب يا رب ربنا يبارك لنا في عمر حضرتك يا استاذنا ويدي لحضرتك الصحه وطوله العمر يا استاذنا. الله احنا في رساله عندنا ان شاء الله تحضرها معانا على الاستبل بلاستي امبيرس ديزيز مدرس مساعد في كفر الشيخ والمشرف معاه برضه معانا في بنها الدكتور حسام. وهتبقى اللجنه الدكتور محمد حسني والدكتور هاني بسيوني ان شاء الله في ميعاد المناقشه هنقول لك يا ريت تحضرها معانا يا دكتور محمد يا فندم يعني. انا وجودي في اي مكان مع حضرتك شرف كبير ليا يا دكتور اسامه بيه خليك ربنا يكرمك ربنا يدي لمعاليك الصحه وطوله العمر لو لو تستاذن لو تاذن لي حضرتك في تو كويستشنز لسعادتك بعد اذن حضرتك يا استاذنا اتفضل يا محمد قيمه الدكتور علي الزواوي واتس ذا رول اوف تريبل بيلفيك اوستيوتومي ان بيرتس ديزيز A triple pelvic osteotomy could be done in, 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 not in the early ages. It could be done in the adulthood age. It needs very, very, uh, exper very experience. It's not an easy operation. It, it, uh, it's a good operation, but it, it should be done in the, in the very experienced surgery. It's not an in, 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 in everyday operation. It could be done in this plastic hip. In the old, in the old, in the old age group, not in, yeah, yani, not after, uh, yeah, yani, uh, 20, 25, uh, up to, to 40 years, could be done if there is this plastic hip was good, was good, was good. Uh, there's no arthritic changes in a mobile hip in, in a non-concentric, uh, uh, defective, uh, stabular coverage. 
of the femoral head, but it could be not, and it's not preferred to be done in the age group. In the younger age group, we can do either a shelf astigoplasty or uh, or a, a, a double a double enamel osteotomy. But shelf astigoplasty, uh, as we see in the X-rays, can perform all the all what we need for for the aim of surgery. We, we are in need for in, in, for pelvic osteotomies is to improve the stabular cover to improve the surface to mechanical advantage or biomechanical advantage to increase the surface area to improve remodeling. This could be done in the early age group. After age, after skeletal maturity, there is no role for remodeling. So if the head is, is, is concentric, the head is spherical or hemispherical with a piece as part of the head is not completely covered, uh, a number of osteotomies, either double osteotomy or triple osteotomy could be done. Triple osteotomy is, is not an easy operation. It should be done by expert surgeon. Or, or for this, it requires special instruments. It, it requires uh, orientation, good orientation. It has a lot of complications. Should, should, so it should not be done easily for, it's an easy, not, not an easy operation. Another question, sir, from Dr. Ali Zawawi. Do you do arthrography before surgery, sir? For birth disease, yani, yani, uh, the, the birth disease, uh, arthrography, what, what, what will this uh, tell us for birth disease? Birth disease, one of the, ter the, the, the terminology of birth disease is coxa magna. Coxa magna means is a large head. Birth disease is a large head with Stablum is not completely covering this large head. What arthrography will add to this? Arthrography means in cases of DDH, yes, it tells us some knowledge, but in person disease, it's, it, uh, practically speaking, what what will add for the treatment, uh, treatment algorithm, as we mentioned, treatment algorithm need uh, proper X-ray, uh, proper X-ray. In some cases, we ask for CT, 3D CT. But arthrography will, will not add any any more for treatment uh, uh, for diagnosis or treatment. If if you ask for special investigations, it should be have a target either to, to, to for diagnosis or for treatment. Arthrography will not add something for diagnosis. Plain X-rays enough. Sometimes 3D CT may may be needed. Uh, it will not add for uh, something more for treatment. Treatment here is very clear, either to conserve or to do a containment procedure. Contain procedure either pelvic or femoral or lateral shelf astigoplasty. A guide for doing these procedures is a plain X ray and sometimes a 3D CT. No role for astrography practically. Practically, maybe academically, yes, or practically, no, no role for astrography. Yes, sir. Akhuna, Dr. Jamal Qasim, be able to do this with the same way, Ustazna. دكتور مقار ابراهيم اخونا دكتور مقار ابراهيم من الجزائر كاتب كلمه جميله قوي استاذنا دكتور اسامه حجازي نعمه من نعم الله في الارض وانا طبعا ب... يعني بشكره وبصدق على الكلمه دي تماما ده حاجه ده شرف ليا والله شرف ليا يا محمد وانا انا بشكرك على حاجه يعني انت عملت وحتى الناس كلها في, في يعني دي, دي حاجه برضو يعني حاجه جميله جدا ان احنا ان انت قدرت تلم العرب وال... ومن الهند ومن يعني يعني جمعت يعني ناس كثير من كل حته وده من الحاجات اللي هي يعني كانت جميله جدا في توصيل العلم وجميله جدا بالنسبه لنا احنا كمصريين الحمد لله يعني ان احنا برضو يعني انك تبقى تحس ان العالم كله بيتواصل معاك دي حاجه جميله جدا انا بحييك عليها لان دي حاجه حقيقه يعني بقت واقع محدش يقدر ينكره بحييك عليها وربنا يزيدك خير خير وبركه ان شاء الله طول عمرنا بنتعلم من حضرتك وهنفضل نتعلم من حضرتك يا استاذنا لحد ما نموت ربنا يدي حضرتك انا, أنا عايز اتدخل عايز اتدخل واعمل دعوه انا كمان دعوه يعني ربنا يديك الصحه دكتور فاضل بيه اه استاذي ده اللي خد ايدي من الاول لل... من الاول لغايه دلوقتي هو ماسك ايدي ربنا يخليك يدي استاذنا الصحه وطول العمر يا رب Can we take can we take some questions, please, sir, or or that's enough? لا لا أنا أنا ما دي أنا عندي وقت تفضل تحت أمرك. Thank you so much, sir. Doctor Mukar from the Gazair. You prefer what kind of brace, sir? What kind of brace? Brace. Abduction brace is abduction brace. It's 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 يعني brace with with which can the both both hips in abduction. Uh, this is, uh, I will show this, this picture in the slides. I will go back to see it with him. 
this is an abduction place. Uh, yes. Just <laughs> something. It could be manufactured in, by, uh, by by this is can can it, it, the principle of space is to, to put two, two limbs in abduction and something maintaining them. It differs from cost. Cost is cost. You can do uh, above knee cost for both legs or and put the door uh, in between. This is. Couldn't be changed or brace has an advantage. It could be uh, t taken off. Patient can take it off and uh, go to bus, uh, take his bus and uh, take, uh, take off for a few hours per day. It's, it could be removed and re re reused. Uh, the, the battery cost is fixed procedure. Abduction brace could be done for the, the cooperative families, which can uh, understand if it should be used. This is an abduction brace. You can you can do uh, something like that, and uh, and to maintain the abduction, it's it's not manufactured by us. It's شركات الآلات هي شركات ال ال الأجهزة اللي هي بتصنعها يعني. طيب you can you can send picture for any factory and we will manufacture. This is an abduction brace. This is this is a battery cast. This is abduction brace. This is there, there's many different uh, kinds of abduction brace, but the principle is to make both hips, the main hip, the, the affected hip in abduction, to uh, use this. The head is go inside the stabler. It's uh, it used it used until lateral pillar or lateral part of the ribs is uh, uh, re So this is uh, you, you mentioned if you want to ask for abduction brace. You mentioned this picture to the uh, person who manufactured it and asked him to make it. It's, it's something to make, to maintain a post hips in abduction. And it's like that. Yes, okay. we, we can take um, two more questions before because we have to stick to time. Uh, Dr. Mohammed can be asked about the distraction, the uh, arthrodiastasis in the birders. We can talk about Dr. Jamal Hosni in the first فهو oh. يعني شرح الموضوع ده دكتور شادي از اسكينج اباوت رول اوف دريلينج اوف بون ان ايرلي ستيج اور ادفانسد هو الحقيقه الاستراكشن ارث اوف ستيج هو دكتور فاضل اظن ليه ليه محاضره عن الاستراكشن ارث اوف ستيج تمام يا هي دلوقتي لما نيجي نفكر فيها وات از ذا ايم اوف استراكشن ارث اوف ستيج هي كود بي دان فور تايت هيبس بيشنت فيرس ديزيز ويز ليميتد موفمنتس This limited movement means there is a tight hip. Tight hip either either a tight capsule or a large hip. If you see in my lecture, all cases the range of abduction is good. If there is a good range of motion, we mentioned the main criteria. The main criteria for decision making is the age and the range of motion. If the patient presents with a good range of motion, good range of motion means there is no tight hip. The head will move inside the stabilum without restriction. The capsule is not tight. The muscle is not stretched. So, yes. uh, what arth arthrodesis can do? Nothing can do. Uh, the, these conditions may be treated by uh, observation if the head is concentric, or by containment procedure if the head is, is outside. But if if the head is very tight, the head is very tight. Uh, capsule is tight. When the head head is large or muscles is so so tight, you cannot move the head. This is, this is one of the indications of arthrodesis. Arthrodesis could be used in condition of precious disease with, which is presented with a tight hip. Uh, there is no role to apply our uh, treatment, uh, treatment rules which mentioned here. If there is a tight hip, and if you see in, in, in all the indications of the surgical procedures I mentioned, is a good range of motion. But if this is a patient presented with a tight hip, So there is no way to treat him by uh, alternative methods. It should be treated by arthrodesis. The conditions they can it be treated by continuous traction. The arthrodesis. Uh, second indication of arthrodesis is if it could be used as يعني, in, in complicated cases. Sometimes you can if you, uh, you get some complications can occur, and we need to distract. The stations around the hip. So, arthrodesis, uh, who passes disease, and according to the recent guidelines, 
There is no second controversy. Three patients, three surgeons, uh, 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 papers uh, recommending it, and papers uh, is not recommending it. But if you can, yeah, take it from scientific point of view. Uh, in cases of mobile hip, good range of motion. Uh, no, yeah, uh, there is no uh, 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 good range of motion. Sometimes you see patients. This is very, very good, very free range of motion. Uh, what what will, what was what will actually this is will do? Uh, in the past, one of the lines of the treatment of patients disease was yani, continuous immobilization for a year. And this uh, proves it will not add the pathology of person disease is is a, is a reversible stage of go and uh, process uh, pro, yani, continuous process up up to three or four years. Uh, external factors will not affect the the the, the intrinsic pathology. Uh, but external, external factors can improve the clinical find. So, uh, person disease with recent, recent guidelines, no need for immobilization, just in cases with pain, in, in cases of pain, there is some risk with an inflammatory treatment. But in cases which is presented by tight hip, tight hip, this is no role for treatment, in the ordinary treatment, but the treatment is arthrodysthesis and it's Mentioned is that mentioned in the treatment, in the treatment uh, to call for a decision with you. Yes, I uh, this is the current treatment of person's disease. He mentioned also that hip distraction is a line of treatment, but, but not for every every case, in cases which is presented by tight hip or by complicated procedure of previous surgical techniques. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Samabi, we don't want to see you, but we have to move to the next speaker. I'm going to talk about our Dr. Saeed, who is the Dr. Dr. Osama, and all the Dr. Saeed, who is Saeed from Ethiopia. Of course, all of our friends are very happy to be here. We ask Allah to bless us in the year of our Dr. Osama, and to be able to do it in the right way. Thank you, Allah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. شكرا شاكرين يا استاذنا الغالي. Our, uh, our next speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Khaled Al Adwar. Professor Khaled will speak about uh, Alexandria University. Professor Khaled will speak about pediatric femoral neck fractures case presentation. Dr. Khaled بي يعني uh, ألف مليون سلام على الوالدتنا الغالية ونص الله سبحانه وتعالى إنه يشفيها ويعافيها يا رب. ربنا يبارك في حضرتك شكرا. حضرتك سامعني؟ سامع سعادتك يا فندم. بس المشكلة مش عارف أجوين إن مش عارف ليه. مكتوب هنا your account has been blocked uh, for 30 minutes due to reaching the maximum five failed log in attempts. فمش عارف اخش مش عارف ليه. دكتور دكتور مايكل حضرتك معانا؟ دكتور مينا؟ بحاول اخش هنا بس مش مش قادر اخش. بيقول لي بليز انتر ذا فيريفيكيشن كود. والبعث في الايميلز بعت باسكود وويبينار اي دي اقترح اقترح على حضرتك دكتور خالد لو جاي لك لينك على على انه بانل ليست هل جا لك لينك بكده؟ ايوه دوس على اللينك بس ومالكش دعوه باي حاجه ثانيه خالص اطلع ودوس على اللينك ده بس فقط لا كود ولا اي حاجه خالص ثانية واحدة يا فندم دكتور مايكل من شركة إيب هيكون معانا. اوكي. معلش أنا آسف. لا لا عفو يا فندم العفو العفو دكتور خالد بيه. أمور متوقعة دكتور خالد لا. ما دي تكنيكال بروبلمز دايما في ال في لحظة ممكن تحصل هذا على طول على طول يبقى. أنا هنا شايف دكتور فاضل بس مش عارف أعمل لوج إن. دكتور مايكل حضرتك تحت في في شاشه كده مكتوب فيها تحت شير سكرين لونها اخضر مربع كده اي حضرتك انت فاتح البرزنتيشن بتاعتك انا افتح افتحها الاول افتح وهات الصفحه كما لو كنت هتقدمها يا بص يا فاضل هو هو مكتوب هنا بروفيسور فادي مسار سكرين يعني هو ممكن دكتور فادي فتح السكرين العمل شير فمش دكتور فادي نصر اوكي 
انا فتحت انا فتحت البرزنتيشن بتاعتي كده إيه صح يا مظبوط دكتور اسامه صح يبقى كده هو ده اللي مانع ايه ده؟ ممكن نقول للدكتور شادي بس فادي يستوب شير والامور هتمشي تمام اه من عند دكتور اسامه بيه يعني تمام دكتور خالد ازيك؟ ازي سعادتك يا بيه ازي حضرتك؟ ازي صح؟ ربنا يكرمك يا خالد ازي سعادتك ازي سعادتك دكتور اسامه رئيس مجلس اداره نادي الكمبيوتر من 2005 20 <تصفيق> سنه وهو ماسك الكمبيوتر مش جديد الله يبارك في عمره من ايام ما كان بنعمل الياهو ميتنج ما كانش آه، فيه كان ياهو كنا آه. بنتكلم على ياهو ما كانش فيه بقى لازوم ولا غيره آه، سبحان الله دكتور خالد ممكن ساعتك تجرب كده يا فندم؟ حاضر انا اعمل شير سكرين اهو شير سكرين دكتور خالد السكرين بتاعتي شايفينها كده؟ أنا شغال يا دكتور خالد بيه تمام تمام ممتاز اتفضل يا فندم لا فول سكرين بس بدل ما هي كده أنا يا حاضر فول سكرين أهو لا تمام اكسلنت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تمام كده؟ تمام يا فندم تمام سعد تمام الريبن السوداء اللي تحت دي اشيلها ازاي؟ اللي مكتوب عليها نيو شير وشير سكرين وبتاع ارفعها ارفعها لفوق وهاتها على جنب يا خالد اوكي تمام كده؟ اوكي تمام يا فندم اجيبها على جنب كده اوكي تمام كده؟ هي عندنا فوق مش موجوده خالص مايكل تمام كده حبيبي تمام انا قدامي شايفها طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اوكي ليديز اند جنتلمان دير كوليجز Uh, I'm going to say good afternoon in some parts of the world, good evening in other parts of the world. I'm going to be talking about pediatric femoral neck fractures. Uh, these actually uh, are classified according to what's called the Delbert classification, where type 1, as you can see, is a trans fracture with or without dislocation from the acetabulum. Type B is a trans cervical fracture. Type 3 is a cervical, trochanteric, or a basic cervical fracture. And type 4 is a trochanteric fracture. These fractures constitute less than 1% of all pediatric fractures, so they are very rare injuries. I'm going to be discussing with you three cases. Case 1 is a four-year-old girl with global developmental delay, where she walks supported, is epileptic, and the parents gave a history of a two-week fall of her bed during a fit. So they presented two weeks after the injury. And that was the injury we can see here, a delbit type 1 fracture, transphyseal, with displacement of the distal fragment proximally. And you can see there are flecks of bone around the hip, sort of suggesting there might be heterotopic ossification. We got a CT scan done, and you can see that the epiphysis is within the joint, it is not dislocated. There are flecks of bone all around, as you can see up here, sort of down there, right? And this is the 3D image of that injury. The options of treatment are to leave well alone, which is not really an option because the patient, although having global developmental delay, she walks supported. So there's no point leaving this injury alone. You have to deal with it, attempting first to do a closed reduction and internally fix it. And if this fails, go, go ahead with an open reduction and internal fixation. Using the better maneuver, surprisingly, we were able to reduce that if it's an injury closed to an almost anatomical position, as you can see from the fluoroscopy images. And then we inserted three smooth K wires into the, uh, across the fracture and into the epiphysis. Uh, both AP and lateral have been sort of satisfactory with the wires holding well. This is a one and a half month post-op X-ray. And this is seven months post-op when the K, K wires were removed. You can see that the fracture is healed nicely. 
then anatomical position. 16 months after the first injury, an epileptic fit resulted in a buccal fracture in the supracondylar area of the left or contralateral side. And this drew the attention of the attending physician who overlooked an ipsilateral identical injury, as you can see. Unfortunately, the parents presented three months later and stress views showed that the fracture had not united. It was completely loose, probably because it is an intercapsular fracture swimming in synovial fluid, the synovial fluid probably preventing any healing. Besides, there was no immobilization for that uh, injury to heal. This is the CT scan of both hips, and you can see that the right side has healed nicely in an anatomical position, and the axial cuts show that there's no much displacement regarding the anteposterior displacement in those four cuts, although there was superior migration in the coronal cuts. Again, surprisingly, the fracture was reduced using the lead better maneuver, and two K wires were inserted, and that is the three months post closed reduction X ray. Uh, one year post op, you can see that both uh, epiphyseal injuries have healed nicely in an anatomical position with no sign of baby N. This is the patient walking with her father, supported, so she's gone back to her pre rapture status, as you can see. So there's no point to leave that in the alone. And thank God we were uh, lucky that they were both reduced dose. This is case one. 22 months post-op, you can see that both femoral heads and necks are in an anatomical position. Take home message from this case is that unlike all neglected physical injuries, Delbert type 1 injuries should be treated, even if presenting late they can be reduced anatomically by closed means and can yield good good results. Uh, the case two is a 15-year-old boy who sustained chance of that cervical fracture neck left femur Adelbert type 2 after a sudden thrust of a car wheel against his thigh. Yeah, I don't have pre-fixation uh, uh, x-rays, but these are the x-rays done immediately post-op. You can see that the Fracture has not been reduced anatomically, which is very basic in femoral neck fractures. To get a good result, you have to reduce it anatomically. And you can see that the two cancellar screws holding the fracture have got their threads across the fracture site, so providing no compression. Uh, this is a four month post op x ray, and you can see that the femoral neck has drifted into virus with almost a 30 degree difference between the left and the right side. And the CT scan showed on the agent images that the fracture is not badly displaced anteroposteriorly, or anteroposteriorly, sorry. Uh, there's a bit of a gap anteriorly, as you can see in that image. The options of treatment are very little in that age group, the best of which is to do a subtrochanteric volumous osteotomy using a 120 degree angle blade plate inserted instead of a 60 degree angle inserted at a 90 degree angle. And this affects a volumous correction 30 degrees after removal of a small lateral wedge which is inserted medially. This is the immediate post op x ray, and he was put in a hip spiker for a few weeks. You can see that the blade is not going through the epiphyseal plate in order not to arrest growth at that area. And this is an egg shaft angle three and a half months post-op, which was adjusted to 150 degrees, which is almost close to the normal side. And you can see again that the blade has not gone through the Brazil plate. This is 14 months post-op, and this is his range of abduction and external rotation. He can sit cross-legged, which is a habit in our uh, society. There's a negative trend in bird sign and full flexion of the ability to uh, squat on the ground. Again, a habit in our society. And he's got a symmetrical range of internal rotation. Case three is a 12 year old girl with an abduction stress to the left hip back in 2011. 
And you can see I don't have the plain X-ray, the AP X-ray, but the lateral X-ray shows a lytic lesion around the trochanter in the neck of the femur. And after doing a CT scan, you can see that there's a lytic lesion involving most of the femoral neck from the base to the basal plate and from superior to inferior. You can see it on both the coronal and the axial cuts. Uh, he was treated, she was treated, sorry, in another center to start with where they followed that sequence of treatment. Well, I thought the sequence of treatment should be a biopsy, reduction, bone grafting, and fixation. They actually took the biopsy, reduced it, bone, did not bone graft it, but they fixed it. And this is the immediate post-op X-ray fixation being done with three cancellular screws going through the fissile plate, as you can see. And you can see that maybe one of these screws is slightly long, maybe going through the hip. She presented to us later, 14 weeks later, where she walked full weight bearing with the limb. She had a full range of motion of the left hip and could act on these straight leg raise. But 14 weeks post-op, as you can see, the, uh, the tip of one of the screws, as I pointed earlier, is going through the hip. The lytic lesion is still there. The fracture had not united. And there's a ma massive defect in the femoral neck. So what to do next? Uh, we had to think that we have several problems here. What are the problems we have? The lesion is quite big from up down, taking all the femoral neck, going down to almost the base of the neck from the axial plate downwards. The problems we have is an osteolytic lesion in the femoral neck with a fraction on union. Uh, Coxavara with a difference of about 15 degrees. The next shaft angle, as you can see from the x-rays. The options are to remove the screws, plus bow graft and re-internally fix, or do a bulgous subtrochanteric osteotomy, plus bone grafting, plus internal fixation. And this is what we opted to do. The question was, was which approach do we use? We opted to use a Watson-Jones approach through which we can remove the screws, go to the hip to bone graft it with an iliac crest bone graft, and then do a vulgus subtrochanteric osteotomy. But the question was, if we remove the screws, the, the fracture can displace. So while the fracture was in place, we inserted a couple of K wires across the fracture site so that after removal of the screws, the fracture would not displace. And then we did our osteotomy. And as you can see, because the lytic lesion is very close to the pubsale plate, we had to use a DHS going through the pubsale plate. We did the subcontary polyps osteotomy. The biopsy showed that this is a simple bone cyst. And two months post-op, as you can see, the osteotomy and the fracture had united nicely. There is a bit of shortening of the femoral neck with collapse of the cyst. This collapse and shortening helped us to achieve union across the fracture site. Uh, she started weight bearing two weeks later. In seven and a half months post op, you can see that the area had remodeled, but there was an area of which of lysis or very chorotic area in the stricanteric and subtricanteric region, probably due to stress shielding. She was full weight bearing at the time with a mild limb and painless full range of motion. And you can see that there's an area that suggests that there might be an early AVN, which was not actually affecting her range of motion. She was doing fine. I was quite happy. The take home message from these two second cases is that pediatric pan-united delbit type 2 unsurvival fractures can be treated using a vulgar subject and terrible osteopathy with a possible good outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khaled Al Adwar. Thank you so much, sir, for this very interesting uh, case presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, if we have any questions to Professor Khaled. Uh, I, I think we, we, we have uh, no questions, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have one question. Uh, when do you uh, do open reduction, sir? 
Uh, actually, you need to do open reduction if you fail to achieve a closed reduction. This is a must. If you fail to you reduce this fracture closed, any of these fractures closed initially, you have to do an open reduction through a Watson-Jones approach and fix it from lateral course, from the lateral side, but making sure that you uh, reduce the fracture anatomically uh, by an open reduction after you fail to do a closed reduction. Uh, we, we have another question, sir. When you put graft in neglected fracture? Uh, actually, I don't use that uh, modality of treatment in the non-united ones. I always do a subtrochanteric bulge osteotomy. It works nicely in those young, young youngsters, in those children and adolescents. Yes. The last question, sir, uh, from Dr. Ale. Uh, can, you, uh, can you leave the QRs two years? Uh, it's, this is quite a long uh, period of time. I've uh, removed them around seven, eight months. Uh, so long as the fracture is fully lighted, you can remove them anytime. So I went for around seven, eight months removing KYs in both the hips with the Delbert type 1. Yes. Two years is quite yes. a long, time, long period of time. You might get bone growing over the KYs laterally. It might be difficult. You'll have to dig for them to, 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 to reach them and to break, to pick them out. Uh, sir, sir, we have um, about two, three f more questions. Can we take them or your... Uh, uh, no, answer? go ahead. Okay. Uh, another question from Dr. Romani. What about leg length discrepancy? The, the, all, all these, these three patients have no limb length discrepancy at the end of the treatment. Because, as you know, most of the growth occurs around the knee in the distant femur. There's very little growth occurring uh, at the proximal end of the femur. The volume of osteotomy does not give much length and add much length to the limb. Uh, I've not had any limb length discrepancy in these two cases. Yes. Thank God for that. Another question from Dr. Muzaffar Ahmed. Why you choose osteotomy over reopen reduction and boom graft, sir? Uh, doing a, a reopen reduction in a fracture like the neck, a permanent neck fracture, which is known to have full vascularity, full blood supply might further jeopardize the, the blood supply to the femoral head. We've seen in the second case, after doing just the volume supplementary osteotomy, just bone grafting the cyst, that we ended up with a, a mild degree of AVN. So opening up the hip again to do a, a reopen reduction or a, an open reduction maybe for the first time is quite risky in these femoral neck fracts. The trans like them. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is asking about the diameter of the pediatric DHS. Uh, actually, I use the pediatric uh, DHS. I don't actually recall the exact diameter of it, but there's a pediatric one and there's an adolescent one. And when you dial them in, you want to achieve some bulges. So the entry, uh, the angle of entry of the DHS, the 135 degree to the femur is 45 degrees. So if you add another, for example, 15 degrees to that, you, end, and you, you go in at an angle of 60, then you're achieving a bulgus of 15 degrees. If you go in at an angle of 70, you're achieving a bulgus of 25 degrees. And this is the most important point to get an X-ray of both sides so that you know what the neck shaft angle is like on the normal side so that you can mimic that on your uh, fractures. Yes, sir. Dr. al Tuhami is asking, how do you make sure the wire not to lose it? Uh, actually, uh, the first case, I put them in a hip spiker for around a month uh, to make sure they don't loosen. But the worry was when you put it in, it might be a bit long. So I inserted them in and then pulled them out a bit and bent them, bent them proud of the femur and then pushed them back again with some pliers so that I don't end up with long wires which might go into there. But they usually don't loosen. Because if the bone quality is normal, you shouldn't have any problems with loosening. Yes. And you've got three wires across. Yes. You don't have just one or two. Although the left side, I put two K wires in, but I put them in a hip spike at some time. Yes, sir. Dr. Mukar is asking about after what age you can traverse the growth plate of the head with screws of DHS? Well, uh, you've seen 
And then the second case where I did the sub uh, subsequent telephone me I had the long necks. So I was able to put the blade plate in without going through the Brazil plate. But in the second case, you've seen that the the colleagues who've done the lytic uh, the sort of pathological fracture, they've had to go through the Brazil plate because the length of the neck was very short. The proximal end of the of the of the neck was very short. They had to go through it. And when I put my DHS in, I had to go through it as well. So it depends on the length of the neck you have, where the fracture is, to see whether you will have to traverse the Brazil plate in the proximal side five meters too short, or if it's long enough so that you don't traverse the fracture side. Uh, so, so the Brazil plate. Yes, sir. The, the last question we will uh, be allowed to answer it uh, from Dr. Akram Azem. Methods of closed reduction in delbit type one, sir. Well, actually, what I used, and it was surprising to me that I you know, thank God for that, that I succeeded, is the lead better maneuver. I like the lead better maneuver, flexing the hips 90 degrees, and then adducting and internal rotating, and then come back into extension and slight external rotation. And thank God, uh, in both cases, the uh, delta type one, type 1 was reduced anatomically. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you for your participation, Professor Khalid. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. And I'm just asking for the other friends. Thank you so much. Much good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just asking for the other friends. We are Dr. Fadi Nasr Al Din. He came with us. He had a technical problem. He was just asking for the other friends. He was present his presentation. I'm just asking for Dr. Fadi, the next speaker. Dr. Fadi, are with us? Yes, we can see your presentation, sir. Dr. Fadi? Hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello? I can hear you, sir. Okay, that's very good. So, hello, everybody. I'm sorry for this, uh, what happened, some technical uh, issue with me. So, I'm back now. Yes, sir. I can't see you. Dr. Fadi? No, I can hear you. You can hear me? You can see yeah, you? we can hear you. Please, please go ahead with, the, with the, your presentation, sir. Dr. Fadi? Okay, our next speaker will be Professor Muhammad Fadil. Professor Fadil, you are ready, sir? Uh, yes, uh, my friend. Uh, Dr. Fadi is sharing. Can you please stop your share, uh, Dr. Fadi? Yes, please. Dr. Father, you can share, please, your, your presentation, sir. Our next speaker will be Professor Muhammad Fadil. Professor Fadil will speak about Perthes disease, Elizarov principles, when and how. Please, sir.
Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Bismillah uh, uh, I am pleased and honored to be uh, here with you, with my professor, uh, Professor Usama Ahgazi, my mentor. Uh, white hands for uh, myself and uh, many of our colleagues, as mentioned by my dear friend, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab. Uh, also, it is a chance to appreciate uh, the effort of Mah Dr. Mohammed Al Ashab for all this activity. Uh, which enlightened uh, uh, many days uh, uh, since Corona days. Actually, uh, alhamdulillah, that we have uh, 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 in touch with you and with other friends, especially uh, with our uh, uh, friends and colleagues, and uh, uh, also as a chance to talk and uh, keep in touch with our seniors as this uh, uh, honor to uh, share and see my professor and mentor, Professor Osama Hagazi. Uh, my talk is about Likab Pers disease, uh, the Elizaro principle, when and how. So when and how is uh, the target of our uh, uh, talk uh, to use the uh, Elizaro principles. Uh, uh, my uh, wish, best wishes for our uh, beloved the Egyptian Hospital Association and for all our members uh, of uh, more, more than maybe uh, 7,000 uh, members. Uh, I am happy to be uh, one of these elegant and uh, honored uh, association. This is uh, the Elmini University Hospital, uh, my place of work, uh, 240 kilometers south to Cairo. And uh, uh, as a start, we can say that uh, Peirce disease represents one of the most challenging pediatric health problems. I am lucky that uh, I uh, come after this panorama and this marvelous uh, uh, decision-making uh, system that had been presented by Professor Osama Hagazi. Uh, uh, it was a very uh, 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 talented uh, presentation, actually, and helped me so much to go through directly so as not to waste time in explaining what about Peirce's disease for other uh, 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 etiologies and other modalities of treatment and go it through directly uh, in this uh, minutes that permitted by uh, Professor Lasha. Uh, Peirce's disease uh, uh, was described uh, more uh, than 100 years. It is relatively common to some extent in childhood, affecting 0.8 uh, per 100,000 uh, children. But the etiology of the disease has not been established, as mentioned by Professor Osama, and there is no consensus on the optimal treatment. Uh, a story of, about uh, bears, uh, this is uh, Nono Lebez, one of those pioneers about uh, arthrodiseases that had been uh, started long time ago, maybe uh, uh, last, uh, the, uh, I think, uh, 1999, I think, or 1990, uh, in Portugal, and uh, uh, we met in Goa in a semi-meeting, and we were discussing about uh, his uh, interest about this diastasis. This was, um, I think, uh, 2008. Um, uh, yes, it is in, in India, yes, in Goa. Uh, I am honored also to share uh, my dear professor and the mentor, Professor Kamisi Deep, in one of his uh, favorite uh, subject, which is modified salt or the innominate osteotomy in the treatment of Peirce's disease in 2009 in the uh, Pan Arab Orthopedic Association, I think, or the Egyptian Hospital Association. Uh, also, he have uh, a great, uh, a great uh, job in uh, this uh, etiology, and I was lucky enough also to have uh, to share him with uh, my dear. Uh, friend Professor uh, Gamal Husni and uh, Mohamed Laklouk. And uh, uh, this is, was in another publication in uh, clinical hospital and the related research. So uh, one of our target uh, this uh, presentation is when. When to do Elizaro principles in Perth's disease and how to do it uh, in these few minutes. Uh, let also the Perth's diseases is that our target in our disease is mainly is our target mainly uh, to talk about uh, source blue the age of eight 
and associated with some headed risk signs and uh, uh, such as uh, 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 those of uh, uh, sacra, uh, some sort of uh, uh, lateral uh, lateralization uh, uh, or even uh, uh, cyst or something like this uh, uh, signs of head at risk. Out of this, we are not going through the age below eight years, but we are dealing directly so as not to frustrate ourselves in the many research dealing with this to talk about late onset person's disease older than eight years of age, which constitute about 20%. It is a, a, a good number to deal with late person's disease of cases and is known for its aggressive course, poor outcome with chronic hip pain and the stiffness. So for late onset of person's disease, older than eight years of age, arthrodysis of the hip joint was used and recommended by many authors uh, to tackle this issue. It is a one target, one principle, and different tools had been used to treat this and different techniques and also different constructs. So arthritis is well known as to stretch out through the joint, whatever the joint. Uh, the uh, arthrodiastasis means to stretch through joints. It had been known in ankle arthritis to make arthrodiastasis of the ankle joint. In the elbow joint, in cases of stiff joints, as mentioned before, and maybe also, in uh, uh, many cases of stiffness of the knee and have marvelous effect there. So the concept of hip arthrodysis is referred to ourselves as a distraction hysteresis. This theory uh, of some authors considered to be that hip distraction in person disease unloads the joint. We know that the joint is in need for unloading. So, also, this unloading negates the harmful effect of the stress on the articular surface, especially in the stage of revascularization, as we know, which may promote the sound healing of this area of necrosis. So if we can offload the joint in the, uh, the, the, uh, the process of revascularization, we can have a, a very nice contained uh, containment and contained head if we negate these stresses as we will see in this vicious circle. So uh, the distraction genesis have um, also a microvascular effect uh, which uh, uh, applied by the tension along the soft tissue surrounding the hip joint during distraction stimulate the microangiogenesis. Microangiogenesis is one of the most important things to revascularize the head. This vicious circle, which is started by anywhere, the trauma, subchondral fracture, collapse, secondary ischemic episodes, and obliteration of the musculature channels, ischemic episodes, osteonecrosis, and is a stage of revascularization as mentioned by our Professor Osama Kez. This revascular stage, stage here, if we can offload and uh, prevent this trauma to revision the circle again and stop it here, we can, this revascularization can be occur, keeping the size of the head without the secondary ischemic episodes due to secondary trauma and this vicious circle could be interrupted by the arthrodesis. This is one theory of the microvascular effect and the mechanical one related to the Elizaro principles of distraction estrogenesis. Another one is that of loading. It looks like simply the bed rest and the ambulation uh, prevention of pampillatory uh, uh, as uh, braces uh, had been mentioned uh, by Professor Samah Ghazi. So this is a mechanical effect which offload this pressure. So creating a space between bony surfaces, minimizing the mechanical stress, restoring synovial circulation, fibrous repair of the defect of the articular cartilage, intact and congruent femoral head will be issued later on. So if we have this head and uh, we didn't leave it to be compressed by 
this with bearing. If we offload it, we can give it the chance for healing for a great uh, percentage of success. So the theory of uh, Elizarov or uh, principles or arsodiastasis, whatever the, 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 the uh, apparatus will be, do either unilateral, bilateral, or Elizarov circular frame, whatever, the arsodiastasis may help in these by two uh, theories. Uh, during this uh, uh, management technique, different complications issue. It is not uh, a bread and butter. It is not uh, uh, all are very nice and simple and uh, could be uh, uh, they work uh, simply. But some patients develop pain tract infection, which not controlled by local dressing and antibiotic. This leading or losing and the pain re replacing in some cases. This cases of implant failure this cause implant failure or stress fracture may occur in some of these uh, chances group so in many instances this dismantling or this disruption of the apparatus may uh, uh, lead to uh, uh, adjustment of the frame sessions every now and then because of the loss of fixation of more or more of one or more pens contamination uh, containment of the hip joint may be lost due to this, due to this loosening if we did if we didn't uh, follow up well the containment and uh, leave lizar of apparatus to work by itself without follow up we can find that the head extruded from its containment method and so it is not a uh, correct uh, process of uh, uh, containment so we should take care of containment all over the process of is our application. The loss of the mobility of the hip joint in some instances uh, uh, need manipulation under general anesthesia and this also if we are doing manipulation under general anesthesia in many instances we are in need for adjustment of the frame again. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, rose the need for more knowledge about its indication as are such diseases, the tool or the uh, the apparatus that will be used, the construct, the technique, and the complication, especially frame readjustment and more research is, is uh, uh, needed. Uh, Kandal start uh, uh, this research in 1993 by many cases at that time. It was not for persons only. Persons use constitutes just three cases, DDH in two, uh, tuberculous uh, affection of the hip joints, chondrolysis in one, epiphysiolysis. So it was taken apart in all salvage procedures of these conditions. And he used the hinge in a monoplanar fixator. Uh, Kuka Oglo uh, used it in 1999 and used Elizaro frame in 11 cases in uh, pairs. Another Kuka Kaya uh, also used it in uh, 2000s. And in this case, uh, he has uh, different etiology. Eight cases in pairs, post traumatic in two, and the DDH again in one. He used in case in his cases, uh, Elizaro frame with articulated distraction. He used this articulation and distraction, not straight, and it is a hinge type of Elizaro frame. Uh, Maxwell, one of uh, very uh, good papers in 2004, used a hinged monolateral external fixator. Uh, also, another authors in 2007 used the monolateral external fixation, articulated distraction. And uh, uh, Ali and Amin also uh, articulated distraction for Pierce's disease itself. Nowadays, Pierce's uh, as itself alone had been uh, used, uh, uh, other cases had been used in, in cases of Pierce's disease only. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman Amir, uh, and uh, our friends, uh, Dr. Ashraf Khafour, also present uh, uh, also a very good uh, 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 paper and uh, I am honored to share uh, Professor Gamal Hosni, Professor Deeb and Professor Laklouk in 2011 uh, in clinical orthopedic and related research and also another one had been presented by Laklouk and Hosni. Uh, so also uh, continuous uh, talking about these techniques had been uh, uh, elaborated but in all 
still we have in many cases pain tract infection, loosening, pain, uh, pain replacing uh, conditions, and the implant failure, and sometimes uh, uh, stress fractures. And adjustment of the frame stress uh, this condition. So we are in need to uh, more idea to safeguard against these drawbacks, especially uh, uh, augmentation and uh, uh, looking for the other way of uh, our uh, lecture, which is when I think we now we know now to some extent when we will use arthrodesis in pers disease, and now we will look for how to do it. Um, the problem of it is that use of non-hinged distraction or articulated joint distraction or hinge technique. For non-hinged distraction, such as uh, circular frame or even articulated joint distraction by monolateral with fixed fixation of the of the uh, of the joint. Uh, there is no no uh, no more problems about using distraction without hinges. But the problem is started by using hinges. Up to the best of our knowledge, there is no comparative study between uh, uh, the effect of articulated versus non-articulated joint distraction in Pers's disease. Uh, so uh, the problem uh, started in using articulation of the joint distraction. Uh, by hinge technique as monolateral hinge replacement. Uh, uh, placement uh, is uh, uh, the basic component. We should put it exactly and the monolateral external fixator or the circular external fixator, the hinge placement is crucial site as we will see here. It should be in line or collinear with the center of the head of the femur. So it is the hinge is lateral to the center of the hip joint. This lateralization depends too much uh, 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 according to the size of the side. So we may like it to have a slim patient or if we have a, a huge side, so this is mean that uh, the center of rotation or the hinge will be away and we are uh, going for what is uh, for for a thigh such like this, it is not like slim like this. So going away from it, make this uh, hinge and this articulation going to uh, 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 a stress that make the pins up and down, uh, doing a cantilever effect with which is not uh, 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 important uh, it is it is an important issue to to prevent loosening especially in the uh, cancellous bone if the supra uh, uh, stabular uh, pin uh, not in the femoral so this loosening starts by starting a movement and this is starting a movement if we go away by the center of the hinge, we will have a cantilever effect of the chance of the suprastabular, especially suprastabular, and also the hinge will be away from this uh, center of rotation. And this is, in our uh, opinion, one of the main cause of loosening. Looking for some thing of uh, uh, cantilever effect in the biomechanics or something like this, it is exhaustive to go through it. But the problem is that we are going to use for the hip joint uh, a, a joint in one direction, flexion extension in cases of Elizarov, not as uh, the function of the hip joint, which is, as we know, ball and socket joint. It is not uh, such uh, like femur or uh, like uh, uh, ankle to do arthrodiseases without def uh, many complications. So the problem, in our opinion, is that the joint or the hip joint in need for a special issue. So we are obliged to take care of loosening of these conditions. So mechanically and the web. Biologically, we oblige the hip joint to behave as one way or a hinge joint, although it is a ball and socket joint. We are going through this again in a hurry to go for what is we recommend is to use a double hinged, multi-axial, multi-level 
fixation, not simple like this one. It is. It was. It may be worse. Well, also, but according to the size of the patient on the age of the patient. But looking for this, we should take care of uh, that uh, uh, we use a, a double hinge, not one hinge, this is hinge here, and another one go inside more, and also to use a, a mini fixation in the axis, and also multi-axial in the longitudinal one. So we have a transverse, or uh, we can call it sagittal uh, fixation, and also parallel one is, and double hinge to support this by this near to some extent to the skin and musculature may help to lessen the effect of cantilever effect and may keep the uh, suprastabular chances, which is crucial uh, in place for a long time. So the aim of uh, this study, uh, it was uh, to highlight the rational approach of treatments that aim to prevent the, de the decrease and the decrease the, the occurrence of previously mentioned complications, especially uh, that of loosening and readjustment of the frame. Uh, looking for the adjustment, whatever the adjuvant procedures, either we will use Elizarov or we'll use non-articulated arthrodiasthesis or using uh, a percutaneous or adductor tonotomy or something uh, uh, of uh, uh, abyssal drilling and some uh, uh, ideas. Uh, generally uh, speaking, uh, in a hurry, the uh, Placement of arthrostasis start uh, after uh, some uh, notes I would like to present it. Uh, pain placement, which may be supraestabular area and iliac wings or both, and the femur may be subtrochanter or the femoral diaphysis, according to the size of the patient. The center of the hinge should be in the center or collinear with the center. And this should we have, even if it is monolateral fixator, and even it is a lizard, we should have a proper positioning to allow flexion extension before going out of the operating theater. Mm -hmm. And the positioning of the patient is so important. Also, this is also the, the, the stop. If you couldn't stop it, uh, pain will exaggerate uh, the night and uh, prevent him from sleep and to do distraction. Distraction, many uh, options about this from the second day to start or the third post operative day to do it uh, 0 0.2 to uh, 25 uh, turn or four times a day or one turn a day uh, until chanton line overcorrected by one up to two or four up to five millimeters. Uh, removal of the fixator, timing of uh, uh, formulation uh, after formation of the lateral pillar is preferred. Uh, Endogenesthesia is recommended to do some gentle uh, manipulation and the operative technique in a hurry, uh, lateral or superior table. Ah, please. Ah, the time, Dr. Fadl, after this, I asked you because I was busy for a whole day. لا 15 يا فندم لا خلينا نكتب 15 لا مكتوبه <تصفيق> لا 15 يا فندم طيب خلاص لا ده انا قاريها 25 عشان كده ده انا زودت وكنت كنت قاطع 15 زودت كل ده زودته <تصفيق> لا انا قريتها 25 اسف بقى فزودت يعني هذا يعني دي حتى لو العنوان اسمه سامري اي ويل جو ان هاري ذيس از ذا كومبوننتس uh, this is interoperative connections. I'm so sorry for misunderstand this uh, message from you. I try to, to extend it after I, <laughs> I uh, find it. Uh, guide wires. This is two hinges, as we see. Application, no problem for this. We will go for this to be sure that it is good and uh, collinear with each other. And this is uh, simply go for directly to the uh, center of the head. We will go in a hurry. This is also all this I, 
I increase the uh, the slides after knowing this. We will go for this. This is important. If we note, we note that the collinearity of both hinges may give me the 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 uh, the view of, as it is one uh, hinge, not uh, uh, not two hinge. And also, uh, it is so difficult to achieve this free movement, the flexion extension, even in uh, 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 a monolateral frame. So we shouldn't go out of the uh, operating theater without achieving this. So this is uh, our opinion about this uh, multi-level, multi-distraction uh, and the message. This is some cases that had been presented before. Uh, this is a clinical case. Post-operative. Another cases. As a conclusion, I would like to go for the conclusion. In case of person's diseases and selected group of patients, if the arthritis disease is indicated where poor results are expected from conventional treatment, it is not in a simple or a, 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 a possibility of I have a conventional surgery. If there is out of conventional surgery, or we suspect that the result is with, it is not acceptable, hip distraction by Elizabeth external texture is a reliable management procedures for decreasing the post-operative loosening and the frame modification, which is a very bad complications of Elizabeth in arthrodiseases, a double hinged double or multi-axial, multi-level uh, uh, option, of Elizabeth application is uh, a method of treat. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Shukran Gazirian Ustaz Nalfad and Chakrini Van. We will move to the I next. I repeat question. my uh, apology because uh, uh, I misunderstand your message. Actually, actually, I prepare it for just 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. I'm so sorry. And I read the right. message. Uh, and I very quick. Shukran Gazirian. Uh, our next and speaker. Thank you that Ustaz. you give me the note. So, question I could tell you in a bit. Shukran Gazilan, your Ustaz. Our next speaker will be Ashish. Professor uh, Mahmoud Al Rusasi. Professor Al Rusasi will speak about the outcome of closed reduction of late presenting DDH. Professor Rusasi, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran, Turre Ashab. Congratulations for this uh, excellent organization and the uh, uh, executement of this uh, magnificent meeting. Uh, I'm honored to present my talk about the outcome and the predictors of successful closed reduction of late presented DDH in children under the age of three years. ممكن تخليها فول سكرين يا دكتور محمود ده تمام كده كده جميل لا جميل تسلم انا محمود الرصاصي بروفيسور اوف اورثوبيدك سيرجري طنطا يونيفرستي ذا بروبلم اوف دي دي اتش ان ديفلوبينج كانتري از ذات وي دو نوت هاف ا روتين نيونيتر سكريننج فور دي دي اتش ذاتس واي ذا تشيلدرن يوجوالي بريزنت After late after walking, usually uh, after the age of one year, sometimes uh, older than this. And so we have a long, very long waiting list in the university hostels waiting for surgery. On the other hand, surgery for DDH is uh, uh, fraught with uh, several complications. The amongst or the most important is a vascular necrosis and the proximal femoral growth disturbance which is almost a variably inevitable consequence of any treatment approach, whether conservative or surgical. A literature review revealed several published articles on a large series about the closed reduction of DDH in children under up to the age of uh, three years 
and several authors have attempted the closed reduction in children with and they reported spontaneous improvement of the acetabulum after closed reduction and this comes in contrary to the statement of Salter that he said that after the age of 18 months the remodeling of the acetabulum is not sufficient and uh, pelvic osteotomy is a must if we are going if we are willing to have a well developed acetabulum uh, a very interesting literature review about the closed reduction for developmental dysplasia of the head the most authors reported a success rate more than 90 percent uh, about nine percent of the hips failed reduction the uh, development of avn in cases treated by closed reduction ranged around uh, 25 percent and uh, interestingly, in a published study about the effect of hip abduction on the development of AVN, they found that uh, by MRI studies, post-operative, uh, post-closed reduction, they found that up to 60, per 60 degrees of abduction did not affect the perfusion of the femoral head. That's why it is necessary to establish a definitive success, uh, success and the complication rates for clo following closed reduction for DDH. Actually, this will hasten the, the, the sequence or the, the treatment of the cases of DDH, and the surgery would be reserved only for the non-reducible hips. We, in the past six years, we have performed a prospective study um, the, which included about 30 children who had DDH and diagnosed after the age of one year. Bilateral dislocation was present in about 18 cases. So we had 36 hips and unilateral hips on 12 cases, a total of 48 hips. The children aged from 9 to 26 months at the time of our treatment, only we treated only idiopathic DDH and we executed the teratologic and the paralytic cases. The method of reduction of or closed reduction of the hip, the child or uh, the procedure was performed under general anesthesia. A uh, percutaneous adductor tonotomy was performed. We can see here, this child on the left side is dislocated. We can see the limitation of abduction of the hip and the prominent adductor tendons. We did percutaneous release of the abductor tendons and under image intensifier uh, the gentle closed reduction was performed by pulling the the uh, femur and then abduction with gentle pressure on the greater trochanter to relocate the femoral head and uh, very important to avoid excessive abduction of the head at this point we will be faced by one of three scenarios the first scenario is the hip which is reducible and stable. Then we will proceed with closed reduction. The other two scenarios, the hip may be reducible but unstable, then there must be a hinder or the very deficient acetabulum. And uh, the, others, the third scenario is the hip which is not reducible after a doctor tonotomy, we try closed reduction, but it is, does not reduce. Then, if the hip is reducible but unstable or not reducible, then we will proceed for open reduction in a standard manner. If the hip is reducible and stable, then we will check the reduction under image intensifier. We, uh, we do not you do uh, arthrography. We uh, uh, the image intensifier and testing the abduction, the, the reduction manually is enough in most cases. And then we apply the human spike, the hip spike, bilateral hip spike in the human position, which is flexion 90 degrees, abduction up to 60 degrees, and external rotation. We do post-reduction CT scan to ensure the uh, good reduction and the containment of the head in the, within the acetabulum. The post-operative immobilization we adopt the three by three protocol. Three month total of three month immobilization. The first three month in a hip spike continuous. 
And the second three months, we use a rigid hip abduction brace, 23 hours per day for three months. The third three months, the rigid hip abduction brace is used by night time only and removed by daytime to allow the child mobilization and to stand up and walk. And this is a case of uh, left hip uh, dislocation in a child. She was uh, 20 months old at that uh, that age. We did abductor tonotomy, closed reduction. Please notice here in the uh, uh, the media post reduction X-ray how the acetabulum was dysplastic, and in the following X-rays and the follow up, you can see here the development of the acetabulum and the formation and documentation reduction. And this is a child at, at the age of six years. The uh, femoral head is uh, uh, well developed, no evidence of AVN. The stabulum is developed very nicely and the excellent range of motion of the hip joint. We were successful to reduce the hip closed in 87%, almost 88% of cases. In five cases, Close the reduction was possible but unstable. The hip reducible but unstable, then we converted to open reduction. A redislocation after one week occurred in one case, and AVN occurred in about 14 cases. AVN of variable degrees, the uh, about 29%. The predictors of successful closed reduction, because this is very important, and the counts, initial counseling and discussion with the parents of the child, are we going to do closed reduction and that's enough? Or we are go going to test the try closed reduction and if it failed, we will proceed to uh, open reduction. This question, the answer to this question is very important. And the predictors of a successful closed reduction in our experience have been first, a low station head like in this case, high dislocated hip is more liable, is more prone to not to re uh, dis uh, relocate easily. A well developed acetabulum like in this case, indicated by a good acetabulum index despite this plastic, indicates uh, and uh, predicts a good or successful closed reduction. Another important test is the telescoping test or pistoning test. Pistoning means you stabilize the pelvis and pull the femur up and the axial distraction and the compression. In some cases, even while the child is awake, you can even relocate the hip. So if the telescoping test is positive, this means that there's a great chance that the hip will be relocated. Another important point is a tight adductor muscles. If in examination, you found that adductors are very tight, this means that if you do percutaneous adductor tonotomy, there is a great chance that the hip will relocate. This is another uh, case. A very important uh, post-reduction uh, X-ray sign we have noticed in our cases is the lateral ossification. Please notice here the red arrow pointing to the lateral ossification. We have seen this in the successful in the cases of successful closed reduction. And this is the fairest sign of the remodeling and the development of the acetabulum. And this indicates that that closed reduction will be successful. Uh, the, uh, we talked about the complication of closed reduction, the AVN and the proximal femoral growth disturbance. If the, uh, the cases which had uh, uh, developed AVN, these are the cases who had residual dysplasia of the acetabulum. This is a child who did closed reduction at the age of 20 months. Unfortunately, she developed an evidence. There is an evidence of AVN. You can see here. 10 months post-operative and three years post-operative. We can see the evidence of AVN. The cases who developed AVN are the cases which failed to model or develop the acetabulum. And these children developed the residual acetabular dysplasia, like in this child, despite an excellent good range, or uh, excellent range of hip motion. The child walking very uh, nicely, no limping. The head is reduced but there is evidence of coxa magna, coxa brevia, and residual acetabular dysplasia. 
we inform the parents that if that child uh, develops a residual established dysplasia but maintain the red hip reduction, then at the age of four to five years, we have to do an augmentation acetabuloplasty to be- prevent the development of uh, premature osteoarthritis of the hip due to acetabular dysplasia. The augmentation acetabuloplasty, we do the normal demodified DEGA and uh, pelvic osteotomy. But instead of inserting a small triangles of bone graft, we intentionally harvest a long, very long, a triangle and insert the part of the triangle inside the osteotomy and leave part of it outside like a shelf. It's so we call it the augmentation acetabuloplasty. Two cocaine art or T cover the oxa magna or the large femoral head. From our study, the future directions and the research is going now in our department, we adopted the technique of closed capsule reduction plus or minus pelvic osteotomy. A closed capsule reduction is a very important concept because we have noticed that just opening the capsule of the hip joint is a risk factor for the development of AVN. We believe that the addition of iliopsoas release at the pelvic brim, preferably by endoscopy, would increase the number of the cases of successful closed reduction. That's why recently we are working on the arthroscopic assisted closed reduction of the hip plus or minus pelvic osteotomy in cases of unstable reduction. For the cases of residual acetabular dysplasia, we recommend augmentation acetabuloplasty as I described. Formal open reduction for, should be reserved only for cases of non-reducible hips and teratologic dislocations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mahmoud, for this very interesting talk. Shukran kaziran ustaz now here. Yani ana udami ala al question and answers. It dawat la hadrita kya Dr. Mahmoud di. Na rabbina ibarik fa hadrita. Allah yikhan. Allah yikhan. Shukran kaziran. Rabbina ibarik fa hadrita kifan. I don't see any questions, so I will have to move to the next speaker. Next speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Wael Nassar, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Shams University. Professor Wael will speak about pediatric sports hip problems. Professor Wael. Assalamu alaikum. 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 Assalamu alaik
Injuries to the hip and groin may account for up to quarter of injuries seen in athletic children and may be acute or chronic, may be due to osseous causes, cartilaginous injuries, ligamentous injuries, muscular injuries, or uh, different mixes of these injuries. Adolescent hip pain often strikes young athletes with structural abnormalities sooner than their less active counterparts due to the stress their level of activities places on the hip, which might otherwise present later or never. Sometimes uh, children or pre-adolescents with mild form of birthies or mild form of dysplasia never come to the orthopedic uh, clinic, but once they start to participate in regular sports activities and sports training, they start to complain hip pain, which may be the first clue of a more serious problem they have in their hips. An occasional ache in the groin or hip may not be something about which parents or young athletes should be concerned, but chronic or repeated pain that does not improve should be evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon who sees hip problems uh, on a daily basis. Also, the increased use of point-of-care ultrasound in orthopedic clinics has helped to provide timely and accurate diagnosis and, uh, and some guided treatment measures. Uh, we have to take care and uh, not to forget the differential diagnosis of hip pain, that it could be true hip pain or radiating or referred pain. If related to passive movement, especially in rotation, it's most probably related to hip pathology, but if not, all possibilities are equally valid. Sometimes it may be coming from the abdomen, may be coming from the back, may be coming from the inguinal lymph nodes, etc. Knee pathology that may be referred or uh, presented as hip pain may relate most commonly to the patellofemoral problems, uh, may be related to spine problems, may be related to non-orthopedic problems like appendicitis or iliac uh, adenitis or inguinal lymphadenitis, colitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, complicated ovarian cyst. I have seen a couple of cases coming to my clinic complaining of hip pain, and they are, um, uh, I was the third or fourth consultant they are coming to take the, uh, the, uh, the opinion of, and both of them, when I sent to my colleague for ultrasound examination, both of them are proved to be edic lymphadenitis, which completely cleared after short course of antibiotics systemically and anti-inflammatory locally. An increasing number of children are taking up sports activities and at more competitive levels for this reason, radiologists should, expe should expect to receive greater number of requests from their orthopedic colleagues to image the athletic child who present with hip or groin pain. And as I mentioned before, developing the experience of uh, ultrasound in the clinic is very important in cutting this dilemma short. The first uh, item that we are going through is the transient cervitis which may be a separate entity or may be the first step in a more serious disease like Barthes disease or slip the capital femoral epiphysis. It's a common cause of hip pain that causes limping and pain after sitting for a long time. It may be occasional self-limiting or the first red signal for a more serious problem like Barthes disease. So what to do with patient with presenting with pain and ultrasound is coming with the diagnosis of transient synovitis. We just do the three R. We do rests, we do reassurance, and we do repeated assessment, whether clinically or combined with ultrasound, which is better. Snapping hip syndrome is a term used to describe a cluster of symptoms that can develop when one of three possible, possible scenarios occur. It may be something related to the tibial band that runs along the outside the leg from the hip to the knee, and proximal tibia, which snaps over the outside of the thigh, especially at the area of the greater trochanter. Or... When the deep hip flexor muscle that forms part of the quadriceps uh, snap over the front of the hip or sometimes the iliopsoas. Lastly, when there are tears of the cartilage or labrum or fascia around the hip socket, and this may be the first clue that gives us the suggestion that the patient may have a, a minor form of phi or acetabular impingement. Muscle strains and or contusions or pulled muscle occurs when a muscle is overstretched or torn in athletes, this type of injury is common in hip and groin area due to fatigue, overuse, or improper use of muscle. The failure to warm up before exercises also contribute to this problem. Or uh, let's say that non-professional uh, trainers that uh, deal with the younger children are a very common cause of such injuries. Erectus femoris strain, which symptomize as a pain sharp in front of the hip in the groin, usually while is doing some explosive activities like short sprinting, 
Uh, it's followed by swelling and bruising in some cases with pain when lifting the knee up against the resistance. It may be muscle injury or maybe avulsion injury from the acetabulum, unable to contract the muscle if complete rupture has occurred, the lump may be felt due to recoil and building up of the proximal muscle. Strains or muscle injuries need rest, stop the activities that cause pain, ice in the area for 20 minutes every three to four hours for two to three days and re-evaluation, re take pain medication if needed for pain, over-the-counter medications such as ibuprofen, naproxen, selective COX-2 inhibitors if the age group allows, or acetaminophen can be used. In severe cases, stretch and strength of hip flexor muscles can be, uh, can be helped by the physiotherapy uh, by uh, acting on the muscles surrounding them and supporting the area, guide the patient in increasing activity level so they can return to former activities. We have very promising results for use early use of PRB injection in the first 48 hours of injury. And this gives very good results because they stimulate formation of repair tissues to go to muscle uh, bundles rather than fibrous tissue. And it gives good results in uh, injury site and to, uh, in returning to the pre-injury activity level. For cases of tears or ruptures, surgery may be deemed necessary in order to repair or attach the torn tendon. Also, some trials of PRB assistance of this repair or stem cells have a variable results. Here, the repair mainly is by osteosutures or suture anchor rather than by classic osteosynthesis. Hamstring is very important and very common. Tears, especially in those not having enough time for warming up, there is overstretching and there is pain maybe in the back of the thigh maybe in the back of the knee, maybe in the lower uh, lower back. Hamstring injury is really rather common, but in most cases, the problem clears up quickly and the injured person is able to return to normal activities after a short period of rest. However, not all injuries are alike. There are situations where medical care and longer recovery periods are required. It can be primary or secondary or repeated. In primary cases, Poor timing coordination in the hamstring during the switch between the leg recovery and initial leg approach, such as in the swing phase of sprinting, and lack of strength and stiffness in the hamstring during contact with the ground while running. And this is uh, common in uh, in uh, gumbas and common in al uh, al Secondary overstriding or pelvic control when running and proper warm up to prepare the hamstring muscles for force. In appropriate training loads, such as high-speed work done late in the workup, fatigue, lower back problems, or playing on the surface that are slippery, which is very common in our playgrounds. This is the different image pictures of such injury, ultrasound pictures on the left side, MRI pictures on the right side. Uh, in the first uh, picture, there is injury and the insertion, second picture injury in the muscle belly, and third picture injury at the attachments, maybe avulsion fracture. This is the classification of different hamstrings, hamstring strains, which may be at the myofascial level or musculotendinous level or intratendinous. Each one of these can be classified in from zero up to four degrees, which is up to the fourth grade, which is the complete pair of muscle that may in professional athletes or semi-professional athletes require surgical intervention. Treatment according to the stage with grade one mild pain and tightness, short period of rest, followed by gradual return to sports. Grade two, there is pain swelling, limp, tenderness, this longer period of rest, which may be two to three weeks with physiotherapy, quadriceps, uh, quite questionable rule of PRP injection, very beneficial if given early, useless if given after the fifth day, and there is gradual return to sports with protection, kinesio taping in the first three months after 10 to pre-injury activities is very important and very protective. Grade three, there is severe injury, severe pain with the swelling and the chemosis, Secondary ability to walk without aid, without aid, surgical intervention may be required, as I told you, maybe by osteosuture or my suture anchor. Here, this osteitis pubis, which is the inflammation of the pubic symphysis, the joint of the two, the joint of the two major pelvic bones at the front of the pelvic bone, the osteitis pubis is thought to be due to the repetitive pull of muscle over the front of hip joints. The condition is often seen in long distance runners, soccer players, hockey players, and take long stride over uh, prolonged periods of time. Stress fracture, very common, because it results from repetitive microtrauma over a period of time and may affect normal bone, which is fatigue fracture, or abnormal bone in the form of insufficiency fracture. 
In the context of sports injuries, fatigue fracture prevails and up to 90% of these affects the lower extremities, especially the hip. Picking up a new sport and or suddenly increasing the intensity of sporting activity may be both predisposing to stress fracture, especially before a championship. This is picture MRI of stress fracture. When once, once whatever you are in doubt or suspecting, please do MRI for this to exclude stress fracture, which may be if diagnosed, if misdiagnosed or missed, may develop to classic fracture that wants and warrants internal fixation. The diagnosis of stress fracture is important because if left untreated, a threat returns to sports activity before healing is complete, they may be progressive, progress to delayed union or even non-union and lead to significant morbidity. So the structure of the pubic MRI are classic, seen in long distance runners. MRI has sensitivity ranging from 96 to 100% and specificity of 100% and therefore is the image of choice for such injuries. There is what's known as female athletic triad, which is uh, amenorrhea and anxiety with uh, uh, osteomalacia and anxiety, amenorrhea and uh, osteomalacia. Sometimes anxiety is, is replaced by uh, anorexia. There is decreased hormonal density and is relatively common among young women participating in sports. The main goal of treatment of young female athletes with this triad is the natural return to menses as well as enhancement of bone mineral dynasty. While no specific drug intervention has been known to consistently improve bone mineral dynasty in this patient population, but of course, vitamin D has a variable rule and there is valuable uh, results in the literature about it. Maximizing energy availability and optimizing vitamin D and calcium intake are recommended. Alex fine avulsions, there is the results from indirect trauma usually caused by sudden forceful contraction of sartorius or tensor fasciata occurs during hip extension, sprinting or swinging in baseball bait. It may be anterior superior X spine or anterior inferior X spine. This is the picture of an uh, anterior superior X spine, which may be easily missed. This is the picture of the anterior inferior X spine. And this is the CT scan in doubtful cases. This is the anterior inferior X spine. It's an abfusial abulsion injury seen in adolescent athletes as a result of eccentric contraction of the rectus femoris. As we said before, diagnosis is made with pelvic radiography that shows abulsion treatment, non-operative in minimally displaced or incomplete cases, but may be operative in older uh, children and pre-adolescents or long uh, the area of displacement. This is the treatment, RICE group, uh, RICE uh, protocol and uh, over reduction internal fixation if abulsion fracture or the displacement is more than three centimeters. Otherwise, painful non-union may hinder and uh, forces the child to change his career. Differential diagnosis we have, hip dysplasia, leg calvis versus disease, slip the capital femoral epiphysis. <coughs> Impingement syndrome, the various impingement syndromes about the hip include femoroacetabular impingement, anterior inferior iliac spine impingement, ischiofemoral impingement, iliopsoas impingement. Many of this will be covered in the next presentation with hip arthroscopy group. This is uh, brief uh, pictures of the CAM and tensor uh, pathologies of the FI syndrome. And this is X ray, MRI, intraarthroscopic views. This will be covered in details in the next presentation and next session. Labral reconstruction after osteoplasty, labral tears, small for debridement, large for repair. Sports that require regular rotation of the hips like golf, soccer, hockey, and ballet increase the risk. So do uh, running and sprinting. 75% of cases of torn acetabular labrum have no known direct cause. Labral tears of the hip are more common in women. Most common associated lesion with labral tears in athletes is chondral lesion, which are usually adjacent to the liberal pathology, chondromalacia, thinning of the cartilage, delamination of the cartilage or chondral flap tears, full thickness chondral injury with exposed bone, lateral impaction injuries seen with football players, combined ligament anterior tear is not uncommon. This is mainly important for prognosis and uh, follow up discussion with the parents if this child will return to sports or not. MRI is very good, MRI ultrasound gives very good results, all the standard for diagnosis and for treatment arthroscopy.
this is different pictures for uh, labral tears and the left one is with ligamentum teres avulsion and this is the ultrasound picture and MRA picture. I will leave the management in details for my colleagues in the next session. And this is just a picture of the uh, interarthroscopic finding. Traumatic subluxation or dislocation of the hip is very rare but very serious uh, uh, where uh, uh, the ball leaves the socket and it should be not overlooked. Sports hernia or athletic pubalgia is a painful soft tissue injury that occurs in groin area. It's a problem commonly seen in hockey players but can occur in other sports that require repetitive twisting. The problem is thought to be due to an imbalance of the strong muscles at the thigh, relatively uh, weaker muscles of the up. The uh, first aid is rice and non steroid anti inflammatory. Classic treatment is by, uh, uh, in severe cases, by open surgery or laparoscopic surgery with the help of general surgery. Other than sports related pathology, this is my last slide incidental pathology presenting with groin pain may be skeletal infection, tumors extraskeletal, related to bowel, genitourinary system, careful evaluation of the clinical data and history is very important, and MR images is always warranted. Take home message, young athletes are not simply minimized adult athletes. Social and emotional factors are different and important. Uh, window of opportunity is narrow. Remodeling is marvelous. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Wael, for this very interesting talk. We have two questions, two main questions. Prof uh, Dr. Ali is asking about the PRP injection, platelet rich plasma. Of course, this is a very, very uh, important uh, subject, but it's it's a huge subject. Uh, uh, you we want conducted a thesis. Uh, we conduct yes, we conducted a master thesis about this issue yes. uh, and con with the control groups. And the results that we uh, end in is that early injection of PRB in the first 48 hours is very beneficial in muscle injuries and in abulsion injuries, especially if helped with drugs that uh, decrease the fibrosis like Lucertan or uh, whatever, alpha chemotrypsin or Ambizim, something like this. And the follow-up ultrasound shows that the healing tissue and the MRI also shows that the healing tissue with the PRB group is mainly muscle fibers, while the healing tissue in the control group, with this, which is not received PRB injection, is mainly by fibrous tissue. Uh, it's not like uh, PRB injection in osteoarthritis or in some other results that lack evidence, but for the muscle injuries, especially in the early 48 hours, it has very good results. Yes. Uh, the second question from Dr. Gamal Kasim is asking, is ultrasound is enough as emergency maneuver for diagnosing acute hip injuries, including physial injuries? Uh, it's first aid. We mean that we, ha we are segregating the patients, whether he needs to do further investigation and will go to the hospital to do MRI, or he will just follow up and re reassured for two to three days. So it's used mainly as a, a filtering procedure or first aid measure just to, se to segregate the two groups of patients, high risk or low risk. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Professor Wael, for this very interesting talk. وفعلا هو اكسترا اوردينري توك يعني انه مش مش بمجال حضرتك يعني بس يو ار تراينج تو ستيك يور تو يور سب سبيشاليتي سير ثانك يو سو ماتش سير اور نيكست سبيكر ويل بي بروفيسور مازن سمير منصوره منصوره يونيفرستي بروفيسور مازن ويل سبيك اباوت ريكونستراكتيف هيب سيرجري ان تشيلدرن ويز سباستيك سيريبرال بولسي بروفيسور مازن بروفيسور مازن السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته أستاذنا أهلا بك دكتور مازن بيه. أهلا أهلا بحضرتك أستاذ أهلا بك. Thank you very much بروفيسور شهاب for inviting me for this uh, fruitful meeting. Um, and thank you for inviting me and thank you all. I'm trying to share my. Uh, okay. Yes sir. Full screen please sir. Yeah. Is that okay now? Yes sir. Full screen please sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I already did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my dear colleagues and uh, professors, I am now talking about uh, reconstructive hip surgeon children with spastic cerebral uh, palsy. I will discuss um, also anatomy of uh, CB hip, hip surveillance um, in CB states indication for virus derotation and or pelvic stratomy enumerate complications of hip 
reconstruction uh, surgery, and finally, I will present uh, some uh, cases. Uh, head displacement is the second most common musculoskeletal deformity in CB after requiring us a deformity of the ankle. Severe hip displacement reduces the quality of life, especially in non-ambulatory uh, CB children. Children with CB uh, are born with uh, normal hip joint. However, spasticity and the contracture of the adductor and iliopsoas muscle, muscles cause osseous changes in the femur and the stabulum, leading eventually to posterolateral hip subluxation or dislocation. Uh, femur abnormality in the spastic hip include increased femoral antiversion and coxavara, while stabular abnormalities are uh, high uh, stabular index and posterolateral stabular uh, deficiency. Hip displacement as a result of abnormality in proximal femoral growth is now considered not only due to spastic muscle contraction, but also due to lack of functional ambulation and weak hip abductors and extensors. In CB children, the femoral neck antiversion is normal at birth and is increased stepwise from level one to level five gross motor function classification scale. And the neck shaft angle is also increased in cerebral palsy. However, the, radiolog the radiographic appearance may be faulty, accentuated due to increased uh, antiversion. In early childhood, uh, early, uh, in early childhood, hip uh, displacement is usually silent, and the rate of increased in migration percentage, uh, migration percentage is between six to twelve per year for children with level five gross motor function level. Incidence of hip subluxation increase gradually and stepwise with increase of the functional impairment as defined by gross motor function classification system rising from zero up to at level one up to 90 percent at level five with is non-ambulatory children passive hip abduction in extension of more than 30 degree is associated with increased risk of hip subluxation and difficulty in uh, perineal care However, progressive abduction, contracture, leg length discrepancy, or even asymptomatic, uh, asymmetrical appearance of the thigh may increase the clinician sub suspicion for hip pathology. Migration percentage and the stabular index are two hip radiological parameters that are most commonly measured in CD children. CT scan can help in pre operative assessment of CB hips prior to reconstructive hip surgery. There is an interaction between hip surveillance and option for preventive and reconstructive surgery with the goal of avoiding salvage surgery and reaching skeletal maturity with good help, uh, hip health. The second figure here shows the management pathway of a girl with gross motor function level four who had multiple intervention of hip surgery over 13 year period. She got first botox injection and pacing and then two years later undergo muscle lengthening and then four years later she undergo bony reconstruction and then at the age of 11, done another bone reconstruction, and one year later, she got scoliosis correction. And here come the importance of hip surveillance in CB hip. The goal of reconstructive hip surgery is to provide a painless, mobile, well located hip. Reconstructive hip surgery include osseous procedures on the femoral and the acetabular side. And the incompletely dislocated hip, hip capsulotomy may be needed to achieve reduction. Femoral side procedures are almost always performed at the type of hip reconstruction, but acetabular reconstruction is indicated only if there is acetabular dysplasia. 
As regards the ideal age for reconstructive hip surgery, uh, these surgery are indicated for children above the age of six years with migration percentage more than 40%. And it should be considered in children less than six years if complete hip dislocation is present. Virus derotation of total aimed at correction of coxa vulga and increased femoral antiviral. A doctor saw what release surgery is done at the same setting, shortening of the bone while doing virus derotation of strotomy, and we call it virus derotation uh, shortening of strotomy, create a relative lengthening of spastic muscle across the hip joint, and this is an uh, advantage while you are doing the virus derotation of strotomy. We can fix the ostrotomy either with a bleed blade or a looking blade with a blend to have a final neck shaft angle of 90 degree to 100 degree for non-ambulatory children and uh, 120 degree for ambulatory children. When a stage femoral and acetabular uh, osteotomy should be strongly considered in young children, especially non-ambulatory CB children. Miller performed a stabler uh, procedure uh, on children with migration percentage more than 60%, and also in children who have both migration percentage more than 40 and the stabler index more than 25. Results from a uh, Boston Children Hospital showed that overall revision rate after virus rotation astrotomy is 37%. And the recurrence is seen when the reconstruction is performed earlier than six years of age, and particularly in non-ambulatory children. Also, lower annual surgical hip volume were reported to correlate with the increased risk of uh, failure. Hip reconstructive procedures typically result in satisfactory outcome in children with CB, as shown by different authors. Complication of uh, reconstructive hip surgery are reported to occur up to 25% of CB children. The cubitus ulcer and the fractures is, are most uh, likely related to post-operative casting. And so casting is not recommended by many, many surgeons when rigid fixation is achieved. A vascular head necrosis also, is also reported up to uh, um, 11% of patients, and this, that's why some surgeons prefer to do femoral shortening during virus osteotomy to decrease the rate of this uh, complication. The trobocotification also reported as a complication following reconstructive hip surgery. Um, in our institute, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University, two years ago, we started any diseases with the aim to report early results of reconstructive hip surgery, including proximal virus derotation osteotomy alone, or in combination with pelvic osteotomy and or open reduction in non-ambulatory children with spastic cerebral uh, palsy. Uh, we performed both femoral and the pelvic osteotomies under image intensifier. Femoral osteotomy was fixed with a, a BD lock plate in all uh, cases. Um, we will present our cases. The first case was um, a five year old girl with spastic cerebral palsy. Um, quadruple, quadriplegic, non-ambulatory, showing left hip subluxation with migration percentage of 95% and a subular index of 45. This is after doing virus derotation osteotomy, um, giga osteotomy, and adductor psoas release. Radiological parameters improved the following uh, hip, resurface, uh, hip reconstructive surgery with uh, migration percentage is now zero and a stabular index of 32. After one year follow-up, the migration percentage 
is increasing, but the hip is still contained. Second case, six-year-old boy with his best cerebral palsy, quadriplegic, non-ambulatory, showing left hip subluxation with migration percentage of 62 and a stabular index of 36. Also, we did for him virus rotation, short finger strotomy, giga strotomy, adductor saw release. And this is six months follow up. Radiological parameter improved with migration percentage zero and stabular index of 25 uh, degree. Third case, third case, a year, five year old girl with spastic cerebral palsy, quadriplegic, non ambulatory, showing complete right hip dislocation and the stabular index of 25 degree. This is after doing virus derotation, shortening of strotomy and adductor release. We didn't do for her. Uh, we didn't do DIGA ostrotomy. However, she got a uh, femur fracture six months after uh, the surgery, and she underwent fixation used locked plate. And now this is her last uh, X-ray we have up to now, six months after last fixation, and with migration percentage of 35, and we will do close for up of hair. So finally, take home message, hip displacement is the second most common musculoskeletal uh, uh, musculoskeletal um, <laughs> musculoskeletal problem in children with cerebral palsy. Severe hip displacement reduces the quality of life in children, especially non-ambulatory children. Reconstructive hip procedures are indicated for children above the age of six years with migration percentage more than 40%. One stage femoral and stabular strotomy typically result in good outcome in children with ACB. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mazin Samir, for this uh, interesting talk. We have uh, just one question, sir. Uh, so, as tendon, do you prefer release or lengthening? Um, actually, I, I'm just doing a release of it. We, I, I didn't do lengthening. And sometimes when I'm doing the... Uh, uh, when I do shortening of the femur itself, I go, I sometimes try to go making the osteotomy, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, making the osteotomy, I didn't remove a wedge. So when I, I make a osteotomy, I just try to elevate the uh, iliosoas from the uh, lesser trochanter itself. Yes, sir. Another question, sir, uh, from Dr. Mukar. When you open the capsule for reduction? Up till now, up till now, I did not do it. Uh, do that. Uh, we all the cases was reduced while doing uh, virus derotation osteotomy and the adductor release. We didn't need up till now to open the capsule, but we bought it in our mind in every case. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, uh, and thank, thank you. you for your participation, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker will be a uh, Professor Mohammed Laklouk from Minya University. Uh, Professor Laclouk will speak about a very interesting subject, S-shaped capsulotomy in DDH, wide exposure of the hip joint and hip layer capsulography. Uh, Professor Mazen, would you please stop sharing, please, sir? Yes, I, I will do that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, Dr. Muhammad. الاول بنشكر سعادتك على المجهود الغير عادي ده والصبر على المجهود ده ربنا يكرمك بيه ويجزيك خير ان شاء الله ربنا يبارك في حضرتك يا استاذ الصوره واضحه كده واضحه يا فندم يس سر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هنتكلم النهارده ان شاء الله اس شيبد كابسيلوتومي ان سيرجيكال تريتمنت اوف دي دي اتش. ات جيف ا وايد اكسبوجر اوف هيب جوينت اند دبل لاير كابسيلوتومي. ذا ستابيلتي اوف ذا هيب جوينت افتر اوبر ريدكشن ديبند مينلي اون اديكوت ريموفال اوف سوفت تيشي اوبستكت. We can see this as a soft tissue obstacle like the limbus and the ligamentum teres, uh, tendon of iliosoas and the uh, bulvinar and uh, capsule uh, ligamentum teres. And the proper correction of the pony configuration. We can go for proper correction by either pelvic osteotomy or femoral osteotomy or by both. 
The soft tissue obstacles in the case of DDH, the cerebrum is filled with inverted limbus. This is the shape of the normal acetabular labrum. In case of DDH, there is hypertrophy of the acetabular labrum and they become enlarged in the superior and the posterior and the inferior rim. It may fold and fold into the joint and become inverted limbus. As seen in this photo, this inverted limbus and in this cadaveric section. This limbus blocks the reduction of the femoral head. The second obstacle is the pulvinar. It is a bifibrofatic debris presented inside the cavity of the stapulum, like this photo. Also, the interposed iliopsoas tendon, as we see in this photo, and the ligament anterior, the capsular constriction, which is caused by the uh, iliopsoas tendon, and Finally, the transverse acetabular ligament. How to deal with these soft tissue obstacles? The pulvinar are removed, the ligament arteries are excised, the capsule is opened, the labrum either left intact or if it is severely used, we can do a radial incision on it, and the ileosoas is divided, and the transverse acetabular ligament are divided. To deal with these soft tissue obstacles, we need a very good exposure of the hip joint. So we need a very wide exposure in the capsule, but we cannot excise all the capsule. This exposure depends mainly upon the used method for opening the capsule. The types of the capsular incision, number one is T-shaped capsular incision. As we see in this photo, it is a T-shaped capsular incision. After opening the superior and the inferior flap of the capsular incision in the capsule, then our inferior advancement is the upper flap, and the inferior flap is the excess the capsule in the inferior flap are excised, as shown in this photo. T-shaped capsular incision with solter type capsulography. It's normal or ordinary T-shaped incision in the capsule. Then this shaded area are excised. And we do a medial rotation of this uh, flap from the capsule. So the, the size of the T uh, limb of the T incision are inserted in the anterior inferior iliac spine. And the size of this B type are inserted in the preostium of the pubis. This is a final uh, diagram for uh, this uh, solter type capsulography. Then, T capsulotomy with a vest over pantus capsulography. This is a T shaped incision after opening the uh, two flap of the T shape. This pants over vest technique for repair of the capsule and this repair of the capsule after reduction of the hip joint. Number two, mini bikini shaped capsular incision. It is a longitudinal incision in the capsule, like a bikini incision. And after reduction of the hip joint, we try to put each letter with adjoining each uh, corresponding letter to do a capsulography. This is the same technique as a mini bikini capsular incision with the excision of part from the capsule. This part of the capsule is excised and do medial or inferior uh, rotation of the inferior flap to cover, to close the capsule. The U shaped capsular incision this is a new technique uh, done by our colleague Dr. Hisham El Basit from Asyut University, and it is uh, a very good technique. It is simply it is a U shaped incision in the capsule, and we after reflect this part, we can see the head of the femur and uh, part of the septum, and after reduction, we can close this flap again. And finally, my own technique is S-shaped capsular incision and double layer capsulography. Simply, it is the shape of this new technique of the capsu uh, capsulotomy. It's like a letter S. 
This is the shape, S shaped incision. After opening the S shaped incision, it is a rectangular flap and it is triangular flap. It gives a very good exposure for the acetabulum. The upper edge of the operator edge can be seen. The ligament materials and transverse ligament become visible and we can do easy radial incision for the inverted limbus. This is the diagram for uh, our own technique. It is S shaped incision. It is the side for quadrangular flap and the side for triangular flap. After opening both flaps, the quadrangular flap and the triangular flap, we can see obviously the hip joint and the sublum is clearly visible. And this is the site of the original S shaped incision. It's a S shaped incision again. And this is a photo of operative, uh, interoperative photo for my own technique. It's simply the anterior uh, exposure of the hip joint, it's an exposure. And we can see the stapulum, and this is the site of the pune stapulum, the site of the head of the femur, and it is a site for capsular attachment. And this is an uh, outline of the bony landmark of the hip joint. And site of the capsular attachment, we can do first the quadrangular flap at this site. After magnification of this photo, we can do the quadrangular flap. And after opening the quadrangular flap in the site of the Zermi marks in the capsule for the quadrangular flap, and this is after opening this the flap. And we can show the video after opening this flap and the, the head of the femur is obviously seen. Then we retract the iliopsoas and the uh, subterus muscle to expose this uh, side of the capsule. This is a site of uh, doing the second incision or second capsular incision at this site. It's done by diathermy. And after opening of the second uh, flap, the triangular flap. And this photo, after opening both the quadrangular flap and the triangular flap, we can see the acetabulum clearly visible and the ligamentum teres and the pulvonar and the inverted limbs. And choose a video for opening for both flaps. Then we talk about the double layer capsulography. It's a photo uh, diagram for the dislocated hip and after reduction. It's a site for S incision in the capsule. And after opening the post quadrangular and the rectangular flap, we can notice that its post flap are not in the same plane. But after reduction, we find both flap at the same plane. Then we close the triangular flap at first and then close the rectangular flap. Then we can show the photo, interrupt the photo after closing the rectangular uh, triangular flap and then this side of the quadrangular flap. And the photo after closure of the quadrangular flap. If we compare between the most common methods of capsulotomy, either T-shaped or U-shaped or S-shaped, after opening of the capsule, we can see that S-shaped uh, capsulotomy can give a wide exposure for the head joint. And it is uh, interoperative photo for the original articles for the that uh, for the T-shaped capsulotomy or U-shaped capsulotomy, and this is my paper which is under press, we can see that as a, this exposure is a very good exposure for the hip joint to can get rid of all soft tissue obstacles in the hip joint. We notice that there is a change in the flap direction after reduction of the femoral head inside the acetabulum. So, this uh, the direction of the flap before reduction is vertical in the craniocaudal direction, but after reduction we found that the flap or quadrangular flap become in the mediolateral direction. Why? 
At the beginning, this side of the quadrangular flap, and this is the base of the lab, is the red line, and it is interrupted to photo, and it is the base of the flap. After opening of this quadrangular flap, then you can choose the direction of the flap with gradual reduction of the hip joint. And it's finally after reduction. At the beginning, the base is horizontal, then become vertical after reduction of the uh, femoral head. After reduction, this is a quadrangular flap. Uh, and after uh, suturing this quadrangular flap, we can choose the direction become horizontal, which is was previously vertical in the first one. So, as the first, the quadrangular flap in the become in the, is vertical in direction, and the finally become horizontal in direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Laklouk, for uh, presenting this uh, unique technique uh, of management of uh, DDH. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have uh, just only one question. I think you have mentioned it and you have answered it, sir, uh, from Dr. Abdullah. What benefits, what shape of uh, capsulotomy provided? Uh, why, uh, why would I prefer S over U or T shape? I think you have answered it. I discussed it, it in my... Uh lecture it's give a wide exposure, wide exposure so you can get rid of from any soft tissue obstacle yes sir thank you so much sir i think we have uh, no more questions thank you so much professor lakluk for joining us thank you so much sir. thank you dr raj uh, our next speaker will be professor ibrahim abu Omera, a professor of orthopedic surgery and head of elazhar asyut uh, uh, orthopedic department Professor uh, Abu Omera will speak about management of paralytic hip dislocation in children. Professor Ibrahim. Professor Ibrahim, you are with us, sir? You are muted, sir. You are muted, Professor Ibrahim. Professor Ibrahim, you are muted, sir. Uh, it's okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, many thank you, Professor Muhammad, for nice work and great effort. And uh, it is my honor to uh, speak a new, new subject about uh, a new blade in proximal femoral osteotomy. Uh, hand in hand, improve our skills. This is our aim. Sorry, I don't. This is not working. It, it was working before, sir. Uh, working before. Sorry. You can stop sharing and make another time sharing, sir. Uh, okay, that's right. Yes. It is a new plate for proximal femoral system. It's called interlocked cannulated blade blade. And our aim, hand in hand, prove our skills. It's basic hip disease is acquired his disability accused by muscle imbalance. This is still a orthopedic challenge as they, as they are difficult to treat and the cure. It is not congenital. Hip problems is spe specific to CB. Subluxation, very common, non impulatory patient. Hip subluxation will devolve in 50% quadriplegic uh, CB patient. Why do surgery in CB, in CB patient? Because about 75% of hip dislocated will be will become painful. Etiology of dislocation is either soft tissue or bony problem. Soft tissue, uh, adduct, uh, contraction of adductors and the iliosoas. Bony problem, coxa valga, excessive femoral antiversion, and the astabral dysplasia. Our goals fix everything at one time. New deformity list, recurrent deformity list, 
offer lengthening one hospital admission. Please don't create base day syndrome by offer lengthening or recurrent deformity. We use a lot of implant in proximal femoral osteotomy, like pediatric DCS, pediatric DHS, BD lock, and the femoral plate, and the LCB plate, but a blade blade became the most wide use, widely used implant because they are sound biomechanical bases supported by several large retro respective studies showing excellent result. Proximal femoral is the major and the common osteotomy in pediatric uh, child. Complication of conventional blade blade is, as you know, children in CB is the bony fragility, wrong direction, uh, or movement plate in the neck of the femur, so secondary displacement is common. Secondary complication, delayed union or non-union fraction under blade. As you see in this case, this is a fraction under blade because we use uh, a blade with the screw 4.5 will be a stress fracture under blade. Late complication, look this case, this is the abasca across of the head because the blade is coming posterior in the in the neck, and there is offer correction will lead to will lead uh, lead to uh, a vascular necrosis of the head from the uh, wrong directions of the blade. To avoid this complication, such such wrong direction movement the blade in the neck of the femur, pull the out of the blade and increase more prominent of the blade under skin and the soft tissue irritation. Look for those cases, double angry blade, there is skin uh, irritation and the ulceration over the blade. Because as you know, CB a child has, has malnutrition and uh, malnutrition, low, low, low weight. So this is the over, over prominent of the blade under skin will, will lead to ulceration and necrosis. After review of uh, literature, we observed many trials to to increase the stability of the blade by screw by screw from inserted from proximal to distal to increase the stability. And uh, we we uh, invention a new technique, screw in from distal to proximal to increase the stability of the blade and uh, prevent bold out blade in our uh, uh, new blade. Also, uh, also after review literature, we observe it can really the blade. This system not available in our country because it's very expensive. So can our most of our patient can afford this is the new system, this system. So on previous complication and difficulties, we decided to introduce implant in control fashion. We assumed that is a new system would offer significant advantage over existing system include more stable fixation, more easy, more safe learning care for trainees. It's available three possibilities, stable, easy, and safe for training new trainees. So we, a new modification plate called the decrease profile plate from 4.5 to 3.5. This is a conventional plate. This is our new plate decrease from 4.5 to 3.5. Can you do blade? This is a cannulated blade. This is a cannulated blade to allow easy insertion. This is a, a blade, the same size of a blade of a sitting chisel. Well, also sitting chisel is a cannulated. Decrease angle blade from Decrease second angle, this is the angle, decrease from point uh, four, from uh, 42.5 to 90 degrees. Why to decrease prominent blade under skin? Don't affect the mechanical axis. We use an interfragmentary locked screw. This is passed from distal to proximal to prevent bold out of the blade. In oblique direction, 90, uh, 30 degrees. This is a workshop of a blade, how insert the blade and they do virus proximal osteotomy. Modification of cell steel to titanium to decrease rate of infection. To prevent confusion, we can summarize in this table. This is a conventional blade, and this is a, a new blade. 
اليو بليت ذيس ذا هول فور سكرو فروم ديستال تو بروك مش عارف هيسولع هيسولع ذيس ذا سكرو فروم ذيس ذا سكرو فروم بروكسيمال ديستال تو بروكسيمال تو بروفينت بولد اوت اوف ذا بليت This is that uh, table summarize the difference between old conventional blade and the new blade. A profile 4.5, the profile 3.5. Interfragmentary screw is the absent at the present in our blade. Canonical blade is absent and the present in our blade. First angle 90 degrees the same, and the second angle decreases from point uh, 442. Uh, to 20. Material, stainless steels and titanium, screw 4.5, 3.5. Length of a blade, about uh, from 35 to uh, 50, the same. And the length of the shaft is the same, or more or less, uh, more in our thickness of blade is the, is the same or less in our uh, new blade. So we use different blade, blade, this is a blade, Uh, from 35, 45, and uh, 50, according to the length of the neck. And there was also a modification for new blade, about uh, 120. This is the blade used for a uh, uh, degree to the edge. This is the video. This is the video showing how to design a new blade. This is a this is a this is a blade, blade blade, and this is a bridge to prevent side to side movement, and this is a, a, a oval screw for uh, inter interfragmentary screw. This is a second angle, and this is a first angle. This is a, the length uh, from thirty five to fifty. This is a bridge, and this is thickness here to prevent breakdown of the uh, uh, implant failure. So the, the, the thickness is gradually decrease in from uh, from uh, from uh, distal to proximal. This shaft about uh, eight centimeter. The second angle. An instrument in our new blade, cell is a sitting chisel, very important one. This is sitting chisel, very important one. This is the uh, key of our work. Uh, sitting chisel is accumulated at the same size of the blade. A blade holder to uh, catch the blade. Drill bite, 2.5, screwdriver, guide wire, uh, uh, 1.5, sleeve. So surgical technique is a new technique from our use wire in in central central in EB uh, and EB and the lateral intensifier image. And this is the uh, wire in EB and this is another wire blue laser counter and this is the wire above laser counter to create a triangle from uh, base medially. We need to do closed wedge to need more virus of the head because uh, most of CB in valgus, as I said before. This is the intraoperative photo showing three wires, inserted one in the neck and the two, one of blue laser to counter above laser to counter. This is the uh, sitting chisel bus uh, according to inserted, according to guide wire. And the bus easy to the the neck. This is the intraoperative foot uh, X-ray to showing how to insert it, uh, sitting chisel in the neck. This is the ostotomy to above uh, uh, above key wire and the blue key wire to create a media triangle. This is the triangle created medially. So we use now inserted the blade. The blade, our assistant, assistant you uh, to do flexion of the hip and the abduction of the hip to allow easy inserted blade uh, 
with the guide wire. This is the intraoperative X-ray showing how to insert it a plate with the guide wire. And this is a plate automatically created virus of the neck. This is the intraoperative X-ray show how to insert it the interferon screw, not need uh, image, just a bus uh, by a sleeve to bus from distal to proximal drill bite to insert it in the hole of the of the neck. And this is the wire, this is the interfragmentary screw. This function support the blade and also to prevent bold out, as I said. Third time, this, please. Sir. Say again. Sir Ibrahim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, time, time, please, sir. Ah, uh, time. Okay, okay. So now, so now, this is the intraoperative fo uh, photo in abulateral. We use in uh, most of our cases diga ostotomy. Diga ostotomy as harvested bone from the proximal femoral ostotomy and uh, from neck of the and the iliac bone. This is a uh, uh, bone bridge from uh, the astablum about ten millimeter. The key wire pointed to medial tricartilage. This is a diga uh, ostotomy. Uh, this plate was registered in real estate registry and the Egyptian of Ministry of Scientific Research. It's published in uh, orthopedic trauma surgery uh, last year and also uh, presented in secret in Malaysia 2022. Uh, the first case, we presented some cases. The first case, male child, four years old, presented by uh, right uh, paralytic hip dislocation. We use triple attack in uh, in our procedure. This is an interoperative photo, how to insert the plate and the virus ostotomy. I have to uh, quickly, this is a follow-up after one month. You use cast for one month. And this is follow-up after three months, completely united. Completely united proximal femur. This is after removal of the blade. Another case of the uh, same child, four years old, bilateral paralytic hip dislocation with this, the same maneuver, uh, triple attack. Uh, in our uh, cases, we use open the uh, capsule because this is a long standing dislocation. Uh, the ligamentum tear is very long. And the hypertrophied when uh, need when do virus structure and uh, not consenteric reduction. So uh, the best remove ill, uh, uh, ligamentum tears and uh, capsulography. This is the same cases. Uh, this is after three months completely united. Another case with the, the blade. This is uh, some cases there is created uh, uh, lateral close uh, uh, open wedge. We use the graft to uh, to close this wedge and they're completely united after three months, as say these cases. Uh, uh, this is the last case. We use uh, 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 120 uh, new blade for this case. This is a neglected DDH. We use this blade with the virus and the uh, uh, triple attack is the same. They're completely united after three months. Take home message. Spastic hip disease, acquired hip dysplasia, cues by muscle balance. Still orthopedic challenge as they are difficult to treat and the cure. Necessity is the mother of invention. We assume the new blade would offer significant advantage over existing blade, including more stable fixation, more easy and safe le learning care for trainees. Thank you for atten your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, for this uh, very interesting uh, technique and very interesting plate. Thank you so much, uh, my thank dear you, Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we move to, I, I think we have no more questions. Before we move to the last speaker in the pediatric session, I remember all of you with the very important uh, workshop uh, transmitted lively from Canada in the next Friday in the inter international section. It will be uh, from Canada, McMaster University, Professor Walid Kashta, a workshop, live workshop on osteotomies around the hip. It will last for one hour and it will be at the end of the uh, second Friday, uh, 26th of uh, January, 
2024, uh, and it will be live transmission from Canada. Our last speaker will be uh, Professor Sharkawi Wagi from uh, Aswan University. Uh, Dr. Sharkawi will speak about CP hep problems. And after we finish the pediatric session, we come to the hep arthroscopy session. Dr. Sharkawi, please. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, please, would you please stop your attention, please, sir? Okay, thank you. Your presentation, I'm sorry, your presentation, sir. Uh, uh, okay, stop sharing. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, uh, welcome. Dr. Sharkawi, please uh, present your uh, presentation. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Thank you, Professor Mohammed Ashad, for inviting me to visit uh, this uh, session. I'm happy to have you all. Uh, I think most of my professors and colleagues cover this uh, point uh, more than enough. I hope to add something. Why this topic is important? Magnitude is a problem. We will talk about magnitude is a problem. We will talk about the pathology and the etiology of hair, CP head problems. We have an idea about the natural history. We have to emphasize the role of, of hip surveillance in our community and the whole, uh, how to catch those patients in between the crowdings of our uh, outpatient clinic. And some treatment recommendation, I will not go, uh, gonna do some techniques or dips. Magnitude is a problem. CP have problems as the second most common after ankle equinus. 90% every 10 patients we have nine of non-ambulatory CP patients have a head dysplasia and head displacement. One third of all CP kids have some head problems at uh, any age. The most to affect the quality of life is the head, unlike the ankle and zen. Most common base of CB literature, 1,360 publication, and now we don't have standard, standard protocol regarding the time and dose of surgery. Then ambulation is the core of the problem that guides the natural history in those people. Though, uh, these people and those kids are medically fragile. So, surgical treatment is demanding and with the high mortality rate. Unlike the ankylosing, orthosis and praising doesn't work. Why to treat those people? The aim is to have, to obtain and maintain. Maintain is more, more important than to obtain. Painless, mobile, free hip with symmetric range of motion to facilitate uh, daily life, like transfers and seating and nursing. In walkers, it's very rare for walking people and walking CD kids to have hip problems, but very few exceptions like type 4 hemiplegia and late dysplasia in some diplegics and gait problems due to scissoring and soft tissue imbalance. Non-walkers is our issue. Non-walkers is the focus of my talk. They have difficult sitting and wheelchair use. They have difficult care and hygiene. They have constant pain, they do this dislocation and arthritis. They have scoliosis. Common scoring, we have many scores to evaluate this, uh, those people, but the most common is gross motor function classification. Everybody knows that. Uh, we have male porn CB head classification system is the radiological classification mainly. We have CB child and pediatric uh, quality of life inventory. Uh, the last two are beta, beta, uh, uh, parent uh, or caregiver priority. This is gross motor function. We have to focus on type 4 and type 5. Type 5 people don't have trunk or head support. Type 4 they have, but they can difficult to, to walk or just standing. This is uh, Melbourne CB head. It's mainly radiological, taking into consideration pelvic obliquity. CB child is Caregiver priority and child health index, as we see, is like questionnaire to evaluate the satisfaction of the parents and caregivers. The same is for the other quality of life inventory. This graph showing how uh, type 4 and type 5 are the most common category that have uh, hip problems. Diabetic patients, uh, sometimes they have after adolescence, in the type 4, they have uh, also hip problems. We have to focus and understand the pathology of CB head, uh, head dysplasia. They born with normal hips. 
The abnormal forces of muscle specificity gradually sublate, subluxate, and pull the head outside the head. Uh, this force is very hard, more than the force of standing. So the, they have very hard joint reaction force. They have multifactorial, pony and soft tissue problem. So uh, just lengthening tendons and doing a doctor tenotomy is not enough in those people. For soft tissue, we have about 59 articles discussing soft tissue pathology. They have abnormal force, magnitude, and muscle space. They pulling the head in the wrong direction, posterior, lateral, and superior. Uh, the adductor lungs and grasses as the main deforming force, sometimes iliosaurus, hamstring, and previous work. Those category of patients have weak abductors. This causes imbalance. That's why soft tissue not working without redirecting the head inside the head again. For bony etiology, we have also a very uh, big uh, data uh, of research. They're discussing the bony etiology in CB uh, by name. Uh, prolonged non-weight training is the main and the key behind the pathology of, uh, of the uh, changes, of the bony changes in this category. Proximal femur and cerebellum have both deforming forces. Proximal femur increase neck valgus and excessive antiversion. This influences head dislocation more than its specificity itself. And uh, we, as we see, uh, gross motor function classification of five are the worst to have uh, this neck shaft, uh, neck shaft angle. The CB head, head display is different than DDH. They have posterior and uh, lateral and coverage. Okay. So they, they have decreased medial pressure. And uh, if you do x ray for these people, you, you find uh, the third group very wide. The pathology, etiology, and displacement of head displacement in CB is multifactorial. The most common risk factors gross motor function classification and young age. Typical age of presentation from uh, 2 to, uh, to 9, 2 to 8 uh, years. Uh, CB hip is positioned most of the time in flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. Typical posterior superior direction in 99 of the patient. Without treatment, the hip completely dislocated, and the stablum open up and, and uh, coming into dysplasia. This is a proximal femoral deformity. Uh, they have a uh, uh, coxa very high neck shaft angle. They have uh, increased femoral antiversion. The only way to improve this is to walk and to stand. And they never walk and never stand. Do this pathology continue even after hip reconstruction? This is the most common cause of failure after hip reconstruction. The, the pathology is still working. Uh, this uh, graph showing why those people uh, getting progressive coxa valga. The epiphysis and the fibers of the proximal femur are um, working in perpendicular to the joint reaction force. So it grow longitudinal. The neck increase in length, not in width. Uh, this is a very simple table comparing DDH and CB head dysplasia. They born DDH born with dysplasia with temporal pathology. CB head was normal hips, but they start to subluxe gradually. Uh, diagnosis, we just need a screening test, but in that we behave, we, ha we have to keep an eye up to maturity. We have we need surveillance, not screening. Uh, the DDH, that non operative treatment to just tenotomy and abduction places work, but in CB doesn't work. General condition uh, DDH is a normal child, but CB is a fragile patient. As we uh, see before, born, uh, the born with normal hip, the highest risk is between two and eight years. We will show now the natural history of the TP hip without any treatment. They born with uh, migration percent, normal, 10%, two and a half years, five years, eight years, 10 years, 13 years, and 15 years. They have complete dislocation. This is natural history of CB hip dysplasia. The natural history in adolescents, usually adolescent people, uh, walking people, the, if they have uh, migration percent lower than 30, they never have hip problems. But in hemiplegia, sometimes they have upper maturity. They, they have very high risk of uh, head displacement after maturity. The natural history in adult, if the adult was adolescent with migration percent of 30%, they uh, usually don't have head displacement at maturity. To diagnose, we have to clinically uh, do abduction, simple abduction. If we have uh, limited abduction, uh, less than 30 degree, 
we have to do a uh, X-ray, tell a uh, X-ray, a uh, supine X-ray with uh, neutral rotation and uh, abduction. We have better to put a pillow be below the trunk, of, uh, below the side, because if you take a B view as a CB child, actually you will take end view because uh, uh, the, the head is always connected. Uh, Riemann migration index is the simple way to measure how far this head is outside the head. We have to measure the lateral extrusion part, uh, which is presented by A. The whole uh, width of the head femur, A divided by B, this is percentage of migration. Sometimes we need 3D CT. Uh, some centers adopted uh, every patient they have to do CT before surgery. Uh, also, it's very nice to allocate the uh, the other head that looks nicely on X-ray, but if you do CT, you will find it dislocated. Uh, very uh, nice to determine how uh, femoral antiversion is, and in revision cases, and in the contralateral head that looks nice on X-ray. This professor, is... Uh, professor of orthopedic surgery, the National Institute of Locomotor Surgery, Locomotor System, I'm sorry. Uh, professor Andrew will speak about the updated surgical technique of safe what happened is happened already, but you, you have to be short, uh, shortened your uh, uh, leg screw uh, to avoid the migration of the screw within uh, the, the establo. Yes, sir. thank you so much, Professor Said. For this. Would I continue in my presentation or not? What what happened, sir? Professor Ashab, I, I heard some people talking. Yes, Maybe please. Professor please Said go with, your, go, go with your presentation. Okay. Okay, this is uh, simple. Right. Go with your this is a 3D CT that show how far the antiversion is very high in this category. The video is working. The video is okay. Yes, sir. The the contralateral nice side is not nice. It's very high antiversion and have this here. So uh, my talk maybe I can. Uh, be happy to talk about hip surveillance. Uh, every child with CB is a candidate for hip surveillance, but not every child of CB is not uh, is not candidate for hip surgery. Uh, to do hip surveillance, we have to do simple EB uh, X-ray with uh, some pillow uh, below the thigh, uh, and it depends on the gross motor function classification. In non walker, we have to do it uh, until the age of eight years. We have to do it every six months until the age uh, of uh, eight years. Surveillance sometimes make an anxiety for the doctors, for the parents to, to monitor the display, but it's very beneficial in education and parent uh, uh, caregiver uh, education and also to clinch dislocated kids very early. Surveillance is very important from the journey, from birth, not from birth, from two years old up to maturity and after adolescent some. We have to clinch the patient in his journey to treat as needed. Treatment of CB, uh, we can uh, roughly divide it in prophylactic measures, reconstruction, and salvage or replacement. Prophylactic uh, is to, uh, the best to attempt to avoid high dislocation and early reconstruction. Surveillance is the best way to, avoid, to make time intervention. Botox and adductor brace is ineffective. Please don't do Botox and adductor brace because it, that, uh, every literature is uh, denying this. The surrounding abduction phase for waiting more than 12 hours is not working also, but sometimes it, it held after tenotomy. So, surgical obstacles of those category, non-walker CB, cognitive communication, aesthetic problem, low bone quality because of malnutrition, no sun exposure, not walking. Uh, they have also pulmonary and feeding problems. Uh, APR, is abductor source release of CB. Is it 80% success or 80% failure? Abduction, uh, abductor uh, source release surgery work least for those children who need it most. Unfortunately, uh, Benjamin Shuri of the Boston Children's Hospital says that this maneuver is very nice, but not in non workers Abductor surgery seems to work time, please, sir. Time, please, sir. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, gross, uh, guidance, uh, gross guidance is a new topic and a uh, very good topic for research. non ambulance children will never resolve infantile coxaferda and increase femoral antiversion. So we have to, to make a dynamic method to correct this hip. 
uh, we have to put uh, kinetic screws in the intermediate cortex and we have to repeat it because the screw is pulled out with growth. Hip reconstruction is the gold standard method for prevention of hip displacement. This consists of bilateral adductor lengthening, bilateral varus derotation osteotomy, and proximal femur osteotomy. Uh, what to do for contralateral located hip? If we have uh, one side dislocated and the other side is located. Actually, the other side is not. Uh, if you do CT for the other side, we find it increases femur antiversion and coxavalgo. Uh, and if you correct the dislocated side, the other side will dislocate soon or after two years. So we have to correct it even by various rotation of theotomy. This is my study in uh, South Korea from uh, three years ago, uh, discussing the outcome of various femoral derivation osteotomy for the without adding velvet osteotomy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, finish my lecture uh, about the salvage surgery. This is the view of the femoral head if you open it in high dislocation and current dislocation. So it's contraindicated to make reconstruction in those people because the pain will increase soon. For salvage surgery, we have three techniques, proximal femoral resection. We have uh, uh, valgus trochanteric osteotomy. We have both techniques. We have to understand the pathology of the head TB to avoid underestimating the problem or doing anesthesia surgery. Unlike ankle anesthesia, overdue and overestimation is better than skillful neglect. Say hi to non ambulant CB child, then request an x ray for him before saying goodbye. Hip surveillance is the most uh, important in monitoring and timely appropriate intervention. Patient, patients and teamwork for medical optimization is fundamental. Hip reconstruction is the most and gold standard method for reduction of those hips. Only soft tissue is not working in those people. With the best hand, salvage surgery has poor outcome and can be avoided. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, my dear uh, the Dr. Sharkawi Wagi, for this very interesting talk about uh, CP HEP. And many thanks to all our dear speakers in the pediatric HEP session. Now we will have to move to the next, uh, next session, which is HEP arthroscopy session. Uh, our uh, first speaker will be uh, my dear Professor, uh, Professor Hatim Galal Said. Professor Hatim will speak about liberal repair and pensar phi management. Professor Hatim. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muhammad. Can you hear me well? Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it's an honor to be with uh, all our distinguished speakers in this uh, webinar, this great effort. So, uh, my presentation... So my presentation is about labral repair, uh, tips and tricks, and uh, pincer management in uh, femoral stabular impingement. And uh, my friend Ahmed Al-Azim will also speak about CAM management. That covers really the most important two parts of managing FAI surgery. So when we think of labral repair, uh, this is just uh, my disclosure. Uh, it's not uh, related to this uh, presentation. When we think of uh, labral repair, there are two main points. Usually there's always an associated degree of pincer with the labrum, so we always have to manage that. And then the technique of actually repairing the labrum itself. So when you're repairing the labrum, there's several questions that we should prepare. Which portals we will use, the acetabular plasty or pincer management, the sutures that the anchors we will use, whether they are knotted or knotless, do we do a loop or a labral base refixation? Do we sep separate the chondrolabral uh, junction? Uh, and how do we penetrate it? And then do we attach a knot? And lastly, what do we do about the far away anchors, the one most medial and the one most posterior for posterolateral impingement? So for portals, this is the classic arthroscopy portals that we use. We use the uh, proximal anterolateral portal and the distal anterolateral portal, these are our viewing and working portals for the peripheral compartment. We start with peripheral compartment first. 
Once that is done, we go into the anterolateral portal, which is for the central compartment. We do our repair. We do the first two anchors. And to do the most medial anchor, we do an accessory uh, and that distal anterolateral portal, which is more medial. This gives us access to the most medial anchor. So it's very important that you do the acetabuloplasty. Most of the times with the cause of the labrum, it's not only the cam, but I would say in 90% of my hands, there is some degree of pincer that we must manage. So it's important that you actually uh, work on the pincer. You decompress the labrum because the extra bone is coming from the tabular side, pressurizing your labrum. So you're decompressing the labrum to allow the labrum to go back into place. This reduces the impingement with the femoral neck, even after doing the cam osteoplasty. So it's important to realize and go to the exactly the head, the, uh, the chondrolabral junction. And do you see that it's been softened and there is no bony protrumens behind the labrum, preventing it from receding backwards. So our work uh, always starts with peripheral compartment. We do the cam. And then we also do a big portion of the acetabuloplasty or the pincer management in the peripheral compartment in flexion of about 70 degrees. That has a great advantage on reducing the traction time. The traction time is closely related to the amount of complications that happen. With this technique, we're able to minimize the traction time to about 45 minutes. That includes putting in three anchors uh, in the operation. So the whole operation and the traction time is reduced if you, uh, if you use, utilize this technique. So this is an example of a pincer a subspinous impingement, which is, uh, as I said, abutting on the labrum. You can see in the upper image, the preoperative view, and you can see on the lumbar image that we've decompressed the subspinous area that's been compressing on the labrum, and this allows the labrum to recede backwards. So which anchors do we use? We're utilizing now all suture anchors. We moved from the metal anchors, which have artifact with the MRI, peak anchors, which are solid and they are big. And now we need to be as close as possible to the articular margin. So we need the smallest size anchors and the safest one to use are the old suture anchors. Most of the companies have those at the moment. They start from 1.3 millimeters up to 1.9 uh, if they're double loaded. This allows you to come very close to the rim, avoids labral eversion because the further away is the suture, the labrum will cause eversion. But when you're close, you can actually keep the inversion, as I'll show you in the upcoming videos. And even if uh, by, uh, by, by any error, there is penetration of the articular surface of the acetabulum, they depend on the mechanism of retraction. So even if they penetrate, you just retract them back and they're not uh, inside the joint. So, and also now with the new guides, you have a curved trajectory. So the trajectory is away from the acetabular edge. So it lessens the potential for complications. And as we said, the mechanism is you pulling to deploy in most of them, or you, even if your uh, the me deployment mechanism gets them backwards, even if you penetrate, it does not cause a problem. Now, do we use knotted or knotless? Both are available. The knotted ones uh, allow you to adjust the tension better allowed you to really control the tension before you do your knot. Uh, it allows you to control very sensitively the inversion, uh, eversion, and they are reversible. If you do too much, you can untie them and control your uh, inversion, eversion. The knotless one has been classically the peak ones. They were larger, so we had to go away from the articular margin. Uh, now we have the knotless old suture, which have the advantage uh, of being smaller and closer to the margin. It does not involve any knot tying, so it, you don't need the skill of knot tying, and you have shorter stitches and less adhesions. So this is an example to show you the difference between the knotted and the knotless. So they're both, you can see very close to the articular margin, and uh, the one at the top is a knotless. There is no knot here, so potentially less adhesions with the capsule post-operative and knotted at the bottom. But since they are very small ones, uh, I don't see much of a problem with that. This is an example of uh, the knotless anchor, which is a peak one. And this is a, a big one. This is an older version we used to use. Apologies. This is an older version we used to use, and uh, I don't use it anymore because of the size. This is more than 2 millimeters, about 2.7 millimeters. But again, as you see, I don't have control on eversion of the labrum. You have to really predict the tension. So as you go in with the labrum, as you go in with the anchor, the labrum everts backwards, which you don't want that. You want the inversion to maintain the labral C. 
But these are the more newer ones, which is the tension adjustable knotless anchors. These are the very uh, new ones. Uh, and these are very nice. They're small in thighs. You're close to the margin. They are knotless, but you are able to, by the type you do your suture, you're able to do a more eversion or inversion even by the knotless. If you look at the picture down on the right, you can see that we're tensioning. It's compressing the labrum without causing the inversion and maintaining the labral C. So these are adjustable all suture or tension controlled knotless sutures. Now, this is the classic anchor that we use is the knotted version. Again, we always do one loop around the labrum. And this, again, allows us to control the inversion inversion. I'm stressing on that point because it's very important to maintain the labral seal at the end of the operation. So we do the tension while maintaining inversion of the labrum. Uh, and then we do our knot tying. So uh, some people suggested that we do labral penetration. You do a labral called labral base refixation, but the same authors later came out and said there's no difference in clinical outcome between if you go around the labrum or you go through the labrum. So I still go Ayla? around the labrum. Are able to go. Uh, I'm able to um, reach yeah. uh, a very good fixation and loop fixation around the labrum. And I think after a while, shortly with the tension, the labrum tissue itself will develop the triangular shape like we've seen in the Bankert repair and also see with meniscal repairs. Now, how do we penetrate the labrum? We try to mean keep the attachment of the labrum to the bone. We penetrate with the smallest possible instrument, which is the acupass or the uh, lasso. Uh, and we try to go, we do a very small uh, penetration of the cartilage. We pass the uh, guide wire and then we do the uh, labrum. Other devices like the suture retriever on the left. This is the nice, it's only one device that does everything. So you are holding the suture. You penetrate the cartilage, you throw the suture, and the same device is able to uh, grasp the suture itself uh, from back. So you go above the labrum, and then you hold it, and you do uh, your suturing. So this is uh, an all-in-one device system. So do we uh, preserve the contralabral junction or do labral detachment? So in, in the old days, people always recommended you do labral detachment. So you're able to do uh, bring back the pincer uh, back into place. However, the recent studies have found there is no need. There is no advantage to attach the labrum. Actually, when you leave it attached, it's easy to control. You can penetrate. You can stays in place rather than being floppy in your operative field. And studies have shown there is less adhesions and revisions when you keep the chondrolabral uh, junction attached. So the video on the bottom is actually one of my older videos again. Yeah, I used to detach the labrum with a knife like most of people did. We received that and then we suture it back and then we stopped doing that. We did not find any advantage of that. Now we come to the most uh, medial anchor and that uh, you have to smoothen the bump at the front of the acetabulum. As we have mentioned, you do an extra uh, distal anterolateral portal uh, to try to reach that. And then you can see from the video, there's actually a curve to the medial edge of the acetabulum. So we want to reach the most medial part we can do the anchor. If you go more medial, the anchor will slip out. Uh, so it's, it's important you reach that, you smoothen that surface out. We do all the instruments, the cleaning, the debridement uh, from the top uh, part. And then after that, uh, we do the penetration. Uh, so once we do that, all anchors, while we're doing them, we need to be looking inside the joint, to making sure we're not pe penetrating the acetabular uh, cartilage. So as you can see from the picture, it's a more anterior and, and medial uh, anchor target trajectory. And this is the look uh, intra-articular. Uh, but also we go inside the hip joint to make sure we have the full thickness of the labrum and the full flap with our acupass or suture passer. And you want to make the smallest possible injury uh, and pass your wire. So we've moved away. We used to use bird beaks in the older days. Now we've moved away to the smaller instruments. They cause less separation in the chondrolabral uh, junction. And you can see now that we are in the most medial part of the delamination of the cartilage. So we know that this is the most medial part of our pathology. Uh, we're able to also move the suture in the right place. So we're able to get the suture in the correct place uh, as medial as possible before the tensioning. We grasp the sutures. We do our technique of lasso while controlling the tension. Again, a very important technique to control the tension 
bring that suture down while maintaining inversion of the uh, labrum. So we're pulling one while we're pulling the other. If I pulled one too much, then eversion would happen. Uh, now, lastly, is to the posterolateral impingement. When you have pincer uh, at the bottom, posterolateral, which is uh, more and more we're starting to find that, uh, it's uh, important that you get the uh, labrum from the most posterior part. Uh, if you look at the video on, on the uh, left, you'll find that there is actually an indentation on the femoral head uh, from uh, the uh, from the pincer. So the femoral head is impinging on the back, on the pincer, and you can see this big indentation on the left side in the femoral head from the pincer. So we have to decompress the pincer all the way to the posterolateral area. And these people have labral degeneration, the posterolateral area, and they have an anterior labral tear and, and, and uh, cartilage uh, delamination in the anterior part. So you have a contra coup pathology at the same time. You can see a very clear indentation of the femoral head in the posterolateral area. So we remove the pincer uh, bone all the way down to 10 o'clock, as you see now. And then the labrum is usually degenerated rather than actually torn, but we still have to fix that and get it fixed so that it's uh, back and stable after decompressing the uh, pincer. So it's important to uh, do peripheral first. We do acetabuloplasty without the traction to minimize the, uh, the traction time. And the chondrolabral junction, again, as we mentioned, as in summary, we, we preserve that. We don't remove that anymore. We're using all suture anchors now. Uh, usually drill two anchors right away in one step. That saves time on the instruments and saving operation time. So our average operation time now is one and a half hours to operate uh, three anchors uh, in the hip, four anchors slightly longer, but this is with a normal sized cam. The third anchor needs an extra medial portal. We loop around the labrum, which allows us to do the tension adjustment. And it's very important to maintain the labral seal uh, and avoid a version of the labrum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Hatem, for this very interesting presentation about a very interesting topic, uh, femoral stable impediment. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think we have a question to you, sir. Um, Periportal versus interpo interportal uh, capsulotomy. What's your opinion, sir? Uh, so for the capsulotomy, we're trying now to do selective capsulotomies. People have, some research has shown the disadvantage of doing large capsulotomies unless you're going to repair all of them. So uh, we don't see the need to repair because we do selective capsulotomies. Uh, which we may call periportal, rather than large interportal capsulotomy. You need to have maneuverability of the instruments, but there is no target to do a huge continuous capsulotomy. I think we have no more questions, sir. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Professor Hatton, for your thank participation. You, it's an honor for us, sir. Uh, we have one more question, sir. Oh, yeah, he's... he's uh, is mentioning that it's a, a great talk, Professor Hadim. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You, sir. Sir. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Ahmad Abdul Azim. Professor uh, Ahmad will speak about diagnosis, pathology, and treatment of CAM5. Please, sir. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Muchakir Giddin, Dr. Ashab, Liddawa, Karima, and Asad, and Anna Kalim, Hadratku, and Dr. Hadim. آه على آه ال topic اللي احنا بنحبها الهيب ارثروسكوبي والفيمور استابل امبنج. So uh, my talk will cover the introduction to the cam femoral stable impingement, what's the pathology, the diagnosis, uh, the arthroscopic technique and the complications. Uh, the cam it's a bump at the antero superior part or the head of the head and neck junction. And actually it's not a new idea. This was يعني, written uh, years and years before, in 1965 and 1975. It was mentioned in the literature by two radiologists, Murray and Stolberg, in which they defined that there is an abnormality or a variation in the anatomical head uh, that leads to secondary uh, uh, osteoarthritis. And it's not actually a primary osteoarthritis, it's a secondary due to a fundamental association with an abnormal proximal femoral morphology. 
uh, Stolberg in 1975, he defined this abnormality as what the, he named pistol grip deformity and identified this as a cause of osteoarthritis, which was query secondary osteoarthritis at that at that time. And it's proved now to be a secondary osteoarthritis and not a wear and tear. So what what happens this bump due, uh, with hip flexion? Uh, it uh, it hits or abuts against the periphery of the acetabulum, leading to the pushing the labrum outwards and tearing of the labrum at its base. As you see in this video, the base of the labrum is torn, as well as shearing effect, creating a delamination of the hyaline cartilage from the subchondral bone, creating a peripheral cartilage flaps. So actually what happens is a peripheral lesion in which the uh, uh, the there is an extensive cartilage delamination or hyaline cartilage delamination together with a basal labral tear. So to identify it by clinical examination during the range of motion, if you have a big cam, you will find that the patient has an obligate external rotation with a flexion, exactly as a sign, dream, dream, dream and sign, exactly like a patient having, as having a slipped capital femoral epiphysis. So actually the, the classical anterior impingement test, which was described by Reinhard Gans in 1991, which is doing a flexion, adduction, internal rotation, actually uh, uh, pushing the femur or the bump against the injured labrum will cause pain or catching at this maneuver. And this maneuver is aggressive maneuver, which has a, a, a high sensitivity, but a low specificity. So you have to compare it with the other side to know the normal uh, pain con pain threshold of the patient or the pain, uh, what he feels in the patient to control it to, uh, to and, and compare it to the other side. The more aggressive test is the scour test, which is a combination of an external, uh, a derotational de external rotation impingement test with a derotation internal impingement test, exactly like McMurray's test of the knees, stressing the pain, the injured labrum against the cam uh, while moving from flexion, internal rotation to abduction, external rotation with axial compression. And again, this has a high sensitivity and low specificity. So you have to compare it with distraction. Do it first with axial compression and compare it if the pain is relieved with traction. For radiographic ex examination or detection, you have to see the cam. The cam is a bump which is usually located at the anterior and the superior part of the head and neck junction. So actually between 3 and 11 o'clock. So that's the way that, that we have to look at x-rays to identify the anterior part of the cam as well as the superior part of the cam. So to identify the anterior part of the cam, you use the lateral view, either a cross taper or a frog lateral view. But to identify the superior part of the cam, you, you look at the anteroposterior view of the hip as well as Dunn, Dunn's view, which is done in a 45 degrees of flexion and a 45 degrees of abduction to get the most post posterior or superior part or the posterior part of the posterior part of the superior part of the cam you to identify the normal from the abnormal you look at the alpha angle usually the circumference of the radius of the uh, uh, of the head leaves the neck at a 45 degrees to 55 degrees. So you identify the center of the head and the center of the neck and draw an axial line. And then you, uh, you measure the angle at which the circle or the radius increases. So that's the increase of the neck. And if you have a bump, that will increase. So this in this case, with a huge bump and the secondary osteoarthritis, the angle reached about 70 degrees, the alpha angle. Another radiographic signs which may indicate the presence of a cam or fem femoroestabular impingement is the vacuum sign. While doing a frog lateral view, you will find that the head is subluxing and you have a vacuum between the head and the femoral head. Another thing is the impingement cyst. You find an impingement cyst which is commonly 
misdiagnosed as osteoma. These are cysts at the head and neck junction due to impingement or due to cracks that happens during the impingement between the acetabular rim and the cam lesion. To go to a more specific or sophisticated Im uh, uh, imaging is the MR arthrography using a special sequence, a spe a special sequence which is the radial oblique sequence, as well as using the very helpful 3D reconstruction to identify the extent of your cam, how much you will go and remove this cam from the anterior to the most superior part. Going to the treatment, you have to understand that the cam deformity uh, uh, is essentially, you have to essential, essentially uh, get, uh, excise all the cam. And this has, uh, has been associated with a better outcome. So in this uh, review, an alpha angle more than 555 degrees after surgery was associated with the lower native hip joint survive, survivability. And this data suggests that correcting the cam deformity may positively affect the, new, uh, the natural history of these patients. So we insist on proper cam excision. This is your target during the surgery. Either to do it open or arthroscopically, you have to excise it completely from the anterior to the most superior part, preserving the vascularity, which is actually more posterior than the cam legion. So for me, I do it arthroscopically. I go, uh, uh, it's very important after going to the central compartment, I go uh, for the central compartment first, after releasing the traction, my assistant moves towards the leg and he controls the leg. So he helps me to flex the hip, to internal and external rotate the hip so as to get a very good control. I go through the central compartment first, doing all the job, attacking the pincer, suturing the labrum, and then I move to the peripheral compartment. So a part of the ca proper cam is to achieve a very good labral seal. So you have to do, as Professor Hatim mentioned, a very good labral repair with a proper labrum repositioning so to avoid the labrum eversion and losing the labral seal and then i go to the do a capsulotomy and extend my capsulotomy if i need uh, to a uh, vertical limb so i uh, to to expose the cam you have to get a vertical limb so as to expose the whole cam except in patients with micro instability or joint laxity you can retract the capsule and it's not preferable to do a capsulotomy to, uh, so as to not to increase the instability that they have. So that's the arthroscopic view in which I did a capsulotomy between the anterior portal and the lateral portal, and then I extend my capsulotomy along the head and neck to expose the full cam. And I have to see the full cam to be able to excise it completely and not to leave any part of it at the end of my operation. So this is the cam now exposed, the whole triangle from the anterior, inferior, and posterior are exposed. The boundaries. The, med the most medial boundary is identified by doing flexion. Most of the cam lesions starts to abut at 45 to 90 degrees. It's according to the, 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 the shape or the, the, how big is the cam. So what we do is the, that we flex the hip to 45 degrees, identify the point of abutment and then you excise what's out and we leave what's in which is the bearing wet bearing cartilage so once we get identified and marked the head as in the uh, uh, photo up uh, you identify it with a radio frequency and then you start excising with a burr the what's outside this line from going from proximal to distal so i use a five millimeter burr and then i do a footprint going down full width with the with the five millimeter not more and this is my depth and i start to move from medial to lateral cautiously without harming any more hyaline cartilage medially and finally i start to go away or distally so as to prevent what we name a hump back deformity. So this is a hump back deformity. This is a, 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 like a, a, I did a cleft and I, re, a, I forgot about distal part. 
and this is what we name the hump back deformity and you have to excise it completely so what about medial and lateral medially you have to go to identify the end of the, the cam medially which is what we name if you can see it uh, 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 inside the operation this is a, a happy scenario uh, however we usually identify it with an image intensifier so it's the medial synovial fold it's hard to identify it inside the operation so it's preferably to be identified using an image intensifier and laterally you have to go to see the lateral retinaculum fold which is the blood supply which lies postro superior so you have to either retract the capsule and see the vessels this is the soft spot or the lateral retinaculum fold or where the blood supply enters and this is an untouchable area so you excise the cam till this area you do not you should not uh, uh, touch this area because it's the blood supply and it will cause an AVN if you touch it and it's very easily seen by an uh, by an arthroscope so again this is another case where you will find that uh, they tract the, the the capsule laterally and see the vessels inside with the, the uh, inside the lateral retinaculum fold which is the terminal branches of the medial circumflex so you go with the burr you get out the cartilage you scratch it either by a curette and then you remove it you remove the 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 cam with a five millimeter burr creating a footprint and going from proximal to distal from medial to lateral and once you finish you you to make sure that you excise the proper diameter and the proper boundaries of the cam and you excise it completely you have to do a dynamic test so while rotating the hip flexing and extending the hip to make sure that there is no cam left medially laterally distally so dynamic and intraoperative dynamic examination is very important so that's the end result that we want to reach a proper labral repair with a proper labral seal and a good cam resection with a very with a clear dynamic examination so again this is what we want to see and this is what, what we want to see in the post-operative x-rays proper labral repair with the proper placement of the anchors and a good cam resection with a proper offset uh, uh, head and neck offset so what's the complication the most commonly encountered complication is under resection and it has been reported that the patient has a will have a lower outcome if you uh, under resect the cam over resection is another problem and it could lead to a fracture however this is not commonly encountered and there is an inquiry now about in, uh, doing too much resection until reaching an instability and instability comes from over resection or uh, over capsulotomy and over resection of the head nowadays we are speaking about a new concept which is making a slope rather than a right angle as if you create a right angle you're actually doing a micro instability and this was achieved in 30 percent of the patients who did uh, cam in this study during deep hip flexion because during hip flexion you while doing a right angle resection you actually are separating the labrum and you are losing the proper labral sear in deep, deep flexion and creating a micro instability so now it's preferable to do it as a slope rather than a right angle excision other complications which is more theoretical like iatrogenic uh, injuring the weight bearing cartilage doing too getting too much adhesions due to lack of uh, proper post operative protocol injuring the lateral retinaculum vessels and getting an avn instability due to extensive capsulotomy especially in patients with ligamentous laxity especially in, in patients with ligamentous laxity and you have to take care of this or recurrence from bone remodeling which is not reported so our take home message is that cam deformity is an ex aggressive uh, uh, is an aggressive femoroacetabular impingement on the hyaline cartilage cam the de cam deformity uh, to diagnose a femoroacetabular impingement with a cam you have to have a very good positive clinical signs as well as findings in the radiology the two together concomitant labral surgery 
labor tears in which the ephemeral stable impingement was not addressed has a poorer results. Osteoplasty without labor management also has a poor results. So you have to do both. Cam resections requires meticulous techniques to prevent under or over resection. And lastly, I would invite you to, uh, to join us who is interested in hip arthroscopy and young adult hip pathologies next week in our Cairo University course. And uh, Dr. Hatim is one of the eminent faculty who will join us. And you are يعني, تنوروننا كلنا كلكم اللي interested في الموضوع ده هو. شكرا. Thank you so much, Professor Ahmed, for this very interesting talk. We have uh, two questions uh, for you, and of course to Professor Hatim. Uh, how to calculate the alpha angle again, please, from Dr. Muhammad Riyad. طيب هو إحنا الالفه أنجل هو الفكرة كلها إن إحنا بناخد السنتر بنرسم مور السيركل ونجيب السر السنتر بتاع الهد. وبعدين نجيب السنتر بتاع النك ونوصلهم ببعض و this is the head and neck axis and then we see the radius of the circle the radius of the circle the radius بتاع السيركل ده مثلا السيركل بتاع الهد مثلا الدايمتر بتاعها هنعتبره ان هو 50 يبقى الراديوس 25 ملي نبدا نلف من الاكسس بتاع الهيد اند نك جونكشن ونشوف الراديوس دون هيبقى ريتشت امتى لو هيبقى ريتشت عند اول السيركل اول ما الهيد الهيد بتسيب النك عند 45 ل 55 ديجريز ذس از نورمال لكن لو الهيد اند نك جونكشن او النك ليها اكستنشن زياده هتسيبها عند 60 او 70 درجه ذس از ذا كام another question from dr gamal qasim how can we identify vascularity accurately while cam removal Uh, هو الفكره كلها ان احنا بنشوف one of the very important steps in doing a cam و, 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 ودي حاجه دكتور حاتم يعني انا حضرت معاه لازم يعملها في كل الحالات وكلنا بنعملها في كل الحالات هي ان احنا لازم نشوف اللاترال ريتيناكولم فيسلز اتس فيري ايزي تو سي ات يو جاست جو اند ريتراكت ذا كابسول عند الساعه 12 او ذا موست لاترال اند ذن يو جو ويز يور 70 ديجريز سكوب هنشوف اللاترال ريتيناكولم فيسلز هنشوف السوفت سبوت ودي الحته اللي انت ما, ما, ما بتقرب لهاش انت ممكن تشيل الكام بروكسيمال ليها وانتيريور ليها لكن في الاخر خالص انت ما المفروض ما, ما بتقربش للحته اللي هي باسترو سوبيريور دهيا علشان هي دي الحته اللي بتدخل الفاسلز Another question sir from Dr. Muhammad Osman does pencil impingement damages the acetabular labral complex while in cam type that damages the chondral surface of the acetabulum Um, so actually, most patients will have both pathologies. Yani I've rarely, sometimes patients rarely, sometimes females don't have much of a cam, but the majority have a combination between cam and pincer that leads, the combination leads to the actual impingement. Of course, when you have a larger cam, it, uh, it damages uh, the articular surface more. If you have pincer, it damages, it damages the labrum more, but you find different combinations. So we, we deal with all pathologies as you go in. Uh, it does not really, I don't stress much because, as I said, most of the time I'm dealing with both pathologies rather than a single pathology. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question, sir, from Dr. Sayed Yassin. What's the uh, in main indication to do cam resection in patient with five? Malish, ma uh, uh, indications? The main indications. Oh, yes, and the main indication how in the IAN. Uh, ي- يكون ما عندوش اوستيو ارثرايتس او ممكن نقول تونس جريد uh, 1 لكن uh, 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 لو عنده اوستيو ارثرايتس فخلاص هو مهما لو شلت له الكام اي دونت ثينك ذات يو ويل ستوب ذا باثولوجي لو دخل في اوستيو ارثرايتس فعني فهي احنا الفكره كلها ان الانديكيشن بتاع ان انت تعالج فيمرو اسيتابري امبينجمنت ان جنرال هو ان هو يكون Uh, مفيش اوستيو ارثرايتس الاوبيسيتي اتس ا ريليتيف انديكيشن بالنسبه للهيب ارثروسكوبي uh, بالنسبه لي الايج اللي هو لغايه 50 55 اتس ان انديكيشن ان احنا نعمل ابوف ذس ات ويل بي يعني uh, حالات معينه سيلكتيف كيسز بلو الايج اوف 50 ل 55 اي دو ات بعمل كل العيانين ان uh, كيس ان هم ما عندهمش تونس اكتر من تونس 1 اوستيو ارثرايتس 
Finally, thank you so much, uh, my dear professors, Professor uh, Hatim Galal Saeed and Professor Ahmad Abdul Azim, for sharing your experience with us in this uh, very fruitful session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have to move to the uh, HEP Oncology session, and uh, the first speaker will be uh, my dear professor, Professor Walid Abid. Professor uh, Walid is the head of uh, orthopedic department, Cairo University, and the eminent star of uh, hip oncology in in Egypt, the Middle East, and all over the world. Professor Walid will speak about hip transposition as a reconstructive method following pelvic resection. Professor Walid, please. Professor Walid, you are with us, sir. Uh, uh, is it is my voice clear? Y yes, sir. It's Dr. clear, Mohammed. Yes, sir. It's clear, sir. Yes, is my voice clear? Yes, but I think. Shall I share the screen? You are you are muted, sir. You are muted. Yes, please, sir. No, I'm. Is the voice clear? Yes, sir. But you didn't share your presentation, sir. Professor Ali, you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yes. Can you please share your presentation, sir, please? this okay no it's it's not obvious sir yes i shared it no it's it's not obvious sir uh, it's not shown okay yes it, yeah yeah okay uh, we can see it sir yes sir full screen please sir is this clear okay yes sir full screen please sir Yes, this is okay. Oh, Harak Sud be at Tabas to read this ad. Professor Ali? I should get a Sud be at Tashway, man. Be at Tashway as ad. الصوت مزبوط؟ اه كده احسن يا فندم. فول سكرين بليز سير. لا وي لوست ذا كونكشن سير. بروفيسور وليد. دكتور محمد السو... ال... انا مش عارف الصوره لا لا الصوره لوست يا فندم كده طالعه ولا اه صوره سعادتك كده طالعه اه وود يو بليز شير يور سكرين سير يس 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 وي كان سي ات سير يس بليز ذس اوكي يس سير يس سير ثانك يو سو ماتش سير اوكي اوكي اي ام جوينج تو توك اباوت هيب ترانسبوزيشن از ا reconstructive method following tumor resections of the pelvis. So there are several types of resections. It could be either including the ileum or the periacetabular area or the pubis. This is type 1, type 2, and type 3. If we include the sacrum, it's type 4. And we can have combinations like P1-2 or 2-3 or P1-2-3. These are different resection types. Following resection, we have different methods of reconstruction. This could be biological reconstruction, endoprosthetic combinations of both, 
or even fusion of the remaining bones, and sometimes we don't do any reconstructive option. You can see here that there are uh, used endoprothesis, uh, uh, ice cream cone prothesis, saddle prothesis. Uh, sometimes we do resection and recycling of the resected uh, area, and then reconstruction with a combination of recycled and total hip replacement. Sometimes we fuse what's remaining of the bones, like here, ischiofemoral fusion or pubofemoral fusion, iliofemoral fusions. Sometimes we leave the pelvis open following resection of type 1 resections. So whenever we have an uh, acetabular uh, uh, affection, uh, we ask ourselves, are there any acetabular, acetabular part that is resected? If uh, yes, then we see if it's a partial or total resections. If no acetabulum is resected, then uh, we can leave the pelvis open. So when do we do hip transposition? We do hip transposition whenever we have type 1 or 2 or 2 and 3 are resected. These are when we leave the pelvis open like this. حضرتك البرزنتيشن دكتور ابراهيم بليز ستوب يور يور دكتور ابراهيم ابو عميره بليز ستوب يور سكرين سير دكتور ابراهيم ابو عميره يس سير يس از از ذس Okay, I'll do it again. Something has been lost. Yes, sir. I'm so sorry, sir. Sorry. I'm going to stop by like this. About this, how do you find the blend? I'm not sure. 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 هو لا يعني كده طلع مظبوط عند تمام يا فندم كده شير اوكي يس سر يس سر تمام اوكي سو وي كان دو ريسايكلينج اند ا كومبينيشنز اور وي كان دو فيوجن اوف ذا ريمينينج بونز وين وي هاف ا بيري اسيتابولار ريسكشن لايك ذس وي كان دو بيري اسيتابولار ريسكشن فولود باي ايليوفيمورال فيوجن اند ذيس جيف جود ريزالتس Whenever we resect the pubis, but preserving the acetabulum, we can leave uh, the pelvis open, just do a proline mesh to prevent uh, abdominal herniation. When we do P1 resections like these, we can close the pelvis with another vascularized or a vascularized fibula, and you have a closed pelvis. Whenever you do a resection of uh, type 1, the pelvis could be left open and with the acetabulum preserved like this. So there are several methods for reconstruction following pelvic resections. So how do we choose our reconstructive modalities? If you, you still have an acetabulum preserved, you'll have a very good function because patients could move well and they could walk uh, without any uh, uh, problem. But the problem is when you when the estabulum is uh, included in the resection. In these cases, especially when you uh, when it's a P two one resection or a P two three resections, this is when we uh, uh, need a hip transposition. So what is a hip transposition? What is meant by this? It's the creation of a new hip joint in the same place or in a higher position. This was first described by Winkelmann in 1988, so it's a very old reconstructive method. And there are several types of hip transposition. 
you can have type 1 in which uh, the remnants of the acetabulum is fixed to the uh, remnants of the sacrum. You can have type 2 where you can use a proline mesh or a Trivera tube to create a new hip uh, at the level of the sacrum. Or you can have type 2B in which you can increase the length by adding a prosthesis and using a higher centered hip. So different types. So uh, we reviewed our cases from 1994 till 20s. And of these 84, 11 were reconstructed by hip transposition. Seven were females, four were males, uh, and the age ranged from 12 to 60 years. This is an example of an osteosarcoma periacetabular area. This is the 3D uh, print of it after resection. And this is the hip uh, uh, fixed with a proline mesh fixed to the sacrum. And you can see the patient can walk with a walker within the first uh, two months, and then she graduates to uh, one, one crutch, then a cane. This is another example of an osteosarcoma uh, periacetabular after resection. Sometimes we fix the proline mesh with two scrocanter. Sometimes we use a mesh, sometimes we use a Trivera tube like this. Whenever, even if you have the remnant of the acetabulum, it gives more stability and patients could walk easier without any supports. Our functional analysis, pain, functional outcome, emotional acceptance, Walking supports, walking distance and gait was 60%, ranging from 50 to 72%. Uh, this is actually similar to other studies. The largest was by Gebert, 62 patients with a 61% MSDS score. This is quite similar to other reconstructive methods using allograft reconstruction, which gives a 60 to 70% uh, MSDS score endoprosthetic reconstructions could give from 40 to 70 percent reconstruction 75 percent of the patients could be ambulated with a walker or two crutches within the first two months then they shift to one crutch or less by five to six months this was similar to other reports the largest was by zhang et al in the multi-center study in japan which included 48 patients 75 percent of the patients used a walker or two crutch by two months. And the earlier the ambulation, the better they walked and the better they walked unaided. Complications are many. Wound complications, neurovascular and vascular complications, but actually these complications are related to pelvic resections. But regarding the reconstructive technique, the complications are minimal. And it's mainly instability, or lower limb discrepancy. Some authors suggested using an external fixator for a temporary external fixator for the first six weeks to stabilize the hip and to early ambulate these patients following hip transposition. And others used uh, lengthening by uh, uh, allografts or bone grafts to increase the length of the uh, femur to uh, accommodate for the leg length discrepancy. So the, there are several modifications. But finally, the advantages of hip transpositions include minimal complications, less operative time. Usually pelvic resections take a, a long time. So surgeons are usually tired by the end of the procedures. So this is a very uh, uh, short, uh, short pro procedure that could be easily done and effectively done following resections. It's inexpensive, especially in countries like ours where we have some economic restraints. So it's very useful in these situations. It has a very acceptable functional outcome similar to other sophisticated methods and with early ambulation. So to conclude, many options are available for reconstruction. The choice is dictated by which part is resected. Sometimes doing less sophisticated reconstruction of 
offers better functional outcome. You can see here, this patient to the left has the hip uh, a transposition. The one on the right has uh, um, blind uh, recycled total hip replacement. They have more or less similar uh, gait. Thank you very much for listening. And I Professor Walid, you can hear me, sir? Professor Walid? Professor Walid, you can you can hear me, sir? Okay, thank you so much, Professor Walid Abed, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk about a marvelous uh, technique uh, of uh, managing uh, hep uh, tumors. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, if you can hear me, sir. Okay, uh, our next speaker, Professor Walid, you can hear me, sir. Okay, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Mohammed Farouk Zaki from uh, Nasser Institute. Uh, Professor Mohammed will speak about hep uh, tumors in uh, adults. Please, sir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wabarakatuh. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Welcome, sir. It is clear? Yes, sir. Firstly, we uh, will talk about the tumors of the hip. Tumors, tumors develop when cells within the a tissue divide uncontrollably, forming a lump or mass of abnormal tissues that possesses non-physiological function. It is either benign or malignant. In the hip joint, we can develop in the bone, in the cartilage, and synovial tissues. Hip anatomy, we consider acetabulum, proximal femur, and capsule. What is about the uh, uh, histologically, bone, cartilage, and synovial membrane. Bone tumors, it is divided in, into primary bone tumors or secondary bone tumors. Primary bone tumors divided into benign tumors or malignant tumors. We will talk firstly about benign tumors. Um, osteogenic origin, osteogenic origin, it is osteoma, osteoma, osteoplastoma, chondrogenic origin, chondroma, osteochondroma, chondroplastoma, inchondroma, chondromyxoid vibroma. About uh, synovial origin, synovial, synovial chondromatosis, pigmented nodular synovitis, synovial cysts, ganglion, synovial hemangioma. Uh, fibrogenic origin, non osphine fibroma with fibrous dysplasia with tumor like conditions, simple bone cyst and aneurysm bone cyst with giant cell tumors. About the malignant primary bone tumors, uh, osteogenic origin, osteosarcoma, chondrogenic origin, chondrosarcoma, and the malignant chondroplastoma, synovial origin, synovial chondrosarcoma, and synovial sarcoma. About uh, marrow origin, even sarcoma, primitive neuroectodermal tumors of bone. What? Father, uh, please, please, uh, everyone mute it, please. Uh, the malignant, malignant lymphoma of bone and myeloma. Gensil tumor of origin, malignant osteoplastoma with fibrous origin, uh, fibrosarcoma. The first majority of tumors spread into the skeleton are carcinomas. It is a secondary bone tumors. This is a rare in children, but can occur from neuroplastoma, abdomyosarcoma, and clear cell carcinoma of the kidney. Most common metastases come from the breast, prostate, lung, renal, and thyroid. Secondary bone tumors, most common sites of metastases are spine, proximal femur, and proximal humerus. Management. 
clinical presentation being due to rapid expansion, hemorrhage, incipient pathological fractures, and maintenance encapsulation. Also, can swelling can cause symptoms and signs. Pathological fractures, neurological symptoms due to stretching of the nerves or pressure on the nerves. Decreased range of range of motion, disability, may be lost of weight loss or malaise. Diagnosis, Anna, we will stop on lab investigations first. CBC, ESR, serum alkaline phosphatase, serum acid phosphatase, T3, T4, TSH, parathyroid hormone, protein electrophoresis, Ben Jones protein in urine, calcium levels, tumor markers. Carcinium embryonic antigen, CA125, CA19.9, PSA. The X-ray. Ideological investigations, X-ray, it is the first step in the diagnosis as it can show the location, size, and shape of the lesion. MRI, it shows the tumor extent within the joint, bone, and soft tissues. It gives an idea about the relation of the tumor to the vessels, helps to delineate the surgical approach. CT, it shows intraosseous and extraosseous structures of the lesion and give an idea about cortical quality, cortical integrity, and may help in the tumor localization. Bone scan, it shows the site of the lesion, skip lesions, and associated bone myths. PET scan, a small amount of uh, radioactive glucose sugar is injected into a vein and the scanner is used to, ma to make detailed computerized pictures of, uh, of areas, size of bodies, where the gl glucose is used. Because cancer cells often use more glucose than, uh, than normal cells, the pictures can be used to find the cancer cells in the body. So we can detect and locate distant metastases and soft tissues and bone. Biopsy, which is the most important step in the, in the, as a, in the diagnosis of the bone tumors in general. It is diagnostic for the lesion. We have two types of biopsy. Needle biopsy, which can be obtained by CT-guided or ultrasonic-guided biopsy, or open biopsy with its rules to get uh, enough tissues for examination to do the operation further. Treatment plan. Medical treatment, it has no rule except painkiller. Some gives bisphosphonates to improve the bone quality, but there is no proof about that. The another step in chemotherapy, it is used in, in chemosensitive tumors, use of anti-cancer drugs to kill the cancer cells using a combination, mainly some drugs like doxorubicin, cisplatin, carboplatin, etoboside, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and fincristine. Radiotherapy, it is used in radioact and radiosensitive tumors, use of high energy X-ray to kill cancer cells. It may be used in combination with surgery. It may be used in patients who refuse surgery. It can be also reduced pain and the risk of bone fracture. There is two types of radiotherapy we use. Proton beam radiation and intensity modulated radiation. What about surgical management? Surgical management, its aim to remove the entire tumor with negative margins. No cancer cells are found at the edges or border of the tissues removed during surgery. Special surgical techniques may be used to minimize the amount of healthy tissue removed with the tumor. It ranges from lo local excision, curative and cementation, limb salvage and reconstructive surgery, hemibilvectomy, disarticulation, and hind quarter amputation. What about benign tumors first? Mostly, benign tumors are treated by intralesional curative in contained benign lesions. Packing the cavity with bone cement or bone grafts and bone substitutes may aiding may aiding fixation beside it. What about osteodystoma? Like uh, we can use CT guided thermocoagulation for osteodystoma in some lesion. Arthrotomy for synovial, synovial benign lesions like chondromatosis. Excision benign soft tissue benign lesion like synovial cysts. Large benign tumors might require extensive surgical excision and reconstruction and can be uh, used like uh, malignant tumors. Primary malignant tumors, we can use the limb, limb salvage technique. The goal is to remove of the cancer and leaving a functioning limb. About 90% of patients are able to, uh, to have their limbs spurred. 
The challenge is to remove the tumor, but still saving the nearby tendons, nerves, and vessels. In this type of surgery, a wide excision is done to remove the tumor, and the reconstructive maneuvers are used. Proximal femoral lesions can be treated by in-plot resection and replacement with several methods, modular prothesis, allografts, vascularized fibular grafts with hip arthrodesis and cement spacers. Acetabular lesions excision with replacement with ice cone cup, modular prosthesis can be done. Hemibelvectomy, the goal is to remove of the whole tumor tissue if it is confined to the acetabulum and build the bone. We do resection of the tumor with the spurring the limb. This articulation and hind quarter amputation. As we have been said that the goal is to remove the whole tumor tissue if it is confined to the proximal femur and extended to the surrounding tissues, we can do hip disarticulation. But if the tumor has intra-articular extension with involvement of the acetabulum and the hip bone and surrounding soft tissue, we can do hind quarter amputation. The golden rule, there is no difference in survival between amputation and limb salvage. Treatment strategy. In chemosensitive tumors, we start with chemotherapy courses for four to six courses, then surgical post, post, uh, post last course about two weeks, then surgery will be done. Then after two to three weeks, we do another chemotherapeutic six courses. In radiosensitive lesions, we can do use uh, radiotherapy only in special cases as lesions with high morbid, morbid surgery in com or in combination with chemotherapy or the patient if refused surgery. Some lesions are chemoresistant and radioresistant, so we consider surgery from the start. Surgical management in bone metastasis, it depends on its location in the proximal femur as it varies from intramedullary fixation in intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy or hormonal according to the original pathology or if it is involving the whole proximal femur, we do resection with modular prosthesis replacement. If it is in the neck, we can replace it with total hip replacement or even hemiarthroplasty. In conclusion, tumors of the hip is a challenging issue, which needs a collaboration between the patient, radiologist, oncologist, orthopedic surgeon, and physiotherapist to reach the final goal of cure and improve the quality of the with least morbidity. Thank you for all. Thank you so much, Professor Muhammad, for this very comprehensive talk about head tumors. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm trying to 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 decrease the amount, but uh, it is um, no, 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 no. You are just on time, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for. We have just one question from Dr. Gamal Qasim. What's the outcome of surgical resection versus neurovascular derangement? The, 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 about the functional uh, results? Yeah. The functional results uh, will uh, will depend on the what reconstructive method you use. Have no rule with the with the vascular with the vascular tree uh, resection. Yes, sir. I, I think we have no more questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for you and for Dr. Walid. Thank you so much, sir, and many, many thanks to uh, our dear professor, Dr. Walid uh, Ibid. Uh, I think he, uh, Professor Walid has a connection. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, we are with you. Yeah, you are with us, sir. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Walid. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Al Ashad. Thank you so much, sir. You. Professor Walid, thank you so much for for sharing your experience with us, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, now, before we move to the last session, which is my favorite session, the arthroplasty session, we will have a, a small talk uh, uh, from Eva Pharma Company, the uh, sponsor of this webinar. It will last for 15 minutes. And then we go to the arthroplasty session with more than uh, 16 speakers from all Egyptian universities. Dr. Michael, please. Thank you, Professor Mohammed. Is my presentation clear? Yes, sir. Full screen, sir, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Mohammed. Before I uh, get dive into my presentation, I would like to express my deepest uh, gratitude uh, to all our eminent uh, professors who spoke today, and uh, many special thanks to Professor uh, Mohammed Al Ashab. On he, he is always keen on organizing uh, these uh, scientific uh, marathon for orthopedic surgeon. And please be sure always that uh, Eva Forma is will we will be always keen to support. Uh, orthopedic surgeons in organizing these scientific uh, webinars uh, for sake of uh, patient health. Okay, let me uh, get into my presentation. Um, first, uh, this webinar is supported by Eva Pharma, mainly neuropathy and pain domain. So I will be surfing into products which will support uh, this therapeutic area. Uh, I choose this slide from uh, Eva corporate uh, presentation to start with. Uh, I know that uh, in your clinics, a lot of companies uh, come and say that uh, they are the best and they are the highest quality. But um, here uh, I bring an evidence uh, that Eva Pharma got European Medicine Agency approval, which is a certificate that Eva Pharma got for a long uh, 10 years. We got European Medicine Agency approval, which is an inspection from the European Federation, which inspect every step. Uh, in pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing and ensure that all our active ingredients is of class A source, which will allow our products to be exported to uh, the European nations and uh, allow other European and multinational companies to manufacture uh, their products in our facilities. So please make sure that all the brands I'm going to talk, to talk about is of very high quality brands. First, my presentation will cover the pathogenetic treatment for entrapment in neuropathies, and then I will be going to serve um, symptomatic treatments for neuropathies. And then lastly, uh, I will going uh, to talk about the nociceptive uh, treatments uh, Eva Pharma brings to your patients. Uh, in Eva, we always believe that uh, uh, there is no one size fits all. So uh, I will going uh, to talk about a lot of products in the same therapeutic area, and we know that you will tailor each product uh, for a single patient. Uh, so let me begin with uh, thiotacid. I know uh, you know it well. Uh, it's present in uh, more than uh, 40 countries worldwide. It is an international brand. This is the first pathogenetic treatment for entrapment in neuropathies. Uh, it fits your patient in cases of sciatica, low back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, and all kinds of entrapment in neuropathies. You can use uh, thytocid in. What happened in uh, any entrapment in neuropathy? Uh, either low back pain, either uh, disc hernia, either uh, carpal tunnel. What is the pathogenesis of peripheral neuropathy and the main cause of pain uh, in neuropathy? There is an inflammation and oxidative stress which happen. Inflammation leads to activation of toll-like receptors and then activation of transcription factors like nuclear factor kappa P and activation of interleukins and cytokines and the tumor necrosing factor alpha. This is the main cause of inflammation. Also, there is free radical which causes oxidative stress. Also in entrapment in neuropathies, there is a microvascular changes which led to perineural mm -hmm. hypoxia and low blood supply to the nerves. This will lead to demyelination and uh, axonal body loss, which is the main cause for the firing happened uh, by the nerve. This needs a pathogenetic treatment, which is thiotacid. Thiotacid works in these cases as an anti-inflammatory, which relieves the inflammation uh, in the pathogenetic, in the pathophysiology I talked about in the last slide, it, it reduces the tumor necrosing factor alpha, interleukin-6, and the nuclear factor kappa P. So it will relieve the inflammation. It works as antioxidant, so it scavenges the reactive oxygen species. Also, it is a neuroprotective brand. It increases the nerve growth factor, which will lead to remyelination of the nerve, which is damaged by the entrapment in neurobasis. Also, it will act as a vasoprotective. It protects us from nerve ischemia and improves the nerve blood supply. So all this multiple action for uh, thytocid helps in uh, your patient in entrapment in neuropathies, and it is a must to prescribe a pathogenetic treatment along with a symptomatic treatment. Thytocid is not used for symptoms, but 
uh, uh, you, you must prescribe it along with a neuropathic painkiller because it is not a neuropathic painkiller. So uh, you must prescribe not only a neuropathic painkiller because it will all, uh, only relieve the symptoms of the patient, but you have to repair the nerves that have been damaged. The doses of uh, thytoside have been recognized by many different guidelines as a pathogenetic treatment for uh, diabetic neuropathies and other entrapment in neuropathies. The dose is three tablets per day in case of severe cases, mild to moderate two tablets per day, and maintenance dose once daily. Our other hero as a pathogenetic treatment for entrapment in neuropathies is uh, Milga Advance. Milga Advance is uh, a unique combination of vitamins uh, pinfutiamine, uh, vitamin P6, and uh, vitamin B12. The concentration of pinfutiamine is 300 milligram in uh, Milga Advance. And you know that thiamine or vitamin P1 is hydrophilic. So uh, uh, we offer here pinfutiamine as a lipophilic uh, vitamin P1, uh, vitamin P1, which has uh, uh, a lot of advantages other than thiamine, which is found in the injections. So uh, Milga Advance, uh, uh, we advise to be taken instead of uh, the injections. WHO said that most injections, around 94%, are unnecessary or could be replaced with suitable oral preparation. And this trial, which uh, is carried out in Egypt in the National Diabetes uh, Institute, uh, it, uh, it was uh, to determine the levels of vitamin B1 after 2.5 hours and after six days, either taking Milga Advance or taking the injections, vitamin B1 injections. And there is a significant difference. There is uh, a significant difference between Milga Advance and, and other uh, vitamin P1 injections. After 2.5 hours and after six days, the levels of vitamin P1 in the, in the blood in Milga Advance was higher than the injections. Also, EVA Pharma offers limitless vitamin B12 uh, ODF, which is oral dispersible uh, film. It is a unique uh, uh, dosage delivery system. Uh, it is uh, a combination between uh, methylcoplamine, uh, 1000 microgram, and 1000 micro microgram of folic acid, biotin, vitamin B1, and vitamin B6. Uh, it's used in deficiencies of these vitamins, and uh, I know uh, orthopedic surgeons are, are using uh, PPIs. Uh, so PPIs, metformin, H2 blockers led to vitamin B12 deficiencies. Oral dispersible film is easy way uh, and, and easy uh, absorb, uh, absorb it. So uh, it's uh, only a film uh, that should be taken under the tongue. Uh, here, uh, this is the other section of my presentation as a symptomatic treatment for uh, peripheral neuropathies. And here is our latest hero, Conventine XR. I know you know Conventine as a brand by name, but here is a new technology uh, in uh, gabapentins, which is Conventine XR extended release tablets. Uh, uh, this slide demonstrates the technology behind Conventine XR when the tablets enter the stomach, uh, it swells for two hours, and then it swells to a size that it is retained inside the stomach and uh, gabapentin is released for about 8 to 10 hours, and then the matrix dissolves within 15 hours, so it covers 24 hours daily gabapentin. Here is the curve, which demonstrates uh, the difference between gabapentin in uh, immediate release and the gabapentin extended release. Uh, the blue one is the immediate release gabapentin. You see the three peaks per day. Uh, here is one dose of gabapentin, um, uh, uh, I will point it by the laser, one dose of gabapentin. So uh, you, uh, it will decline, and uh, here is other dose of gabapentin, and then you, uh, he have to take the third dose. That's why we were advising you to prescribe Conventine three times daily. But the white curve is Conventine XR. Uh, here is the dose is increasing slowly, and then reaching a peak more than Conventine immediate release, and then it will decrease slowly. It's covering it 24 hours just with a single dose. What is the advantage of this technique? Uh, the three peaks of the gabapentin IR or uh, immediate release were the reason of the side effect. Uh, you were telling us that patients are falling down, patients are suffering from sedation, patients are suffering from abuse. These three peaks were the reason behind this but with Conventine XR, uh, uh, there are much lesser side effects 
than the IR. It has a better absorption. It has lesser side effects. Uh, then we will move uh, to uh, Sympatex. Sympatex is adulexetine. Here is another option for uh, symptomatic treatment of neuropathy. Uh, Sympatex works with a dual action. You know that chronic low back pain cases is not only suffering from pain. They have also uh, uh, sleep disturbances. They have an anxiety. Here is our hero, Sympatex, which works not only in relieving pain, but it also works as antidepressant, relieving the stress, relieving anxiety and improves mood and sleep. Uh, it is recognized by a lot of uh, international association as a first line treatment in the treatment of uh, peripheral neuropathies. Uh, also, uh, one of the main differential points in Sympatex is that it's allo, -allo technique because the luxetine molecule is subjected to photo transfer uh, transformation within one, max, uh, one month. The only Allo allo technique in the market is uh, Sympatex. Uh, then we will move uh, to the uh, last section, which is the nociceptive treatment of uh, pain. Uh, here is uh, our Stupadol range. I, I came only with, uh, with two forms. Stupadol Fort, which is paracetamol, 1000 uh, milligram. It is used for musculoskeletal pain. Uh, it's very safe. It is uh, um, effervescent uh, granules. Uh, with orange taste, it's very fast and faster than tablets. This is for acute pain. So for the chronic pain, we have Stupadol uh, extended release, paracetamol 650 milligram. It has a new technology, dual release tablets, where uh, here the, the first immediate release top layer, 325 milligram, fast releasing within 15 minutes, within only 15 minutes, and long lasting for up to uh, six to eight hours with its extended release bottom layer. So it has a dual release action. One is fast releasing and the other is long lasting. These uh, two options you can use in case of acute pain and in case of chronic pain. Chronic pain is Stobadol extended release tablets and in case of acute pain, Stobadol fort, which is effervescent granules. The, the last product in our presentation uh, regarding no susceptive treatment of pain is uh, Lepradiclan, which is our uh, diclofenac sodium, 150 milligram. Its absorption is 2 to 10 percent, the oral dosage form. Its absorption to the systemic circulation. So uh, actually it has a minimal side effect or it has no side effect because it, is, it works only locally. Uh, you should apply it uh, one medicated plaster, apply it twice daily uh, in between 12 hours. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mohammed, for this chance. Uh, thank you all. I wish you a great night. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. Uh, it's a very concise presentation. Thank you so much. Now we will move to my favorite uh, session, which is uh, the arthroplasty session. 16 speakers from uh, different Egyptian universities. First speaker will be Professor Taimur al Husseini from Ain Shams University. Professor Taimur will speak about hip arthroplasty for acetabular protrusion. Dr. Michael, can you work on the Dr. Taimur? Dr. Taimur, Dr. Taimur's presentation is a recorded presentation, but he will be with us for any questions. Uh, is it clear? Yes, sir. الصوت مش موجود يا دكتور دكتور مايكل الصوت مش واضح لا مفيش صوت اصلا اوكي اي ويل تراي تو تو شير ات اجين
Can you hear it? Can you hear it, sir? لا ما فيش صوت يا فندم. طيب انا عندي فكره بقى هو لو ابتدى من الأ... لو ابتدى من الاول انا ممكن اعمل الناريشن من هنا لو انت سامعني. اه سامعين حضرتك يا دكتور تيمور بيه. احنا ممكن نشغل معاك الاول بس تقول ال... 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 التوك بتاع معاليك يعني. اه يقولوا من الاول بس يطلعوا من الاول ايوه. طيب اوكي, أوكي. حاضر يا <تصفيق> ما حصلش حاجة. Uh, this presentation is uh, aimed at uh, discussing the acetabular protrusion with special reference to hip arthroplasty. Uh, acetabular protrusion is the medial and upward migration of the femoral head uh, inside the acetabular socket uh, to a point where it crosses the cohular line. Uh, the CE angle of Weber usually is high. Uh, probably more than 40 degrees in most cases of protrusion. Uh, as far as the etiology, uh, the, the historical idiopathic bilateral condition, which is arthrocatadesis or uh, autopelvis, is an idiopathic autosomal uh, condition that affects uh, young patients and uh, has uh, uh, no other cause apart from being idiopathic, we don't know why it happens. But the majority of cases that we see in practice are due to bone softening conditions like metabolic diseases, inflammatory conditions, infection, neoplastic. Uh, a big deal of uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, conditions or post-traumatic malunions uh, 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 results in uh, protrusion acetabuli, especially those with central dislocation of the hip. Uh, failed arthroplasty as well can cause uh, prosthetic protrusion acetabuli. Uh, there is a lot to see uh, and talk about radiographic diagnosis of uh, protrusion. Uh, the earliest is crossing of the teardrop, and this is the least observed by us. Uh, the center edge angle, as we said, uh, is usually above 40. There is crossing of the ischial line, the corner line, by the acetabular line medially. Uh, the uh, crossing of the iliopectinian line as well uh, happens. These are the four grades of uh, the teardrop changes that we see in acetabular protrusio. Uh, the usual open, open one, and the uh, the, uh, the 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 B uh, presentation here is the closed one. Uh, the C is crossed teardrop. And the D is the reversed teardrop, the last degree. Uh, the teardrop usually uh, precedes uh, the, the, the migration uh, process. Uh, when the protrusion is well established, you could uh, see a measurement as by uh, Sotello and Garza, Charlie, we, we call it Charlie, which is the crossing of the collar line deposited in, milli in millimeters uh, from mild to severe. Uh, also, you can measure it through the uh, Ilyuvskia line, which is the uh, uh, Kilgren and, and, uh, and Lawrence method. Uh, treatment for the skeletally immature, now, Samahto, skeletally immature is the triradiate fusion occurring in combined with intertrochanteric osteotomy. Uh, this provides good results. For the young adults, vulgus intertrochanteric proximal femoral osteotomy is recommended. In older adults uh, with less uh, arthritis, the procedure uh, discussed above, which is the intertrochanteric proximal osteotomy, uh, may provide acceptable results. Uh, but for patients with more advanced arthritis or with elderly uh, patients, arthroplasty is the best option. In the arthroplasty arena, cemented or cementless cups could be used either alone or with bone graft or with metal augmentation or device augmentation, uh, usually referred to as a supporting device. Uh, the need for such devices uh, has been more frequent in the past. Now we don't use it much because of the advances in uh, the arthroplasty uh, 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 process, uh, prosthesis arena. Uh, you would need medial bone grafts, usually more and well-impacted, where you use oversized cups 
uh, with good fixation, either by screws or with a well-fixed uh, uh, screwless cup. Uh, here is a cemented cup on a bone graft, and the, as you can see, the, the, the cemented cup is a bit oversized. Uh, compressing the bone graft, uh, which is muscleized behind it, over a layer of cement. Uh, the cement. This is an example on the on the right side of a treatment of protrusio, uh, perhaps a bit too, uh, with uh, a cemented, a straightforward cemented arthroplasty, as compared with the left side uh, showing the cementless uh, reconstruction. Right. Uh, the cementless cup follows the same uh, rules uh, uh, over the impacted uh, muscleized bone graft, but usually uh, this needs more care for the sizing and the reaming process uh, to have a good, well-fixed uh, rim of the cup. Uh, Inline hammering of uh, serial-sized impactors over the bone graft, as you could see, uh, is uh, needed, followed by reverse reaming. That's putting the reamers in uh, incremental size on uh, the reverse side, uh, causing impaction of the graft after being hammered. Uh, the radiographic gland marks uh, on the X-rays, uh, you have uh, a protrusio on the left side and a normal hip on the left uh, on the right side. Uh, it shows all uh, the landmarks uh, that is famous for the radiographic measurements. Uh, note here that the center of rotation of the hip, the red star, uh, is medial uh, to the normal uh, position. And when reconstructing the hip with arthroplasty, you have to take care to uh, return this center of rotation more or less to its uh, normal position uh, with minimal displacement. If there is displacement, it should be less than four to five millimeters. Uh, in uh, an ordered uh, work by Ranawat et al., uh, they reported on uh, 35 hips done for protrusion with the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where 16 out of 17 hips reconstructed uh, had a, a, a revision for the cup, for, for, for the loose cup, where the center of uh, rotation of the cup was more than 10 millimeters from the anatomic center, while 13 hips reconstructed for the cup with less than 5 millimeters of uh, displacement had no loosening. Uh, Garza and Charlie, long time ago, uh, did uh, a, a long series of more than 250 uh, hips, uh, showing that uh, the results of cementless uh, reconstruction is as equal as uh, cemented reconstruction. Usually there is a problem uh, in, uh, in the surgical steps the first one you uh, you face is uh, to uh, how to extract the head, which is deeply seated inside the acetabulum. More often than not, the standard dislocation will do the job for you without causing any fractures, uh, or whether in the rim of the acetabulum or in uh, the femur. Uh, if not, uh, the, the corkscrew in the neck is a very handy tool that you could put in uh, the neck uh, directed to the head and pull it out. Uh, there is also a possibility of ins inside to neck uh, cut followed by dislocation using a uh, skid or uh, a cord screw. There is also a technique which could be done when the when the head is uh, more or less fused and closed. That's to say, with the with the stabular. <coughs> Sorry, which is inside to neck cut and reaming on the head. And lastly, number five is to do a trochanteric osteotomy when all of the above are not suitable for that. Take care of the uh, sciatic nerve. It's usually nearer to the uh, posterior neck and to the posterior trochanter in protrusio, and you might hurt it uh, in a higher percentage of cases. 
Uh, here is an example of why you would need to do a trochanteric osteotomy in a case of protrusio. This is a, a rheumatoid case which needed uh, the, 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 the technique in both hips. Uh, I hope I can change, but it will change. Uh, here is the, the, the X-ray showing <coughs> the need to, uh, to, to do the osteotomy is uh, to clear a space where you can cut the neck, as well as uh, you can do uh, some sort of trochanteric advancement <coughs> in order to do uh, a good abductor function after. As you could see, the trochanteric osteotomy is an excellent viewer of uh, the hip in difficult cases, like on the top. Uh, and with proper uh, uh, circlage, you can get very good results. Uh, reaming uh, also needs to be technically uh, followed up in steps. Uh, here we'll show some videos. Uh, this is a video showing uh, the reaming. Uh, the reaming has finished, a very light reaming, so you don't injure the acetabulum. Then you lay the uh, uh, morselized bone graft. Then you do a serial inline hammering until you achieve the maximum compression. And then you apply the reverse dreaming until the proper size dreamer reached the, the uh, periphery of the acetabulum, yeah. so the circumference of the acetabulum. And after that comes uh, the impaction of the cup, which usually uh, is very stable. And uh, in these uh, times and years, we don't even use cups with screws for that. Uh, here is the X-ray that follows. You have the bone graft impacted. Uh, here is uh, another uh, case with bilateral cementless, one with high protrusion on the right and one with mild protrusion on the left. The issue of using rings and cages, which are myriad, as you could see, uh, starting from uh, the Eichler, the, the, the first one, the Muller rings, the uh, Berg-Schneider and variants and others, uh, is really dependent on uh, the rim. Uh, the rim will tell you uh, what to do concerning the rings. If the rim is a supporting rim, a well uh, acetabular supporting rim like on the left, you would put a graft, a morselized graft, uh, and a cup, as we've shown before. But if there is an unsupporting rim, you would need a graft, of course, to fill the medial side, but you would need a supporting rim on the graft. This is the old-time Eichler ring. Uh, we don't use it now, but uh, the idea is to uh, hang it on the rim of the acetabulum over a, uh, a compressed uh, morselized bone graft, and then apply... Uh, at these times, a cemented uh, cup. Uh, you can use many types of, reamers, uh, of, uh, of rings in order to uh, medialize or lateralize the center, like you will see here. Uh, this is an example done with the uh, Kerbul ring. Uh, you can bend the Kerbul ring in the lower part, as you could see, hence putting the ring two millimeter outside or two millimeter inside, and this will translate into medialization or translation of the head. This is an example of uh, a rim defect in rheumatoid arthritis and the need for uh, the uh, cup and, uh, and ring. Uh, in this case, we've, uh, we've used a protic uh, ring, a modified molar ring. As you could see, the bone graft on the top impacted bone graft, and then the ring is uh, fixed with screws uh, over the impacted bone graft. Uh, to those who do not like to use rings, but need to do uh, some sort of uh, augmentation, the uh, metal mesh is a very good uh, alternative. Meta metal mesh on uh, an, an impacted bone graft, uh, whether cemented after that or cement this, but usually the cemented one is very good. Uh, 
protrusion can be secondary to previous arthroplasty surgery. And in this case, the revision or the conversion, if you might call it conversion, should follow the previous rules. Uh, note that the, uh, uh, the, acet the, the acetabular protrusion affects the uh, uh, offset and the length. Hence, the importance of templating the hip before the surgery. Otherwise, you might land uh, on a shorter or uh, a, a medial uh, hip with uh, lax uh, uh, plactors. Uh, there is an interesting uh, work done in Brazil showing that uh, if you use a, a, a rim impaction uh, acetabular component, uh, the medial bone struts re remodel. These are two hips in the bottom where the medial struts remodeled after using this uh, kind of uh, screw-in cups. As for the outcome, the results of total hip for protrusion with the medial acetabular bone grafting uh, shows success rates similar to that of standard total hip arthroplasty. Uh, when you're doing uh, it well, consider it a solved problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Taimur, for this very interesting presentation. And I think we are ready for questions for this very important topic, sir. Can I, can I start with questions from me, please, sir? Uh, uh, yes, sure. Uh, first question, sir. If I got the uh, hip, uh, ankylosed hip, but not properly fused, uh, can you do also uh, cutting of the neck and reaming inside it, or it is uh, it, it's not uh, it, it's not uh, advisable? Because we used to uh, yes, do you, five reaming. This in, is one, in, in one of the five. One, yeah, one of the five methods is you do uh, a, a, a neck osteotomy. Uh, of course, the neck osteotomy is a is a resection of the neck removal one centimeter or so of the neck. Uh, so you can move the proximal femur and have the stump of the neck in front of you. Uh, if there is uh, what you have described, that there is a partial ankylosis or ankylosis of the protrusion uh, head inside the acetabulum, uh, you can resort to putting uh, a standard uh, small reamer, uh, reaming the remnants of the neck, and then gradually uh, ream uh, the uh, head. But in this case, it is always advisable to do this procedure uh, under image control. Uh, you shouldn't do it uh, without image control because uh, 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 the, uh, some reamers are sharp, some <laughs> reamers are not sharp. Uh, it, the reamer might migrate faster than you can think. Yes, sir. Uh, second question, sir. Uh, if I'm, I put the, the graft, I, I do the reaming over the, the graft. I do it in the classic manner or in a reverse direction? The reverse direction, uh, uh, usually uh, uh, they propagate now uh, reverse reaming on on its own without impaction. Yeah. But I still prefer to do serial impaction first with gradually increasing uh, uh, sizes. Say uh, you go two, two, two to four millimeters uh, incrementally until you reach the size that is uh, suitable for you. And after that, you do the uh, reverse trimming again from a smaller size to a bigger size until you reach uh, a contact or good friction between the circumference of the acetabulum and the reamer. Uh, yes. Usually, you should reach edge of the acetabulum, and at this stage, you stop, uh, and there is no more, more impaction. You apply your, uh, your, uh, your cup. Uh, if you are not sure uh, if the cup is well seated or not, use a, a, a screw cup. Two screws or three screws uh, superiorly will be enough. Yes, sir. Sir, do you prefer to use uh, 3D printing in uh, uh, preparation for such a case, or you 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 just uh, 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 you just uh, a simple to uh, templating the the ordinary templating? The, the, the computer-based templating is is uh, is enough, I think, in these cases, because you are not intending uh, this uh, procedure for uh, tailoring the acetabular uh, component or the acetabular prosthesis. Uh, you are intending uh, by this procedure 
is to know your offset and to know your length. Uh, so uh, you would go having where is the neck resection and uh, you know uh, what type of uh, of cone uh, or shoulder you would need, whether a high offset or a standard offset. Yes, sir. Sir, we have two questions from uh, our dear attendees. One from uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Hifnawi. He is asking about intraoperatively how to judge enough bone grafting for reconstruction of protrusion. Uh, yes, uh, uh, it, actually, it was mentioned uh, within the talk. Uh, what you need is to put uh, a bone graft enough. Uh, so where you do a serial impaction, uh, uh, there is something like uh, three millimeters or so. Uh, your impaction uh, uh, cup is outside the acetabulum. That's to say you would need to do some impaction through reverse reaming uh, equivalent to something like three to four millimeters. After your reverse dreamer has been used, uh, I said that. The, the, the rim of, or the edge of the reverse dreamer, so perilaterally, should be at the edge of the acetabulum, at the rim of the acetabulum. And hence, when you put a cup, it should be following this uh, uh, measure or uh, a little bit protruding, which is better, actually. Yes, sir. The second question from Dr. Mohammed Osman, sir. Uh, is it mandatory to use the head size 32 in protrusion? No, 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 not at all. Uh, uh, Protrusion, as I said, now in, in the year 2024 is a solved problem. You can use whatever hip you would like, uh, but get away from uh, uh, from short stems and uh, and the, 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 the very new uh, products uh, because it's a difficult hip to, to do. Uh, it gives good results, but it doesn't mean it's, a, it's an easy surgery. No, you do not need to have uh, uh, a large size head. You can use a 28 head. Uh, 28 is, is perfect. Uh, you don't need to have dual mobility. Uh, you don't have to need, mostly now, as I, sh as I, as I showed you, you don't need to, to use uh, rings or cups, except if there is uh, a, a rim defect. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. We have no more questions. Many thanks to you, Professor Taimur, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Not at all. Now, our uh, next speaker will be my dear Professor, uh, Professor Dr. Rauf Al Abbasi, Major General Rauf Al Abbasi, one of the eminent stars of arthroplasty in Egypt. Professor Rauf will speak about arthroplasty in field internal fixation of fractures of the proximal femur. Professor Rauf, please, sir. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. عليكم السلام طيب بركاته استاذ بحب اشكر الاستاذ الدكتور محمد النشب على المجهود الرائع اللي بذله في التحضير لهذا الويبينار المفيد جدا الواحد فعلا بيستفيد منه وارجو ان يكون زملائنا الجونيورز بيستفيدوا توداي ام جوينج تو سبيك اباوت كونفرجن اوف فيلد انترنال فيكسيشن اوف ذا بروكسيمال فيمر تو هيب ارثوبلاستي Sir, for, 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 screen, for screen, please, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, failure of fixation is largely accounted for by non-union, loss of fixation, hardware cut out, and evascular necrosis. So possible presence of occult deep infection should always be considered. And baseline complete blood count, yes, RCRP, and sometimes aspiration in overly suspicious cases should always be performed preoperatively. Conversion of total, uh, to total hip replacement has poorer outcome and is associated with a longer operative time, greater cost, and greater morbidity and mortality rates compared with primary internal fixation or acute total hip replacement. The goal of non-geriatric femoral neck fracture surgery is to, pres to preserve the native hip joint. However, reoperation for painful implants, also necrosis and non-union are common. 
The main aim of the surgery in this patient is to provide either stable internal fixation or replacement arthroplasty to relieve the pain, allow early mobilization and functional rehabilitation. And that minimize potential associated morbidity and importantly, avoid the potential morbidity and mortality of the second revision procedure. Femoral neck fracture in adults are a challenge to treat successfully. So they often occur from high energy trauma and result in displaced fracture patterns. Reduction in internal fixation is performed for nearly all younger patients with this fracture in order to preserve the native head of the femur. The risk of healing complication is often high, with the most common causes being osteonecrosis in 14%, non-union 99%, and severe femoral neck shortening in 13 to 32%. A recent meta-analysis estimated a reoperation rate of 18% following internal fixation of young femoral neck fractures. While several case series have described the short-term surgical complication of these injuries, long-term population-based studies remain lacking, eventually require a reoperation or conversion to total hip replacement. The role of arthroplasty in young femoral neck fracture this patient total hip has historically been foregone as a primary intervention due to the finite lifespan of the implant. Total hip replacement is typically considered a secondary procedure for the treatment of complications such as non-union and osteonecrosis. However, the use of total hip replacement as a secondary procedure for internal fixation is associated with a higher complication rate. Advancement in our surplusy system has demonstrated improved survivorship, increasing their viability as a primary treatment for younger patients. A uh, high rate of free operation and conversion to total hip arthroplasty after internal fixation of young femoral neck fracture, a population-based study of 796 patients, find expands in the understanding of young femoral neck fracture outcomes by estimating short, medium, and long-term reoperation rate. One in three patients will require a reoperation, while one in seven will be converted to total hip replacement. Many of the te technical considerations of these procedures are similar to those encountered in the revision total hip replacement. Limb lens discrepancy should be recorded pre-op. Removal of the metal work is a particular concern and may leave stress rises. Cortical defects in the femoral shaft must be bypassed by at least two cortical diameter to avoid periprosthetic fractures. Uh, this is an example of non-union and vascular necrosis was treated by removal of the metal work and doing a total hip replacement as a mental swan. In this case, Still, there is non-union of the femoral neck, which would have been converted to a total hip replacement. The implant shall provide stability, prevent displacement in varus, prevent displacement in retroversion, prevent rotational micro-movements, allow axial sintering along the implant without penetrating into the joint. In case of delayed union and non-union, migration into the joint pelvis should not be possible. This is the way for fixing a transcervical fracture, so you can read screws parallel to one another and perpendicular to the fracture line, obtain optimal compression at the fracture side. Screws should be in an inverted triangular configuration to avoid sub trochanteric fracture. The most inferior screw should rest on the medial femoral neck of the distal fragment to resist various displacement. The second should be placed just posteriorly along the neck, and the third should be placed superiorly. As regards the canalated screw, no advantage to more than three screws. Inform compression across the fracture, fixation most dependent on bone density. As regards the location, avoid posterior and superior quadrant because of blood supply, the cutout, biomecha biomechanical advantage to inferior calcar screw. This is another example of a failed DHS with non-union, 
it has been converted into a total hip replacement. This is a proximal femoral plate with non-union of the femoral neck, which have been converted into a cementless total hip replacement. There's still a field with various deformity of the neck, which had been converted also to a total hip replacement, was, although it was very demanding, these sort of operations. This is a fracture, pertrochanteric fracture, which was fixed with uh, a PFN. And was converted also to total hip replacement. This is an old uh, plate with a vascular necrosis. The problem with this case is to remove the metal work as we have no instruments for such removal, so we used osteotope to take the blade out of the femur. This is a failed PFN, which was converted to a total hip replacement using a long uh, cementless Wagner stem. This is a failed uh, sliding plate with perforation of the femoral head by one of the screws, and this was converted to a total hip replacement using the same technique. Another example of failed PFN which was converted to a total hip replacement using the same technique with the lung Wagner stem. Nowadays, I'm using a standard hip instead of the lung uh, Wagner stem. So this is a broken nail, which was removed and converted to total knee replacement, a uh, total hip replacement, sorry. This is another failed PFN with the screw in the pelvis. The metal work was removed, and fortunately, it was, there was a piece of the screw in the stablum, so I can remove it through the stablum, not doing an uh, extraoperatory approach to remove the screw. Another example of a broken with various deformity. The metal work was removed and converted also to a total hip replacement. This was a severely comminuted pertrochanteric fracture, which I, I didn't uh, fix it, and I went to a primary total hip replacement, and I'm using this technique in severely comminuted pertrochanteric fractures to a primary hip replacement, although it is very demanding, but the patient, uh, it is good for the patient to for early mobilization and to avoid the complication of the PFN. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Rao, for this very interesting presentation. It was a marvelous presentation, sir. And uh, we, uh, if you allow us to start uh, the discussion. Yes, please. Uh, my, my first question from me, sir. Uh, we know that the uh, main decision uh, making uh, item for uh, ch choosing between uh, to replace or to reconstruct, such as uh, osteotomy in case of non united femoral neck fractures, is the vascularity of the head. What's your opinion, sir? I don't believe in osteotomies. Uh, converting the cheering force to compressive force because it takes a long time to yeah. heal and sometimes didn't heal at all. And the patient is young and want to work. So I don't believe it with the new uh, arthroplasty or the new hips. It, uh, the longevity is about 30 to 40 years. So I don't think I go never, I never go to an osteotomy of the neck. Yes. 
Uh, which do you prefer to this pay? This my to opinion. Pay? They'll be That's wrong, it. but this by no, opinion. No, 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 not at all, sir. Which do you prefer to fix uh, in case of femoral nerve fracture, sir? Y using cannulated screws or DHS? In the trans cervical? Yeah. Uh, I, I prefer cannulated screws. Can you, Three can cannulated they, screws, but in basal, to be put in the, right, the correct way. Yeah. And in basal, sir, in basal fracture? In basal fracture? Yeah, I prefer in cervical basal or basal or low basal or high basal. According. No, no, it's uh, it's basal. It's not cervical basal. It's basal, sir. It's not through country. Sometimes I fix it, and the majority of cases I, I go for arthroplasty. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Uh, we have a question, sir. The uh, indications from Dr. Muhammad Osman: the indication of short femoral fem femoral stem and long one. Uh, in case of uh, femoral neck fracture, sir? Uh, nowadays, I have changed my techniques. Instead of putting long stems, I put standard stems. Yes. So I and think there is no difference. Un unless there is a cortical defect, so I have to, to bypass it by two diameters of the fibre. What's your opinion, sir, of using the dual mobility uh, cup in managing the uh, non-united femoral neck fractures? because they said that the uh, uh, survival shape of uh, total hip arthroplasty after trauma is uh, uh, more or less less than in uh, pathological cases. What's your opinion, sir? No, I don't think so. The same, the same results after fractures as regards the dislocation. I have in my series, I have the same results. So it's better to do a arthroplasty without using the tripolar. And in my early cases of conversion, of uh, failed fixation to total hip replacement, I was using constraint, the constraint cups. Then I changed my technique to standard cups. Yes, sir. Uh, we have no more questions. Thank you so much, Professor Raouf al Abbasi, for uh, your very interesting talk and for your participation with us, sir. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, would you please, sir, stop your share? Yes. Thank you so much. يا دكتور محمد لا لسه يا فندم لسه السلايد موجوده على اساس بس استاذنا دكتور اوف بي ستوب شيرنج عشان دكتور محمود بي يبدا يا فندم يس سر Our next speaker will be Professor uh, Mahmoud Mabrouk, a professor of orthopedic surgery at Azhar University and one of the eminent stars of arthroplasty in Egypt. Professor Mahmoud will speak about hemi versus total hip arthroplasty in displaced femoral neck fractures. Welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. بداية طبعا بشكر الاستاذ الدكتور محمد الاشهر الحقيقه على المجهود الوافر والكبير اللي بيبذله الحقيقه ربنا يجعله في ميزان حسناتك حاجه جميله يا جدا مجهود تشكر عليه تعليميا هايب وفرصه كبيره الحقيقه ان انا اكون في وسط الكوكبه العظيمه ديت من جراح العظام وجراح المفاصل يعني والحقيقه الدكتور رؤوف بي يعني صديق العزيز سهل المامورين المامورين عليا في في الطب بتاعي اور توك از هيبي فيرسس توتال هيب ارثروبلاستي ان ديسبليزد intracapsular fracture neck femur. A displaced fracture neck femur is a serious injury, both for a younger and an older individual. This is one of the fragility fractures, and a majority of the patients are older. Patients are often, often frail regarding their general health and the strength of the skeleton, mostly osteoporotic, which increases the risk of a fracture when falling. The optimal treatment of recent 
displaced intracapsular flexure neck femur has been a focus of vigorous debate for decades. All my colleagues uh, decided that, and we hope when we review, when we look for some yeah, literature and uh, some registry, yeah. we hope to find the solution. Anyone? This uh, oh, yes. articles uh, in 27, a randomized controlled trial comparing a bipolar hemi are supposed to start a hip replacement for displaced the intercapsular flexion neck femur in elderly. This study coming from Sweden. Huh? The present study clearly indicates that total hip replacement yields better hip function than bipolar hemi are supposed without increasing the complication rate. Hip arthroplasty better than him. And then we come to this article at 2010, uh, coming from Germany, also comparing uh, primary total versus him arthroplasty. They reported that some evidence suggested that patients treated with total hip arthroplasty for intracapsular hip fractures may have better outcomes than those treated with him or subvast. Now, they nearly the same. And at 2010, this study made analysis of total hip arthroplasty versus hemi arthroplasty also. There was no difference, no difference in mortality, pain, and the infection rates between total hip arthroplasty and the hemi arthroplasty. But the mobility of total hip arthroplasty was more superior than hemi, and the reoperation revision needed in total hip arthroplasty was lesser than hemi arthroplasty. But the average operating room times, blood loss volumes, dislocation rates in total hip arthroplasty were more than hemi arthroplasty. So Total, they reported that total hip should be used in the younger and the fitter patients, while hemi arthroplasty should be preferred in patients with lower life expectancy. At 2018, this article also coming from uh, this, this coming uh, hemi arthroplasty or total hemi arthroplasty in recent fractures coming from Switzerland. They reported that hemi is indicated in patients with limitation to physical activities, self-sufficiency, and walking ability before the fracture. A unipolar implant, they used a unipolar, uh, unipolar implant in a Swedish country, being the preferred option given the absence of improving benefits from bipolar implants. And at uh, this article, at uh, 2019, the in the Journal of Arthroplasty, hemi arthroplasty versus total arthroplasty for the management of displaced intercapsular neck fracture, systemic review and meta-analysis coming from Australia. They said 17 studies were included, totaling 1,364 patients between total and hemi. Total hip arthroplasty is the recommended management option for displaced femoral neck fracture in patients with a predictive, a predicted life expectancy of more than four years or in other in those under the age of eight. More than four year, five years expectancy or the age less uh, more than uh, under than uh, 80. And the hemiarsoplasty is a reasonable intervention for elder patients above 80 and those with a predicted life expectancy of less than five, four years. In the England uh, Journal, New England Journal of Medicine at 2019, they reported that among independently ambulating patients with displaced femoral neck fractures, the incidence of secondary procedures, mean revision, did not differ significantly between patients who were randomly assigned to undergo total hip arthroplasty or hemi arthroplasty. So they said that total hip arthroplasty provided a clinically unimportant improvement over hemi arthroplasty in function and the quality of life over 24 months. And then we come at 2020 for this very famous and very strong uh, uh, study 
total hip arthroplasty versus hemi arthroplasty displaced femoral neck fractures, systematic review and meta analysis of randomized control trials by Ikhtiari et al. They said that 16 studies had enrolled 3,084 patients randomized to undergo total hip arthroplasty 1,531 and the hemi in 1,563. The best evidence showed with moderate certainty that HEMI and the total likely result in similar revision rate, the same revision rate, function mortality, function mortality and the periprosthetic fraction. And the dislocation at up to five years, the same, the same, like uh, revision, function, mortality, periprosthetic fraction, and the dislocation at up to five years with a small, possibly an important benefit in health related quality of life with total hip arthroplast. And now when we go to the registry, one of the most famous register and the oldest one, the Swedish registry 2021, during the 2010s, many saw a potential quality improvement in increasing the number of total arthroplasty at the expense of HEMI. But the Swedish units vary extremely in their use of total arthroplasty with everything from 6 to 94, uh, 94 total hip arthroplasty. And when we look to this figure, the, the, sorry, the blue color represents the hemi arthroplasty. The units who are doing the hemi arthroplasty, while the yellow one, the, the surgeon or units who are doing the total arthroplasty for fractional neck femur. And when we look, Many of them, or most of them, are using hemi bipolar hemi arthroplasty more than total hip arthroplasty. And when we look to this figure, comparing total hip replacement or bipolar or unipolar or dual mobility cup, they said that no difference is seen regarding revision surgery between the implants. We are talking about the fractional neck femur, of course. This correlates well with a current meta-analysis of 16 randomized clinical studies where no difference of clinical re relevance was found between total and hemi for any important outcome. As I have shown before, Ektiari et al. John Bunch, uh, Journal of Bunch, uh, uh, Surgery at 2020. And when they compare in this figure, the, the, the high one is the percentage of hemi arthroplasty and the yellow, the blue one in the middle is the uh, percentage of total and the yellow one just for the dual mobility. They said that it is probably not the implanted choice that determines the patient's future. If we stick to well documented processes and the surgical technique. And they said that additional attempts at improving the result through implant choice is the increase of dual mobility cup during uh, 2010. Uh, like the year, hem hemi arthroplasty at the highest, then total hip arthroplasty, and the yellow one representing the dual mobility cup. And lastly, we will go come to the recent, the most recent annual report of uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery in association with the American Joint Replacement Registry at 2023, just before, just appears a few weeks before. They said that while historically joint, uh, uh, American Joint Replacement uh, Registry, uh, hemi arthroplasty predominates as the most frequent arthroplasty options for femoral neck fracture, there has been a significant decrease in the use compared to total hip arthroplasty between 2012 up to 2022. And when we look, this, the, the red line is the, representing the hemi arthroplasty starting by 83%, sorry, and ending even up till now at 2022 by 72%, while the total hip arthroplasty representing at the last is only about 27%. I mean that up till now they doing or they uh, 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 selecting the hemi arthroplasty and intercapsular fraction neck femur. And if they consider the age, below the age of 60 years, the total hip arthroplasty is, may be used more, but above 60, between 60 and 65, this line is, here switches for the hemi arthroplasty. Above 70 years, 
about 70% of patients are using hemiarsoplasty and going up even up 90 years is 20, 92% are using hemiarsoplasty. And really they highlighted this statement. No significant difference was I defined comparing a cumulative percent revision between total hemiarsoplasty and the hemiarsoplasty for a fracture in Medicare patients aged 65 years and older. So to take home message for the selection of surgical methods for femoral displaced intercapsular femoral neck fracture in the elderly, we should consider several aspects, the age of the patient, the quality of the bone, osteoporotic or not, the type of femoral neck fracture, the needs of the patient and his family for the post-operative situation, the socioeconomic situation, and this is important for our country, the optimal treatment for this fracture remains a topic of debate. Up till now, it still remains a topic of debate and is typically individualized to the patient. For patients older than 60 years, arthroplasty is usually performed, but choosing between total and the hemi deserves discussions. Usually total hip replacement is an increasing utilized treatment option for fracture neck femur. It may be that in less active, older patients, bipolar hemiarsoplasty converts the stability needed to reduce the risk of dislocation and avoid a stabular erosion. And thank you very much for you. Thank you so much, Professor Mahmoud Babrook, for uh, your presentation and your elegant presentation, sir. Uh, we have thank questions, you. sir, for you. But before we go to questions, uh, let me please remember my dear professors and my dear attendees with the second Friday on 26th of January uh, uh, 2024 the International Day of the uh, HIP uh, webinar. We have uh, many, many speakers, 35 speakers from seven countries on uh, next Friday, mainly in arthroplasty. We have eminent figures in arthroplasty, especially in the Indian section. We have Professor Ramish Sen, Professor Rajesh Malotra, Professor uh, Vijay Kumar, uh, Professor Vivek Trecha, uh, Professor v uh, Vikas uh, Khanduj, of course, the president of the SECOT, from UK, Professor uh, Peter Giannoudis from Leeds University. We have a great collection of uh, eminent stars in arthroplasty and, of course, in all aspects of uh, hair problems. Uh, sir, we have two questions regarding your presentation. Yes. First question, sir, from Dr. Kamar Rashid. Why dislocation rate is more in total hip arthroplasty uh, than uh, hemiarthroplasty? Maybe because the uh, in hemiarthroplasty, you have two levels of mobility between the metal heads and the polyethylene uh, cup and between the polyethylene cup and the uh, bony acetab. And usually, usually also, uh, hemiarthroplasty was used or usually used for the elder patients with less activity and so the dislocation rate less than that in total hemiarthroplasty. Yes, sir. The second question, sir, from Dr. Gamal Kasim, is the preference of monoarthroplasty over bipolar one for the purpose of revision or for other causes? Uh, monopolar, usually we didn't use it. And in most countries, there is no there is no space for monopolar. But I think in Scandinavian countries, especially in Switzerland, maybe in Swedish, they up till now used for elder patients for non display for displaced fracture neck femur up till now i have seen them are using uh, thompson processes and uh, they consider it it is one of the solution like that of him arthroplasty and maybe like total help for them yes thank you so much sir we have uh, no more questions many thanks thank to you uh, professor mahmoud mabrook thank you so much thank sir you. thank you now, our next speaker is my dear professor professor said morsi Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Arthroplasty, of course, the eminent star of arthroplasty in Monofaya University and all over Egypt and the Middle East. Professor Said, you are very welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Said will speak about the use of standard stem total hip replacement after failed internal fixation of proximal femoral fractures. Very interesting topic, sir. Uh, good, after good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rashab, for your uh, effort, um, and I hope uh, 
they will be benefit for you in the late days in Yom al uh, uh, I will start my talk. Uh, Full screen, please. Sir. Uh, a liberal placement after failed internal fixation of oxygen femoral fracture. Actually, Dr. Ofer Abbas's book about this, the same topic by my talk, will be uh, in a totally different view. Sir, uh, sir, full screen, please, sir. Full screen, please, sir. Sorry? Full screen, please, sir. Full screen. It's not full screen. Uh, Just... I, are, you, are, are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you. Full screen, sir. Full screen. Okay. Full screen, yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. That's Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, of course, as we all know, hip joint is the most important weight-bearing joint in the body, and any disorder affecting it markedly limits the patient activities. And we also know proximal femoral fractures are very common, and usually uh, um, they are treated by internal fixation. The method of fixation depends on the quality of bone, site, and pattern of fracture, method and technique of internal fixation, and patient compliance. But unfortunately, the instance of failure of this internal fixation ranged from 5 up to 40%. The causes of failure are so many, like non-union, loss of fixation, femoral head osteonecrosis, post-traumatic arthritis, malunion and infection, but the most common causes are non-union and the loss of fixation. These are examples of the fixation, and by the way, uh, uh, the complication from the BFN was found to be greater than the complication from the DHS. This is in the, uh, uh, in the literature. Usually, the uh, solution of this con co uh, condition, uh, failure of internal fixation, is salvage conversion to total heat. And the bio studies showed these high operative, intraoperative, and post operative uh, uh, complications and difficulties in this uh, operation, and my talk will be technical talk about the complication and how to manage it. But uh, uh, the second uh, aim of this talk is to change the concept, again, to change the concept of using a long stem prosthesis in these cases. There are two issues regarding the type of femoral prosthesis still controversial, the use of cement, cemented or uncemented, and the use of a standard stem or long stem femoral component. We did our work uh, between uh, 2070 and uh, 2013. We have 173 patients. Uh, total hip replacement after failed management of uh, femoral, uh, uh, proximal femoral uh, fractures. Uh, we have uh, six patients lost to follow up due to causes unrelated to the uh, study. So we have 167 patients. The aim of the study is uh, to solve the debate about the femoral processes, these two issues, cemented or uncemented, standard or long stem. This has been published in Journal of Arthroplasty in, 19, in 2019. Uh, 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 the use of a standard cemented femoral stem in total hip replacement after failed internal fixation of enter to contact femoral fractures. The demographic data as is usual, but uh, all, most of our patients uh, 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 were management with DHS. This is very important to know the technical point about and the difficulties and how to, blow, to, to, to plan for this operation. The preoperative plan should include the following point. Infection should be excluded by first the history. If the patient has been in working, this is mostly due to the implant failure, not due to infection, but if it is, uh, uh, there is pain in move, in, 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 uh, in rest, and the more in rest than in movement, usually it is due to infection. Is, if there is redness, hotness at site of operation, this is mostly due to infection. If there is uh, uh, the blood count, uh, uh, white blood count is high, ESR and CRB is not mandatory to be elevated infection. This is a very important point. I insist. ESR and the CRB is not mandatory to be elevated in infection. 
you can get normal ESR and the normal uh, CRB in case of infection, in special situation. Uh, uh, and again, uh, joint aspiration, if there is doubt, we can show, th they can prove that there is infection or not. X-ray should be uh, done before the operation to determine the quality of bone if there is any bone condition and of, 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 uh, you have to uh, focus on the greater cortocanteric fracture for uh, post-operative rehabilitation. You have to have a complete set of removal of all the implant and you take care of this point very well. Uh, you have to have a cannulated flexible remar. Why I will say it in the technical point and how to manage it later. You you should have we should have anticoagulant, uh, and we should do very about the physiotherapy. How we will speak about it. About the difficulties first the skull. The, we have a skull. If this skull you we can use this the same the same skull or the same skin incision. For the operation, and in our work, we did that because we use a, a lateral hardening approach. But sometimes, other surgeon don't use the same, uh, won't use the uh, posterior or anterior approach or whatever the approach. They can do it, but they have to put in their mind the rule of seven. What is the rule of seven? If you decide to do another incision in patient. During operation and the, dif the difference of time between different time between the first operation and second operation less than three months, you have to have a seven centimeter of skin about. You have to have a seven centimeter skin about. This is rule of seven. Uh, you have to know it. As regards implant removal, uh, removed, you have to remove the. Uh, you have to to make dislocation before removal of any implant. Why? Because this can avoid the uh, can avoid the fracture during external or internal rotation and the manipulation of the femur. You, you have to make the discussion first and then remove the uh, uh, the uh, screws. Uh, you have to get a complete set, as I said, of uh, implant removal. You have to look at the broken screw and have you have to remove it. And but the migrated screw you can. If they are not a new way, don't lose time and effort to get them out. If you are, they are not a new way in doing the total. Screw holes, how to, if you we use the cement in these cases, and I prefer cement, and I will say why, because if we use cement, we can't uh, uh, give efficient pressurization in, pressurization in presence of screw holes. There are so many methods to prevent, uh, to um, uh, close these holes before cementation in these uh, cases. In the literature, we filled it with cement. We use bone graft in the holes. We use short screws, then uh, implant the process, and then remove the short screws. We can even use the tip uh, 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 of finger of the assistant to close the screw while visualization of the cement. And these screw holes uh, give you, uh, if you are not uh, closing these screw holes, they will be stress riser and they will be uh, enter about the bibliocytic fracture. And the old theory and the old concept is to use a, a long stem. And this is changed. Uh, uh, in, in our work, we used uh, uh, cement uh, to fill this screw. Our technique is to put a trial process inside a, 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 a latex uh, glove and we make the surface of the latex glove so it by, uh, by uh, betadine or some antiseptic solution, put it inside the medullary uh, canal, the trial process is wrapped with the latex glove and we uh, put, uh, close the screw holes with bone uh, cement uh, uh, by this way, we are sure that the, 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 the cement doesn't go inside the uh, medullary canal and that it does not interfere with you during uh, uh, putting the new processes. This is our technique that is published. Uh, distorted anatomy in our cases, we found adhesion, malunion, closed the medulla, and we will say how we manage it. The consequence of this is a malposition of the comp component and enter operative variable fracture. 
Uh, how to manage these difficulties? As I mentioned, uh, in this 167 patient, we used the old skin incision because we use holding approach. Uh, we uh, don't remove the implant except after dislocation uh, because these uh, screw holes will make may make uh, fracture because the patient is osteopathic. Uh, what is severely osteopathic, not osteopathic only. There is osteoporosis that did, that usually lead to the fracture, and there is more osteoporosis during because the failure of the implant make it um, non-movable, non water non bearing, and this will add to the osteoporosis. But that screw holes has to be closed for better visualization of uh, the semen. You have to handle this patient very gently because, as I said, the osteoporosis. We get about 10, 20 percent of our cases is a, a, a problem in the medullary canal with like fibrosis or obstruction by the school school tract. Uh, there is uh, uh, after removal of the screw, there is track of bone inside the medullary canal that prevent you. So you have to use a, a flexible remo, remo. We put we don't use the arm. We just use a, a remo with olive tip. We put it in the medullary canal and we. Uh, Pass it till it hit the uh, femoral condyle. We get a hard stop uh, point, and then we aim over it uh, 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 any obstruction. For formal antiversion, we uh, usually the lesser to counter is fractured or not present or distorted or malunited, so we use the adductor to break it, uh, of the lower end of the femur as a landmark for. Uh, uh, for, for femoral uh, bosses uh, uh, antiversion, and this uh, in this part the anterior medial edge of the bosses should be in line with the adductor tubercle, not in front of the adductor tubercle, like like Lazarus to cantal. No, it is should be in line with the adductor tubercle. We use cemented stem femoral bosses with 32 millimeter head. In all cases, why 32 millimeters? What about the bipo uh, 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 bipolar or dual mobility? Dual mobility is proved to be good in these cases, uh, but when in two situation, when you are not in the in, in the start of your begin in the in the beginning of your career, you are not well experienced, so you are uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, effort of uh, dislocation, so we use uh, dual mobility is uh, for giving uh, both uh, for the antiversion. Uh, uh, this is number one. Number two, if you have money, because the dual mobility is more uh, uh, expensive. But if you are well experienced surgeon, you you can use thirty two millimeter head. Uh, why thirty two? Because it is somewhat less less uh, uh, easy to be dislocated. And as, as we all know, in these cases, the instance of discretion is higher than the biomyototal rate due to other causes. On the stapler side, we can manage if it is bone defect, we can use uh, uh, bone graft, but usually we uh, use a standard uh, cemented stem. Or you can use uncemented, yes, you can use uncemented uh, cup, but in my opinion, this is my opinion, based on scientific basis. I use in these old ages, osteopathic basis, cemented bothesis. Why? Because the best, best uncemented bothesis in best hand is even with robotic, uh, bo uh, uh, robotic uh, assistance, the first uh, contact and the first stability will be 35% only. And the 90 or 100 percent stability will be gained by bone in growth inside the bosses. This is the basis, the scientific basis. This is written in the literature. So these patient osteobotics, that mean it's bone cells are not capable of making bone in growth like the normal patient or like a patient with without osteoporosis. So this is my opinion to use cemented uh, uh, implant in both female and semen based on scientific basis. The most about management we have, we, we should improve the general health and the blood loss. We should use isometric ab, uh, abduction exercise in the hip and isotonic exercise of the knee and ankle. We should use this before the operation and after the operation. Isometric means we don't uh, we can we can don't uh, we we can not move the uh, hip joint during uh, these exercises. It's isometric, mean the metric or the distance is the same. But we can use uh, iso iso uh, isotonic exercises, uh, movement with the knee and ankle off both feet to prevent of uh, prevention of DVT. You have to use prophylactic antibiotic for two days. 
full weight bearing is allowed in the first week after the first week uh, post operatively we have to uh, take care of mycetes ossificant because the instance of this mycetes ossificant is uh, 10 times more than the instance of mycetes ossificant by my total hip due to other causes. We, in our work, we used uh, endomycetes 25 milligram CDS three times every day. In other situations, you can use uh, 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 one radiation, uh, uh, 800 radon, one radiation three, three days after the operation if you have facility in your, uh, in your hospital. Uh, you have to kill and treat osteoporosis. Our results uh, with mean follow up 6.5 uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, years. Uh, uh, the mean high risk score is about 80, and the improvement, the mean improvement is about 40. Radiologically, using the standard criteria of Harris et al., and using the zones of Gun, Gun and the McNeiss for the Astablam and uh, Charlie and Dilly in for the uh, zonal for the femur. Uh, we have implant stable in 162 out of 167 in uh, uh, about uh, seven year follow up, and but we have no late babyocytic fracture. These are examples. This is uh, tocantec, failed DHS, and total hip ten years after uh, in, in the vision. This is seven years after the failed implant. This is five years, and this is six years. As I said, most of the literature before our paper is about using the long stem processes, and some papers, if you like Zhang and Li, uh, uh, say we can use a standard stem, uh, not long stem. We, when we looked at the uh, why they say long stem, this is based on a theoretical hypothesis popularized by Dennis et al. But in, in clinical orthopedic 1987, it is a biomechanical study on cadaveric bone, uh, and he uh, recommend to uh, uh, bypass the testicular screw hole by double the femoral canal diameter in order to prevent, prevent the set rise. The biomechanical experiment, if we look at the paper, you will find the biomechanical experiment was carried out by Dennis on femoral bone with hole nine millimeter. Nine millimeters means more than one third of the femoral. This is about uh, 40 or 45 percent of the usual diameter of the upper part, which is range from 2.5 to 3.2 millimeter in the normal population, and the male, the female, babe, uh, uh, was less. And this hole will not fall with, with not filled with bone cement. This is his hypothesis, and this is the concept we are using based on this hypothesis in nine in 1987, more than 40 years. In recent studies, by mechanical studies, they found that when that effect is less than 20 to 30 percent of bone diameter, we found this caused no significant reduction in torsional stress. Stores et al. found that femoral hole filled uh, defects filled with bone cement, if they are even 30 percent, but when filled with bone cement, have the nearly same biomechanical strength of the normal bone. And in the clinical basis, there is no clinical study that proves that the instance of babyocytic fracture increase we, who, when we don't use, the, when, when we don't bypass the distance school holds by double the femoral canal diameter. No clinical study till now in the literature. Based on this, and by the way, the, the reference is based on my paper, uh, the reference if you want to get these references, uh, biomechanical references. So, the Advantage, if we look at the advantage of using the uh, uh, long stem, uh, yes, uh, they can support most of the femur in this osteoporotic patient. But this is not true. There are many, many disadvantages. It is more expensive in, related to, in relation to the standard stem. And despite that, they support most of the femur, still, so that is still present at the, at the distal end. It is still present. So the standard stem is better. On revising the closed stem, and this is a very important point, the difficulty of the extraction is so much more, and the probability of heterogenic bone destruction is high, and they extend more distal. So this is all disadvantage is not present in the standard prosthesis. Conclusion, as far as the reliability and cost effectiveness, start, uh, standard stem cemented femoral prosthesis showed excellent survival shape at midterm follow-up without very bosetic femoral fraction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my dear professor, Professor Said, for this very interesting presentation. We have uh, two questions for you, sir, please. 
Yes. First question from Dr. Gamal Kasim. Post-operative time at which vigorous exercises can begin, meaning physical therapy. Unfortunately, Dr. Gamal, at the end of this uh, session, we have one of uh, our dear eminent uh, physiotherapist consultants will speak about also physiotherapy after total hip replacement. But of course, Professor Said will uh, give us his experience regarding this I, I, subject. As, as I said, physio physiotherapy is very important, pre-operative and post-operative for patient rehabilitation uh, to get satisfaction for the patient. We do isometric exercise for the hip joint. What is means by isometric exercises? We, uh, the patient, can contract and relax the muscles without moving the joint, without moving the limb, the limb. So there is no pain. The pain is present when he moves the limb in preoperative cases. The, 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 the implant is loose. So this is isometric exercises for the hip muscles. And isotonic means you can move the movement for the knee and the ankles to strengthen the muscle, to prevent the DVT, to make the patient able to walk easier because this patient usually the, the, the movement of them after the operation will be difficult due to the uh, affinity, the, the weakness, weakness of muscle and general weakness. They are all the age patients. So you have to make your plan isometric exercise for the hip and isotonic exercise for the knee and ankles before and after the operation. Yes, sir. The second question, sir, from Dr. Tarek El Dogman. Uh, can you repeat, please, your protocol to prevent myositis or cervicans? Yes. Prevention of myositis or cervicans, three things. First, I, I, I wrote it in my presentation don't use diacermy a lot. Diacermy increases the instance of myositis or cervicans by 30%. So don't use diacermy uh, a lot in these cases. Second, about you can use after the operation either endomycetine, endomycetine, 25 milligram, three times daily for one and a half months. But take care of two things. Take care of the gastric ulcer and the renal function because endomycetine, endomycetine is very harsh on the stomach and the kidney. So take care of this. Second, third, third, third uh, option is to make one shot of radiation, one shot of radiation. If the radio service do doesn't know, it is 800 radon. This shot measured by something called radon. 800 radon, one shot, three days after the operation. This is written in the literature. It is not my 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 my, uh, my experience. This is written in the literature. Whatever you will do, this is this will prevent the myositis or something. Thank you, sir. The last question, sir, from Dr. Uh, Muhammad Al Hanafi. Please, can you mention again tips of closure of screw hole during cementation? Okay. There is many methods like putting uh, cement, putting bone graft, uh, putting screws uh, just to close the holes, and then after do putting the uh, uh, implant, you remove them. And uh, uh, there is uh, also some people said uh, the assistant to put here, uh, his tip of finger in the screw holes. My technique is a new technique is to make try after I made everything and then the very the female, I put a, a trial uh, stem uh, that I will, I, I, with the same size, I will put the uh, actual processes, trial stem. Uh, and I wrap it in the uh, latex glove. I make the latex glove, the surface of the latex glove, wet by antiseptic solution like betadine, and I put it in the medullary canal. After that, I, I put bone cement in the holes and let it dry. When, why I put the, the uh, trial processes? To be sure that there is no bone cement inside the canal, that will prevent me or will make their processes go virus or valgus or anything. So it is it, it will prevent this. It will make it will be close these holes without affecting the uh, putting the processes uh, actual processes in its place. This is my uh, technique that I uh, published it.
Thank you. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, the last question uh, from Dr. Aydrus Mohammed. Uh, please, again, rule of seven for incision. Yes. For skin incision, this is this is general rule. It is the plastic surgeon know it. If there is any operation and the skin incision, and you have to have another operation in less than three months, and the period is between the two operations, less than three months, you have to have a seven centimeter of the skin away from the your new case, your new incision away from the old incision by seven centimeter of skin. You have to use, to, 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 to leave seven centimeter of skin between the first incision and the incision of the second operation. If the time between the two operations less than three uh, months. If some, uh, uh, to complete, some authors say, say three and some authors say six. But after six, you can do whatever you want. After six months. Some also say three months, and some also say six months. After six months, you can do whatever you want, but before this, you have to have the rule of seven. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Said Morsi, for this uh, very interesting presentation and for this very fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Our next speaker will be uh, my dear professor, Professor Baha Karana, professor of orthopedic surgery, El Azhar University. Professor Baha will speak about strategies and factors affecting blood loss in total joint arthroplasty. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, nice uh, uh, webinar. And Rabbana Ga'alu fi Uzan Hassanatik. It's an uh, honor for us. Just assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, for all this day, I'm just uh, sending this uh, smile, just to smile and uh, make it easy uh, for a little bit. Okay, this is the point of, to be highlighted. Uh, what is the technique to use to minimize the blood loss? How can we blood loss preventing and the strategy and which is the following the technique have been shown to reduce the blood loss? The pre, uh, preoperative blood management the technique for the orthopedic are critical to avoiding the risk of consequences, as uh, the risk and the consequences associated with allergenic blood transfusion. The benefit of reducing this blood uh, loss is less the surgical stress, reduce the blood uh, in the field facilitating the surgical, and improve the bone cementation and decrease the morbidity and the mortality. The factor affecting the, the blood loss is the site of the operation, large area of raw, uh, raw bone, previous surgery, infection or tumor, proliferative bone disease, operative technique, and uh, use technique to reduce the blood loss. Why we concerned about the blood loss? The, the, there is a, a multiple risk and consequences of blood transfusion like the, uh, blood borne infection, uh, isoimmunization, anaphylactic reaction, and the hemolytic reaction. Also, there is increase in the length of the hospital stay. Also, there is increase in post to complication. And also, we, ha we have a question about the quality of the blood, the cost, and the availability of the blood component. So this is a risk of transmission, HIV, it is one in half million, and, and hepatitis C, it is one in 100,000 patient, and the hepatitis B, one for 550,000 patient. So in the total knee, it will be associated with significant blood loss, it is up to two liters, with 10 to 30, uh, 38% of patients required allogenic blood transfusion. In total, hip to the blood loss also it is about 1,700 milliliters, and the 32 69 of the patient needed blood transfusion after total joint. So the goal it is to reduce the needed for allergenic transfusion in the patient undergoing replacement surgery. There is are, are many strategies and the factors affecting the uh, preoperative loss in the patient undergoing the total joint. So remember this preoperative patient you you have. Preoperative anemia assessment, intraoperative blood uh, conservative, including red cell salvage, and postoperative toler tolerance of anemia by transfusion decision support. This is a method of reducing. We divide it into three stages: is a preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. And the preoperative the detection and diagnosis of anemia in the intraoperative and apply all uh, uh, appropriate modalities for blood preservation and post-operative quality of the care and the multimodular treatment approach. 
The preoperative factor in the full detailed history is a, is a must, and then physical examination to, uh, to identify any, uh, any drugs uh, with the bleeding tendency, drugs and treatment if possible. The drugs that, uh, such as anticoagulant, antiplatelet, non-steroidal, selective serotonin, even uh, some herb medication like uh, gurgle uh, and can uh, lead to uh, uh, coagulabilities and the sign of the bleeding tendency. So in the preoperative, look for the age, advanced it is associated with decreased perihemo, hemobiotic activity, elderly patients are at risk of great blood loss following lower extremity due to malnutrition, poor preoperative hemoglobin, and decreased for intrinsic coagulation or capability. Also for the gender, the women are at high risk for transfusion following uh, long extremity total joint arthroplasty. And also look for the weight and the body mass. In the, uh, in the body mass, low body mass uh, index uh, is associated with high risk of transfusion and uh, high body mass associated with more operative time. Also, antiplatelet uh, um, agent, uh, remember that most of these agents must be uh, stopped about five, five to seven days uh, preoperative. So the lower risk patient with aspirin should be stopped about seven days to 10 days before operation. High risk patient is suggested that aspirin should be continued during the whole period of the operation. Also, the antiplatelet factor, which is uh, many drugs can be uh, also, but uh, as a rule, the seven to um, from five to seven days must be stopped to be preoperative. And also, you have to do a preoperative investigation for hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, uh, PT and PTT, uh, uh, INR, bleeding time, clotting time, platelet fibr uh, fibr fibrillation, uh, and also variation and optimize of the other par parameters <coughs> like nutrition ventilation and uh, uh, also reduces the transfusion requirement. Also during the PA, which is uh, the preoperative autogenic blood donation, you have to look for the CPC, also for the blood group and the during, uh, during history for anticoagulant and the antiplatelet. Also supply this patient with IR therapy for four weeks preoperative oral ferrous sulfate or IV uh, iron in anemia of chronic uh, disease. Also, we can recommend human erythropoietin to increase uh, the RBC's volume. Also, in the preoperative, we have two methods: is the preoperative planning and preoperative autologous donation bed. So, the preoperative planning is to reduce the time of operation. It is very important. Performing the planning made and discuss with the anesthesiologist the treatment involving more than one extremities. Uh, uh, and enlarges the surgical team with a simultaneous operation at two sides. If you have a complex procedure to do it in two uh, stages manners. So in the preoperative, in the Red Cross program, mostly widely used for this uh, uh, band, which is a preoperative autologous donation. This is uh, applied from the patient with 12 to 17 years, weight less than 100, hematocrit uh, more than 34%. And last donation must be one week period to the surgery. And also you have to supply this patient with iron. And this is the way to do the preoperative autologous uh, blood donations. The advantage of the, pre, uh, the, the bad is uh, reducing the risk of infection and reaction, but still immunological and allergic reaction can occur. So the drawback of bad, which is the patient time and effort, uh, the patient has to be for four weeks, uh, 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 coming to the hospital, the cost uh, combines the autologous donation against allogenic donation, and also the complication of lipotomy reducing anemia. And also, this is the preoperative management. Now we go for the intraoperative management. So the technique to minimize the surgical blood loss, uh, what uh, what we call the white line surgeon in an operative strategy and the fact of various intraoperative strategy are available to help reducing the blood loss. Uh, in the interoperative, you can divide it into four, uh, four uh, uh, arms, is the, the surgical related technique, and it sees the related technique, interoperative red salvage, and artificial blood uh, substitution. So the surgical uh, uh, related technique, the preoperative planning and enlarging, enlarging the team, minimal invasive surgery, controls the blood loss during surgery, 
by ventricular hemostasis, uh, pneumatic tourniquet, electrocautery, and arterial uh, immobilization, uh, and the position of the patient. This is uh, the arms for the intraoperative uh, procedure for conservative. Uh, also, the position of the patient operative site above and delivering the heart decreases the blood loss, and the head up or tilting favorably the arterial hypotension in the upper part and venous pooling in the lower part of the body. And this is some position which can help you in, uh, during uh, to reduce the blood loss. And, and the interoperative, also the operative time increases the time that will be increasing the blood loss using the tourniquet and minimal invasive and in navigating minimal invasive uh, treatment. The tourniquet, which is a, a very a good tool for to reducing the blood from the limb, reducing the total blood loss, provided dry operative field and they make exposure and dissection more precise. We have two types, non-inflatable where, and the pneumatic tourniquet. And also the using, the, uh, it depends on the calf, uh, calf size, single versus the uh, dual bladder design, calf shape, and this uh, disposable versus uh, reusable, a special application and the limb protection and to look for the inflation pressure. And this is uh, the, the tourniquet, it depends on the patient age, the skin, the blood pressure, shape and the size of the extremity and the dimension of the curve. The method uh, of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the lowering the calf pressure, this is the way you reduce the pressure of the calf to prevent the complication of the, uh, the calf uh, pressure on the skin. They make a double tourniquet to change the point of compression, control the hypotension to bring down the systolic blood pressure, uh, Doppler technique to, and the pulse exometer to confirm the absence of arterial pulse, tourniquet inflation based on the limb occlusion pressure, calf pressure synchronized with the systolic blood pressure. What's about the, the, the effect of deflating of the tourniquet? When you are deflating the tourniquet, there will be uh, so there will be metabolic changes. This depends on the size of the extremities, duration of the tourniquet time, physiological status of the patient. So th this will release anabolic, uh, uh, anaerobic metabolic uh, factors, which lead to changes in the cardiovascular effect, has a respiratory effect, cellular circulation, hematological effect, and the metabolic and temperature change, and also ca can cause the tourniquet pain and pharmacological effect of this drug. So the contraindication for the tourniquet, you have to be considered severe peripheral vascular disease, sickle cell disease, severe crushing injury, diabetic neuropathy uh, patient, and patient with history of deep venous thrombosis and the pulmonary employees. What about the uh, uh, intraoperative? Use hypotensive epidural anesthesia, this is a controversial or acute demophilomic uh, hemodilution, ANH, and the cell salvage we will speak about in a uh, uh, second, and the pre- and the intra-articular uh, injection of bibovacaine and epinephrine. So the, the intraoperative uses antifibrinolytic agent like transaminic acid and uh, other drugs, uh, non-pharmacogic and hemostatic agent, uh, for uh, using uh, topical fibrin seal, uh, sealants, they are compressing the most, uh, most of the fibrinogen. This advantage is the cost of this uh, material. Uh, using bipolar or monopolar, in monopolar electrocautery is, is a device that delivery electric currency. Bipolar uh, sealing uh, deliver a radio frequency energy. No significant difference in the post-operative drain output uh, in both uh, uh, cases. What about the platelet rich plasma? They contain the platelet and the factor uh, whose the hemostasis and the wound healing effect, hemostatic rule is still debated. Uh, but the using of the bone wax, which is a mixture of peas, paraffin, uh, and uh, uh, parameters, controls the bleeding from the bone surface during surgical procedure. Complication is some allergic can, reaction can be occur or inflammation. What about sealing of the femoral tunnel? This is a very important step during total hip and uh, the intramodular alignment system in the total hip. You have to sealing this femoral tunnel to prevent more blood loss. Sealing this tunnel about with the bone in order to minimize the blood loss. 
Uh, for anesthesia related, this is maintain normal thermal uh, intraoperative transfusion target and uses hypotension, tension, regional anesthesia better than general anesthesia, monitoring the coagulation parameter, acute normal volume hemodilution, blood salvage technique, and autogenous free donation in a bad and pharmacological agent. This is some drugs which cause hypotensive technique, uh, like beta blocker, and also in the inhalation. Hypotension is secondary to those dependent decrease in the left ventricular functions. Region anesthesia, it is preferable for this patient in a central neuroaxial block, such as spinal or abdominal anesthesia, are associated with reduction in the blood loss during uh, surgery. The preferential extended to the post aortic period to, uh, to especially for osmotic and vascular surgery. Systemic hypotension inducing by sympathetic blocker and decrease the venous tone uh, in response to the blood salvage effect. So the intraoperative also the uh, technique for acute normovolemic hemodilution and cell salvage. The acute normovolemic uh, hemodynamics, this technique is a pre-donation of the blood by the patient immediately pre-surgery, pre uh, pre uh, while circulation volume is maintained by crystalloid, then the donating blood re-transfuse post-operative. This is the intraoperative blood salvage, which is a collection of the blood from the uh, cleaning operative field, uh, uh, automated cell salvage devices, then suction the, uh, the, 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 the blood, washing, concentrated, re resuspended, and reinfuse again. Uh, useful for revision surgery, but contraindication if there is an infection or malignancy. And the suitable for the knee, the blood loss is in the post operative. Interoperative with cell salvage, uh, look for the disadvantages, the cost, and also the equipment and the operator they needed for this uh, operation. At least two a unit of blood loss and the uh, debris and the infection uh, can be transmitted uh, in some cases. This is a hemodilution, which is a technique we use uh, in many, many patients, just to take a blood make a solution, intravenous solution, then take this blood with re, re replacement again. Uh, we have two types, an acute normal volumic hemodilution and the non-acute uh, normal volumic uh, hemodilution. In the acute normal volumic uh, dilution, uh, retrieve blood from the patient and replaced by intravenous fluid, so the patient, uh, we, uh, the, the patient is with the uh, Hematocrit 20, 21 to 25, the blood stores in CPD, bag it at the room temperature for six hours to preserve the platelet. So during the surgery, the patient bleeds diluted blood and the treat blood transfusion later. Uh, the, this uh, rare use in uh, orthopedic is a hypovolemic uh, devolution, dilution of the blood flow uh, of the patient, so less blood uh, RBCs during surgery will loss. Uh, we have a blood substitute, which is uh, called artificial blood. We have a free fluorocarbon basic oxygen carrier, which is our convenient, largely available, economical and oxygen free, and is uh, storable for oxygen carrier. And also we have a hemoglobin based oxygen carrier by licensing the red cells from the human or animal and provide the hemoglobin. And also we have a, a platelet substitute, which is under uh, under investigation. And we have now possible to grow the RBCs platelet and the neutrophil in vivo from the cell for therapeutic use. Also, we have arterial embolism, uh, 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 blocking the bleeding vessel by chemical agent, mechanical agent, uh, particular or microsphere of gelatin form, injection liquid turned into thick gel-like or spongy mass. Use the for a section of the tumor with the blood loss. Then, um, now we come to the post-operative, which is a very important part in the post-operative strategy, the compression of uh, anti-cryotherapy, limb position, post-operative cell salvage, drainage, clamping, post-operative thrombo prophylactic. Then, uh, compression and uh, cryotherapy, elastic compression bandage, after two ten years, reduce the swelling, and uh, the blood loss, cryotherapy devices, the gel bag or circulating ice water, could be efficient uh, and minimize the blood loss. 
limb position very important in a different knee flexion position like hip elevation by 60, 60 degrees combined with the knee flexion have uh, been reported to have promising result in reducing the blood pre-operative uh, pre blood loss. Also post-operative cell salvage, which is uh, collecting the blood which is coming from the drain, and this uh, can uh, return and uh, unwash the filtrated the blood and can be used. After this period, it can be used as a vacuum drainage and uh, the disadvantage is an expensive procedure. What about the drainage and the clamping? Clamping of, uh, of the drain should help them minimize the blood loss by acting as a tamponade. Drainage clamping combined with uh, transaminic acid can reduce the blood loss after totally. Post-operative frame of uh, prophylaxis, uh, we have two mechanisms in the mechanical and pharmacological strategy. The mechanical by avoiding the dehydration and early mobilization and the low limb uh, motion exercise, gradual compression stock, uh, stockening, and the foot pump and intermediate pneumatic calf compression, and also in ferrovella cava filter may be uh, appropriated for selected group of high risk patients. Also, you will, can use pharmacological Professor, part. Time, please, sir. Yeah? Yes, time, please. Unfortunate uh, uh, heparin, low molecular, and then off. This washing and, and washing blood transfusion can be used. And uh, this is uh, blood conservative. Autologous blood transfusion increase RBCs, reduce the blood loss. You, have, you, can, you can calculate the amount the blood loss. And also, you can use uh, apoprotein, turinine. And also, this uh, has an advantage of using in cardiac and deliver surgery. Transaminic acid is antifibronic agent, decrease the conversion of plasmogen to plasmin. And this is in the, uh, in the hip arthroplasty, use 15 milligram kilogram as induction, and it can be repeated. And also, the knee, you can use the same, and you can repeat it. The dose also can use locally intraarticular transaminic acid. And this is another drug you can not use it routinely. And intraoperative patient monitoring very important, and they optimize this take home masses, optimize the preoperative red cell mass, and minimize the preoperative blood loss, optimize tolerance of postoperative anemia. And this is uh, uh, preoperative, postoperative, and intraoperative uh, protocol. And thank you for your attention and thank you for, uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We have uh, three questions for you, sir. First question from Dr. Gamal Qasim for DVT patient who are at risk if stopping anticoagulant for a long time, what's the precautions? Uh, can, can you repeat it again, please? If for patient? DVT patient who are at risk if stopping anticoagulant for a long time, what's the precaution? Uh, this patient, we have to make a uh, good investigation for him. And sometimes you can ask the, uh, the uh, vascular surgery to make a filter for, uh, for uh, to prevent the DVT again. As a reflector. Yes, sir. Second question from uh, our dear uh, friend, Dr. Adnan El Moflah from Yemen. Any rule uh, for mixing the tranexamic acid with uh, normal saline for wash for washing the wound to reduce blood loss? I think you have mentioned this, sir. Oh, yes, yeah, so the transaminic acid is one uh, of uh, antifibrolytic, and we can use the systemic and the local loss. Yes, sir. The third and last question from Dr. Ahmed El Qasim from Iraq, uh, use of trans tranexamic acid is a routine for every patient, regardless age and cardiac condition and risk of thrombosis and the dose to be used. To be avoided for any uh, complication, use it locally. We inject it after we close the joint and we can use it locally, uh, in the, uh, especially in the total joint replacement. And we, 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 we found that there is a reduction in the blood loss. Yes. Uh, Professor, thank you so much, and thank you for being with us, sir, and for your very fruitful scientific uh, participation, sir. Thank you. Our, our next speaker will be Professor Mustafa Abdel Khaled from uh, uh, from Mansoura University. Professor Mustafa will speak about difficult primary total hip arthroplasty. Professor Mustafa, how are you? Thank you very much. Professor Al-Ashab, for your kind invitation 
but I have a question before I'm starting. Are you leading this webinar since 1.30 uh, BM? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard work. Uh, I will start with the, uh, my uh, talk by difficult primary total hip replacement. Also, primary total hip will be defined in most of the cases. Certain principles must be followed to obtain expected functional results. And despite of the total hip is being one of the most successful orthopedic procedure, certain difficulties may be encountered, which might affect the results either involving technical difficulties and increasing the risk of complication. It is necessary to restore biomechanics of the hip, restoring the liver arm and the correct position of the implant to limit impingement and wear from the different components. A lot of uh, difficulty may be encountered which uh, uh, interfere with the good results, especially in obese patient, which needs a long operative type and liable for infection and bleeding mortality, neurological diseases. Also, difficult due to biomechanical anomalies such as the coxavara, dysplasia, with the acetabular side difficulties and the femoral side as well, hip ankylosis and arthrodesis, and protrusion, which consider the restoring the center of rotation and might need a bone grafting, and fracture whether in the acetabulum or in the proximal femur with the post-traumatic sequelae, so you have to plan for this difficulty to overcome the uh, risk and that interfere with the uh, uh, functional results. So you know which surgical approach should be used for soft tissue, which implant you chose, and how should the implant be positioned in relation to the patient anatomy. I'm going to present a series of cases with the uh, possible difficulty you may face in such uh, surgery. This is a, a, a girl, 14 years old, child, with bilateral dysplastic hip and history of multiple surgery, whether in the pelvic side or in the femoral side. This is how to manipulate her life. And this is the X-ray. There is a disfigured anatomy of both hips with a long lasting implant, which seems to be inside the medulla of the proximal femur in both sides. In addition to liability of the deficient acetabula. And this is the pre-X-ray the plate, the plate in this side is inside the medulla, so this is a difficulty. And then the right side is well, the plate in the uh, uh, inside the medulla. And this is the uh, how to overcome the implant. In the uh, left side, we try to remove this uh, plate. However, it is difficult to be removed, so we start to just put the rasp away from the plate and uh, uh, we're grafting the deficient acetabulum with the bone graft and screws and this is a, a two years follow-up. And the other side, which is the right side, we plan to remove the plate through a window in the uh, proximal femur. Fortunately, we remove it easily and we do by a cemented uh, uh, cup and cemented, uh, cementless cup and cementless uh, stem as well. And this is how she moved after two years from the operation. The other case is 30, it is the 43 years old female with a history of femoral neck fracture underwent valgus osteotomy. 
So the difficulty here is the uh, 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 proximal femur deformity. In addition to how to remove uh, this plate, we remove it and we do osteotomy and applying a cementless cup with the plating to fix the osteotomy site. And this is the follow up. The third case is a 45 years old male with a history of fused hip in the right side and the previous surgery on the uh, uh, left as well. The left, the right side was uh, 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 nearly enclosed and the left as well with the uh, uh, retained implant. So we plan to remove the uh, implant in the left side and we just remove the screws by slivering the bone from the head of the screws and leave the plate in place and then we do a cementless hip and post sites. And this is a follow up. Another case of a girl, 19 years old, with a multiple surgery, whether in the pelvic site or in the uh, femoral site, in addition to pelvic support osteotomy, as Dr. Gamal Hosni described this procedure th this morning. So there is a problem here with the deformity of the prox proximal femur after pelvic support osteotomy, in addition to deficient acetabulum in both sides. We plan for re the correction of the deformity, drafting the acetabulum in both sides, and cementis cup and cementless stem as well. Another case of dysplasia, and here the difficulty is the, uh, the, 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 the rostration of the hip center, in addition to the loss of the uh, uh, bone stock in the acetabular side. We do a medialization of this cup with grafting of the medial wall and the superior uh, uh, superior, posterior superior wall of the acetabulum, in addition to uh, 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 shortening and restore the rotation of the femoral head. And this is the follow up. And I will show you the seven years, seven years, how the graft is marvelously incorporated with the acetabulum and it looks a, a near normal acetabulum with the, a good healing. This is a, a seven year after seven years. And this is the clinical, I think. She can squat. And the problem in this girl is how to abduct to get married. Another case of a male, 23 years old with bilateral dysplasia and the multiple surgery in the, in the femoral and uh, acetabular side. And there is two DHS here. He, seeks for the equalizing the leg lens at first and then he done a leg lens and then got a fracture on the lengthening side fix it with the with the uh, long plate so he came to me with this x-ray with the trial of removal of the dhs in the uh, left side unfortunately the surgeon cannot remove it and he got a fracture of the proximal femur, so had more difficulty in this side. And the other side, it looks good with the 
union of the flesh. So I plan to do the sequential hip, cementless cup in the acetabulum, and long stem cemented. And the other side I have done a dual mobility, cementless dual mobility in the acetabular and in the femoral side. I removed the screws in the proximal plate and leave it in position. Unfortunately, he fell down, got a fracture of the patella, and I fix it. And this is the last X-ray, and he is doing good so far. And this case is a 50 years old female with a history of previous hip surgery. Uh, this lady got a cetabular fracture and ended by arthritic hip and one of our seniors have done this type of osteotomy just to overcome the pain from the hip and then she came to me after 32 years of this surgery she is doing well with the gradual pain in the uh, uh, left hip and propagated to acute pain so I asked myself, she is doing well for 32 years after this type of osteotomy. It looks some of ischial, uh, 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 some of, of pelvic support or McMurray osteotomy. Then I did the X-ray and I found this crack in the proximal femur. Have you seen it? So this is explained the severe pain. Actually, I am convinced that any change in the anatomy around the hip will disturb the mechanics of the hip, especially if it got with the uh, hip fusion and increase the liver arm of the lower limb, so it get fractured in the proximal femur, and I have seen a lot of such cases. Back to this case, the difficulty here is the crack and the protrusion of the head with the deformity of the proximal femur. So I have done it with the cementless acetabulum and cementless stem as well and doing a wiring of the uh, crack. And it was easy to introduce the stem. This case is a trauma case with a smashed proximal femur. The trochanter is fractured, the head is fractured and dislocated. And this is uh, a lady, 23 years, recently married and came in the uh, emergency hospital. So I am planning for just to know the anatomy and restore it. So I decided to fix it in such a way and see how the uh, how it goes in. After six months, this is the uh, uh, hair position. So I go remove the implant and do normally standard stem and she is doing well. Thirty six male with the post traumatic osteoarthritis and the history of acetabular fracture is three months, smashed the acetabulum with medialization of the head. The posterior, the posterior wall and the posterior fragment of the acetabulum disrupted. So I am going to graft it the acetabulum and fix it with the screws. And this is a post X-ray with the cementless cup and uh, stem. Uh, by the way, I am rarely use the cemented implant. 
whether in the acetabulum or in the uh, femur. And this is one year with the good incorporation of the defective acetabulum with the graft. And this is the clinical. Another case with the uh, fracture acetabulum with the central dislocation as well. The same technique I used. Reconstruction of the acetabulum using a bone graft and screws using a cementless implant. And this is the X-ray in the final follow-up. Also, there is a history of acetabular fracture fixed by plate and screws with severe shortening and the proximal migration of the head. I have done the grafting of the acetabulum as well and shortening using a Wagner cementless stem. And this is after 10 years. See how the graft taken. Another case of hemiasoplasty with severe medial dis displacement, protrusio, which contain defect. I've been using a head, the whole head was fashioning to cope with the defect and fix it with the screws. And the last X-ray, eight years now, with a good incorporation of the uh, uh, graft. This is also a hemiarthroplasty with the protrusion and the difficulty here with the broken the cement. Fortunately, it is not a periperiocytic fracture. There is just penetration of the tip outside of the cortex. So there is a dual difficulty in the acetabular side and in the femoral side. I have done a grafting of the defect of the acetabulum with the screws and apply a cementless cup and the embedded graft for the femur as well, putting a mesh just to keep the uh, uh, bone graft inside the medullary canal and putting a cementless long, a cemented long stem here. And this is the final follow-up, which looks nice, whether in the acetabular side or in the femoral side. Now we come to the disease. I have done this case when this lady, 15 years old, for some uh, 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 septic arthritis. And I have done, I converted it after uh, 15 years. Oh, 15 years, yes. She is now 30, over 30. And I have done dual mobility after removal of the uh, Copra head. And this is the how to manage her life. After four years now, after six years, six years of follow up now. She is doing well so far. Another case of arthritis, I have done it 22 years ago. After acetabular fracture. It's the same. Dual mobility cementless. It looks nice postoperatively and he is doing now after three months. This is a female, 55 years bilateral protrusio. I think this is arthrocatadysis or autoacetabulum, which is the idiopathic type. I have done it. Severe protrusio, bilateral cementless, with impacted on graft, just impacted on graft. Have a look. This is after 15 years. 
she is doing well with the nice x-rays, I think. Another female with bilateral protrusio, restoring the normal hip centers in both sides with impacted graft bilaterally. And this is 25 years old female with bilateral protrusio as well. I have done grafting of the acetabulum with cementis and short stem bilaterally. And this is after one year follow up. She is doing well. Many difficulties should be expected and addressed in performing total hip, including acetabular bonus stock deficiency, abnormal anatomy, neurological disorder, dysplasia. Surgical exposure and placement of the component can be a major challenge, resulting depend on the multiple factors, including age, the disease pathology, overall bone and or soft tissue deficiency, careful preoperative planning is of great importance to identify difficulties and how to manage. With proper surgical technique, good to excellent results can be expected and thank you for all. Thank you so much, Professor Mustafa Abdel Khali, for presenting such a difficult cases, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I, I can start with uh, some questions from me, please. Yes. For, for for such a difficult cases, sir, if it is avail available for me to use the PSI, patient specific instrumentation, do you prefer to use it, sir, or just the ordinary instrumentation? Really, I have no experience with the uh, patient-specific instruments. I do it myself on my hand. Yes, sir. So in, in such complicated cases, sir, if it is available for me, uh, do, do you prefer to uh, expose yes, yourself? Yes, yes. For sure, for sure, it will facilitate. Yes. It will make it more easy for you to use it. Yes, but sir. actually, I do it in my hand experience if... I have the rights to, to call it experience. Yes, sir. Very long experience, sir. Thank you. In, in such complicated cases and deformed cases, uh, such like the case you have presented, sir, in uh, the uh, uh, pelvic support osteotomy, if it, it yes. needs, I, I was asking Professor Gamal Hosni at the start of this webinar, if it needs a total hip replacement, do you prefer to exhaust yourself in making a reconstruction and osteotomies and doing total hip, or if it is available for you to use a custom made hip replacement? What's your opinion, sir? Actually, I hear the, the, the presentation of Dr. Gamal Hosni. Trust me, any change in the anatomy around the hip will uh, 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 affect even the mechanics of the hip itself. I have seen a lot of cases with the uh, types with the different type of osteotomy they if they went to a fusion or limitation severe limitation of movement of the hip it will get a fracture because the long liver arm i have seen a lot of these cases with the uh, 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 trochanteric fractures proximal femur uh, fractures the fracture neck of femur uh, because the stiff hip will affect if it is not in a proper mechanical position. So uh, uh, the pelvic uh, uh, support osteotomy will distort uh, the uh, uh, anatomy around the hip. In such case I presented, uh, uh, she came to me, she can't uh, uh, walk rightly uh, 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 in recent days, and there is some difficulty in abduction. She is a female and she needs to be, uh, uh, you know, for her, uh, she is worried about her sexual life. Uh, uh, the difficulty here is how to correct, how to correct the, the, this deformity. And the problem here is the anti-version of the uh, 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 introducing the stem. It is so difficult. Uh, I'm using the transcondylar axis of the knee uh, uh, all through my surgery to put the uh, 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 stem in the right position. Uh, this is what I think. 
Doctor, you have you have presented a case with uh, bilateral uh, uh, bilateral D, uh, DHS, I think, and severe limb length discrepancy. That soft tissue release or even adjusting the limb length will not overcome this the severe limb length discrepancy. In such a case, do you prefer to lengthen the shorter limb or shorten the longer uh, limb? No, 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 no at all. I prefer to do a release as you can relieve the, 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 the hip and do uh, uh, shortening osteotomy. And it will correct, trust me, we will correct the length length discrepancy in both sides. If you do it in a right, in a, in a right way, uh, you can't do a, a, a lensing in such a case. It will make, we do a shortening, it is not a lengthening. You mean the yes. second case I presented with the severe dysplasia of the hip? Yeah, I, I have done a, a shortening. I have done a shortening, not lengthening. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, we have two questions, sir. One from Dr. Ahmed from uh, El Iraq. Uh, at which situation you can put total hip replacement in neglected DDH in the false acetabulum? I am not prefers to put the, 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 the cup in a false acetabulum. The prerequisites for a good results in treating a dysplasia for, for me to put the cup in the anatomical or near the anatomical position, not in the false acetabulum. I haven't done it at all. Uh, another... One of the prerequisites for a good and long time uh, 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 good results is to put, is to try to restore the normal anatomy, especially the hip center. In the uh, dysplasia, you put it in a little bit medialized, and in the protrusion, you, 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 you uh, uh, move the hip centers laterally, putting a graft. So put the uh, cup in the uh, uh, anatomical position, you have got a, a, the, the best results from my point of view. Yes, sir. You don't accept high hip center at all, sir? No, 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 no. Yes, sir. No. Uh, another question from Dr. Ahmed. CT scan is routinely done in such difficult cases, sir? Yes, I have done the CT. Yes. Yes, sir. The last oh, question is... طبعاً بس حضرتك عشان أنا عندي ال questions عطلانة أنا محمد عبد العال محمد بيه تفضل يا فندم ااا كل مصاحبة بي أولاً فرش وقول و thank you for these very 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 difficult cases thank you but I have uh, uh, two questions first one what about the uh, abductor mechanism in especially in the long standing cases of fusion secondly uh, uh, what about the sciatic nerve injury? How could you uh, protect the, your sciatic nerve in these very difficult cases? Your experience, please, sir. <laughs> I have done this, the, the uh, conversion of, of these two cases. I have done the arthrodesis, one uh, for 15 years and the other for 25 years. I am using, I, I was using uh, the, uh, the technique uh, modified technique of Schneider in that days. Uh, 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 I am uh, uh, transferring the, uh, do you know this, the, the Schneider technique for the uh, arthrodesis, extra articular arthrodesis? Yes, which sir. On the, and using the compression side by using a cobra head plate and the pelvic osteotomy and so on. Uh, the problem here is the, uh, uh, he take off the greater trochanter, he do as an osteotomy of the greater trochanter, and take the uh, 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 the part of the superior neck and head as a liver yes. bone and put it as a graft. Yes, uh, I am. I'm, I'm in, in, in in the cases uh, I published it in bone and joint. I think in the no, in the Egyptian jur journal of uh, orthopedics. I I I am not using the pelvic osteotomy. I'm just using a compression of the plate and I'm doing uh, 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 intra and extra uh, uh, articular arthrodesis. I combine both. I dislocate the hip and decorticate the uh, uh, cartilage and uh, the, remove the cartilage from the head and the uh, uh, reaming the acetabulum. And then I put it in, inside in the uh, uh, arthrodesis position 
and fix it with the cobra head plate. And using the greater to canter, I just transfer it to the anterior, the the anterior uh, area of the trochanter. So it was easy for me to find the greater to canter as well. Uh, 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 it's also uh, the bone will be uh, frayed, and you but you can find the abductor. Uh, uh, with a sliver of bone and put it in the trochanter again. And I tested the, uh, uh, the stability. So in post cases, I worried about the stability. So I using the uh, dual mobility uh, total hip. So it is easy for me to reconstruct what is present of the uh, abductor again in their anatomical side. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mustafa, for this very interesting talk and very interesting uh, cases. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Ayman Suleiman, uh, Ayman, Professor Ayman Suleiman from uh, Alexandria University. Uh, Professor Ayman, you are with us, sir. Hello. Yes. <coughs> Professor Ayman, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. I'm going to say one more thing, when we talk about the science and the science, we talk Dr. Ayman Suleiman. فطبعا ده شرف كبير ان حضرتك معنا دكتور ايمن بي شرف ليا والله يا دكتور محمد اي وود لايك تو ثانك يو بروفيسور الاشرف فور ارينجينج ساتش ا فيري فروتفول ويبينار اند تو انكلود مي ان ذيس جروب اوف فيري هاي رانكينج سيرجنز يو ميد life difficult for me to talk after uh, Professor Mustafa Abdel Khali uh, but uh, my life is difficult but his cases are more difficult actually so uh, <clears throat> my talk will be uh, about large head total hip replacements um, and uh, I work in Alexandria which is the uh, summer place for the Egyptian where they like to swim and uh, have a nice time. <clears throat> we know that total hip uh, replacement is the second most satisfying surgery in medicine after cataract, uh, and this success led to broadening of indication to include young and active uh, individuals. Unfortunately, the ideal process is still not uh, clear. If you look into any registry, you find that the four most common reasons for revision is uh, uh, aseptic loosening, dislocation, deep infection, and fractures. Uh, so uh, if we uh, look at uh, dislocation, uh, uh, we uh, find that it is the second most common reason for revision, and actually is the first reason for revision in the first two years. So this is one of the important factors to add to the problem, dislocation also is the complication that is not improved during the new generations, either due to uh, different uh, patients' uh, activities uh, or uh, the operation became a routine operation that is not taking the uh, important uh, precautions to avoid such a, a problem. To add to the problem also, patients still feel that the artificial hip is artificial. So if we can improve such a, a point, it will be a very important factor. Um, the range of motion is influenced heavily by process design. And there is in the literature and in practical, there's a wide variety of head diameters ranging from 22.25, which is the Charlie head, uh, to approximately 60 millimeter, which is uh, actually the metal on metal, which is now not uh, uh, allowed to be used. In friendship, size, height, color, status doesn't matter. It is true, but actually in life, I think, especially as regard the head size, it is, it matters. So the head size directly influences the technical theoretical range of movement and increasing the head size from 28 to 36 yield an increase of 13 degree in the technical 
again theoretical range of movement why theoretical because the true range of movement of patients is heavily influenced by other factors like the orientation of the components surgical technique muscle muscular and soft tissue situation patient characteristics the lens the sports activities and a lot of acti- of uh, factors to improve the range of uh movement you can either increase the head diameter or decrease the diameter of the taper or you can if you bevel the ends of the cup the uh, polyethylene cup it also improves the range of movement so these are the three techniques to improve the theoretical range of movement and uh the jumping distance is an important factor which is the distance the head has to jump before leaving the cup it amounts in hemispherical cups to 50% of the head diameter so if you increase the head diameter the jumping distance needed to dislocate will be will need to be very uh, big so increasing the head diameter improve stability this is uh, a very simple fact The disadvantage of increasing the head diameter higher friction moments which have to be supported by the fixation of the bearing components so increase the friction could be one of the important factors for the observed problems with cup loosening and increased wear so it is either because of mechanical uh, instability or uh, uh, increased wear and biological loosening nearly all publications document a decrease in the dislocation rate for an increase in head diameter so this is a well proven uh, in the literature for head with a 28 mm diameter the range of dislocation from 0.6 to even 3.6% for smaller head diameters the 22 mm it can reach up to 18 mm uh, 18% for larger heads the rate may <coughs> are very low and uh, it range or it might be only about half percent for heads more than 38 mm so uh, literature proved that it is with no dislocation rate but again you have to remember that theoretical gain in stability obtained by using a large femoral head is negligible in cases there were uh, there is a mal oriented cup so a mal oriented cup will uh, destroy any uh, benefit of large heads this is important we reviewed about 29 total hips with metal on metal articulation performed in 27 patients in our hospital and uh, if you remember this metal on metal Uh, usually it is more than 40 mm in diameter so i wouldn't uh, go in details but i will just show you example of cases which is difficult i know that it is less difficult than uh, in mansoura i think life in mansoura is uh, more difficult than alexandria actually professor abdul khal um This is a 14 a 14 years old uh, boy with the uh, slip upper femoral epiphysis which has binning and complicated by chondrolysis and this metal on metal head inserted four years follow up <coughs> also sequence of septic epiphysitis with very uh, uh, obvious shortening metal on metal applied with large heads also a uh, 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 complicated birth disease with this uh, six weeks follow up three months six months all these complicated cases after uh, AVN of uh, after trochanteric fractures we know that these cases are has a lot of complications and we apply this uh, large heads for such cases also fractures in the stabulum and in the head using these large heads uh, 
improve the uh, 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 Harris score and with minimal radiological loosening. But the most important that there is no dislocations. So large heads is very good to sort out the problem of dislocation. We know that. And if you are after stability in difficult situation, large head is the answer. This is what I believe. And also, I believe uh, of uh, uh, the, that the dual mobility, which is a very uh, modern uh, uh, solution for instability, acts like a large head. I don't believe that it acts uh, like a two or three joints, as they say. And remember that dual mobility is a bipolar inside artificial stability. And our knowledge about the bipolar, it never acts like two joints. It's always one joint only moves and the other one is usually stable. So dual mobility is a bipolar inside artificial hands. And in fact, dual mobility only advantage is being a large head. But the problem is that it is a wobbly construct. This is my belief, and I am sure that this opens a lot of discussion, but this is my opinion, actually. And the new literature proved that there is no difference between stability after uh, dual mobility and large heads. Uh, so I think dual, uh, large heads is the uh, solution for Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ayman Suleiman, for this very interesting talk about a very important topic. And thank you for the statement, Professor Ayman, that uh, the large head is, uh, is, is a, uh, you have, if you want to obtain the benefit of the large head, you have to obtain the proper orientation of the cup and the, and the neck. I don't only depend on the large head to prevent the dislocation, although I have improper orientation of the cup. I'm right, sir? Yes. So it is important to apply uh, the principles and avoid uh, great uh, uh, bad orientations either for the stem or the cup because this will never be connected by any other mean, either head, large heads or dual mobility or whatever. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, if we have any questions to Professor Ayman, I think we have uh, no more questions, sir. Thank you so much, Professor Ayman, for joining us. Okay. It was an honor, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Muhammad Saleh, Professor uh, of Orthopedic Surgery, Swiss Canal University. Professor Muhammad will speak about a very important uh, topic, which is a very prosthetic hip joint infection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment algorithm. Professor Muhammad, please. Professor Ayman, would you please, uh, sir, stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you, sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Ashab, for uh, your kind invitation for this uh, uh, valuable webinar. Uh, my talk uh, today uh, Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Full screen. It's okay. full screen. Okay. Uh, my talk uh, today for uh, for this night uh, on very prosthetic joint infection. Uh, my talk will include uh, challenges of very uh, prosthetic joint infection, definition, incidence, risk factors, etiology and pathogenesis, classification, diagnosis, and radi radiographic findings, prevention, and treatment. The challenges facing uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, uh, due to uh, hip infection, uh, 
uh, is one of the leading causes uh, of failure following uh, primary and revision total hip uh, arthroplasty and still continue to, to be the major cause of morbidity and mortality after uh, uh, joint replacement. Why? Because uh, it has uh, been shown to induce uh, uh, immunosuppressive state, and this is something dreadful. Patient with uh, uh, infection has an immunosuppressive state. In a study in, uh, published in 2018, uh, 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 authors found over expression of programmed cell death receptors uh, uh, is is a common and uh, is common in infected tissues, and may be a risk factors for failure in this patient. So, uh, this is how much uh, uh, this problem uh, we face in in our uh, practice. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there is no single definition for a periprosthetic uh, 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 joint infection. Uh, no single definition has gained an, ex uh, 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 an acceptance internationally, uh, maybe due to uh, the complexity of the problem and uh, uh, wide geographic variations. Uh, 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 also, uh, uh, expensive tests are uh, uh, every day are uh, produced uh, to do, to find a, a, a single uh, test to uh, diagnose periprosthetic joint infection, uh, and also that uh, 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 disagreement over the accuracy of some included uh, tests. Uh, to try to define the periprosthetic joint infection, MSIS in, 11, in 2011 uh, and AIC, ICM in 2013 and ICM uh, modified the, the production of 2013 to, uh, to try to produce a, a, a unified definition of periprosthetic uh, joint uh, infection. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the the, uh, the very early definition uh, included uh, uh, major criteria and minor criteria for uh, definition of a patient with uh, with infection. The major criteria, as we see in the in the table in front of us including uh, uh, two positive cultures of the same organism or sinus tract with uh, evidence communi communication to the joint or visualization of the process. Uh, any of these two major criteria uh, means this patient unfortunately has a, a periprosthetic joint infection. Uh, the minor criteria uh, uh, included uh, the serum uh, investigation and the synovial fluid or uh, synovial tissue investigation included elevated C-reactive protein or D-dimer, elevated ESR, elevated white blood count in the synovium or synovial brain, uh, positive alpha defensine, Elevated uh, 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 synovial polymorph uh, polymorph nuclear percentage and elevated uh, synovial C-reactive protein. Uh, very uh, early definition uh, 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 defined the patient with with BGI uh, having four of out of uh, these six uh, uh, criteria. Uh, the the modification modification of this uh, uh, definition uh, give a score for each of these criteria. So the elevated C-reactive protein and D-dimer has two. Uh, ESR one uh, uh, elevated synovial white blood count three alpha deficiency three elevated synovial polymorph uh, nuclear percentage two. 
elevated synovial C-reactive protein 1. Patients have 0 to 1, is not infected, is free. Patients have a score from 2 to 5, is possibly or likely infected. And the patient has 6 or more score, is definitely infected. So, after application of this criteria, according to ICM 2018, the last uh, modification, infected patient has six scores, unlikely f uh, or uh, unlikely patient or uh, inconclusive patient, four to five, and uh, aseptic or non-infected, zero to three. This modification has uh, 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 more or less uh, uh, agreement, unified agreement, because its sensitivity is uh, up to 97.7% and uh, specificity up to 99.5. Uh, the incidence of our problem uh, is in total HIP, in primary total HIP is 2%, and this is a large number, and in revision, total HIP is 15%. Uh, this problem costs a lot of money, billions of dollars every year. So, who's one, who's patient of, of uh, 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 our patient with total hip or uh, uh, hemiarsoplasty having uh, the possibility of our, or the risk factors of having uh, uh, BGI? Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, patients with blood transfusion, smokers, male patients, old age, alcohol abuse, diabetic patients, and ASA, three or more. And this is the last one, ASA, the American Society score, if I see zoologist score, maybe the, the, the most important item uh, in the risk factor. So patient has three or more uh, would have a high risk uh, of having a BGI. Also patients with bilateral arthroplasty, patients with allogenic transfusion, patients with atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, and urinary tract infection, patients with, uh, with long uh, hospitalization, all these patients are uh, subjected to BGI. Most important, and my message to my uh, junior colleagues, uh, uh, the following slide. Patients suffering from superficial surgical site infection, SSI, after primary hip arthroplasty, has 35, 35 times possibility of having BGI more than others who has who have no SSSI. So this means that we should not leave patient with superficial surgical site of infection with no care, with no close care. I don't leave this patient for the relatives to dress or this patient uh, or the untrained nurse, I should follow uh, this patient closely. Uh, uh, our experience, if we treat uh, 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 superficial infection early and perfectly, we eradicate this infection, we will avoid at least half uh, of the patients with uh, BGI. Patient related risk factors include uh, considered significant for development superficial surgical wound infection or old age high body uh, mass index and rheumatoid and diabetic patients. So again, my message is to take care of the surgical superficial surgical site infection.
etiology, 50% uh, of the infection uh, are caused by staph aureus, staph epididermis, and other uh, coagulase, coagulase negative uh, staph. Fungal infection has role, but rarely affect, uh, rarely causing uh, uh, BGI. Uh, about one to two percent of the affected cases. Researchers, doctors, surgeons found staph aureus causing early infection. Involved in early infection in about third, uh, one third of the cases. It is also the leading cause in late infection caused by hematogenous spread, staph aureus. In one third of the cases of the early infection and about 40% of hematogenous spread late infection. Whereas delayed infection is caused by less virulent microorganisms. Pathogenesis of the infection is caused by direct invasion, sinus tract, wound dehiscence, hematogenous, and infection in uh, teeth, dental work, or gallbladder. Classification, the, the most widely used classification is early onset, which occurring in the first three months, and fortunately has no biofilm, and the, the, the bacteria not invading to the prosthetic bone interface. Delayed onset occurs between the three and 12 to 24 months. It manifests the, the symptoms and signs uh, uh, from three to 10 weeks after surgery. Late onset infection occurs beyond 24 months. After two years of the surgery, maybe you, you forget the patient, you will have someone you did uh, say to you, you did the surgery for me and now I have been uh, uh, on walking uh, some uh, hotness at site of operation and so on. The manifestation will, will be uh, uh, 10 weeks after implantation. Unfortunately, biofilm will be created by all bacteria in the late onset infections. Late hematogenous infection can uh, caused by bacteria of the skin, respiratory, dental, UTI, uh, which should change it from asymptomatic to symptomatic. Again, superficial surgical wound infection uh, can cause a lot of patients, and treating these patients can prevent a lot of cases of BGI. Diagnosis. Diagnosis of deep periprosthetic infection made if at least three of the following five criteria were present. Strong clinical and radiological suspicion. Clinical as hotness, swelling at the site of the surgery. Draining sinus is, as we said, it is a major criteria. And radiological signs as focal osteolysis, osteolysis. Number two, abnormal ser uh, uh, serology as ESR and seriactive protein. Professor Morsi said ESR and seriactive protein uh, uh, can be normal. Yes, it is very sensitive, but it's not specific. Very sensitive means you can rule in patients who has ESR and C-reactive protein high, very high, and have surgery few weeks or few months ago, you can suspect this is an infection. 
but patients who has normal or low ESR and seroactive protein but has other symptoms and signs of infection or loosening, you cannot say it is not infection. So you cannot rule out infection by low ESR and seroactive protein. Positive joint aspiration, uh, evidence of virulence, and positive intraoperative culture. This is algorithm for diagnosis, including uh, the knowledge we mentioned before. We'll take history uh, and uh, examination with basic seriology, seriology as ESR and seroactive protein. Uh, if normal, uh, you will have patient with no infection. Uh, if no clinical signs or normal uh, uh, serology, so you will search uh, uh, for other uh, uh, causes of this loosening, if any. Uh, uh, if there is symptoms, but the, seri the serology is negative, you will have joint puncture. Uh, maybe you will need to repeat the joint puncture. And in uh, some studies, you need three to four uh, or to five uh, 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 culture uh, samples to, to have a, a, a negative uh, 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 results. If, if it's not conclusive, you may need biopsy from the synovial, uh, 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 from the joint, from the synovium to exclude or include. Radiological findings include periosteal reaction, scattered batches of osteolysis, generalized bone resorption without implant wear, transcortical sinus tracts, and implant loosening. An X-ray of patient with prosthetic joint infection showing osteolysis, reactive sclerosis, and subsidence of the implant. Another X-ray. Bone scan has a role uh, in, in diagnosis of uh, 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 infection with sensitivity 99% but specificity is low, 30 to 40 percent. Prevention? Professor, Professor Muhammad, time, please, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so Prevention much. Prevention is very important. Uh, in patients with rheumatoid, we should stop drugs uh, four to six weeks before surgery. If intraoperative, we have to uh, give very operative antibiotic. Another uh, important is deprivement and uh, uh, mechanical wash during uh, surgery. Post operative wound closure with subcuticular sutures uh, should be done. Uh, uh, treatment, including non-operative in patient unfit for surgery or refusing surgery, operative including uh, irrigation and debridement, one stage exchange arthroplasty and two stages exchange arthroplasty. Uh, the debridement antibiotic and the implant has role in, uh, uh, in patient with uh, three months uh, uh, operation uh, and symptoms is less than three weeks. Uh, the the implant is well fixed, well aligned, uh, and uh, uh, acute infection irrespective of the time of the in contraindication of, of uh, this procedure, presence of sinus, MRSA infection, and uh, uh, in cases where the implant will be removed. Uh, we have a uh, score for uh, 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 estimating this procedure will be successful or not. One stage of uh, uh, revision 
uh, is getting popular uh, nowadays and uh, it's uh, indicated in no sinus tract, no prolonged antibiotic, proper soft tissue uh, to cover the wound, minimal to moderate uh, bone loss, no bone graft, uh, uh, and the, the organism causing infection will known, absence of immune compromised patient. Two stages is a gold standard still, uh, 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 gold standard for infected joint more than four weeks, uh, indicated for in patient medically fit for multiple surgery, uh, patient infected with more than one virulent uh, organism, uh, reduced bone stock, uh, benign uh, clinical exam with normal lab, uh, including removal of the prosthesis, removing the biofilm was much much uh, uh, more than important to remove the biofilm insertion antibiotic uh, spacer the second is removing the spacer and reimplantation of a new prosthesis time for reimplantation is uh, still uh, uh, there is a difference between uh, many studies 2 weeks 6 weeks or, or more. Uh, uh, if nothing seems to work, salvage procedure will be done, uh, like resection arthroplasty, arthrodesis. Uh, these are algorithms also for uh, uh, treatment mentioned before. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the professor, Dr. Ashab, and the uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, very interesting talk about very important topic. We have two questions to you, please, sir. First question yes. from Dr. Ahmed al Qasim from uh, Iraq. Uh, for a patient with multiple joint replacement of hip and knee, and one hip is infected. So if aspiration is needed to confirm diagnosis, uh, you will also aspirate the sound one. No, sir. I aspirate only the suspected joint. I don't aspirate uh, the, the other joint uh, uh, for the fear of uh, infecting this uh, sound joint. Yes, yes, sir. The second question, sir, from Dr. Ziad. Well, what's the period time between the acute and chronic PGI? And in acute case, what's the plan of management? And thank you. Uh, for the acute case, uh, we drain, uh, we retain the implant, drain and uh, retain the implant if fixed and well aligned. Uh, the time, uh, less than three months, most operative will consider it acute case. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation and for your par participation with us, sir. Thank you so thank much, you, sir. Thank you. Professor Mohammed, would you please stop your uh, sharing your screen, please, sir? Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Michael, the Tasgil of Dr. Ayman Abid and Dr. Ayman Masafir Oman. Dr. Michael? Yes, Dr. Will share it. Can you share the Tasgil of Dr. Ayman B? Sure, of course. Yes, sir. One second. Any problems, Dr. Michael, with the uh, recording? Um, I don't know. Um, the, the, the video... Uh, okay, just one second, Doctor. One second. Yes. yes. Yes, it's working. And the voice? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be with you this um, Is this it clear? Evening. 
Um, at the beginning, I would like to thank yes, it's clear. dear friend, um, uh, Professor Mohammed El Ashtab, for his kind invitation to this uh, prestigious uh, webinar. Um, in the coming few minutes, I'll be speaking about total hip arthroplasty for trochanteric fractures, the indications and techniques. And the agenda of this um, 15 minutes talk will include why have I chosen to speak about trochanteric fractures and total hip arthroplasty for this category of fractures and the difficulties that surgeons usually face. I'll hint on how to evaluate patients with non-united fractures, and then the indication for total hip in acute trochanteric fracture and um, uh, give some video demonstration of technical details. Um, trochanteric fractures uh, still um, is a problem and a challenge for hip surgeons and general orthopedic surgeons as well, because there are um, whatever technique of fixation being used for these fractures, um, we cannot say that the success for fixation is 100% in any of these techniques, despite the development of the um, uh, uh, instruments and tools of fixation, and despite um, a great deal of understanding of the mechanisms of failure that have happened over the years, and help its surgeons to develop their skills and to develop better techniques of fixation. And when we speak about indications for total hip intracantric fractures, we have two categories of patients. One category, which is the majority of the indication, is to, to salvage patients who have had fixation previously, but it is failed fixation whether it is due to the development of secondary arthritis and head, co head collapse, failure of metal work, non-union, or the catastrophic situation of infection. There is another category or another indication for performing hip arthroplasty in trochanteric fracture as an acute procedure, as primary treatment of all these acute fracture. In patients who have pre-existing arthritis, for example, or patients who are highly osteoporotic and have um, uh, high comminution of their fracture. But how to evaluate the patient who have non-united fracture? We have to look at a holistic approach when we look at these patients. We evaluate the patient as a whole and we exclude infection. Obviously, we can speak about how to exclude infection in these patients and this is a different uh, uh, subject that perhaps would need a different picture altogether, but um, relying on ESR, CRP, specimen that's being taken into operatively um, and high degree of suspicion is something that we should always look at and think of. PT assessment of the field fixation and the hip joint to find what's happening on the head and the acetabular side and look at the greater to counter and the gluteus muscle attachment because this is an important aspect of regaining function and keeping the hip stable postoperatively um, in addition to the buttock and the medullary canal and how the previous metal work has invaded or damaged the uh, medullary canal and surrounding areas. There are difficulties when we perform hip arthroplasty for following internal fixation. For example, calus formation and heterotrophic ossification um, uh, uh, makes the um, uh, uh, defining the medullary canal difficult intraoperatively. Um, it is a disturbed anatomy in some way or another, so um, we have to take caution when we perform these procedures, and perhaps we can use the arm control intraoperatively to make sure that we are uh, in the corrected plane within the medullary canal and within the acetabulum as well. Um, because the medullary canal may, may be obliterated by the callus formation and the fibrous tissue, metal work, for example, uh, especially if there are broken screws. The greater trochanter is detached and proximally migrated in many of these cases. And we have to find out if uh, w where the screws or the invasion of the medullary canal has stopped because we have to think of the length of the stem while performing a arthroplasty. But what implant choice would be the best for cases 
uh, of arthroplasty following failed fixation of the trochanteric fracture, we have to look at the bone quality. Bone defects around the proximal femur and the screw holes in the medullary canal that may cause a stress riser because the end of the stem should be below these stress risers by somehow uh, two um, uh, 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 diameter widths. We're talking about four or five centimeters distant to the uh, screw holes. But generally speaking, Cemented implants may be preferred in patients who are osteoporotic elderly population because you have less incidence of developing uh, intraoperative and postoperative fractures. However, cement fixation is um, uh, uh, an important tool and an important uh, implant to be used in patients with good bone stock. And um, we have to always have uh, on shelf revision implants because you, you don't know what you are going to face intraoperatively. But when we, we think of patients um, who have uh, 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 failed fixation, we have to determine at the beginning and before proceeding to um, uh, any kind of uh, uh, implantation whether this patient is infected or not. Because if they are infected, I think staged arthroplasty should be the, um, uh, the answer. If they are not infected, um, at least from the findings uh, pre and intraoperatively, and um, uh, we should think of uh, whether they are elderly, have poor bone stock, and eroded head, and therefore, uh, if they are not infected, single stage arthroplasty uh, may be suitable. If the patient is young and have good bone stock, perhaps there may be a room for revision of fixation and salvaging of the uh, head joint uh, 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 by refixation. Now, when you look at the outcome of hip arthroplasty to salvage through country fracture, um, I quoted um, these two papers. Um, we, we find that the rate of complication in these cases is higher than normal. It reaches to around 20%. Some of these complications might be duplicated, infection, periodic fracture, interoperatively, and hematoma formation. But uh, uh, when we look at dual mobility, as an implant for um, for um, uh, to salvage these cases of non-united trochanteric fractures, we find that dual mobility has a low rate of dislocation, less than three percent. It is uh, uh, both cemented and cemented stems uh, were um, uh, were successful. This is the paper that uh, appeared from Saint Etienne in France, and um, uh, uh, there are uh, incidents of intraoperative uh, uh, fractures, uh, as I said earlier. Uh, which may um, uh, make us think carefully about what method of uh, uh, of uh, stabilization of the stem, whether it is cemented or uh, cementous, because uh, cemented stems usually have a good track of less intraoperative fracture when compared to uh, cementous stems. Um, I'll give an example, and this is um, uh, a lady in her uh, um, mid late seventies, I remember. Um, had the fixation with the uh, proximal femoral nail, but um, she's very osteoporotic. The fracture is unstable to start with, and the gradual collapse has happened within a few months uh, postoperatively. And when we uh, think of this lady, we should consider first, is it infected or not? What is the magnitude of bone defect from the proximal femur? Uh, what is the abductor mechanism? like and whether we are going to reattach the greater to can turn back to the uh, shaft of the femur. It, it, it cemented implant may be suitable. She is very osteoporotic um, and that dual mobility may be uh, the suitable uh, implant for this case. Now, intraoperatively, you have to define where is the greater to counter and to preserve the attachment of the gluteus muscles, both gluteus medius and minimus, to the greater to counter because um, uh, this is what is going to restore function and help this lady's mobilization. And uh, perhaps it is better to try to preserve the soft tissue continuity between the vasta lateralis and the abductor mechanism. Joint mobility articulation was used, cemented, and wires that is inserted through the lateral wall of the femur and around the stem from anterior posterior direction around the place, distal to the calcar, distal to the distal canter. Uh, these wires that is inserted before cementation and before insertion of the stem uh, should be um, uh, thought of and um, uh, performed 
before the insertion of the stem. And as I said, one of the um, uh, uh, points that I have to highlight here is the stem height, because you have lost the anatomic landmarkers that normally helps you to define the height of the stem. And it is a matter of a trial intraoperatively to um, adjust the soft tissue tension, make sure that you can reattach the greater to enter back into position. At the end of the operation, uh, you see we have preserved the um, uh, attachment of the um, uh, abductor mechanism to the greater to counter. We have preserved the soft tissue continuity between the vastus lateralis and the abductor mechanism. And this is the soft tissue cover postoperatively. This is the postoperative x ray and uh, double wired one lateral and one uh, encircling the stem. Um, uh, coming from the front and the back to encircle the greater two counter uh, to achieve the reattachment. Um, we get patients uh, like this one when the um, uh, uh, comminuton has extended to the subtrochantric area. The patient is 72 years old, had had two operations for fixation, for the timbit fixation of, of this uh, comminuted fracture that weren't uh, successful. Still non united, head is violated through by the metal work that was inserted. And in this case, perhaps uh, uh, because uh, good bonus stock is the available, cementless fixation of the stem and the cup uh, may be suitable. And if you observe the stem, it is distal to the uh, 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 most distal screw hole by about. Uh, six centimeters or so, it is distally locked stem to uh, control the rotation and to help this patient early mobilization uh, uh, and um, maintaining the integrity of the bone uh, sleeve around the proximal part of the stem that leads to um, uh, healing. Uh, at two years follow up, you can see that the um, uh, soft, the bone sleeve around the proximal part of the stem has healed in full and the hip is stable and the patient um, uh, starts early mobilization because he has got uh, the distal locking of the stem that allows early post-operative mobilization. Now, one of the difficulties as well is the heterotrophic ossification that is built around non-united structures and uh, um, one of the challenges is to restore range of movement um, um, uh, um, uh, but obviously by removing this uh, heterotropic ossification bar between the uh, alien and the uh, greater to counter. Uh, this is the um, um, operative X-ray and this is the uh, cementalist hip that was inserted. The patient starts early physiotherapy to regain range of movement and you can see that the patient has restored good function of uh, of this hip. So it is usually a disturbed anatomy. You have to think carefully of um, uh, uh, removing the heterotrophic ossification bars that links between the proximal femur and the ilium, and to start postoperative uh, mobilization. Now, we have another category of our patients with infected non-union that have published this paper a few years back um, that detailed um, uh, uh, the strategy in the management of infected bone union in the first stage. We performed the debridement that includes metal work and the infected bone and soft tissues, in addition to taking the specimens for culture and sensitivity and antibiotic loaded um, uh, cement spacers inserted. In the second stage, we uh, we perform the um, uh, the implantation of a proper uh, uh, implant. Now. Um, the second stage timing should be based not only on the clinical finding, but also also on the laboratory findings when we find the curve of decline of both CRT, ESR, and the D-dimers that takes us to the uh, second stage. Um, in our study, we found that 12% of the patients didn't appear for the second stage. They were satisfied that the pain has been relieved despite the deficiency in function. Um, uh, Reinfection happened in this than 5% and the dislocation rate was higher when we used the 28 millimeter diameter heads 
in comparison to the dual mobility. And um, uh, you may find um, uh, bone defects not only on the femoral side, but sometimes on the acetabular side, you see the uh, screw of the DFS has eroded the side of the ileum and has created that defect. Uh, um, uh, staged arthroplasty will perform it and um, uh, um, a tantalum augment was used along with a cemented uh, uh, cup. But um, uh, a Wagner stem, uh, street stem was used again by passing the uh, stress riser of the uh, previous screw holes on the top of the femur by about four or five centimeters um, uh, distant to them to avoid uh, creating any orthopedic problems. In the uh, staged arthroplasty uh, part, um, uh, um, you may opt to use cemented stems when you have screw holes, but uh, 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 at least if you perform it. Um, uh, as a staged protocol of treatment, this will allow you to seal the holes on the shaft of the femur and use a cemented uh, standard stem in the second stage of the, uh, of the uh, procedure. Now, um, the other indication for hepatoplasty in acute trochanteric fracture uh, are patients with pre-existing arthritis. If they have severe osteoporosis, and patients with polyarticular arthritis like uh, rheumatoid. Uh, there is a, a, an article that was published recently comparing the use of uh, proximal femoral nails um, uh, 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 versus hip arthroplasty in, in these highly commuted uh, fracture for patients above the age of 75. And uh, the mechanical complications with the nail was higher than uh, with the hip arthroplasty. Basically, that uh, the third is the dual mobility cup, and they found that cemented stem that achieved a better functional outcome uh, when compared to uh, the cemented one. Um, uh, in, in this um, uh, lady, um, uh, had pre existing arthritis in the hip joint, had a commuted trochanteric subtrochanteric fracture, and uh, a cemented stem and the dual mobility cup um, uh, was used with the attaching the greater to canter back to the shaft of the femur. She was um, uh, quite happy with the uh, with the result. Now, the fixation of the greater to canter in the acute situation is very important, and uh, I, I would like to highlight the details of uh, of performing this um, uh, 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 to canter reattachment. As I said earlier, I tended to preserve the uh, soft tissue continuity between the vastus lateralis and the um, uh, uh, gluteus medius uh, greater to canter. Um, reaming is being performed, they go through the posterior approach, reaming is being performed, and when the size um, uh, of the stem is determined, I perform the trial to uh, determine the uh, height of the stem. And then prior to inserting the um, uh, stem or cementing the uh, medullary canine, I apply two wires, one through the lateral wall, one double wire through the lateral wall, and another one anteroposterior, medial to the anteroposterior direction insertion I made, uh, medial to the uh, stem, and encircle the greater to canter with these two wires. This is the direction of the wire that I've, uh, I've uh, uh, just mentioned. And um, uh, uh, now the stem is cemented, um, uh, having determined the height of the uh, of the uh, stem, cementation and, um, and insertion of the stem, and then reattaching the greater to canter using these double wires, uh, encircling, encircling the greater to canter. And part of it is going around the uh, one limb of it. I mean, is going around the greater to canter, and the other limb is going through the bone of the biofilm uh, for so which is uh, a Strong part of the uh, of the greater to canter. This is a both operative uh, uh, X-ray and the final position uh, of the wire um, uh, that is being inserted for the reattachment. I have to um, highlight the fact here that uh, even if you use the um, uh, dual mobility uh, cap, it's not a substitute for uh, 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 proper orientation of the cap and the height of the stem and restoration of the offset, restoration of the soft tissue tension around the hip joint. So yes, you can use an implant with a wide range of movement and a good track of achieving good stability, but you have to uh, to remember all that uh, uh, technical details are important. And these technical details uh, uh, should apply to uh, both preservation of the soft tissue attachment to the height of the stem, to the inclination 
of the uh, of the cup and the height of the uh, stem, as I uh, as I mentioned. Again, this is the technique of the uh, wiring uh, to make sure that the uh, greater to canter is reattached, not to the stem, but back to the shaft of the femur. So hopefully, union can happen. Now, um, again, this is um, a, a, another case scenario for uh, a lady with rheumatoid arthritis who have had uh, uh, acute total hip replacement for the comminuted trochanteric uh, uh, fracture. Uh, then I hope um, I have covered the um, uh, indications for total hip arthroplasty and trochanteric fracture, both in cases of um, failed fixation and in the acute situation. Um, it is um, uh, uh, a good procedure that is being to uh, salvage failed fixation, uh, but also can be performed as a primary treatment in patients with pre-existing arthritis and highly commuted uh, osteoporotic fractures. We have to exclude infection if we are revising a case or had previous metal work. And we should uh, take specimens from around the implants and be uh, meticulous in our debridement techniques. Um, uh, if um, uh, dual mobility or large head is available, this will give a better stability postoperatively. Uh, cemented stems in patients with osteoporosis will be better in terms of less incidence of intra and post operative fracture. Make sure that you reattach the abductor mechanism back to the shaft of the femur or to the implant. So um, uh, you can uh, you can have good post operative function and behaving of the abductor mechanism and make sure that your stem bypasses the last uh, stress riser on the shaft of the femur so um, uh, you can achieve um, uh, uh, good stability and avoid post operative fractures. Now, um, uh, at the end, I would like to, uh, again, thank you for your attention and thank um, uh, Professor Ashtab for his kind invitation. I wish you all the best. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ayman Abid, for this interesting talk. Shukran gazeelan lahadratak. على حرص حضرتك على التواجد معانا بريكوردد ليكتشر بالرغم من سفر حضرتك للخارج ترجع في سلامه الله يا فندم ان شاء الله اور نيكست سبيكر ويل بي ماي دير فريند بروفيسور ملهم محمود ودايما بنقول ان لكل واحد من اسمه نصيب واعتقد ان دكتور ملهم يعني له نصيب كبير من اسمه ان شاء الله بروفيسور ملهم ويل سبيك اباوت لمبلنت ديسكريبنسي ان توتال هيب ريبليسمنت بروفيسور ملهم يو ار فيري ويلكم سير مساء الخير دكتور محمد. جود ايفنينج دير كوليجا اند بروفيسور او احسن نقول جود مورنينج. ثانك يو فور اكسترا اوردينري ايفورت دكتور محمد فور ذيس يعني مجهود كبير بتاع حضرتك بصراحه. الشير باين كده تمام؟ باين يا فندم بس فول سكرين تمام تمام يا فندم اتفضل يا فندم شكرا يا فندم. Uh, when you are in your office and a patient coming inside with this X-ray, for the first impression, as regard what is the patient complaint, if the surgeon who performed this replacement has any mistake, can you help this patient or how to help him? Uh, طبعا we are late in the time where I think some of the attendance has uh, fallen. Uh, I want uh, you to share with me to make some brainwash and uh, brain refreshment before we start. This is a short quiz. Try to answer this quiz and keep the answer to the end of the lecture to know the true answers. First question. Limb length discrepancy can be associated with gait disorder, back pain, nerve injury, all of the above. All of the following intraoperative techniques may result in lengthening of the operative leg during total hip replacement, except increasing femoral neck offset, increasing femoral neck length, incomplete insertion of a cemented femoral stem, making a high femoral neck cut just below the femoral head. When two limb length and apparent limb length are unequal in the same amount, this means limb length is equal and pelvis is balanced 
limb length is unequal and pelvis is balanced. Pelvic obliquity exists. Limb length inequality and compensatory pelvic obliquity are present. Last one, post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy with abduction deformity should be managed by show lift, release of adductors, physiotherapy, revision of the femoral component. Come back to my lecture, why I called it dilemma. Actually, this subject has many points of controversy. The precise division, uh, definition of limb length discrepancy is not clear. Also, its prevalence is not accurate. It is associated with many complications. It depends on the perception of patient. So, you may see limb length discrepancy and the patient has no complaint and vice versa. There is a difference between true limb length and apparent limb length discrepancy. Stages of assessment start pre-operative and end post-operative. The treatment of post-operative LLD has many controversies. What is the limb length discrepancy? It simply means right lower limb not equal to the left lower limb. Why it is important? Due to patient satisfaction depends on it. Many complication is associated with it, like abnormal gait, low back pain, nerve injury, and the need for revision, and medical legal issues. More than 45 years ago, Sir John Charlie stated that over lengthening of up to one centimeter can be justified because it permits active rehabilitation and patient very soon become adjusted to it. At 2017, the percentage of LLD was about third of patient with total hip replacement, up to 30%. You have four scenarios depend on the condition of limb length pre- and post-operative. What I mean, pre-operative, the patient may have equal limbs or unequal limbs. And post-operative, the patient may have equal limbs or unequal limbs. So you have four scenarios. The first scenario, the patient pre-operatively, his two limbs are equal and post-operative remain equal. The patient will be happy. The second scenario, the patient preoperative will have unequal limbs and postoperative, the limbs will be equalized. He will be very happy and grateful for the surgeon. The third scenario, the patient preoperative has unequal limbs and this unequality remains postoperative. The patient will be not happy. He will feel, why I do this operation if my limbs remain unequal? The last and worst scenario, the patient preoperative has equal limbs and found himself postoperatively unequal. And this is the start of medical legal problems. How to avoid it? This is a clever tailor. When he wanted to make a perfect suit for his client, he started by making a proper planning, then started to make his cuts, followed by first and second or more rehearsal, and finally gave his client the suit which is exactly fit him. To be an excellent surgeon, you should be more clever than this tailor by starting operatively, proper preparation and templating, intraoperative, make your cuts, then make rehearsal through trial component more and more times, even if you need more cuts. Then finally put your final implant to reach a post-operative patient with equal limbs. First, you should know the difference between true and apparent limb length discrepancy. True means 
measuring the limb from two points in the same limb. Usually, we use anterior superior iliac spine to medial malleolus to right and left. And this reflects the actual length of the limb. Apparent is meaning measuring the distance from a point in the midline, like umbilicus or zip sternum to the medial malleolus. This reflects what the patient feels. So the apparent it is the patient feel. So maybe the patient has equal limbs but have, has abnormal thing in pelvis or spine. This will reflect in abnormal feeling of short or long limb and apparent limb length discrepancy. You have four possibilities also. First, may the true limb length and apparent limb length is equal. You measure two limbs, find them equal, true, and apparent. This means the patient is normal patient, has equal limbs, and his pelvis is balanced. The second scenario, the patient may have two limb lengths are unequal, the apparent also unequal in the same amount. And this means the patient has unequal limbs. One of them is shorter but his pelvis is balanced. The third scenario, you measure the two limbs, find them equal by true and unequal in apparent. This means his limbs are equal, but the problem in pelvis, he has pelvic obliquity. The last scenario, the true limb length is unequal, but apparently looks equal. This means the patient has an unequal limbs, but there is a compensatory pelvic obliquity to cover this inequality. You should have assessment from the history. Ask the patient is has perceived any unequal feeling. Is one of his pants usually is shorter than the other side? Did he have any spine, hip, or muscle problem? Then, by examination, you should examine hip, pelvis, spine, and apparent and true and true limb length. By clinical measurement, using a tape or using indirect measure, which is block test. This is followed by radiographic assessment by anteroposterior pelvic radiograph, full length limb standing radiograph, and Scanogram. The pelvis anteroposterior radiograph depends on you determine two points, one on the pelvic side, one on the femoral side, and measure the vertical distance between them right and left. You said the full length and the scanogram. In the preoperative templating, the important point related to limb length is. Measuring the vertical distance between center of rotation of acetabular component and femoral head. There are operative measures to avoid limb length discrepancy. Depends on relation between two reference point and the position of the patient. You should make the position of the patient fixed to make all methods are right. First, stick to preoperative templating and execute it using shock test, external bony landmarks, distance between femoral head and lesser trochanter or greater trochanter, using leg length calibers and semi calibers. Also, you can use head and neck calibers and intraoperative x rays. This is using external bony landmarks. Simply, you can use ECG electrodes and feet in the special position and repeat this. Compare this before operation and after trial reduction and final implantation in the same position of the patient and the foot. This is distance between the center of femoral head and greater trochanter or lesser trochanter. Intraoperative photo showing measuring distance from center of femoral head to the tip of greater trochanter or the distance from lesser trochanter to the level of neck osteotomy. You can use the calibers, 
it depends on a fixed point on the pelvis and on the proximal femur. You can use a guide wire and bend it or a unicortical screw super stabler and a screwdriver in it as a fixed point. This interoperative photo of some of these calibers. Also, you can use with it a water level. These head and neck calibers used to measure the length of the head and neck and compare it to the trial component to determine the level of insertion. Also, you can use interoperative in X-ray and compare the side of the operation with the other side during trial component and after final implantation. The most important point is to never, never, never jeopardize stability for equal limb length. And you should explain to your patient preoperative that you may need to make a little lengthening to achieve stability. Post operative limb length discrepancy, if you reach this situation, you should determine is it apparent or true limb length discrepancy. If it is apparent limb length discrepancy, is this usually due to contracture. So wait, send your patient to physiotherapy to stretch contracted muscle and please avoid, avoid, avoid show lift and don't delete your physiotherapy to use show lift. This will apport the treatment of the patient. Wait to six months up to one year and this problem most probably will be solved. Very rarely you may need local injection or release contracted muscle. If it is true limb length discrepancy, you start. If it is less than two centimeter, just using show lift will be enough. If more than two centimeter and the patient has pain, correct this by show lift. If pain persists, there is may be another cause for this pain search for it. If the patient satisfied by this elevation, it is okay. If not, you need surgical correction. If the patient has contralateral hip problem, so wait till arthroplasty of the contralateral hip. If not, then you make equalization either by limb shortening or lengthening or revision to, of the total hip and fix your first fold. To summarize, limb length discrepancy is a very critical issue. True limb length is different than apparent limb length. Prophylaxis by pre- and intraoperative measures, much, much better than treatment post-operative. Uh, now we will uh, make the solution of the quiz. LND can be associated with all of the above, sure. All of the following intraoperative techniques may result in lengthening of the operative leg during total hip replacement, except increasing the femoral neck offset. When the true limb length and apparent limb length are unequal in the same amount, this means, I hope you know the answer, limb length is unequal and the belt is balanced. Post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy with adduction deformity should be managed by physiotherapy only and with. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Molham. You made a very difficult uh, subject, very easy, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Professor Molham. Uh, I think we have no, uh, no more questions. We have just answering the quiz, some answers to the quiz. Yeah. It, 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 it's very clear. You made it very clear, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, our, thank you, sir. Our next speaker will be Professor uh, Wael Samir. Uh, يعني Professor Wael, مش محتاج تقديم. أعتقد ما فيش حد ما يعرفش دكتور Wael Samir يعني. دكتور Wael Samir طبعا أخينا العزيز ويعني المحاضر الـ الـ المتميز والقدير. فطبعا شرف كبير لنا دكتور Wael يكون معنا. Professor Wael Samir at Chelsea yeah. University. والف شكر على المجهود الرائع اللي حضرتك بتعمله يعني انا اسف على التاخير والله يا استاذنا بس أه المحاضرات أه كلها قيمه جدا يعني ربنا يخليك تسلم تسلم الحمد لله على السلامه حافظ 
الف عند الله سلامة الله يسلمك دكتور وائل زي الصحة يا اخوان حضرتك يا فندم الله يسلمك هبتدي المحاضرة إن شاء الله المانجمنت أوف فيمورال بون ديفيشنسي إن ريفيجن توتال هيب أرثروبلاستي فيرست أي ويل إنتروديوس ذيس كيس إت إز 83 يرز أولد فيميل هاد دون باي بولر هيم أرثروبلاستي 14 يرز أجو ويز أس أ سكور أراوند 2 إت إز أونلي أون أسبرين أند أنتا هايبرتنسيف ويز رايت هيب أند ثاي بين أند إكس راي شون Of course, we can notice the uh, subsidence of the bipolar, uh, the loosening around the bipolar uh, arthroplasty and uh, deformity or remodeling at the end of the processes of uh, bipolar. And of course, as a patient advised for surgery as soon as possible to avoid any prosthetic fracture. Uh, but unfortunately, what we expected it is coming after only two weeks by very, very prosthetic fracture at the end of the process due to instability and the deforming force of virus remodeling at the end of the bipolar. The question is how to assess the femoral deficiency. And the question should be answered before going to revision arthroplasty in a case with femoral bone deficiency. We should ask ourselves about the etiology of the bone deficiency. Is it infected or not? Because we sometimes, uh, if we found a loosening of the bipolar for a long time or the hypoarthroplasty, we need to investigate for its septic or aseptic loosening. If the patient have associated deformity or remodeling in virus, it is around 30% of the cases of loosening of the primary hip going for a virus deformity and need, of course, for uh, planning for uh, extended trochanteric osteotomy to correct the deformity and the, for proper implantation of the revision um, uh, the, the stem. Is the bone deficiency uh, exceeding to the only confined to the metaphysial or diaphysial extent to, to make a proper classification of the bone deficiency? And since we can choose from different uh, implant design uh, to match with the uh, presented bone deficiency. And we, we should ask ourselves about the mechanical stability of the remaining bone in the distal part of the femur. And of course, the intraoperative assessment of the dome fish it is the final assessment after the preoperative assessment. So the etiology of bone deficiency may, may, may be due to aseptic loosening or septic infection, osteolysis, periprosthetic fracture, periprosthetic fracture. deficiency, or component malposition or catastrophe and the stem fracture. The classification of bone defects based on the description of the extent of the bone defect in various anatomical region of the femur. And if it is associated with any axial or deformity around the femur, and what about the mechanical stability of the remaining bone? And should done about uh, this through the analysis, the proper analysis of preoperative radiograph. But ultimately, we can only be determined the exact bone deficiency. Of course, it is intraoperative after removal of the loose step. What about the classifications of uh, femoral deficiency in revision total, which is the most commonly used is the Paprosky classification. A type 1 deficiency, it is only minimal defect in the calcar or the metaphysial in anthroposterior direction, but the metaphysial and the diaphysial is still intact and sufficiently intact for any bone support as so can be matched for any type of implant design. The Paprosky type 2 defect, this is more extensive defect to the metaphysis, the calcar and defect of varying extents still in the metaphysis, but still the diaphysis is completely intact. In Paprosky type 3, it is a, also it is an extensive defect in the, metaph in the metaphysis and no longer allow for any part of proximal fixation or proximal fixation design implant uh, for the revision total hip arthroplasty. And the diaphysis is also deficient. It is depending on the remaining glands of the diaphysial bone in the isthmus of the femur that is still available for the distal fixation. So we have two types of Paprosky type 3. It is type 3A or type 3B. In type 3A, it is the absent proximal metaphysis. With the diaphysis is intact, but still we have more than or equal 4 centimeters of the isthmus intact, which gives the stability of the diaphysial fixing revision stem. In Paprosky type 3, of course, it is absent proximal metaphysis, diaphysial intact for the, some distance, but the remaining part of the intact isthmus is less than 4 centimeters, it is still intact. 
In type 3, 4, which is a more severe, it is extensive metaphyseal defect, extensive diaphyseal defect. The entire femur is expanded all through the length of the femur with the remaining cortical bone is thin and the isthmus of the femur is no longer present. It is unsuitable for normal distal fixation of a revision stem from the available stem for revision in total hip arthroplasty. How can I go for implanted shows according to the femoral bone deficiency? The monoplock proximally porous coated femoral component, it is only suitable for the type 1 with a minimal defect in the metaphysis, but still we have an intact metaphysis for some degree and intact diaphysis. And no rule for this type of implant, which is more suitable for the primary total hip arthroplasty and the type 1 deficiency in revision total hip arthroplasty. Because in type 3 and type 4 and uh, type 2, 3, and 4, we have difficulty to obtaining stable proximal metaphyseal fixation and poor integrity of the proximal to hold this type of fixation. With a very high failure rate, about more than 50% at 8 years in revision if, if you have dealing with severe bone deficiency. Uh, the proximally modular femoral component, it is uh, com uh, component are uh, composed of breastfed metaphyseal sleeve, the same idea as when you are using sleeve for total knee arthroplasty for the proximal tibia or the distal femur. Breastfed metaphyseal sleeve with separately in an uh, integrated stem. So we have one part is separated for the fixation in the metaphyseal part and the slotted diaphyseal segment is inserted into the sleeve. Around, it is allows the sleeve metaphyseal match for proper fixation in the deficient metaphyseal part and accommodate fluted diaphyseal stem of different lengths and configuration and allowing the version to be uh, dialed in separately and the result have been more favorable, of course, than the short uh, proximally coated monoblock stem uh, as discussed before. What about the, the, the philosophy of the distal fixation based uh, implant, which is mainly indicated in type 3A and type 3B and type 2? We have two main philosophy in the distal fixation at what is called the slender and slender fixation uh, or a scratch fit or in cone and cone philosophy fixation. What about cylinder and cylinder fixation? This means the stem is in slender in shape and I should create the cylindrical shape in the uh, femoral isthmus or the diaphysis to be matched and allow for the scratch fit and the proper fitting between the stem and the intact diaphyseal. This type of processes have minimal, you should have a minimal fixation zone of four centimeters of the stem. So it is a better and probably indicated in type two and type three A, and with high failure rate in type three B, because we have less than four centimeters of the isthmus to be matched with this, this is type of implants. Cone in cone fixation. This means that this type of stem is conical in shape, and I should go for proper uh, uh, matching with the 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 isthmus of our patient. So we should create a conical reamer to get a conical shape in the diaphysis, and I should use the conical reamers to be used to create a conical fixation bed with the cutting into the cortex with a taper about two degree. It is not zero degree as a scratch fit or the slender in slender. And they're using tapered titanium stem with longitudinal fluids. This longitudinal fluids our splines of the stem create what rotational stability. And of course, I can use this type of implant in type 3P if we have a fixation distance less than four centimeters. And it better working in type with deficiency or a fixation distance of three to five uh, centimeters and produce greater stability than the cylindrical fully coated and best to work in type 3A and more in type 3B with deficient more uh, more uh, <coughs> fixation than the type 3A. So, and we have from this conical fixation, we have tapered stem either mono mono uh, non-modular or the medular and this of course uh, as the Wagner design uh, from Zimmer it is a new workhorse for the femoral revision surgery for advanced bone loss we have the modular part the uh, modular design with uh, the distal part and the proximal part 
because because the modular designs allow for the predictable restoration of the lens and offset i can control every items separately than the fixation zone at the diaphyseal part in the isthmus so i can control between the fixation zone of the implant and for proper orientation through the modular part of the proximal part through the lens and the offset and version. But still we have concern about the stem fracture at the more taper with this design. What about the non-modular tapered stem? Without using modular metaphysial part, it is decreased the risk of stem fracture, fretting and corrosion on the osteolysis, but more difficult to component position or restoration of the hip biomechanics may be complicated by early subsidence didn't appear to affect the clinical outcome with protected early wood bearing. We have also what is called anatomical or cur curved or the straight stem. The curved, uh, the curved stem, it is fixation bed first prepared cylindrical flexible modular emirs to, to, to create cylindrical part of the femur because it is an a curved stem. Then using the conical rasp to create the conical shape of the isthmus part to receive the conical design of this implant. The curved distal component, the same with two degree of the taper and the longitudinal flutes allow for rotational stability and used for moderately severe type 3 and type 3A, type 3P. The longer stem, this is one of the most common mistakes we are using in revision stem. You don't need to increase the length of the stem to get more stability. Once you get the proper fixation zone of this type of implant, which is about three to five centimeters between the conical shape of the stem and the conical created part through the special reamers, or the special rasp to create the conical shape to be fitting with the same implant design, the same length of fixation is achieved, whatever the lens we are using. So increasing the lens will not add a more benefit for the patient, may even lead to a worth fixation, and will convert the philosophy of this stem design from the cone to cone fixation into a three-point fixation in the isthmus of the femur, which is uh, le less or uh, not better than the conical in our cone cone fixation of this special designed implant. What about the using of the locking screw, the distal interlocking screw? If we have the isthmus fixation zone is less than three centimeters or associated with a fracture or associated with a defect, but still provided that you have a good cortical thickness over this short distance, which is less than three centimeters. The anchorage of the stem is still required in very short cone and cone fixation. Here, the, the, the main idea of the locking screw is increasing the axial and rotational stability of the fixed stem, but the screw are not sufficient to achieve the producible outcome. So you should First, be sure that you have a good fixation, although in a very short cone and cone fixation, but the screw add more stability at the rotation with additional stability until the callus formation, especially in transfemoral approach. Implantation of revision stem going for two approaches, either endofemoral from, uh, from proximal part of the femur without any osteotomy or transfemoral through the extended trochanteric osteotomy. In the endofemoral, you can use the, low, the curved stem because to allow for the matching with the anterior bone of the femur, you can use a greater lens, provide no femoral deformity uh, or, uh, because it may be if you're using with a femoral deformity in uh, intraoperative periprosthetic fracture. Longer stem, this means that you convert the philosophy into three-point fixation more and using a center to avoid jamming as the anterior curvature of the femur and slightly longer in the curve than the transfemoral. In transfemoral, after doing extended trochanteric osteotomy, you can use a straight stem, avoid the ventral perforation of the stem pro with proper design, distal fixation zone and therial fixation if you have about three centimeters of isthmus fixation zone is sufficient. Very important point, don't mix between the distal fixation and the proximal fixation. You should know the design of the stem. It is distally fixed stem or metaphysically fixed stem design. 
because either to go for the distal or proctomy. Never, never combined between if if one of the company representative come to you and uh, told you that this stem for revision uh, gets you the distal and the proximal fixation, it is not good. Because if you have a conical fixed stem component, there is no need for a more voluminous proximal component. Here I get the proper fixation in the diaphyseal part and the only need for the proximal part to proper leg length rotation and center of rotation and the offset adjustment. I don't need to to this component to be probably fixed in the metaphysis because I already get the proper fixation zone in the distal part. Can we use cemented stem in severe bone deficiency? Yes, but with disadvantage because the bony process bed is widened because the, 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 the rule in revision surgery to use more cementalis, not cemented, because the sclerosis, the scent, the thinning of the cortices as a result of the loathing with severe decrease in the shearing force of the cemented comparative to primary cemented uh, implantation about 80%. So it is significantly reduces the, the, the cement integration and should be confined for only patient with a uh, uh, elderly patient with uh, a low <coughs> a low need or uh, low activity patient because significantly longer long term losing rate for the cemented revision stem than cementless revision stem as high as 20 percent what about impaction grafting it is only performed in few center of the world with a high rate of early femoral component subsidence and the femur the idea is to prepare the 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 bed for uh, grafting with canal deployment of the oil stem fibrous tissue and the membrane and using morsalized cancellous allograft tightly packed in the canal we using cannulated tamps and approach over a guide wire, then using a polished tapered stem cemented into the reconstructed femur. It is better in severe proximal bone deficiency in type 2, non-predictable results in type 3, B or uh, for defect and it is technically demanding and as I mentioned before it is only performed in a few centers in the world. The allograft processes it is indicated in severe the circumferential proximal femoral bone loss with long stem either with long stem cemented in the allograft part of the proximal femur and the distal it may be cementless to get a stem breastfed or cemented to the host femoral canal with a step cut between the allograft processes component in the proximal part and the distal part. It is a potential for disease transmission, secondary bacteria infection, mainly to a non-union and graft resorption, and the several study on thoracic oncology, especially in the oncology reported encouraging results. What about the mega process in proximal femoral replacement? It is very limited to the elderly and low demanding patient with a massive bone loss. It is alternative. Uh, alternative is revision, uh, resection, arthroplasty, and the quick implantation. This advantage, uh, of course, uh, the fixation problems, the early loosening, the instability, and the severe stress shielding, fatigue, fracture, limb length discrepancy, sciatic nerve, of course, is a cost and a challenging revision and should be considered only as a salvage procedure. To summarize at the end, we have what is called uh, menu a la carte from a lot of designs of the stem, either cemented or cementless, and we have the cementless either proximally fixed implant or a distal fixed implant. We have either monoblock or modular. We have is extensively cylindrical borus coated or we have the tapered stem, the tapered stem, which is designed for the uh, coning comb fixation, and the medular tapers either straight or curved according to the use of with endofemoral indication or the transfemoral uh, with extended tutocantric osteotomy, because at the end of the story, I should match between the proper implant design and the deficient uh, classification of the femur in revision surgery, to end in to reestablish a stable implant to avoid the more bone loss and restore the hip biomechanics to reconstruct already bone loss. And at the end, we uh, get more good uh, reproducible results. Thank you very much for your time and uh, attendance. Thank you so much, Professor Wael Samir, on the Mohadra al Shamila al Gamea Adia Fandi. Thank you so much. If we have any questions to Professor Wael, 
اعتقد حضرتك ما شاء الله ما سبتش حاجه ما اتكلمتش عنها دكتور وائل بي يعني ربنا يكرمك يا فندم I think we have uh, no more questions. Everything is made easily and, and it's very obvious. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, we have just one question. Yeah, I know they are. Th uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Well, great lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asha, for it. Thank, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker will be Professor Mahmoud Hafiz. Alhamdulillah, salam, a friend in London. Professor Mahmoud will speak about 17 years outcome of conversion of bilateral fused hip to total hip replacement. Professor Mahmoud is the head of uh, orthopedic department, 6th of October University, or October 6th University, as you, as you like, Professor Mahmoud. Professor Mahmoud, you are muted, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, first, I would like to thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ashab, for this wonderful um, opportunity to have this large number of speakers to cover so many topics and um, also for the attendees who are waiting uh, late that late. Okay, I hope I'm not going to be long with you. This is uh, um, a series um, of unique cases where they have bilateral fused hips and these two hips are converted to total hip replacement. And uh, the third important thing is that 17 years um, outcome. So this is uh, just the causes of hip fusion in general. Uh, we have either surgical or pathological. So the surgical one, they are really rare now that anybody does uh, hip fusion. And especially if bilateral, it's contraindicated to do bilateral hip fusion. Um, in our series here, we have four cases, but these actually, they are iatrogenic. So patients who had um, um, previous surgeries in the hip and it ended up with fusion um, as a result of the surgery. Um, other causes could be autoimmune disease, especially including spondylitis, rheumatoid, and could be traumatic. Um, pediatric hip diseases usually doesn't cause fusion, uh, but some rare cases may cause fusion either because of any intervention um, or um, 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 as a result of um, the, the case itself. Um, AVN also rarely cause fusion unless it is really advanced and left for a long time. I have a patient who left the AVN for almost 10 years, that refusing to do hip replacement until the hip became fused. And then idiopathic cases. If we look at the literature, we have two great um, Egyptian colleagues who published about hip fusion. One of them is Ahmed Abdel Al from Asyut, who published in orthopedics, 15 cases. Um, and also uh, Prof. Morsi um, from Menufea, um, and he published in GBGS. Um, unfortunately, the largest number of hip fusion series was just 187 cases, um, and this was from writing in a hospital um, um, published in 2002. Um, and this 187 cases, they had few cases bilateral. Um, so in the literature, there's nothing about bilateral hip fusion and a conversion to total hip replacement and looking at outcome. Uh, here are some other literature, as you can see, um, um, one latest one in 2021, um, Journal of Arthroplasty, and there's also uh, one called, not, not so many uh, papers on this subject. So the aim of our work is actually to look at the clinical outcome of conversion of bilateral hip fusion into hip replacement. Uh, and the main primary outcome was a functional hip score and the secondary outcomes basically to look at um, complications and complaints from the patients. And especially, we, we need to find out um, other associated problems in the back and knee um, and um, leg length discrepancy. And most importantly, is the failure of the hip replacement, uh, whether um, it's loosening happened or patient required revision. So here is our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, the first 
patient was in 2007, last patient in 2021, and I have um, a table with every patient with the year where the operation was done. Um, so we have from three years to 17 years, any patient with symptomatic bilateral fused hips. Because if you have a patient with fused hip and not symptomatic, you may wonder and say, all right, if I fuse the hip, normally it causes no pain. So why the patient will have uh, surgery? They have surgery because of associated pain somewhere else because of the hip fusion or maybe because of deformity or maybe because of other uh, reasons of mobility, especially mobility. For example, if you have fused the hips, I have a few more pay, few patients who come at the age of 20s, usually the age of marriage for females, uh, and they have fused hips, they have no pain, but they have no mobility. And they think that they're not going to get uh, childbirth and they, they, they have misconception, uh, but definitely the patients like this cannot have any um, sexual um, relations, and also they will not be able to um, um, uh, get married as such. Um, so a patient with symptomatic bilateral fused hips and then patients who had bilateral hip replacement. So they must have bilateral hip replacement. I have patients who had bilateral fused hips, but for some reason they had one side that they couldn't like get funding for other um, side. And these are excluded from this study. Uh, regardless of the cause, whether surgical or pathological, as long as they had hip replacement, they are included. Exclusion is infection, uh, any general debilitating disease, neuromuscular disorders, and if a patient had unilateral hip replacement. So fused hips in this study is done for, um, um, sorry, for, for the conversion of fused hips here done for either um, surgical or pathological. And the surgical, as I mentioned, is atrogenic and the pathological, you will find a table with um, the number of cases for each disease. And uh, the bilateral hip replacement, some of them they had some bilateral simultaneous and some of them they had them staged. So the message here, we have 32 um, hip replacement done in 16 patients. Uh, these were included in this study who all had um, hip fusion. Previous pathologies included, um, as I mentioned, iatrogenic and closing spondylitis, EV and septic arthritis, uh, flexion deformity ranged from 10 to 45 degree. They had shortening, and if they have hip fusion bilateral, uh, still because of the migration of the hips, so both of, both legs are short, but they could be equal or they could be discrepancy. Okay, three patients uh, showed severe narrowing of the femoral canal, um, and you will see some examples of these cases. Lateral approach was used on all patients, and all patients were done by one surgeon, uh, who's myself. Uh, here is just a, an example of some cases, and then we're going to look at the methods and results in, 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 in more um, um, informative way with data and the statistical analysis. Here, um, a patient who's um, um, at the age of 20s, I, I think she is, um, I'm, I'm just showing this picture, sorry, as just an example of um, hip fusion as a result as of iatrogenic patients who had uh, previous surgery um, on both sides ended up with fusion. So our preoperative preparation um, as normal history examination and investigation, looking at the complaint and look at the cause and go into the examination in details and also investigation if needed. Not every patient will have MRI or EMG, but some of them might have. Operative planning, I use templating, either 2D, occasionally 3D for some complex cases, spot the opportunity uh, abnormalities, uh, look at sizing and offset, and also uh, leg length uh, uh, equalization in preoperative planning. During the surgery, many of these cases I had to use image, uh, the CR, um, or computer assisted, like a PSI, um, two sessions um, for some uh, primary cases. Um, and as you can see here, sequential for bilateral um, with a short interval. So for this bilateral, the interval could range from three days up to a few weeks, um, rarely more than one year when patient like no funding, they cannot get the other side 
uh, before one year or so. So these are delayed. But we try to make the, sh the interval as short as possible. So during operative uh, uh, technique, uh, the approach, as I mentioned, is lateral um, anatomy. Uh, definitely, there are difficulties, especially with the uh, dislocation and neck cut. Uh, many of these cases, you cannot get dislocation. You will ask a question, were all these cases being radiologically fused and clinically fused? All of them definitely clinically fused. You may see radiologically uh, a lion or something like this, but most of these cases, we had very difficulty during the surgery, um, even for a fibrous fusion, which is clinically uh, no move motion at all, uh, it's still some, it's difficult to dislocate the hip and you have to ream into the head itself. We occasionally do a wedge cut in the neck in order to uh, get the femur away from the astabulum and expose the astabulum. Uh, we ream, get the antiversion and abduction. We look for the anterior astabular ligament. We're lucky if we get it, not in every case. And also, um, we're going to look at the complications. Here is one of the, the patient is actually, this is the x-ray that I showed with the iatrogenic fusion. Um, and I was lucky to get the anterior stapular ligament. As you can see here, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, uh, but that is just below the blue cup here, the trial. You can see the white structure of the uh, acetabular ligament. And this will help you a lot in the anatomy, uh, even more than image intensifier. This is just uh, you know, some slides about the templating. You're all familiar with this. We're either using acetate, conventional acetate, or either using software to measure sizing, offset, and adjust leg length, and do all the planning in the EP and lateral views. So all these steps is meant to help you uh, predicting any intraoperative difficulties or, or problems. So here is the first case. This is the same x-ray that you showed earlier. Uh, the patient is 23 year old, female, bilateral DDH, um, failed uh, operative surgery uh, on each side uh, at the age of four years, uh, ended up with bilateral fusion. Um, and as I mentioned, um, patient usually they come complaining of pain, either from the hip region itself, either from the back, the sacroiliac, uh, the lower back, uh, or in, around the hip region, um, or as I mentioned, there is no motion. So lack of motion for a patient, for a female patient um, who is just in her 20s um, is a great indication for surgery. So here, this is a preoperative templating and planning, and that is a postoperative um, X-ray for this patient. Uh, this patient follow-up is now from 2008, so you're talking about 16 years. This is a second case, again, of iatrogenic uh, fusion from previous surgery. Um, the 52-year-old uh, gentleman who um, fell off a donkey um, like 25 years ago, uh, earlier, and then he bilateral good bilateral fracture neck femur as a result he had two surgeons in each side ended up with uh, infection and fusion and um, this patient after that long period came to have uh, the surgery because he was not able to walk he was walking like a robot with a bilateral fusion um, he never had the chance to sit on a chair um, so these patients are really crippled and when they have uh, the privilege of motion from hip replacement, no pain, good motion, um, improved gait, this for them is a new life. And that's what this patient said and described himself after surgery, that he is a new man. He wouldn't believe that he stayed uh, more than 25 years, uh, we were not able to sit on a chair and not able to walk properly. Here, the patient, uh, where you can see there is a, a, a big challenge because he had seven centimeters shortening, and I was extremely worried about the sciatic nerve. But as you can see here, uh, there is no sciatic palsy 
uh, in either side. There was shortening of 7 cm on one side and 5 cm as a result of the superior migration of the hip. Here is a case, um, as you can see here, of bilateral fusion uh, as a result of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthropathy, which was initially diagnosed as ankylosing spondylitis, but the patient was in his 20s. Um, and um, he had, again, um, um, bilateral um, hip, um, as you can see here. Uh, we managed to, to get the cups without screws. And for a patient like this, it was a new life again because he had 45 degree of friction deformity from the idiopathic hip arthropathy. And also he had knees, as you can see, damaged. And he had bilateral simultaneous uh, knee replacement in order to also help him with the hip biomechanics. Then he came later on with a severe ankle and subtalar joint uh, deformity was a vulgus that I felt that that's going to uh, affect the hip and knee alignment. So we requ he required um, fusion, as you can see here, uh, for the tailors, for the subtalar and ankle joint with a subtalar nail. Um, here is him uh, after surgery, managed to get married and get a job and new life for him. Uh, here is a patient with enclosing the spondylitis, and, and you can see the fusion on both sides. And as a result, he had, um, again, 45 degree flexion deformity, and he had um, this X-ray. Look at this X-ray here. You will see it later on when we talk about complications, because he got a complication uh, on the right side. Um, I'm just giving these case examples because everyone is different, either because of the um, um, pathology or uh, because of the nature of the disease and the hip replacement that was done. Um, here is a case, pediatric hip disease, um, 45 year old gentleman um, who again was not married and after this surgery, good married, good children, again, new life for him. You can see this is a post-operative X-ray uh, uh, for him. And, uh, sorry, this is for another patient, and I am just presenting this because uh, uh, um, unfortunately, I, I don't have the preoperative x ray for uh, this patient, but I got the post operative one. Okay, this is um, another case with a bilateral fusion. This is another patient, as you can see here. Okay, when we look at the demographics for these patients, as you can see here, the main uh, age, um, which was 35, ranging from 21 uh, up to 54. Um, and here is also the differences between males and females and the staging of the surgery. So we did bilateral simultaneous total hip replacement in six cases. And we did a staged hip replacement with a short interval, as I mentioned, in 10 cases. Here is a number of cases done per each year, starting from 2007. And the last one is 2021. Um, and we stopped after COVID. We didn't get any. I actually got one fused hip uh, this uh, year and last year. But these are not included in the study because of the short follow-up. Here is a disease distribution. As you can see, majority ankylosing spondylitis, um, few AVN, osteoarthritis, surgical, as I mentioned, the iatrogenic one, the four uh, hips, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and patient with pediatric hip disease. Um, the p-value and the student t-test that was done uh, for this data was um, statistically significant, was um, less than, as you can see here, 